Talmud, Mas Arab and ACHAPTER mission across beam spanning the entrance to a blind alley at a height of more than 20 cubits should be lowered. Arjuna ruled this is unnecessary and any entrance that is wider than 10 cubits should be reduced in width. But if it has the shape of a doorway, there is no need to reduce it even though it is wider than 10 cubits. Imara elsewhere we have learned a sukkah which in its interior is more than 20 cubits high is unfit. But Arjuna regards it as fit now wherein lies the difference between the two cases that in respect of the sukkah it was ruled unfit while in respect of the entrance to a blind alley remedy was indicated in respect of a sukkah since it is a pentateuchal ordinance it was proper categorically to rule unfit in respect of the entrance. However, since the prohibition against moving objects about in the alley is only rabbinical a remedy could well be indicated if you prefer I might reply a remedy may. Properly be indicated in the case of a pentateuchal law also, but as the ordinances of a sukkah are many, it was briefly stated unfit. While in the case of an entrance to a blind alley, since the regulations governing it are not many, a remedy could be indicated. Rav Judah stated in the name of Rav the sages could have deduced it only from the dimensions of the entrance to the Hikal, and Arjuna could only have deduced it from the dimensions of the entrance to the Ulam, for we have learned it. Entrance to the Hikal was 20 cubits high and 10 cubits wide, and that to the Ulam was 40 cubits high and 20 cubits wide, and both based their expositions on the same text and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The rabbis being of the opinion that the sanctity of the Hikal is distinct from that of the Ulam, and that of the Ulam is distinct from that of the Hikal, so that the mention of the entrance of the tent of meeting must refer to the Hikal only. Arjuta, however, is of the opinion that the Hikal and the Ulam have the same degree of sanctity so that the mention of the entrance of the tent of meeting refers to both of them if you prefer I might say according to our Judah's view also the sanctity of the Hikal is distinct from that of the Ulam but the reason for our Judah's ruling here is because it is written to the entrance of the Ulam of the house and the rabbis if it has been written to the entrance of the Ulam the implication would indeed have been as you suggested now however that the text reads to the entrance of the Ulam of the house the meaning is the entrance of the house that opens into the Ulam but is not this text written in connection with the tabernacle we find that the tabernacle was called sanctuary and that the sanctuary was called tabernacle for should you not concede this consider the statement which Rab Judah made in the name of Samuel peace offerings that were slain prior to the opening of the doors of the Hikal are Disqualified because it is said in scripture and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting which implies only when it is open but not when it is closed. Now surely it might be objected is not the scriptural text written in connection with the tabernacle. The fact then must be conceded that an analogy may be drawn between the two since we find that the sanctuary was called tabernacle and that the tabernacle was called sanctuary. One may well agree that the sanctuary was called tabernacle since it is written in scripture and I will set my tabernacle among you once. However do we infer that the tabernacle was called sanctuary if it be suggested from the scriptural text and the Kohathites the bearers of the sanctuary set forward that the tabernacle might be set up against their coming Talmud. Mas Arabin B that surely was written in respect of the holy ark rather it is from the following text that the inference was made and let them make me a sanctuary that I May dwell among them whether according to the ruling of the rabbis or according to that of Arjuna might not the deduction be made from the entrance of the court of the tabernacle since it is written in scripture the length of the court shall be a hundred cubits and the breadth fifty everywhere and the high five cubits and it is also written the hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits and again it is written and so for the other side on this hand and that hand by the gate of court were hangings of fifteen cubits as there the entrance was five cubits in height by twenty cubits in width so here also the dimensions allowed should be no less than five cubits in height but as many as twenty cubits in width such an entrance may well be described as the entrance of the gate of the court but it cannot be regarded as an ordinary entrance if you prefer I might reply the scriptural instruction that the hangings for the one side shall be fifteen cubits Applies to its height, you say its height is it not in fact written and the high five cubits that refers only to a part of their height above the edge of the altar as to Arjuna. How could it be said that he inferred the measurements of a gateway from the door of the Ulam when in fact we have learned and any entrance that is wider than ten cubits should be reduced and Arjuna did not dispute the ruling of a reply, he does dispute this ruling in the Baritha for it was taught and any entrance that is wider than ten cubits should be reduced, but Arjuna ruled that it was not necessary to reduce it, then why does he not express his disagreement in our mission? He expressed it in respect of the height of the gateway, and the same disagreement applies to the width. Can it however still be maintained that Arjuna inferred the measurements of a gateway from the entrance of the Ulam when it was in fact taught across beam spanning the entrance to a blind alley? Height of more than 20 cubits should be lowered, but Arjuna regards the entrance as a proper gateway even if the beam is as high as 40 or 50 cubits and Barkapur taught even 100 the high figure of Barkapur might quite well be regarded as an hyperbole but in respect of the figures of Arjuna what hyperbole could be postulated as regards that of 41 might well explain that he derives it from the height of the door of the Ulam once however does he derive that of 50 Arhista replied the following Barrytha must have misled Rav for it was taught across being spanning the entrance to a blind alley at a height of more than 20 cubits and thus forming a gateway higher than the doorway of the Hikal should be lowered he consequently thought since the rabbis derived their figure from that of the height of the doorway of the Hikal Arjuna must have derived his figure from that of the height of the doorway of the Ulam in fact However, this is not the case. Arjuna derived his figure from that of the height of the doorways of kings. As to the rabbis, however, if they derive their figure from that of the height of the doorway of the Hikal, should they not also require a gateway to have doors like the Hikal? Why then did we learn the rendering of an alley fit for carrying objects within it? Beth Shammai ruled requires a side post and a beam, and Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam. The doors of the Hikal were made merely for the purpose of privacy. If that is the case, the shape of the doorway should be of no avail since the entrance to the Hikal had the shape of a doorway and yet was only 10 cubits wide. Why then did we learn if it has the shape of a doorway? There is no need to reduce it even though it is wider than 10 cubits. Does not that reason originate but from Rab? Well, when Rab Judah taught Hibi Rab in the presence of Rab, it is not necessary to reduce it with the latter told them. Teach him it is necessary to reduce it still if that is so Talmud, Mas Arab and a, a cornice should be of no avail since the entrance to the Hikal had a cornice and yet was only twenty cubits high for have we not learned five cornices of oak were above it one higher than the other one an objection however is this is it not possible that the statement about the cornices was made in respect of the Ulam and what difficulty is this it is quite possible that the build of the entrance to the Hikal was like that of the Ulam and why did RILA state in the name of Rab that if a crossbeam was forehand breadths wide it constitutes a proper gateway even though it is not strong enough and if it had a cornice there is no need to lower it even if it was higher than twenty cubits or Joseph replied the ruling about the cornice is that of Barry who learned it Abbe replied Hamma the son of Rabbi Abu learned it but even if the ruling about the cornice is a that does did not present an objection against Rab Rab can answer you even if I am removed from here are not the two Barithas mutually contradictory all you can reply however is that they represent the views of different Tanis so also the reply to the contradiction against me may be that our respective statements are the views of different Tanis are and B Isaac said in the absence of the statement of Rab there is no contradiction between the two Barithas since the reason of the Rabbis for limiting the height of the beam may be that there should be a distinguishing mark and that the use of the expression higher than the doorway of the call is a mere mnemonic as to Arnam and B Isaac his explanation may be accepted as satisfactory if he does not adopt the view of Rabba but if he does adopt the view of Rabba who stated it is written in scripture that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths if the roof of the booth is not higher than 20 cubits one knows that one is living in a booth but if it is higher than 20 cubits one would not know it since the roof does not catch the eye from which it is clear that in respect of sukkah also they differ on the question of distinction why it may be asked should they express the same difference in two rulings both are required for if we had been informed of their dispute in
A sukha why is this admissible in the case of an entrance? Obviously, because we say regard the beam as plain, but then why should it not be said in respect of a sukha? Also, regard the roof as thin. If you assume the roof to be thin, the sunshine in the sukha would have to be assumed to be more than the shade. But here also, if you regard it as plain, would not the beam be like one that can be carried away by the wind? Consequently, you must assume that beams in the conditions mentioned are regarded as metal spits. May it not then here also be said that whatever the assumption, the extent of the shade is actually more than that of the sunshine. Rabba Parasika replied in the case of a sukha, since it is usually intended for the use of an individual, one might not remember the altitude of the roof in the case of an entrance. However, since it is made for the use of many, the people concerned would remind one another. Rabbin replied, the rabbis made the law. Stricter in respect of a sukha because the commandment is pentacle, but in respect of an entrance to an alley, the prescribed construction of which is only rabbinical, the rabbis did not impose such restrictions. Are at a beam and taught the statement of rabbi just cited in the reverse order. Rabbi said it is inadmissible in the case of an entrance, but admissible in that of a sukha. Why is this admissible in the case of a sukha? Obviously, because we say regard the roof as thinned out. But then why should it not be said in respect of an entrance? Also, regard the beam as plain. If you regard it as plain, the beam would be like one that can be carried away by wind. But here also, if you regard the roof as thinned out, would not also the sunshine in the sukha have to be regarded as larger in extent than its shade? Consequently, you must maintain that whatever the assumption, the actual extent of the shadow is larger than that of the sunshine. May it not then here also. He said that whatever the assumption beams in the condition mentioned are regarded as metal spits. Rabba Parasika replied in the case of a sukha, since it is usually made for one individual, that person realizes his responsibility and makes a point of remembering the conditions of the roof in the case of an entrance. However, since it is made for the use of many, the people affected might rely upon one another and so overlook any defects in the crossbeam. For do not people say a pot. In charge of two cooks is neither hot nor cold. Rabbin replied, the law of sukha, since it is pentacle, requires no buttressing, but that of an entrance, since it is only rabbinical, does require buttressing. What is the ultimate decision? Rabbi B. R. O. replied, the one as well as the other is inadmissible. Rabbi replied, the one as well as the other is admissible. Talmud, Mas Arabin B. Talmud, Mas Arabin B. For what we learned in respect of height refers to the interior of the sukha and to the empty space of the entrance set our Papa to Rabba Barry was taught which provides support for your view across beam over an entrance to a blind alley that is higher than 20 cubits and is thus higher than the entrance to the Hikal should be lowered now in the Hikal itself the height of the hollow space of the entrance there too was 20 cubits Arshai Mai B. Ashi raised an objection against our Papa how does one construct the prescribed entrance one places the cross beam below the limit of 20 cubits of its altitude read above but surely it is stated below it was this that we are informed that the lowest permitted altitude is to be measured on the same principle as the highest as in the case of the highest altitude permitted the hollow space of the entrance must not exceed 20 cubits so also in the case of the lowest altitude permitted the hollow space of the entrance must not be lower than 10 cubits have a stated in the name of Arnam in the cubit. Applicable to the measurements of a sukkah and that applicable to an entrance is one of five handbreadths. The cubit applicable to the laws of Kilim is one of six handbreadths. In respect of what legal restriction has it been ruled that the cubit applicable to the measurements of an entrance is only one of five? If it be suggested in respect of its height and of the size of a breach in the alley, surely it could be retorted, is there not also the law on the depth of an alley? That must be no less than four cubits, in which case the adoption of the smaller cubit results in a relaxation of the law. He holds the same view as does he who limits the depth to four handbreadths. If you prefer, I might reply that the depth of an alley must indeed be four cubits, but he spoke of the majority of cubit measurements in respect of what legal restriction has Arnaman ruled that the cubit applicable to the measurements of a sukkah is one of five if it be suggested in Respect of its height and the permitted size of a crooked wall, surely it might be objected. Is there not also the law requiring the area of the sukkah to be four cubits by four cubits, in which case the adoption of the smaller cubit results in a relaxation of the law? For was it not taught? Rabbi said, I maintain that any sukkah which does not contain an area of four cubits by four cubits is legally unfit. Arnaman is of the same opinion as the rabbis who ruled that a sukkah is valid. Even if it accommodates no more than one's head, the greater part of one's body and a table, and if you prefer, I might reply, it may in fact be in agreement with the view of Rabbi, but he spoke of the majority of cubit measurements in respect of what legal restrictions has Arnaman ruled that the cubit applicable to the laws of Kilim is one of six in respect of a passion of vineyard and the uncultivated border of a vineyard, for we have learned each side of a passion of vineyard beth. Shammai ruled must measure no less than 24 cubits and Beth Hillel ruled 16 cubits and the width of an uncultivated border of a vineyard Beth Shammai ruled must measure no less than 16 cubits and Beth Hillel ruled 12 cubits what is meant by a patch of vineyard the barren portion of the interior of the vineyard if its sides do not measure 16 cubits no seed may be sown there but if they do measure 16 cubits sufficient space for the tillage of the vineyard is allowed and the remaining space may be sown and what is meant by the border of a vineyard the space between the actual vineyard and the surrounding fence if the width is less than 12 cubits no seed may be sown there but if it measures 12 cubits sufficient space for the tillage of the vineyard is allowed and the remaining area may be sown but surely there is a case of vines planted closely within 4 cubits distance from one another where the adoption of the higher Standard would result in a relaxation of the law for have we not learned a vineyard the rows of which are planted at distances of less than four cubits from one another is not regarded our simian ruled as a proper vineyard and the sages ruled it is regarded as a proper vineyard the intervening vines being treated as if they were not existent our nomin is of the same opinion as the rabbis who ruled that whatever the distances the plantation constitutes a proper vineyard if you prefer. I might reply he may in fact hold the view of our simian but he was referring to the majority of cubit measurements rabba however stated in the name of our nomin all cubits prescribed for legal measurements are of the size of six handbreadths but the latter are expanded while the former are compact an objection was raised all cubits of which the sages spoke are of the standard of six handbreadths except Talmud, Mas Arabin, that their measurements must not be exactly alike now. According to Rabbi, this is intelligible since the measuring must be done in such a manner as to have the handbreadths in the latter case expanded and the former case compact. But according to Abbe, does not this present a difficulty? Abbe can answer you the cubit spoken of in respect of Kilim is of the length of six handbreadths. But since it was stated in the final clause, our Simeon Begamaliel ruled all cubits of which the sages spoke in relation to Kilim are of the standard of six handbreadths, except that these must not be compact. Does it not follow that the first ten refer to all cubits? Abbe can answer you is there not our Simeon Begamaliel who maintains the same standpoint as I uphold the same ruling as our Simeon Begamaliel? According to Abbe's view, the standard of the respective cubits is undoubtedly a question in dispute between ten. As must it, however, be said that according to Rabbi's view, also the standard of the cubit is a question in dispute between. Tanis Rabbi can tell you it is this that our Simeon Begamaliel desired to inform us that the handbreadths of the cubit applicable to Kilim must not be compact. If that is the case, he should have said the handbreadths of the cubit applicable to Kilim must not be compact. What, however, could he have meant to exclude by his addition of the standard of six handbreadths? Did he not obviously mean to exclude the cubit of the sukkah and the cubit of the entrance? No, to exclude the cubit by which the base and the one by which the surrounding ledge of the altar were measured, for it is written in scripture, and these are the measures of the altar by cubits. The cubit is a cubit, and a handbreadth. The bottom shall be a cubit, and the breadth a cubit, and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about a span, and this shall be the base of the altar. The bottom shall be a cubit refers to the foundation of the altar, and the breadth a cubit refers to its surrounding ledge. And the border thereof by the edge thereof round about a span refers to the horns, and this shall be the base of the altar refers to the golden altar. Our high B. Ashi stated in the name of Rab the laws relating to standards,
One domain into another on the Sabbath pomegranates are an illusion as we learned all defiled wooden utensils of householders become clean if they contain holes of the size of pomegranates. A land of olive trees is an illusion to the land all the legal standards of which are of the size of olives. You say all the legal standards of which etc. is this conceivable. Surely there are those that have just been enumerated rather read a land most of the legal standards of which are of it. Size of olive honey is an illusion to the eating of food of the size of a big date that constitutes an offense on the Day of Atonement. Do you then imagine that the standards were actually prescribed in the Pentateuch? The fact is that they are but traditional laws for which the rabbis have found illusions in Scripture, but the laws relating to interpositions are Pentateuchal. For was it not taught since it is written in Scripture, then he shall bathe all his flesh? It follows that there must be no interposition between his flesh and the water. In water implies in water that is gathered together. All his flesh implies water in which all his body can be immersed. And how much is this a volume of the size of a cubit by a cubit by a height of three cubits? And the sages accordingly estimated that the waters of a ritual bath must measure forty se where a traditional law is required. It is in respect of one's hair, and it is to be understood in accordance with the statement. A rabbi son of Arhuna for rabbi son of Arhuna said one knotted hair constitutes an interposition three hairs constitute no interposition but I do not know the ruling in the case of two but are not the laws relating to one's hair also pentacle for was it not taught and shall he bathe all his flesh implies even that which is attached to his flesh and by this was meant here where traditional law is required it is the case of hair and it is for the purpose of distinguishing between an interposition on its major and one on its minor portion and between one to which the bather objects and one which he does not mind this being understood on the lines of our Isaac who said according to traditional law an interposition on its major part to which a man objects constitutes an interposition but one which he does not mind constitutes no interposition the rabbis however ruled that an interposition on its greater part shall constitute an interposition even when it Man does not mind it as a preventive measure against the possibility of allowing an interposition on its major part to which the man does object and that an interposition on its minor portion to which a man objects shall constitute an interposition on account of the possibility of allowing an interposition over its major portion to which a man objects but why should no prohibition be enacted also against an interposition over its minor portion to which one does not object as a preventive measure against the possibility of allowing an interposition over its minor portion to which one does object or its major portion to which one does not object this ruling itself is merely a preventive measure shall we go as far as to institute a preventive measure against another preventive measure but the laws defining partitions are pentacle for did not a master state the height of the arc was nine handbreadths and the thickness of the arc cover was one handbreadth so that we have here a total height of ten handbreadths. The traditional law is required in respect of the views of our Judah who holds that the cubit used for the structure of the temple was of the standard of six handbreadths, while that for the furniture was only one of five handbreadths. According to our Meir, however, who holds that all cubit measurements were of the medium size, what can be said in reply? According to our Meir, it may be replied the traditional law refers to the legal fictions of extension junction and the crooked wall. If the crossbeam was higher than twenty cubits and it is desired to reduce the height, how much is one to reduce it? How much is one to reduce it? You ask as much obviously as one requires, but it is this that is asked: How much must the raised ground be? And with our Joseph replied, a handbreadth of a reply for handbreadths. May it be suggested that they differ on the following principles? He who said a handbreadth being of it. Opinion that it is permissible to make use of the floor space under the beam Talmud. Moss Ayurveda while he who said four handbreadths is of the opinion that it is forbidden to make use of the floor space under the beam. No all may agree that it is permissible to make use of floor space under the crossbeam, but here they differ on the following principles. One master holds the opinion that a crossbeam is required on account of the necessity for a distinguishing mark, while the other master holds that a crossbeam is required on account of the necessity for a partition. If you prefer, I might reply that all agree that a crossbeam is required on account of the necessity for a distinguishing mark, but here they differ on the question whether the distinguishing mark below must be of the same dimensions as the one above. One master is of the opinion that we say that a distinguishing mark below is provided by the same width as the one above, and the other master holds. That we do not say that a distinguishing mark below is provided by the same dimensions as the one above, and if you prefer, I might reply that all agree that a distinguishing mark below is provided by the same width as the one above. But their point of difference here is the question whether a wider space was ordered as a preventive measure against the possibility of its being trodden down if an entrance to an alley was less than ten handbreadths in height and it was desired to dig up the ground so as to bring up the altitude to ten handbreadths. How much must one excavate? You ask how much must one excavate? As much, of course, as one requires. Rather, this is the question: to what extent and with must one excavate? Our Joseph replied to four handbreadths. Have a reply to four cubits. Might it be suggested that they differ on the principle laid down by RMI and RC? For it was stated if a breach was made in a side wall of an alley close to its entrance, it was ruled. In the name of RMI and RC, if a strip of the width of four handbreadths was there, it is permissible to regard the alley as ritually fit, provided the breach is not wider than ten cubits. If, however, there was no such strip there, it is permissible to regard the alley as ritually fit if the breach was less than three handbreadths wide. But if it was three handbreadths wide, this is not permissible. Might it then be suggested that our Joseph adopts the principle of RMI and that Abbe does not hold the principle of RMI? Abbe can answer you there. It is a question of destroying the ritual fitness of an alley, but here it is a case of creating one. Consequently, if the excavation extends to a width of four cubits, the entrance becomes ritually fit. But if not, it is not fit. Said Abbe wants to derive my ruling from what was taught: the movement of objects in an alley cannot be permitted on the Sabbath by means of a side post and a crossbeam unless. Houses and courtyards open out into it now if a strip of the width of four handbreadths were to constitute a proper alley wall how could this be possible and should you reply that the doors might open in the middle wall the fact is it could be retorted that Arnaman stated we have a tradition that if the movement of objects in an alley is to be permitted on the Sabbath by means of a side post and a crossbeam its length must be more than its width and houses and courtyards must open out into it and our Joseph each door might open in a corner of a further stated once do I derive my ruling from what Rami Bihama said in the name of Arhunai of a projection from the end of a side wall of an alley is less than four cubits in width it may be regarded as a side post and no other post is required to affect the ritual fitness of the alley but if it is four cubits wide it is deemed to be a part of the structure of the alley and another post is required to affect its ritual Fitness and our Joseph to deprive a projection of its status as a post there must be a width of four cubits but as regards constituting a wall in an alley even a width of four handbreadths is also enough to constitute an alley reverting to the above text Rami B. Hama said in the name of Arhunai of a projection from the end of a side wall of an alley Talmud, Mas Arab and B is less than four cubits in width it may be regarded as a side post and no other post is required to affect it. Ritual fitness of the alley but if it is four cubits wide it is deemed to be a part of the structure of the alley and another post is required to affect its ritual fitness where however does one put up that other post if it be attached to the projection would not one be merely adding to it or proper replied one puts it upon the other side Arhunai son of our Joshua said it may even be maintained that it is attached to the projection but it is made bigger or smaller Arhunai son of our Joshua. Stated this has been said only in respect of an entrance to an alley that was no less than eight cubits in width, but where the entrance to an alley is seven cubits wide, sabbatic ritual fitness is affected because the portion built up is longer than the breach. This ruling is inferred a minority ad majus from the law relating to a courtyard. If a courtyard, the movement of objects in which on the Sabbath cannot be rendered permissible by means of a side post and a crossbeam is nevertheless deemed fit for such movements where its built up portions are larger than its broken parts. How much more than should an alley where such movements may be rendered permissible by means of a side post and a crossbeam be deemed fit when the built up portion across its entrance is larger than its open part but is not a courtyard, however different from an alley since a gap of ten cubits was also allowed in it, then how can one apply the same ruling to an alley where only a gap of four cubits was allowed. Arhuna son of Arjashu holds the opinion that in an alley
Presumably because one can say that the gap is an entrance but then could not one say also when it is made in the front wall that it is an entrance Aruna son of Arjashu replied the ruling applies to a case for instance where the breach was made in a corner since people do not make an entrance in a corner Aruna however ruled the one as well as the other is subject to the limit of four cubits and so in fact did Aruna say to Arhina and Birabha do not dispute with me for Rab once. Happened to visit Damharia and actually gave a decision in accordance with my Birab the other replied found an open field and put a fence around it Arunam and B. Isaac remarked reason is on the side of Arhuna for it was stated a crooked alley Rab ruled is subject to the same law as one that is open on both sides but Samuel ruled it is subject to the law of a closed one now with what case are we dealing here if it be suggested with one where the passage through the bend is wider than ten cubits. With Samuel in such circumstances it may be retorted rule that it is subject to the law of a closed one consequently it must be conceded that the width of the communication passage is within the limit of ten cubits and yet Rab ruled that it is subject to the same laws as one that is open on both sides from which it definitely follows that the permissibility of a breach in a side wall of an alley is limited to four cubits and Arham Birab there it is different since many people make their way through it this then implies that Arhuna is of the opinion that even if not many people make their way through it a breach of no more than four cubits is allowed but why should this be different from the ruling of RMI and RC there it is a case where ridges of the broken wall remain but here it is one where there were no ridges our rabbis taught how is a road through a public domain to be provided with an air of the shape of a doorway is made at one end and a side post and crossbeam are fixed at the other hand and he, however stated Beth Shammai ruled the door is made at the one end as well as at the other end it must be locked as soon as one goes out or enters and Beth Hillel ruled the door is made at one end and a side post and a crossbeam at the other may an Arab however be lawfully provided for a public domain was it not in fact taught a more lenient rule than this did Arjuna lay down Talmud, Mas Arab and B if a man had two houses on the two sides. Respectively of a public domain he may construct one side post on any of the houses on one side and another on its other side or one crossbeam on the one side of any of the houses and another on its other side and then he may move things about in the space between them but they said to him a public domain cannot be provided with an Arab in such a manner and should you reply that it cannot be provided with an Arab in such a manner but that it may be provided with one by means of doors. Surely it can be retorted did not Rabbi Barhan estate in the name of Aryohanan that Jerusalem were it not that its gates were closed at night would have been subject to the restrictions of a public domain and Ulatu has stated that the city gateways of Mahuza were it not for the fact that their doors were closed at night would have been subject to the restriction of a public domain Rab Judah replied it is this that was meant how is an Arab to be provided for alleys that open out at both ends into a public domain the shape of a doorway is made at one end and a side post and crossbeam at the other it was stated Rab said the Halachah is in agreement with the first Tana and Samuel said the Halachah is in agreement with Hanani the question was raised according to Hanani's ruling in the name of Beth Hillel is it necessary to lock the single door of the alley or not come and hear what Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel it is not necessary to lock it and so also said R. Mahana in the name of Samuel it is not necessary to lock it some there are who read R. Mahana stated I myself was once concerned in such a case and Samuel told me that there was no need to lock the door Arain and was asked is it necessary to lock the door of an alley or not he replied come and see the alley gateways of Nihardia which are half buried in the ground and Mar Samuel continually passes through these gates and yet never raised any objection Ar Kahana said those were partially Close when Arnaman came he ordered the earth to be removed does this then imply that Arnaman is of the opinion that alley doors must be locked no provided they are capable of being closed sabbatic ritual fitness is affected even though they are not actually closed there was a certain crooked alley at Nihardia upon which were imposed the restriction of Rab and the restriction of Samuel and doors were ordered to be fixed at its bends the restriction of Rab who ruled that a crooked alley is subject to the same law as one that is open on both sides but as Rab in fact stated the Halachah is in agreement with the first hand of the second restriction was applied in agreement with Samuel who stated the Halachah is in agreement with Hanania and as Samuel in fact ruled that a crooked alley is subject to the law of a closed one the first restriction was applied in agreement with Rab who ruled that a crooked alley is subject to the same law as one that is open at both and do we however adopt the restrictions of two authorities who differ from one another was it not in fact taught the Halachah is always in agreement with Beth Hillel but he who wishes to act in agreement with the ruling of Beth Shammai may do so and he who wishes to act according to the view of Beth Hillel may do so he however who adopts the more lenient rulings of Beth Shammai and the more lenient rulings of Beth Hillel is a wicked man while of the man who adopts the restrictions of Beth Shammai and the restrictions of Beth Hillel scripture said but the fool walketh in darkness a man should rather act either in agreement with Beth Shammai both in their lenient and their restrictive rulings or in agreement with Beth Hillel in both their lenient and their restrictive rulings now is not the self-contradictory you said the Halachah is always in agreement with Beth Hillel and then you proceed to say but he who wishes to act in agreement with the ruling of Beth Shammai may do so this is no difficulty the latter statement was made before the issue of the bath coal while the former was made after the issue of the bath coal and if you prefer I might reply both the former and the latter statements were made after the issue of the bath coal Talmud, Mas Aravane but the latter represents the view of our Joshua who does not recognize the authority of the bath coal and if you prefer I might reply it is this that was meant whenever you come across two Tanis and two Amoras who differ from one another in the manner of the disputes between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel a man should not act either in accordance with the lenient ruling of the one master and the lenient ruling of the other master nor in accordance with the restriction of the one and the restriction of the other but either in accordance with the lenient and restrictive ruling of the other or in accordance with the lenient and restrictive ruling of the other at all events however does not it. Original difficulty remained Arnam and B. Isaac replied all the restrictions were imposed in accordance with the views of Rab for Arhuna stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with the first Hillel but no such ruling is given in actual practice according to our Adabi Ahaba however who citing Rab stated the Halachah agrees with the first Tana and this is also the ruling to be followed in practice what can be said in reply to the objection raised Arshez by replied we do not adopt the restrictions of two authorities who differ from one another only where their views are mutually contradictory as for instance in the case of the backbone and skull for we learned if the backbone or skull of a corpse were defective it does not impart levitical uncleanliness by overshadowing and how much is deemed to be a defect in the backbone Beth Shammai ruled two vertebrae and Beth Hillel ruled one vertebrae and in the case of a skull Beth Shammai ruled a whole as large as that made by drill and Beth Hillel ruled one that would cause a living person to die and Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel and the respective rulings apply also in the case of Trifa but where the views are not mutually contradictory we may well adopt the restrictions or relaxations of two authorities against the contention that where the views of two authorities are mutually contradictory we do not adopt the restrictions of both our measures he raised the following. Objection was it not taught it once happened that our Akiva gathered the fruit of an etrig on the first of Shabbat and subjected it to two tithes one in accordance with the ruling of Beth Shammai and the other in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel our Akiva was uncertain of his tradition not knowing whether Beth Hillel said the first of Shabbat or the fifteenth of Shabbat and therefore he subjected himself to both restrictions our Joseph sat before our and in the course of the session he Stated Rab Judah laid down in the name of Rab that they differed only where an alley opens out into a camp on the one side and into a camp on the other or into a highway on the one side and into a highway on the other but where there was a camp on one side and fields on the other or fields on either side the frame of a doorway is made at one end and a side post and crossbeam at the other now that it has been said that where there was a camp on one side and fields on the other it is sufficient if the frame of a doorway is made at one end and a side post and crossbeam at the other was it at all necessary to state the case of fields on either side it is this that was meant if there was a camp on one side and fields on the other it is the same as if there were fields on either side he then concluded in the name
Joseph B. Abba, I may explain to you that Rab's ruling is dependent on whether an Arab has been prepared or not. No contradiction between the two statements of Rab does now arise for one refers to a case where the residents of the courtyard joined in an Arab with those of the Ali while the other refers to one where they did not join them in an Arab Talmud. Mas Arabin, according to our previous assumption, however, that Rab and Samuel are in disagreement irrespective of whether a joint Arab was made or not on what principle do they differ where a joint Arab was made and on what principle do they differ where no such Arab was made where no joint Arab was made they differ on the question whether a gap that has the appearance of a door from without but is even with the walls within may be regarded as a door and where a joint Arab has been made they differ on a principle that underlies a statement of our Joseph for our Joseph stated this has been taught only in respect of all Ali that terminated in the middle of the backyard but if it terminated at the side of the backyard all movement of objects in the alley on the Sabbath is forbidden Rabbi said the statement that termination at the middle of the backyard is permitted applies only where the gaps were not facing one another but if they were facing one another movement of objects in the alley on the Sabbath is forbidden our measure said the statement that where the gaps were not facing one another the Use of the alley is permitted applies only to a backyard that belonged to many people but not to a backyard of an individual who might sometimes reconsider his attitude towards it and build houses in it and the alley would thus be one that terminated at the sides of a backyard in which the movement of objects on the Sabbath is forbidden once however is it inferred that a distinction is made between a backyard belonging to many people and one belonging to an individual from what Rabin B.R. Atta stated in the name of our Isaac it once occurred that one side of an alley terminated in the sea and the other terminated in a rubbish heap and when the facts were submitted to Rabbi he neither permitted nor forbade the movement of objects on the Sabbath in that alley he did not declare it forbidden because partitions in fact existed and he did not declare it permitted since the possibility had to be considered that the rubbish heap might be removed or the sea might throw up. Olivium, now is it necessary to take into consideration the possibility that a rubbish heap might be removed? Have we not in fact learned if a rubbish heap in a public domain was ten handbreadths high objects from a window above it may be thrown onto it on the Sabbath? Thus it clearly follows that a distinction is made between a public rubbish heap and a private one, and so here also a distinction may be made between a backyard that belonged to many people and one that belonged to one person. And what was the view of the rabbis on the question of the Ali R. Joseph B. of Dimi replied Atanad taught that the sages forbade it Arnam and stated the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of the sages. Some there are who say R. Joseph B. of Dimi stated Atanad taught that the sages permitted it and Arnam and said the Halachah is not in agreement with the ruling of the sages Miramar partitioned off Surah by means of nets because he said the possibility must be considered that the sea might throw. Oblivium, a certain crooked alley once existed at Surah, and the residents of one of its arms folded up some matting and fixed it in its bend. This arrangement said, Our Hisdad is neither in agreement with the view of Rab nor with that of Samuel. According to Rab, who ruled that the law of such an alley is the same as that of one that is open at both ends, a structure in the shape of a doorway is required, and even according to Samuel, who ruled that it is subject to the law of a closed one, it must be understood that his ruling applied only where a proper side post had been fixed. But such matting, since the wind blows on it and throws it about, is useless if a pin, however, was inserted therein, and it was thus fastened to the wall. It may be regarded as a proper partition reverting to the main text. Our Jeremiah B. Abel laid down on the authority of Rab that if an alley was broken along its full width into a courtyard and a breach was made in the courtyard wall over against it. The courtyard is ritually fit, but the alley is forbidden. Said Rabbi Biola to our Babi Abe Master, is not this ruling one that already appeared in a mission of ours? If the full width of a wall of a small courtyard was broken down so that the yard now fully opens out into a large courtyard, movement of objects on the Sabbath is permitted in the large courtyard, but forbidden in the small one because the gap is regarded as an entrance to the former. The other replied, If our information had been derived from there, it might have been assumed that the ruling applied only where not many people tread, but that where many people tread, even the courtyard also is forbidden. But did we not learn this also? A courtyard into which many people enter from one side and go out from the other is deemed to be a public domain in respect of Levitical defilement and a private domain in respect of the Sabbath. If the ruling were to be derived from there, it might have been assumed to apply. Only where the gaps were not facing one another, Talmud, Mas Arabin B, but not where they were facing each other, according to Rab, however, who ruled that a courtyard is forbidden where the gaps were facing each other. How would he explain Rab's ruling? Obviously, that it referred to a case where the gaps were not facing one another, but then the question arises again what need was there for two rulings on the same subject? If the rulings were derived from there, it might have been assumed to apply only to the throwing of objects into it, but not to the moving of them within it. Hence, we were informed of Rab's ruling. It was stated if an alley is constructed in the form of a centipede, the shape of a doorway said Abbe is made at the entrance of the major alley, and all the others are rendered ritually fit by means of a side post and cross beam said Rabba to him in agreement with whose view is your ruling if it is in agreement with that of Samuel who ruled today. Crooked alley has the same law as one that is closed at one end. Why should it be necessary to have the shape of a doorway? And furthermore, was there not once a crooked alley at Nihardia? And in providing for its ritual fitness, Rab's view also was taken into consideration. The fact, however, is said Rabbi that the shape of a doorway is made at the entrance of each minor alley on the one side, while the other side of each minor alley is rendered ritually fit by means of a side post and cross. Beam said Arkahana be Talafa in the name of Arkahana be Minyamai in the name of Rabkahana be Makayo, who had it from Arkahana the teacher of Rab. Others say that Arkahana be Makayo is the same Arkahana who was Rab's teacher. If one side of an alley was long and the other short, and the shortage is less than four cubits, the cross beam may be laid in a slanting position. But if it is four cubits, the cross beam is laid only at right angles to the shorter side. Rabbi said in either case, the beam must. Be laid only at right angles to the shorter side, and I can give my reason. And also, there's my reason is the erection of a crossbeam was enacted in order to provide a distinguishing mark, and a beam in a slanting position provides no such mark. Their reason is the object of a crossbeam was to provide a partition, and a beam in a slanting position is also a partition. Arkahana remarked, as the ruling is reported in the name of Kahanas, I would say something about it. The rule that the beam may be laid in a slanting position applies only where the slant was no longer than 10 cubits, but if it was longer than 10 cubits, all agree that it is placed only at right angles to the shorter side. The question was asked, may the space under a crossbeam be used? Rab and Arhai and Aryohan and replied, it is permitted to use the space under the beam. Samuel Arsimian B. Rabbi and Arsimian B. Lakish replied, it is forbidden to use the space under the beam. May it be assumed that they differ on it. Following principle, one master is of the opinion that a crossbeam serves the purpose of a distinguishing mark, while the other master holds that the crossbeam serves the purpose of a partition. No, all may agree that a beam serves the purpose of a partition, but it is this principle on which they differ here. One master holds that the distinguishing mark is to serve as such for those who are from within, and the other master holds that it is for those who are without. And if you prefer, I would reply, all agree that it serves the purpose of a partition, but it is this on which they differ here. One master holds that its inner edge is deemed to descend and close up the entrance, while the other master maintains that it is its outer edge that is deemed to descend and close it up. Arhista stated, all agree that the use of the space between side posts is forbidden. Rami Bimama inquired of Arhista, what is the ruling where one inserted two pins respectively in the two extremities of it? Walls of an alley on the outside and placed the beam on them. The other replied, according to him who permits elsewhere the use of the space under the crossbeam, the use of the space here is forbidden, and according to him who forbids the use elsewhere of such space, the use of it here is permitted. Rabbi said, according to him also who forbids the use of the space under the crossbeam, the use of the alley here is forbidden, since we require the beam to rest above the alley, and this is not the case. Here our Adabi Matina raised an objection against Rabbi if its crossbeam Talmud, Mas Arabin was drawn away or suspended at a distance of less than three handbreadths from the walls of the alley, there is no need to provide another beam,
We're informed that both may also be applied. Arzakai recited in the presence of Aryohan and the space between the side posts and beneath the crossbeam is subject to the laws of the Karma. If go out, the other told him recite this outside Senna Bay. It stands to reason that the view of Aryohan applies to the space under the beam, but that between the side posts is forbidden. Rabbah, however, said the space between the side posts is also permitted. Said Rabbi, why do I say this? Because when R. Dimi came, he reported in the name of Aryohan in a place whose area is less than four by four handbreadths. It is permissible for both the people of the public domain and those of the private domain to rearrange their burdens, provided only that they do not exchange them. And Abay, there it is a case where the place was three handbreadths in height. Said Abay, why do I say this? Because Arhamabi Goria said in the name of Rab, the space within a gateway requires a special side post to render. It permissible and should you suggest that this is one where the area is four handbreadths by four, surely it can be retorted. Arhamim B. Rabba stated on the authority of Rab the space within a gateway, though it is less than four handbreadths by four, requires a special side post to render its use permitted. And Rabba, there it is a case where the alley opens out into a Carmel. Is this, however, permitted where the alley opens out into a public domain? The native then would be in the earth. And the stranger in the highest heavens, yes, the like has found its like and is aroused. Said Arhuna, son of Arjashua to Rabba, do you not uphold the view that according to Aryohan and the space between side posts is forbidden? Surely Rabba B. Barhana stated in the name of Aryohan and if a section of one side of an alley was lined with side posts fixed within distances of less than four handbreadths between one another, the question of its use is dependent on the dispute between Arsimi and B. Gamaliel and the rabbis now this obviously means does it not that according to our Simeon B. Gamaliel who ruled that in respect of such distances the law of Labud is applied one is allowed to the alley from the interior thereof only up to the inner edge of the innermost post and that according to the rabbis who ruled that in respect of a distance of more than three handbreadths the law of Labud is not applied one is allowed to use the alley up to the inner edge of the outermost post. But the use of the space between side posts is unanimously forbidden and rabbi there also it is a case where the alley opens out into a Carmelith would this however be permitted where the alley opened out into a public domain the native then would be in the earth and the stranger in the highest heavens yes the like has found its like and is aroused Talmud, Mas Arab and B. R. Ashi replied this may refer to a case for instance where one side of the alley was lined with side posts. Placed at distances of less than four handbreadths from one another along four cubits of its length, according to Arsimian B. Gamaliel, who ruled that in respect of such distances, the law of Labud is applied. The space bordered by the side post is deemed to be a proper alley, which requires an additional side post to render it permissible. And according to the rabbis who ruled that the law of Labud is not applied, no other side post is required to render it permissible. But even according to Arsimian B. Gamaliel, why should not this alley be permitted as one having a side post that may be seen from without? Though it appears even within is not this explanation required only in respect of a statement of Aryohanan. But surely when Rabin came, he reported in the name of Aryohanan that a post that may be seen from without but appears even from within cannot be regarded as a valid side post. It was stated a post that is seen from within but appears even from without is regarded. As a valid side post, but if it is seen from without and appears even from within, there is a difference of opinion between Arhai and Arsimian B. Rabbi. One maintains that it is regarded as a valid side post, and the other maintains that it is not regarded as a valid side post. You may conclude that it was Arhai who maintained that it is regarded as a valid side post for Arhai taught a wall of which one side recedes more than the other, whether the recess can be seen from without and appears even from within, or whether it can be seen from within and appears even from without, may be regarded as being provided with a side post. This is conclusive. Did not Arhai however hear this? But what you might contend is that he did hear it and is not of the same opinion. Is it not then possible that Arhai also is not of the same opinion? What a comparison is this? It might well be contended that Arhai does not hold the same opinion, and that it was for this reason that he did. Not teach it, but as regards Arhai, if it is a fact that he does not hold the same opinion, what need was there for him to teach it? Rabbi son of Arhuna said a post that is seen from without, though it appears even from within, is regarded as a valid side post. Said Rabbi, we however raised an objection against this traditional ruling if the full width of a wall of a small courtyard was broken down so that the yard now fully opens out into a large courtyard. Movement of objects on the Sabbath is permitted in the large one, but forbidden in the small one because the gap is regarded as an entrance to the former. Now, if this is valid, should not the movement of objects in the small courtyard also be permitted on the principle that the entrance may be seen without, though it appears even from within? Arzera replied, This is a case where the walls of the small one project into the large one, but why should not the principle of the be applied so that the use of the smaller courtyard also? Might be permitted, and should you reply that the walls were too far apart, surely it may be retorted. Did not our Adabi Abami recite in the presence of our Hannah the ruling applies to a case where the small courtyard was ten and the large one eleven cubits? Rabbin replied, This is a case where the projections were removed by two handbreadths from one wall and by four from the other, then let Labud be applied to one side and thereby the smaller courtyard would be permitted. Talmud, Mas. Irabin this ruling is in agreement with the view of Rabbi who laid down that two posts are required for it was taught a courtyard may be converted into a permitted domain by means of one post, but Rabbi ruled only by two posts. But what an interpretation is this if you can see that a side post that can be seen from without but appears even from within cannot be regarded as a valid side post, and that Rabbi holds the same view as our Jose and that the replies of our Zera and Rabbin are. Not to be accepted, it will be quite intelligible why the measurement of the small courtyard was given as ten cubits and that of the large one as eleven. The reason being that he is of the same opinion as our Jose. If, however, you contend that a side post that can be seen from without, though it appears even from within, may be regarded as a valid side post, and that the replies of our Zera and Rabbin are to be accepted, and that Rabbi is not of the same opinion as our Jose, what it may be asked was the object of giving the measurement of the large courtyard as eleven cubits. For whatever the explanation advanced, the difficulty arises if it be suggested that the object was to explain why the large courtyard was permitted. It could well be objected that a length of ten cubits and two handbreadths would have been enough, and if the object was to provide a reason for the prohibition of the small courtyard, why it may equally be objected. Did he not inform us of a case where the Walls were much wider apart, hence it must be concluded that a post that can be seen from without but appears even from within cannot be regarded as a valid side post. This is conclusive. Our Joseph remarked, I did not hear that reported ruling from my teacher, said Abbe to him. You yourself told us that ruling, and it was in connection with the following that you told it to us for Rami B. Abba said in the name of Arhuna that a post which formed an extension of the wall of an alley provided it was less than four cubits in length may be regarded as a valid side post, and one may use the alley as far as its inner edge, but if it was four cubits long, it must be regarded as an alley, and it is forbidden to make use of any part of the alley. And you told us in connection with this that three rulings may be inferred from this statement. It may be inferred that the space between side posts is a forbidden domain, and it may be inferred that the minimum length of an alley is four cubits. And it may also be inferred that a post that can be seen from without, though it appears even from within, may be regarded as a valid side post. And the law is that a post that is visible from without, though it appears even from within, may be regarded as a valid side post. A refutation and a law, yes, because our high taught in agreement with him, and any entrance that is wider than ten cubits should be reduced. Said Abay Atana taught, and any entrance that is wider than ten cubits should be reduced. But Arjuna ruled that it was not necessary to reduce it. But up to what extent is reduction unnecessary? Arahi discoursing before our Joseph intended to reply to the extent of thirteen cubits and a third is being deduced a minority ad majus from the law relating to enclosures round wells. If in the case of enclosures round wells where the use of the wells is permitted, even though the broken portions of the enclosure exceed the standing ones, no break wider than thirteen. Cubits and a third is permitted. How much more reason is there that no opening wider than thirteen cubits and a third should be permitted in the case of an alley the use of which is not permitted where its broken portions exceed the standing ones? But in fact, this very law provides ground for all argument to the contrary. In
and breadths by four cubits may be constructed and this is placed in the middle of the entrance parallel to the length of the alley or else one may proceed in accordance with the advice of Rab Judah who laid down that where an entrance to an alley was 15 cubits wide a strip of boarding of three cubits in length may be constructed at a distance of two cubits from one of the walls of the alley but why could not one put up a strip of the width of one cubit and a half adjoining? The wall and at a distance of two cubits from it another strip of the width of one cubit and a half may then one infer from this that standing portions of a wall on the two sides of a breach in it though jointly exceeding the width of the breach are not to be regarded as valid standing in fact it may be maintained that standing portions separated by a breach are elsewhere regarded as a valid wall but here the law is different since the space on the one side of it intermediate strip and the space on its other side unite to destroy its legal existence then why should not one put up the joining one of the walls a strip one cubit wide and at a distance of one cubit from that strip another strip one cubit wide and at a distance of one cubit from the second strip a third strip one cubit wide may then one infer from this that where the standing portions of a wall are equal in size to its breaches the space it enclosed is forbidden in fact it May be maintained that elsewhere this is permitted, but here the law is different since the space on the one side of the third strip and the space on its other side unite to destroy its legal existence. Why then could not a strip of one cubit and a half in width be put up at a distance of one cubit from one of the walls and another strip of the width of one cubit and a half at a distance of one cubit from the first strip? This could indeed be done, but the rabbis did not put a man to so much trouble. But should not the possibility be taken into consideration that one might neglect the bigger opening and enter by the smaller one? Our Adabim Ahana replied, There is a legal presumption that no man would forsake a big opening and enter by a small one, but wherein does this case differ from that of RMI and RC? There one might use the smaller opening as a shortcut, but here it cannot be used as a shortcut. Elsewhere it was taught the leather seat of a stool and its hole. Combined to constitute the minimum of a handbreadth, what is meant by the leather seat of a stool? Rabbi Barhana, in the name of our Yohanan, explained the leather covering a privy stool and how much must the respective areas of the leather and the hole be. When Ardimi came, he stated an area of two fingers of leather on the one side of the hole and an area of two fingers on the other side and a hole of the size of two fingers in the center. When Rabin came, he stated the area of one finger and a half on one side and of one finger and a half on the other and a hole of the size of one finger in the center. Said Abe to Ardimi, Are you in dispute? No, the other replied, One of us referred to the thumb and the other to the small finger, and there is no real difference of opinion between us. Indeed, retorted the former, You do differ, and your difference emerges in the case where the standing portions of a wall jointly exceed its breach on both sides of which they stand. According to your view, the standing portions situated on the two sides of the breach do combine, but according to Rabin's view, they must be on one side only. But if they are on the two sides of the breach, they cannot combine. For if it be imagined that you have no difference of opinion on this point, the statement of Rabin should have run thus the area of a finger and a third on one side of the hole, and that of a finger and a third on its other side, and a hole of one finger and a third in the center. What then do you suggest, said Ardimi, that we differ? Should not in that case my statement have run thus the area of a finger and two thirds on one side of the hole, and that of a finger and two thirds on the other side, and a hole of the size of two fingers and two thirds in the center? If, however, it must be said that we differ, our difference would apply to the case where the breach is equal to either of the standing portions, but if it has the shape of a doorway. There is no need to reduce it even though it is wider than 10 cubits thus we find that the shape of a doorway is effective in respect of the width of an entrance and a cornice in respect of its high talmud. Mas Arabin what however is the law where these are reversed come and here what was taught across beam spanning the entrance to a blind alley at a height of more than 20 cubits should be lowered but if the entrance had the shape of a doorway there is no need to lower it. What about the effectiveness of a cornice in respect of its width come and here what was taught across beam spanning the entrance to a built alley at a height of more than 20 cubits should be lowered and an entrance that is wider than 10 cubits should be reduced in width but if it had the shape of a doorway there is no need to reduce the height of the beam and if it has a cornice there is no need to reduce does not this refer to the last clause no it may refer to the first. Clause Rab Judah taught Hibi Rab in the presence of Rab it is not necessary to reduce its width teach him Rab said to him it is necessary to reduce it said our Joseph from the words of our master we may infer that a courtyard the greatest part of the walls of which consists of doors and windows cannot be converted into a permitted domain by the construction of the shape of a doorway what is the reason since an entrance wider than 10 cubits causes the prohibition of an alien a breach in a wall that is larger than its standing portions causes the prohibition of a courtyard the two may be compared as an opening that is wider than 10 cubits which causes the prohibition of an alley cannot be ritually rectified by means of the shape of a doorway so also a wall the breach in which is larger than its standing portions which causes the prohibition of a courtyard cannot be ritually rectified by means of the shape of a doorway this however is no proper analogy for the shape of a doorway may well be ineffective in the case of an opening wider than 10 cubits which causes the prohibition of an alley since it cannot affect permissibility in the case of enclosures of wells in accordance with the views of our mayor but how could you apply this restriction to the case where a breach in a wall is larger than its standing portions though it causes the prohibition of a courtyard when this was permitted in respect of enclosures of wells in accordance with the opinion of all may it be suggested that the following provides support to his view it was taught the space enclosed by such walls as consist mostly of doors and windows is permitted provided the standing portions exceed the gaps you say as consist mostly is this conceivable rather read the space in which there were many doors and windows is permitted provided the standing portions exceed the gaps said Arkahana that may have been taught in respect of Semitic doors what is meant by Semitic doors are Rehumi and our Joseph differ on this point. One explains doors that have no proper side posts and the other explains such as have no lintel. Our Yohanan also holds the same view as Rab for Rabin son of Arad stated in the name of our Isaac. It once happened that a man of the valley of Beth High Warden drove four poles in the four corners of his field and stretched across each two of them a rod and when the case was submitted to the sages they allowed him its use in respect of Kilim and in connection with the statement Rush Lakish remarked as they allowed him its use in respect of Kilim so have they allowed it to him in respect of the Sabbath but our Yohanan said only in respect of Kilim did they allow him its use they did not allow it in respect of the Sabbath now what is the form of the construction with which we are here dealing if it be suggested that it is one where the rods were attached sideways surely it could be objected did not Arhista. Rule that the shape of the doorway that was made with the cross reed attached sideways is of no validity. Consequently, it must be a case where the reeds were placed on top of the poles. Now, how far were the poles from one another? If it be suggested less than ten cubits, the difficulty arises. Would Aryohanan in such a case have said that in respect of the Sabbath there is no validity in such a door? Must it not consequently be conceded that the distance was greater than ten cubits? No. The distance, in fact, might have been within that of ten cubits, and the reeds might have been attached sideways. But the principle on which they differ is that laid down by Arhista in incongruity. However, was pointed out between two rulings of Aryohanan as well as between two rulings of Reshlakish. For Reshlakish stated in the name of Arjuna, son of Arhanan Talmud, Mas Arav and B.A. plate of rods trained on poles is a valid partition in respect of Kilim, but not in respect of the Sabbath. And our Yohanan stated as it has no validity as regards partitions in connection with the Sabbath so it has no validity in respect of partitions in connection with Kilim one might well concede that there is really no incongruity between the two rulings of Rush Lakish since the former might be his own while the latter might be that of his master but do not the two rulings of our Yohanan represent a contradiction still if you were to concede that there the rods were placed on the tops of the poles while here the plate was trained on the sides all would be well if however you maintain that in both cases the rods were attached sideways what can be said in explanation the fact is that it may be maintained that both cases refer to rods attached sideways but there the distance between the poles was within that of 10 cubits while here it exceeded that of 10 cubits but whence is it derived that we draw a distinction between distances of 10 and more than 10 cubits from the following which our Yohanan
A door of straw rush ruled in the name of Arjane the shape of a door we must have a mark for a hinge what is meant by a mark for a hinge are we reply to loop Araha the son of Araha met the students of Arashi he asked them did the master say anything in respect of the shape of the doorway he they replied to him said nothing at all about it it was taught the shape of the doorway of which they spoke must have a reed on either side and one reed above must the side reeds touch the upper one or not Arnaman replied they need not touch it and Arshi's hate replied they must touch it Arnaman proceeded to give a practical decision in the house of the exilarch in agreement with his traditional ruling said Arshi's hate to his attendant Argadago pulled them out and throw them away he accordingly went there pulled them out and threw them away he was found however by the people of the exilarch's household and they incarcerated him Arshi's hate thereupon followed him and standing at the door of his place of confinement called out to him Gadda come out and he safely came out Arshi's hate met Rabbi Samuel and asked him has the master learned anything about the shape of the doorway yes the other replied we have learned an arched doorway said our mayor is subject to the obligation of a mezuzah but the sages exempted they agree however that if its lower section was ten hand breadths in height the doorway is subject to the obligation and abase stated all agree that if an arched doorway was ten hand breadths high but its lower section was less than three hand breadths in height or even if the lower section was three hand breadths high but its total height was less than ten hand breadths the doorway is not valid at all they only differ where the height of its lower section was three hand breadths its total height was ten cubits and the width of its arch was less than four hand breadths but its sides are wide enough for the arch to be cut to a width of four Hand breadths are is of the opinion that the sides are regarded as cut for the purpose of completing the prescribed width, while the rabbis maintain that they are not regarded as cut for the purpose of completing the prescribed width. If you meet the people of the exilarch's house, he said to him, Tell them nothing whatever of the very about the arch doorway mission, the rendering of an alley fit for the movement of objects within it on the Sabbath. Beth Shammai ruled requires a side post and a beam, and Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam. Our Eliza ruled two side posts. A disciple in the name of our Ishmael stated in the presence of our Akiba Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ on the ruling that an alley that was less than four cubits in width may be converted into a permitted domain either by means of a side post or by that of a beam. They only differ in the case of one that was wider than four and narrower than ten cubits in respect of which Beth. Shammai ruled both a side post and a beam are required while Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam are Akiba maintained that they differed in both cases Gemara in accordance with whose view was our mission taught is it in agreement neither with the view of Hananiah nor with that of the first Tanarab Judah replied it is this that was meant how is a blind alley rendered fit for the movement of objects within it on the Sabbath Beth Shammai ruled by the construction of a side post and a beam and Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam Beth Shammai ruled a side post and a beam does this then imply that Beth Shammai hold the opinion that Pentateuch ally four partitions and no less constitute a private domain no as regards throwing into it from a public domain one incurs guilt even if the former had only three walls but in respect of moving objects within it only where there are four walls is this permitted Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam does this imply that Beth Hillel hold the view that Pentateuch ally three partitions are required to constitute a private domain no as regards throwing from a public domain into it one incurs guilt even if the former had only two walls but in respect of moving objects within it only where there are three walls is this permitted our Eliza rule two side posts the question was raised does our Eliza mean two side posts and a beam or is it likely that he means two side posts without a beam come and here it once happened that our Eliza went to his disciple our Jose B. Parada Talmud Mas Arabin at Abilin and found him dwelling in an alley that had only one side post he said to him my son put up another side post is it necessary for me the other asked to close it up let it be closed up the first replied what does it matter our Simeon B. Gamaliel stated Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ on the ruling that an alley that was less than four cubits in width required no Provision at all they only differed in the case of one that was wider than four but narrower than ten cubits in respect of which Beth Shammai ruled both a side post and a beam are required while Beth Hillel ruled either a side post or a beam at all events it was stated is it necessary for me to close it up now if you can see that both side posts and a beam are required it is quite intelligible why he said is it necessary for me to close it up but if you contend that side posts without a beam are sufficient what can be the meaning of to close it up it is this that he meant is it necessary for me to close it up with side posts the master said our Simeon B. Gamaliel stated Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ on the ruling that an alley that was less than four cubits in width required no provision at all did we not learn however a disciple in the name of our Ishmael stated in the presence of our Akiba Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ on the ruling that an Ali that was less than four cubits in width may be converted into a private domain either by means of a side post or by that of a beam. Our Ashi replied, It is this that he meant it required neither a side post and a beam as Beth Shammai ruled, nor two side posts as our Eliza ruled, but either a side post or a beam in agreement with the ruling of Beth Hillel. And how much is the minimum Arli or it might be said, Our Yayil replied, No less than four hand breadths. Our Shis hate in the name of our Jeremiah B. Abba, who had it from Rab, stated the sages agree with our Eliza in the case of the side posts of a courtyard. Our Naman, however, stated the Halacha is in agreement with the ruling of our Eliza in respect of the side posts of a courtyard. Said our Naman B. Isaac, who are they that agree with our Eliza Rabbi? But since our Naman said the Halacha is, it follows that some differ who is it that differs from his view. The Rabbis, for it was taught a courtyard may be converted into a permitted. Domain by means of one post, but Rabbi ruled only by two posts. R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan, a courtyard requires two side posts. Said Arzera to R.C. Did our Yohanan give such a ruling? Did not you yourself state in the name of our Yohanan that the side posts of a courtyard must have a width of four hand breadths? And should you suggest that the meaning is four hand breadths on one side and four on the other? Surely it may be retorted, did not our Adabi Abami reside in the presence of our Hanan? Or as some say in the presence of our Hanan Abipapi, the ruling applies to a case where the small courtyard was ten and the large one eleven cubits. When Arzera returned from his sea travels, he explained this contradiction. A side post on one side of an opening must have a width of four hand breadths, but side posts on the two sides of an opening need be no wider than a fraction each, and that which our Adabi Abami resided is a view of Rabbi who holds the same view as our Jose R. Joseph laid down in the name of Rab Judah who had it from Samuel that a courtyard may be converted into a permitted domain by means of one side post said Abbe to our Joseph did Samuel lay down such a ruling did he not in fact say to our Hanani Bishila do not you permit the use of a courtyard unless there remained either the greater part of the wall or two strips of it the other replied I know only of the following incident that occurred at Dura Diara way the wedge of the sea penetrated into a courtyard and when the question was submitted to Rab Judah he required the gap to be provided with one strip of board only you have a said to him speak of a wedge of the sea but in the case of water the sages have relaxed the law as you may infer from the question which our table asked of Rab does a suspended partition convert a ruin into a permitted domain and the other replied a suspended partition can affect permissibility of use in the case of water only because it is only in respect of water that the sages have relaxed the law does not the difficulty at any rate remain when our papa and our son of our Joshua returned from the academy they explained that a side post on one side of a gap must be four hand breadths wide but where there is one on either side any with whatever is enough our papa said if I had to point out a difficulty it would be this for Samuel said to our Hanani B. Sheila do not you permit the use of a courtyard unless there remained either the greater part of the wall or two strips of it now what was the need for the greater part of the wall is not a strip of four hand breadths in width enough and should you reply that the greater part of the wall referred to a wall of seven hand breadths in width where four hand breadths constitute the greater part of the wall the objection might be raised why should it be necessary to have four hand breadths when three and a fraction are enough since early or it might be said are Ruled that no provision was necessary where a gap is less than four hand breadths in width. If you wish, I might reply. One ruling deals with a
This slope that determines whether it shall be a private or a public domain was it not in fact taught in the case of common courtyards and blind alleys whether the residents have joined together in the provision of an Arab or whether they have not joined guilt is incurred by anyone who throws anything into them on the Sabbath from a public domain if the statement however was at all made it must have been as follows Rav Judah ruled as to an alley that is unfit for a joint Arab guilt is incurred by the man who throws anything into it if its ritual fitness was affected by means of a side post but if its fitness was affected by a cross beam no guilt is incurred by one who throws anything into it thus it is obvious that he is of the opinion that a side post serves the purpose of a partition and a cross beam that of a mere distinguishing mark and so did Rabbi say a side post serves the purpose of a partition and a cross beam that of a mere distinguishing mark Rabbi however ruled the one as well as the other only serves the purpose of a distinguishing mark. Our Jacob B. Ava raised an objection against Rabba was it not taught a man who throws into an alley incurs guilt if it was provided with a side post but is exempt if it had no side post it is this that was meant if it required only a side post and the man who throws anything into it incurs guilt but if it required a side post and something else the man who throws anything into it is exempt he raised against him a further objection was it not taught a more lenient rule than this did Arjuna lay down because if a man had two houses on the two sides respectively of the public domain he may construct one side post on the one side of any of the houses and another on the other side or one cross beam on the one side of any of the houses and another on its other side and then he may move things about in the space between them but they said to him a public domain cannot be provided with an Arab in such a Matter the explanation there is that Arjuna maintains that Pentateuch Ali two partitions constitute a private domain. Rabjuda said in the name of Rabban Ali whose length is equal to its width cannot be turned into a permitted domain by a mere fraction of a side post. Arhai B. Ashi said in the name of Rabban Ali whose length equals its width cannot be turned into a permitted domain by a cross beam of a width of one hand breadth. Arzera remarked how exact are the traditions of it. Elder since an Ali's length is equal to its width it has the status of a courtyard which cannot be converted into a permitted domain by means of a side post or a cross beam but only by means of a strip of material of a width of four hand breadths. If however Arzera continued I have any difficulty it is this why should not that side post be regarded as a fraction of a strip and thus convert the Ali into a permitted domain he overlooked the following ruling which RC had laid down. In the name of our Yohanan that the strips of a courtyard must consist of a width of four hand breadths are nominated stated we have a tradition that if the movement of objects in an alley is to be permitted on the Sabbath by means of a side post and a cross beam its length must exceed its width and houses and courtyards must open out into it and what kind of courtyard is it that cannot be converted into a permitted domain by means of a side post and cross beam but only by means of a strip of it. With the four hand breadths one that is square shaped only one that is square shaped but not one that is round it is this that he meant if its length exceeds its width it is regarded as an alley in which case a side post and a cross beam is sufficient otherwise it is regarded as a courtyard and by how much must its length exceed its width Samuel intended to rule by no less than twice its width but Rab said to him thus ruled by uncle even by one fraction a disciple in the name of Arishmael. Stated etc. Talmud, Mas Arav and A. R. Akiva maintained that they differed in both cases etc. Is not R. Akiva expressing the very same view as the first ten of the difference between them is the ruling of Arli or as some said Ar Yael but it was not indicated who maintained what it was taught R. Akiva said it was not R. Ishmael who laid down this ruling but that disciple and the Halachah is in agreement with that disciple is not the self-contradictory you first said it was not R. Ishmael who laid down this ruling from which it is obvious that the law is not in agreement with his view and then you say the Halachah is in agreement with that disciple Rav Judah replied in the name of Samuel R. Akiva made that statement for the sole purpose of exercising the wits of the students Arnam and B. Isaac however replied what was said was his words appear quite logical R. Joshua B. Levi stated wherever you find the expression a disciple in the name of R. Ishmael stated in the presence of R. Akiva, References to none other than Armeir who attended upon our Ishmael and our Akiva successively for it was taught Armeir related when I was with our Ishmael I used to put vitriol into my ink and he told me nothing against it but when I subsequently came to our Akiva the latter forbade it to me is this however correct did not Rab Judah in fact state in the name of Samuel who had it from Armeir when I was studying under our Akiva I used to put vitriol into my ink and he told me nothing against it. But when I subsequently came to our Ishmael the latter said to me my son what is your occupation I told him I am a scribe and he said to me be meticulous in your work for your occupation is a sacred one should you perchance omit or add one single letter you would thereby destroy all the universe I have I replied a certain ingredient called vitriol which I put into my ink may vitriol he asked me be put into the ink has not the Torah in fact stated and he shall write and he shall blot out too. Indicate that the writing must be such as can be blotted out. What relation is there between the question of the one and the reply of the other? It is this that the latter meant there is no need for me to assure you that I would make no mistakes in respect of words that are plain or defective since I am familiar with the subject, but I have even taken precautions against the possibility of the flies perching on the crownlet of a dullet and by blotting it out turn it into a rush for I have a certain ingredient called vitriol which I put into the ink. Now is there no contradiction in the sequence of the attendance and in the authorship of the prohibition? The contradiction in the sequence might well be explained by the suggestion that he first came to our Akiva, but as he was unable to comprehend his teaching, he went to our Ishmael where he studied the traditional teachings and then returned to our Akiva and engaged in logical discussion and argument, but the authorship of it. Prohibition surely presents a difficulty, does it not? This is so indeed it was taught. Our Judah stated Armeir laid down that vitriol may be put into ink intended for any purpose except that of writing the Pentateuchal section dealing with a suspected wife. Our Jacob, however, stated in his name except that of writing the Pentateuchal section dealing with a suspected wife in the sanctuary. What is the point of their disagreement? Our Jeremiah replied, the point of their disagreement is whether the writing may be blotted out for her sake from a scroll of the law, and these tannis differ on the same question as the following tannis, for it was taught the scroll that was written for one suspected woman is not to be used for another suspected woman, and our Ahibi Josiah ruled the scroll is fit to be used for another suspected woman. Our Papa remarked, it is possible surely that the question in dispute is not the same for the first tannis may have maintained his view there only because once. The scroll had been set aside for Rachel, it cannot subsequently be set aside for Leah, but in the case of a scroll of the law which is written for no particular person, the writing may well be blotted out for any suspected wife. Arnam and B. Isaac remarked, It is possible that the question in dispute is not the same for Arahi B. Josiah may have maintained his view there only because the scroll was written at least for one suspected wife, but in the case of a scroll of the law which is written for the purpose of study, he also might well admit that it may not be used for the purpose of blotting out, but does not Arahi B. Josiah uphold the following ruling for have we not learned if a man wrote to get to divorce his wife there with Talmud, Mas Arab and B. And then he changed his mind and a fellow townsman met him and asked for the document saying, Your name is the same as mine and your wife's name is the same as my wife's name. The document is invalid for the purpose of Divorcing there with the other man's wife, what a comparison concerning that case it is written in scripture and he shall write for her, hence it is required that the writing shall be expressly for her sake, but in this case it is written and he shall execute upon her, hence it is required that the execution shall be expressly for her sake, and the execution in her case is the blotting out our Ahabi Hanan said it is revealed and known before him who spoke and the world came into existence that in the generation of Armeir there was none equal to him, then why was not the Halachah fixed in agreement with his views because his colleagues could not fathom the depths of his mind for he would declare the ritually unclean to be clean and supply plausible proof and the ritually clean to be unclean and also supply plausible proof one taught his name was not Armeir but Arneri, then why was he called Armeir because he enlightened the sages in the Halachah his name in fact was not even Neri, but our Nehemiah or as others say our Eliezer Birak and why was he called Nehemiah because he enlightened the sages in the Halacha Rabbi declared the only reason why I am keener than my colle
But the Halacha is in agreement with the rulings of Beth Hillel since however both are the words of the living God what was it that entitled Beth Hillel to have the Halacha fixed in agreement with their rulings because they were kindly and modest they studied their own rulings and those of Beth Shammai and were even so humble as to mention the actions of Beth Shammai before theirs as may be seen from what we have learned if a man had his head and the greater part of his body within the Sukkah but his table in the house Beth Shammai ruled that the booth was invalid but Beth Hillel ruled that it was valid said Beth Hillel to Beth Shammai did it not so happen that the elders of Beth Shammai and the elders of Beth Hillel went on a visit to our Yohan and Beheraneth and found him sitting with his head and greater part of his body within the Sukkah while his table was in the house Beth Shammai replied from their proof may be a dis for our view for they indeed told him if you have always acted in this manner you have never fulfilled the commandment of Sukkah this teaches you that him who humbles himself the Holy One blessed be he raises up and him who exalts himself the Holy One blessed be he humbles from him who seeks greatness greatness flees but him who flees from greatness greatness follows he who forces time is forced back by time but he who yields to time finds time standing at his side our rabbis taught for two and a half years were Beth Shammai and Beth. Hillel in dispute the former asserting that it were better for man not to have been created than to have been created and the latter maintaining that it is better for man to have been created than not to have been created they finally took a vote and decided that it were better for man not to have been created than to have been created but now that he has been created let him investigate his past deeds or as others say let him examine his future actions mission the cross beam of which they did. Rabbi spoke must be wide enough to hold an area which is half of a of three handbreadths it is sufficient for a beam to be one handbreadth wide in order to hold the width of an area the beam must be wide enough to hold an area but also strong enough to support such an area our Judah ruled the beam is valid if it is sufficiently wide although it is not strong if it was made of straw or reeds it is looked upon as though it had been made of metal if it was curved it is looked upon as though it were straight if it was round it is looked upon as though it were square whatsoever has a circumference of three handbreadths is one handbreadth in diameter Talmud Mas Ayur Ben one handbreadth is not a handbreadth and a half required since it is wide enough to hold an area of the size of one handbreadth one may provide a foundation for the remaining half of the handbreadth by plastering the beam with clay a little on one side and a little on the other so that the area can be kept in position Rabbi son of Arhuna said the cross beam of which the rabbi spoke must be strong enough to support an area the supports of the beam however need not be so strong as to be capable of bearing the beam and the area Arhista however ruled they must be strong enough to support both the beam and the area Arshis hate said if one laid a beam across an entrance to an alley and spread a mat over it raising the lower end of the mat to a height of three and breadths from the ground there is here neither valid crossbeam nor valid partition there is here no valid crossbeam since it is covered up and no valid partition since it is one through which kids can push their way our rabbis taught if a crossbeam projects from one wall and does not touch the wall opposite and so also if two crossbeams one of which projects from one wall and the other from the wall opposite do not touch one another it is not necessary to provide another beam if it Gap is less than three handbreadths, but if it was one of three handbreadths, it is necessary to provide another crossbeam. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled if the gap was less than four handbreadths, it is not necessary to provide another crossbeam, and only where it was one of four handbreadths, it is necessary to provide another crossbeam. Similarly, where there were two parallel crossbeams, neither of which was wide enough to hold an area, it is unnecessary to provide another crossbeam if it two together can hold the width of one handbreadth of an area. Otherwise, it is necessary to provide another crossbeam. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled if they can hold an area of the length of three handbreadths, it is unnecessary to provide another crossbeam. Otherwise, it is necessary to provide another crossbeam if they were fixed one higher than the other. The higher one said, Our Jose son of Arjuna is looked upon as if it lay lower, or the lower one as if it lay higher, provided only that the Higher one was not higher than 20 cubits and the lower one was not lower than 10 cubits. Abbe remarked, Our Jose son of Arjuta holds the same view as his father in one respect and differs from him in another. He holds the same view as his father in one respect in that he also adopts the principle of his looked upon and differs from him in another. For whereas Arjuta holds that a crossbeam may be higher than 20 cubits, Our Jose son of Arjuta holds that it is valid only within but not above 20 cubits. Arjuta ruled the beam is valid if it is sufficiently wide, although it is not strong. Rab Judah taught high be Rab in the presence of Rab wide, although it is not strong. When the latter said to him, Teach him wide and strong enough, did not, however, RLI state in the name of Rab a crossbeam that is four handbreadths wide is valid, although it is not strong. One that is four handbreadths wide is different from one that is less than the prescribed width if it was. Made of straw, etc. What does he thereby teach us that we adopt the principle of is looked upon, but then is not this exactly the same principle as was already enunciated? It might have been assumed that the principle is applied only to one of its own kind, but not to one of a different kind. Hence, we were taught that any material is valid if it was curved, it is looked upon as though it were straight. Is not this obvious? He taught us thereby ruling like that of our Zara for our Zara stated. If it was within an alley and its curve without the alley, or if it was below 20 cubits and its curve above 20, or if it was above 10 cubits but its curve was below 10, attention must be paid to this whenever no gap of three handbreadths would have remained if its curve had been removed. It is not necessary to provide another crossbeam, otherwise, another crossbeam must be provided. Is not this also obvious? It was necessary to enunciate the ruling in the case where the beam was. Within the alley and its curve was without the alley as it might have been presumed that the possibility must be taken into consideration that the residents might be guided by it hence we were informed that no such possibility need be considered if it was round it is looked upon as though it were square what need again was there for this ruling it was necessary on account of its final clause whatsoever has a circumference of three handbreadths is one handbreadth in diameter whence are these calculations deduced are Yohanan replied scripture stated and he made the molten sea of ten cubits from brim to brim round in compass and the height thereof was five cubits and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about but surely there was the thickness of its brim our papa replied of its brim it is written in scripture that it was as thin as the flower of a lily for it is written and it was a handbreadth thick and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup like it. Flower of a lily it held two thousand baths, but there was still a fraction at least when the measurement of the circumference was computed. It was that of the inner circumference. Our high taught the sea that Solomon made contained one hundred and fifty ritual baths, but consider how much is the volume of a ritual bath. Forty S E I as it was taught, and he shall bathe Talmud. Mas Arab and B in water implies in water that is gathered together. All his flesh implies water in which all his body can be immersed. And how much is this a volume of water of the size of a cubit by a cubit by a height of three cubits? And the sages have accordingly estimated that the waters of a ritual bath must measure forty S E I. Now how many cubic units were there in the molten sea? Five hundred cubic cubits from three hundred cubic cubits are obtained. A hundred ritual baths and from hundred and fifty cubic cubits, fifty ritual baths are obtained. Would not then a volume of four hundred and 50 cubic cubits be enough these calculations apply only to a square shaped tank while the sea that Solomon made was round but consider by how much does the area of a square exceed that of a circle by a quarter then of the 400 cubic cubits previously assumed 100 must be deducted and of the 100 cubic cubits 25 must be deducted would not then the number of ritual baths be only 125 Rami B. Ezekiel learned that the sea that Solomon made was square in its lower three cubits and round in its upper three granted that you cannot assume the reverse since it is written in scripture that its brim was round can you not say however that only one cubit of the height of the brim was round this cannot be entertained at all for it is written it held 2000 baths now how much is a bath 3 se offer it is written in scripture the tenth of the bath out of the core which is 10 baths so that the sea contains six Thousand griba, but surely is it not written it held three thousand baths. This includes the addition of the heap in the dry measure set away from this. It may be inferred that the heap of a measure is one third of the entire quantity, and so have we also learned a large box or chest to covered a large straw or reed basket and the
Side post for a half of an alley he may only use the inner half of the alley is not this obvious rather read he may use a half of the alley is not this however also obvious it might have been presumed that the possibility should be considered that one might proceed to use all of it hence we were informed that the inner half may be used Rabba stated if one constructed a side post for an alley and raised it three handbreadths from the ground or removed it three handbreadths from the wall his act is invalid even Arsimian B. Gamaliel who holds that in the case of gaps we apply the rule of but maintains his view only where the gap occurred above but where it was below since the post constitutes a partition through which kids can push their way he did not uphold that view our Jose ruled there with must be no less than three handbreadths or Joseph stated in the name of Rab Judah who had it from Samuel the Halachah is not in agreement with our Jose either in respect of Brian or in that of side posts said Arhuna behind it to him you told us this concerning Brian but not concerning side posts now wherein does Brian differ obviously because the rabbis disagree with him but do not they disagree with him in respect of side posts also side posts the other replied are in a different category because rabbi has taken up the same point of view our Rehumi taught us Rab Judah son of our Samuel Bishalaf stated in the name of Rab the Halachah does not agree with our Jose either in respect of Brian or in that of side posts did you say it they asked him no he replied by God Rabbi exclaimed he did say it and I learned it from him why then did he change his view because our Jose has always good reasons for his ruling said Rabbi son of Arhin and to obey what is the law go the other told him and see what is the usage of the people there are some who teach this in connection with the following a man who drinks water on account of his thirst must say the benediction by whose Word all things exist are Tarfan ruled that the following benediction must be said who create as many living beings with their wants for all the means that thou hast created said Arhain and to Abe what is the law go the other told him and see what is the usage of the people Talmud. Mas Arab was stated a side post put up accidentally Abe ruled is a valid side post but Rabba ruled it is no valid side post where the residents did not rely on it from the previous day no one disputes that. It is no valid side post they differ only where the residents did rely upon it on the previous day Abe ruled it is a valid side post since the residents relied on it from the previous day but Rabba ruled it is no valid side post because owing to the fact that originally it was not made for that purpose it cannot be regarded as a valid side post it has been assumed that as they differed in the case of a side post so they differed in that of a partition come and here if a man made a sukkah. Among trees and the tree serve as its walls it is ritually fit here we are dealing with trees that were originally planted for the purpose if so is this not obvious it might have been presumed that a preventive measure should be enacted as a precaution against the possibility of using the tree for other purposes also hence we were informed that no such precaution was deemed necessary come and here if there was present a tree or a wall or a fence of growing reeds it may be treated as a corner piece here also we are dealing with one that was originally intended for the purpose if so what need was there to tell us this we were told that a fence of reeds is valid if the distance between any two reeds was less than three handbreadths as was explained in the inquiry that Abe addressed to Rabba come and here where a tree overshadows the ground it is permitted to move objects under it if the top of its branches is not higher than three handbreadths from the ground here also we are dealing with one that was originally planted for the purpose if so it should be permissible to move objects under it in all cases why then did Arhuna the son of our Joshua state that movement of objects under it is permissible only where its area was no larger than two Beth Sia because it is a dwelling that serves the outside air and no movement of objects is permitted in a dwelling that serves the outside air unless its area is no larger than two Beth Sia come and here if a man received the Sabbath on a mound that was ten handbreadths high and between four cubits and two Beth Sia in area or in the cleft of a rock that was ten handbreadths deep and between four cubits and two Beth Sia in area or root corn that was surrounded by growing ears he may walk in all the area and outside it for two thousand cubits and should you reply that there also it is a case where one had originally made them for the purpose your submission might be quite agreeable as Regards the corn what however could be said as regards the mount or the cleft the fact however is that in respect of partitions no one disputes that one put up accidentally is a valid partition they only differ in respect of a side post Abe follows his own point of view for he has laid down that a side post represents a partition and a partition set up accidentally is a valid partition Rabba on the other hand follows his own point of view for he has laid down that a side post serves the purpose of a distinguishing mark and only where it is made for that purpose is it a distinguishing mark otherwise it is no distinguishing mark come and here if stones that project from a wall are separated from each other by less than three handbreadths no other side post is required if they are separated by three handbreadths another side post is required here also it is a case where they were originally built for that purpose if so is not this obvious it might have been presumed that Projections are made solely as building connections hence we were informed that no other side post is required come and here what our high taught a wall of which one side recedes more than the other whether the recess can be seen from without and appears even from within or whether it can be seen from within and appears even from without may be regarded as being provided with a side post here also it is a case where it was originally constructed for the purpose if so what need was there to tell us the obvious it is this that we were informed if the recess can be seen from without though it appears even from within the wall may be regarded as provided with a side post come and here of the incident where Rab was sitting in a certain alley and Arhuna sat before him when he said to his attendant go bring me a jar of water by the time the latter returned the side post fell down and he motioned to him with his hand to remain in his place said Arhuna to him is not it. Master of the opinion that one may rely upon the palm tree this young rabbi he replied seems to think that people cannot explain a ruling they have heard did we rely upon it since yesterday the reason then is that no one had relied on it but if they had relied on it it would have been regarded as a valid side post might not one suggest that Abe and Rabbi differed only where the residents did not rely on it but that where they did rely on it it is regarded as a valid side post this cannot be entertained at all for there was a certain piazza at the house of Barhabu about which Abe and Rabbi were always in dispute mission side posts may be made of anything even of an animate object but our mayor forbids this it also causes defilement as the covering of a tomb Talmud Mas Arab and B but our mayor ruled that it was not susceptible to defilement women's letters of divorce who may be written on it but our Jose the Galilean declared it to be unfit Tamara it was taught our mayor ruled no animate Object may be used either as a wall for a sukkah or as a side post for an alley or as one of the partitions for watering stations or as a covering for a grave in the name of our Jose the Galilean. It was laid down. Women's bills of divorce also may not be written on it. What is our Jose the Galilean's reason? Because it was taught from the scriptural expression of letter one would only learn that a letter may be used once. However, can it be deduced that all other things are also included? From the explicit statement that he writes her, which implies on any object whatsoever. If so, why was the expression of letter used to tell you that as a letter is an inanimate object and does not eat, so must any other object used for the purpose be one that is inanimate and does not eat? And the rabbis, is it written in a letter? Surely only letter is written, and this refers merely to the recording of the words as to the rabbis. However, what exposition do they make of the expression that he Right through they require the text for the deduction that a woman may be divorced only by writing but not by money for it might have been presumed that since divorce was compared with betrothal as betrothal may be affected by means of money so may divorce also be affected by means of money hence we were informed that only by writing can divorce be affected and whence does our Jose the Galilean derive this logical conclusion he derives it from the expression of a letter of divorcement which implies the letter causes her divorcement but no other thing may cause it and the rabbis they require the expression of a letter of divorcement to indicate that the divorce must be one that completely separates the man from the woman as it was taught should a husband say to his wife here is your divorce on condition that you never drink any wine or on condition that you never go to your father's house such a divorce is no complete separation if he said during 30 days is it Regarded as a complete separation and our Jose the Galilean he derives it from the use of Kirith instead of Kareth and the rabbis they base no expositions on the distinction between Kareth and Kirith Mishnah if a caravan camped in a valley and it was surrounded by the trappings of the cattle it is permissible to move objects within it provided the trappings constitute a fence ten handbreadths in height and the gaps do not exceed the built up parts any gap which in its width does not exceed ten cubits
If the gaps are equal to the built-up parts, what is the law? Is the movement of objects forbidden? If so, however, should not the reading have been the gaps are not equal to the built-up parts? This is indeed a difficulty. Come and here, if a man covered the roof of his sukkah with spits or with the long sides of a bed, the sukkah is valid. If there is as much space between them as that of their own with here, we are dealing with such as can be easily moved in and out. Is it, however, possible to be exact? RMI replied. One might supply more of the proper roofing. Rob replied. If they were placed crosswise, one puts the suitable material lengthwise, and if they were placed lengthwise, one puts it crosswise. Come and here, if a caravan camped in a valley and it was surrounded by camel saddles, talmud, moss, iron, and a saddle cushion, saddlebags, reeds, or stocks, it is permitted to move objects within it, provided there is no more than the space of one camel between any two camels. Bed of one saddle between any two saddles and bed of one saddle cushion between any two saddle cushions. Here also it is a case where each object can be easily moved in and outcome and here thus you might say that there are three categories in the case of partitions wherever in a reed fence the width of each reed is less than three handbreadths it is necessary that there shall be no gap of three handbreadths between any two reeds so that a kid could not leap headlong through it. Wherever the width of each reed is three or from three to four handbreadths it is necessary that the gap between any two reeds shall not be as wide as the full width of a reed in order that the gaps shall not be equal to the standing parts and if the gaps exceeded the standing parts it is forbidden to soak corn even over against the standing parts wherever the width of each reed is four handbreadths or from four handbreadths to ten cubits it is necessary that the gap between any two. Reeds shall not be as wide as a reed in order that the gaps shall not be equal to the standing parts and if the gaps were equal to the standing parts it is permitted to sow seed over against the standing parts and forbidden over against the gaps if however the standing parts exceeded the gaps it is permitted to sow seed over against the gaps also if there was a gap wider than 10 cubits sowing is forbidden if four reeds were there and a plate was made above them sowing is permitted. Even if the gaps between the reeds exceeded 10 cubits in the first clause at any rate it was taught that the fence is valid if the width of each reed was from 3 to 4 handbreadths provided the gap between any two reeds was not as wide as a reed is not this an objection against our papa our papa can answer you by the expression of as wide as was meant the width of the space through which the reed can be easily moved to and for logical deduction also leads to the same conclusion for. Since it was stated if the gaps exceeded the standing parts it is forbidden to sow corn even over against the standing parts it follows that if they were equal to the standing parts the sowing is permitted this proves it must it then be assumed that this presents an objection against Arhuna the son of our Joshua he can answer you according to your line of reasoning how will you explain the final clause if however the standing parts exceeded the gaps it is permitted to sow seed over against the gaps also from which it follows that if it was equal to the gaps sowing is forbidden now then the final clause is a contradiction to the ruling of our papa and the first one to that of Arhuna son of our Joshua the final clause is really no contradiction to the ruling of our papa for since the Tana used the expression if the gaps exceeded the standing parts it is forbidden in the first clause he used the expression if the standing parts exceeded the gaps it is permitted in the Final clause the first clause presents no contradiction against Arhuna the son of our Joshua for as it was desired to state in the final clause if the standing parts exceeded the gaps it is permitted it was also taught in the first clause if the gaps exceeded the standing parts it is forbidden according to our papa it is quite well for this reason that the two cases were not included in one statement according to Arhuna son of our Joshua however why should not the two cases be included in one statement thus wherever the width of a reed is less than three or as much as three handbreadths it is necessary that the gap between any two reeds shall be less than three handbreadths because the cause of the restriction in the first clause is not like that in the second clause the cause of the restriction in the first clause is that a kid shall not be able to leap headlong through the gap while the cause of the restriction in the final clause is that the gaps shall not be equal to the standing parts whose view is expressed in the principle that the gap must be less than three handbreadths is it not that of the rabbis who laid down that to a gap of less than three handbreadths the law of the is applied but that to one of three handbreadths the law of the is not applied read however the final clause where the width of each read is three or from three to four talmud moss iron b does not this represent the view of our simian b gamaliel who laid down that the law of the is applied to a gap that is less than four handbreadths for if it represents the view of the rabbis how could it be said from three to four where three and four are subject to the same law of a replied since the first clause is the view of the rabbis the final clause also must be that of the rabbis but the rabbis admit that wherever it is a question of permitting to sow corn over against the standing part if it is four handbreadths why it is deemed a partition but not otherwise, Robert replied, as the final clause is the view of our Simeon B. Gamaliel, the first clause also must be that of our Simeon B. Gamaliel, but it is only to a gap above that he applied the rule of Labud, but in the case of one below it is like a fence which kids can break through to which the rule of Labud is not applied. Come and here the space enclosed by such walls as consists mostly of floors and windows is permitted provided the standing parts exceed the gaps. Now is it possible to imagine that the reading was mostly the reading then must obviously be the space enclosed by walls in which many doors and windows were made is permitted provided the standing parts exceed the gaps. Thus it follows that if the standing parts equal the gaps it is forbidden is not this then an objection against our Papa. This is indeed an objection. The law however is in agreement with our Papa an objection and the law yes because the inference from our mission is in agreement with his. View for we learn the gaps do not exceed the built-up parts from which it follows that if they are equal to the built-up parts it is permitted mission a caravan and camp may be surrounded by three ropes the one above the other provided the space between the one rope and the other is less than three handbreadths the size of the ropes must be such that their total thickness shall be more than a handbreadth so that the total height shall be ten handbreadths the camp may also be surrounded by reeds provided there is no gap of three handbreadths between any two reeds and laying down these rulings the rabbi spoke only of a caravan this is the view of our Judah but the sages maintain that they spoke of a caravan only because in its case this is a usual occurrence any partition that is not made up of both vertical and horizontal stakes is no valid partition so our Jose son of our Judah but the sages ruled one of the two is enough Gemara said our in the name of Rab behold the rabbis have laid down that if the standing parts of a partition made up of vertical stakes exceed the gaps the fence is valid what however asked our Hamna is the ruling in respect of horizontally drawn ropes have a reply come and here the size of the ropes must be such that their total thickness shall be more than a handbreadth so that the total height shall be ten handbreadths now if such a barrier were valid what need was there for the total thickness to be more than a handbreadth seeing that one could leave a distance slightly less than three handbreadths and stretch a rope of any thickness and again leave a distance slightly less than three handbreadths and stretch a rope of any thickness and then again leave a distance slightly less than four handbreadths and stretch a rope of any thickness but how do you understand this where could one leave less than four handbreadths of distance were it to be left below the barrier would be like a partition which kids can break through were it to be left above the unlimited air space on the one side of the rope and that on the other would join to annul its validity and if one were to leave it in the middle the virtually standing parts would be exceeding the gaps only by combining the parts on its two sides or would you infer from this that where the standing parts of a partition or barrier exceed a gap in it only by combining those on its two sides they are nevertheless valid but it is this that our Hamna asked what is the ruling where one brought for instance a mat that measured seven handbreadths and a fraction and cut out in it a hole of three handbreadths leaving untouched the remaining four handbreadths and fraction and put it up within a distance of less than three handbreadths from the ground our Ashi said his inquiry related to a suspended partition as did that which our tabla addressed to Rab does a suspended partition convert a ruin into a Permitted domain and the other replied a suspended partition can affect permissibility only in the case of water because only in respect of water did the sages relax the law the camp may also be surrounded by reeds etc only in the case of a caravan but not in that of all individual but was it not taught our Judah stated all defective partitions in connection with the Sabbath laws were not permitted to an individual if the space enclosed exceeded two Beth Sei's are nomin or as some. Say our BBB have a reply
was asked and acted in agreement with our Jose son of Arjuna thereupon Arnaman appointed Amora on the subject and gave the following exposition the statement I made to you was an error on my part it is this indeed that the rabbis have said an individual is allowed to Beth Seah two also are allowed to Beth Seah but three become a caravan and are allowed all the space they require Talmud, Mas Arabin is then the first clause in agreement with our Jose and the final clause only in Agreement with the rabbis, yes, because his father adopts the same line. Argital stated in the name of Rav, three persons are sometimes forbidden in five Beth Sia and sometimes permitted even in an area of seven. Did Rav they ask him really say so by the law, the prophets, and the writings? I can answer. He said to them that Rav did say so. Said Arashi, but what is the difficulty? It is possible that he meant this if they required six Beth Sia and they surrounded an area of seven. They are permitted even in all the seven, and if they required only one of five Beth Sia but surrounded one of seven, they are forbidden even the five Beth Sia. But then what of what was taught? Provided there be no two Beth Sia unoccupied, does not this mean unoccupied by human beings? No unoccupied by objects. It was stated on the question of the extent of the area permitted where there were three persons and one of them died or two, and their number was increased. Arhuna and Arizak are in. Dispute one maintains that Sabbath is the determining factor and the other maintains that the determining factor is the number of actual tenants. You may conclude that it is Arhuna who held that the determining factor was the Sabbath for Rabbis stated I inquired of Arhuna and also of Rab Judah as to what was the law where an Arab was laid in reliance on a certain door and that door was blocked up or on a certain window and that window was stopped up and he replied since permission for the Sabbath was once granted the permissibility continues until the day is concluded this is conclusive must it be assumed that Arhuna and Arizak differ on the same principle as that on which our Jose and Arjuda differed for we learned if a breach was made in two sides of a courtyard and so also if a breach was made in two sides of a house or if the cross beam or side post of an alley was removed the tenants are permitted their use for that Sabbath but forbidden on future Sabbath so are Judah or Jose ruled whatever they are permitted for that Sabbath they are permitted for future Sabbaths and whatever they are forbidden for future Sabbaths they are also forbidden for that Sabbath must it then be assumed that Arhuna is of the same opinion as Arjuda while our Isaac is of that of our Jose Arhuna can tell you I can maintain my view even in accordance with that of our Jose for our Jose maintained his view there only because there were no partitions but here there are partitions and our Isaac can tell you I can maintain my view even in agreement with Arjuda for Arjuda upheld his view there only because the tenants were in existence but here there was not a sufficient number of tenants and the sages ruled one of the two is enough is not this ruling precisely the same as that of the first ten of the practical difference between them is the case of an individual in an inhabited area mission of four obligations was exemption granted to warriors in a camp they may bring would from anywhere they are exempt from the washing of the hands from the restrictions of Dima and from the duty of preparing an Arab Gemara our rabbis learned an army that goes out to an optional war are permitted to commandeer dry wood our Judah be team ruled they may also encamp in any place and are to be buried where they are killed are permitted to commandeer dry wood was not this however an enactment of Joshua for a master stated that Joshua laid down ten stipulations which included the following that people shall be allowed to feed their cattle in the woods and to gather wood from their fields the enactment there related to thorns and shrubs while the ruling here refers to other kinds of wood or else there it is a case of trees that are attached to the ground while the ruling here refers to such as were already detached or else there it is a case of fresh and here it is one of dry wood our Judah be team ruled they may also encamp in any place and are to be Buried where they are killed is not this obvious since a killed warrior is a methmizwa and a methmizwa acquires the right to be buried on the spot where it is found this ruling was required only for the following case although Talmud, Mas Arabin B he has friends who would bury him he is to be buried where he was killed for it was taught who is deemed a methmizwa any person who has no one to bury him were he however to call for help and others answer him he is not to be regarded as a methmizwa but does a methmizwa acquire the right to be buried on the spot where it is found was it not in fact taught if a man found a corpse lying in the road he may remove it to the right of the road or to the left of the road if on the one side there was an uncultivated and on the other a fallow field he should remove it to the uncultivated field a fallow field and a field with seeds he should remove it to the fallow field if both fields were fallow sowed or Uncultivated he may remove it to whichever side he wishes or be replied here we are dealing with a corpse that lay across a narrow path and since permission was granted to remove it from the path one may also move it to whichever side one pleases they are exempt from the washing of the hands have a stated this was taught only in respect of the washing before a meal but the washing after a meal is obligatory our high b as she stated why did the rabbis rule that washing after a meal is obligatory because there exists a certain sodomitic salt that causes blindness and said a it is found in the proportion of one grain to a core in any kind of salt said Arahasan of Rabbah to Arashi what is your ruling where one has measured out any salt this the other replied is perfectly obvious from the restrictions of Dime for we learned poor men and billeted troops may be fed with Dime Arhuna stated one taught Beth Shammai ruled poor men and billeted troops may not be fed with Dime and Beth Hillel ruled poor men and billeted troops may be fed with Dima and from the duty of preparing an Arab it was stated at the schoolhouse of Arjanay this ruling was taught only in regard to an Arab of courtyards but their obligation to an Arab of boundaries remains unaffected since Arhaya taught for transgressing the laws of Arab of boundaries flogging is incurred in accordance with Pentateuch Allah Arjanathan Demert is flogging incurred on account of a prohibition implied in Al-Arahabi. Jacob Demert now then since it is written in scripture turn ye not unto them that have familiar spirits nor unto the wizards should no flogging be incurred in that case also it was this difficulty that Arjanathan felt is not this a prohibition that was given to authorize a warning of death at the hands of Beth Din and for any prohibition given to authorize a warning of death no flogging is incurred Arashi replied is it written in scripture let no man carry out it is in fact written. Let no man go out. Chapter 2 Mishnah wells may be provided with strips of wood by fixing four corner pieces that have the appearance of eight single strips. So our Judah Armeyer ruled eight strips that have the appearance of twelve must be set up for being corner pieces and four single strips. Their height must be ten hand breadths. Their width six and their thickness may be of any size whatsoever. Between them there may be as much space as to admit two teams of three oxen each. So are Meir but our Judah set of four oxen each. These teams being tied together and not apart but there may be space enough for one to enter while the other goes out. It is permitted to bring the strips close to the well provided a cow can be within the enclosure with its head and the greater part of its body when drinking it is permitted. Talmud, Mas Aravane to remove the strips to any distance provided one increases the strips. Our Judah said the enclosure may be only as large as two beth. Seah, but they said to him the limit of two Beth Seah was prescribed for a garden or a car path only but if the enclosure was a cattle in a fold a backyard or a courtyard it may be as big as five or ten Beth core and for this reason it is permitted to remove the strips from the well to any distance provided one increases the number of the strips Gemara must one assume that our mission is not in agreement with the ruling of Hanani for it was taught strips of wood may be put up round a cistern and ropes around a caravan but Hanani ruled ropes may be put up round a cistern but not strips of wood it may be said to agree even with the ruling of Hanani for a cistern and a well belong to two different categories there are others who read since it was not stated Hanani ruled ropes must be put up round a cistern and strips of wood may be put up round a well it may be inferred that according to the view of Hanani both in the case of a cistern and in that of a well only ropes are permitted but not strips of wood must one then assume that our mission is not in agreement with the ruling of Hanania it may be said to agree even with the ruling of Hanania for he only replied to that of which the first Tana had spoken must it be assumed that our mission is at variance with the ruling of our Akiba for we learned strips of wood may be provided for a public well a public cistern as well as for a private well but for a private cistern a screen ten and breadth I must be provided so our Akiba whereas here it was stated that such strips of wood may be provided for wells does it not then follow only for wells but not for cisterns it may be said to be in agreement even with our
Meaning of side one explains a full face and the other explains a tale according to him who explained a full face it was quite proper for scripture to state thou hast shaped me behind and before but according to him who explained a tale what could be the meaning of thou hast shaped me behind and before as RMI explained for RMI said Adam was behind last in the work of the creation and before the others for retribution one may well concede that he was behind in the work of it. Creation since he was not created before the Sabbath Eve what means however before the others for retribution shall I say it refers to the curse surely it could be objected was not the serpent curse first Eve afterwards and Adam last but it refers to the flood for it is written in scripture and he blotted out every living substance which was upon the face of the ground both man and cattle etc according to him who explained a full face it is easy to see why and he formed W A I was written in scripture with two yods according to him however who explained a tale what could be the significance of and he formed it may be explained in agreement with our Simeon Bipazi for our Simeon Bipazi said woe to me on account of my evil inclination woe to me on account of my creator according to him who explained a full face it was quite correct for scripture to write male and female created he them but according to him who explained a tale what could be the interpretation of male and female created even the text was required for an explanation like that of Arabab for Arabab pointed out an incongruity it is written in scripture male and female created even previously it is written in the image of God created him and he explained at first it was the intention that two should be created but ultimately only one was created according to him who explained a full face the expression of and closed up the place with flesh instead thereof is quite intelligible. But according to him who explained a tale what could be the meaning of and closed up the place with flesh instead thereof are or as some say are and B. Isaac replied the text refers only to the place of the cut according to him who explained a tale it was quite proper for scripture to write and he built it but according to him who explained a full face what could be the significance of and he built it in agreement with that which has been stated by our Simeon B. Menasia for our Simeon B. Menasia made the following exposition and the Lord God built it the side teaches that the Holy One blessed be he played Eve's hair and then brought her to Adam for in the sea towns a plate is called building another interpretation of and the Lord God built it are his da stated or as others say it was taught in the very this teaches that the Holy One blessed be he built even the shape Talmud, Mos Irvin B. Talmud, Mos Irvin B. of a storehouse as a storehouse is made wide below and narrow. Above so that it may contain the produce so was the womb of a woman made wide below and narrow above so that it may contain the embryo and brought her to Adam teaches that the Holy One blessed be he acted as groomsman for the first man from here you may infer that a great man should act as groomsman for a minor person and feel no regrets about it with reference to the view of him who explained a full face which of them walked first Arnam and B. Isaac replied it is reasonable to assume that the male walked first for it was taught no man should walk on a road behind a woman even if she is his own wife if she happened to be in front of him on a bridge he should leave her on one side and whosoever crosses a river behind a married woman has no share in the world to come our rabbis taught a man who counts out money for a woman from his hand into hers or from her hand into his in order that he might look at her will not be free from the judgment of Gehenna even if he is another. Respects like our master Moses who received the law at Mount Sinai and concerning him scripture said hand to hand he will not be free from evil which means he will not be free from the judgment of Gehenna Arnaman said Mano was an ignorant man since it is said and Mano arose and went after his wife Arnaman B. Isaac demurred now then since in the case of Elkanah it is written and Elkanah went after his wife was he also an ignorant man or in the case of Elisha since it is written in scripture and he arose and followed her was he also an ignorant man but the meaning is after her words and her counsel so here also could it not be explained after her words and her counsel said Arashi on Arnaman's assumption that Mano was an ignorant man he did not attend even a school for scripture for it is written and Rebecca arose and her damsels and they rode upon the camels and followed the man but they did not precede the man or Yohanan remarked let one walk behind a lion but not behind a married woman, behind a married woman, but not behind an idol, behind an idol, but not behind a synagogue. At the time the congregation is praying, our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated in all those years during which Adam was under the band, he begot ghosts and male demons and female demons, for it is said in scripture, and Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image, from which it follows that until that time he did not beget after his own. Image and objection was raised, our Meir said Adam was a great saint when he saw that through him death was ordained as a punishment. He spent a hundred and thirty years in fasting, severed connection with his wife for a hundred and thirty years, and wore clothes of fig leaves on his body for a hundred and thirty years. That statement was made in reference to the semen which he emitted accidentally, our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated only a part of a man's praise may be said in his presence, but all. Of it in his absence only a part of a man's praise in his presence for it is written in scripture for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation but all of it in his absence for it is written in scripture no it was in his generations a man righteous and wholehearted our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated what was signified when it was written and low in her mouth an olive leaf freshly plucked the dove said to the holy one blessed be he may my food be as bitter as the olive but entrusted to your hand rather than sweet as honey and dependent on a mortal for here it is written freshly plucked and elsewhere it is written feed me with my allotted bread our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated any house in which the words of the Torah are heard at night will never be destroyed for it is said in scripture but none saith where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated since the sanctuary was destroyed it is enough for the world to use. Only two letters of the tetragram, and for it is said in scripture, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated, when Babylon was cursed, her neighbors also were cursed, but when Samaria was cursed, her neighbors were blessed, when Babylon was cursed, her neighbors also were cursed, for it is written, I will also make it a possession for the bitter and pools of water, but when Samaria was cursed, her neighbors were blessed, for it is written, therefore I will make Samaria heap in the field Talmud, Mos Irvin, a place for planting of vineyards. Our Jeremiah B. Eliezer further stated, come and see that human relationship is not like that with the Holy One, blessed be he in human relationship when a man is sentenced to death for an offense against the government, a hook must be placed in his mouth in order that he shall not be able to curse the king, but in the relationship with the Holy One, blessed be he when a man incurs it. Penalty of death for an offense against the omnipresent he keeps silence as it is said towards the silence is praise and he furthermore offers praise for it is stated praise and not only that but he also regards it as if he offered a sacrifice for it is said in scripture and unto thee the vow is performed this is exactly in line with what our Joshua B. Levi has said what is the meaning of what is written passing through the valley of Baca they make it a place of springs yet the early rain. Clot hated with blessings passing is an illusion to men who transgress the will of the Holy One blessed be he valley is an illusion to these men for whom Gehenna is made deep of Baca signifies that they weep and shed tears they make it a place of springs like the constant flow of the altar drains yet the early rain clot hated with blessings they acknowledge the justice of their punishment and declare before him Lord of the universe thou hast judged well thou hast condemned well and well. Provided Gehenna for the wicked and paradise for the righteous, but this is not so for did not our Simeon be like state the wicked do not repent even at the gate of Gehenna for it is said and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that rebel against me etc. It was not said that have rebelled but that rebel implying that they go on rebelling forever this is no contradiction since the former refer to transgressors in Israel and the latter to transgressors among idol. Worshippers logical argument also leads to this conclusion since otherwise a contradiction would arise between two statements of Resh Lakish for Resh Lakish stated the fire of Gehenna has no power over the transgressors in Israel as may be inferred a menorah ad mages from the golden altar if the golden altar the layer on which was only of the thickness of a dinar lasted for many years and the fire had no power over it how much more would that be the case with the transgressors in Israel who are as full of good deeds as a pomegranate with seed as it is said in scripture thy temples are like a pomegranate and our Simeon B. Lakish remarked read not thy temples but thy empty ones signifying that even the worthless among you are as full of good deeds as a pomegranate with seed what however about
whose fire is in Zion and its furnace in Jerusalem and the school of our Ishmael taught whose fire is in Zion refers to Gehenna and its furnace in Jerusalem refers to the gate of Gehenna are there however no more gates as not our Marion in fact stated in the name of our Joshua be Levi or as others say Rabbi Marion learned in the very of the compilation of the school of our Yohan and Bezakai there are two palm trees in the valley of Ben Hinnom and between them smoke rises and it is in Connection with this spot that we have learned the stone palms of the Iron Mountain are fit and this is the gate of Gehenna. It is possible that this gate is the same as the one in Jerusalem. Our Joshua B. Levi stated Gehenna has seven names and they are netherworld destruction pit tumultuous pit miry clay shadow of death and the underworld netherworld since it is written in scripture out of the belly of the netherworld cry I and thou heardest my voice destruction for it is written in scripture shall thy mercy be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction pit for it is written in scripture for thou wilt not abandon thy soul to the netherworld neither wilt thou suffer thy godly one to see the pit tumultuous pit and miry clay for it is written in scripture he brought me up also out of the tumultuous pit out of the miry clay shadow of death for it is written in scripture such as sat in darkness and in the shadow of death and the name of netherworld is a Tradition, but are there no more names? Is there not in fact that of Gehenna this means a valley that is as deep as the valley of Hinnom and into which all go down for gratuitous acts? Is there not also the name of Hearth since it is written in scripture for a hearth is ordered of old that means that whosoever is enticed by his evil inclination will fall therein as to paradise? Resh Lakish said, If it is in the land of Israel, its gate is Bethshin, if it is in Arabia, its gate is Beth Arab. And if it is between the rivers, its gate is Dumas Canaan in Babylon, Abbe praise the fruit of every Yamana and Rabba praise the fruit of Harpania yeah, between them. There may be as much space as to admit to, etc. Is not this obvious for since it was stated that they are to be tied together? Do we not know that they would not be apart? It might have been presumed that tied together implies as if they were tied together, but not actually so, hence we were told and not apart one to enter while the other. Goes out a tanda taught one team to enter while the other team goes out. Our rabbis taught how much is the total length of the head and the greater part of the body of a cow two cubits and what is the extent of a cow's thickness a cubit and two thirds of a cubit talmud. Mas Iravan be so that the extent of all the cows is about ten cubits. So our Meir but our Judah said about thirteen or about fourteen cubits about ten you say but are they not in fact ten exactly as it was desired to state? About thirteen in the final clause about ten was stated in the first clause also about thirteen you said but are there not more about was used because it was desired to state about fourteen but there are not really about fourteen are there our papa replied the meaning is more than thirteen but less than fourteen our papa stated in respect of a cistern that is eight cubits wide no one disputes the ruling that no single boards are required in respect of a cistern that is twelve cubits. Why no one disputes the ruling that single boards also are required they only differ in the case of a cistern that was from 8 to 12 cubits in width according to our Meir single boards are required and according to our Juden no single boards are required what new principle however does our Papa teach us did we not learn what he said in our mission our Papa did not hear of the Beretha and he told us the same measurements as the Beretha Nemonic extended more in the Mount Fence of a courtyard that dried up Abbe inquired of Rabba what is the ruling according to our Meir where one extended the corner piece so that the excess of their width was equal to the required width of the single boards the other replied you have learned this provided one increases the strips of wood which means does it not that one extends the width of the corner pieces no it might mean that one provides more single boards if so instead of provided one increases the strips should not be Reading have been provided one increases the number of the strips read provided one increases the number of strips there are others who read the other replied you have learned it provided one increases the strips which means does it not that one must provide more single boards know that one extends the width of the corner pieces by deduction also one arrives at the same conclusion since it was stated provided one increases the strips this is decisive Abbe inquired of Rabba what is it? Ruling according to our Judah where the distance between the corner pieces was more than 13 and the third cubits is it necessary to provide additional single boards or must one rather extend the width of the corner pieces the other replied you have learned it how near may they be as the length of the head and the greater part of the body of a cow and how far may they be even as far as to enclose an area in which a core and even two cores of seed may be sown our Judah ruled an area of Two Beth Sei is permitted, but one that exceeds two Beth Sei is forbidden. Do you not admit the rabbi said to our Judah that if the enclosure was a cattle pen or a cattle fold, a rear court or a courtyard, it may be as big as five or even ten Beth Core. This he replied is one that has a complete partition, but those are isolated boards. Now, if that were so, should they not have objected the one as well as the other is a proper partition? It is this that he meant the one is subject to the law of the partition and gaps, and it must not be wider than ten cubits, but those are subject to the law of strips of wood and gaps of thirteen and a third cubits between them are allowed. Abbe inquired of rabbi is a mound that rises to a height of ten hand breadths within an area of four cubits treated as a corner piece or not. The other replied, You have learned it. Our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled if a four sided stone was present, we must consider this if on being cut there would remain a cubit. Length for either side it may be regarded as a valid corner piece otherwise it cannot be so regarded our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Barak ruled if a round stone was present we consider this if on being chiseled and cut there would remain a cubit length for either side it may be regarded as a valid corner piece otherwise it cannot be so treated on what principle do they differ one master is of the opinion that one imaginary act may be assumed as having been affected but not two and the other master is of the opinion that two imaginary acts may also be assumed to have been affected Abbe inquired of Rabbah is offensive reads in which the distance between any two reads was less than three hand breadths regarded as a valid corner piece or not the other replied you have learned this if there was present a tree or a wall or a fence of growing reeds it may be treated as a corner piece does not this refer to a fence in which the distance between any two reeds was less than three and breadths no it may refer to a hedge of reeds if so is it not exactly of the same nature as a tree what then would you suggest that it refer to a fence in which the distance between any two reeds was less than three hand breadths is not this one could well retort exactly of the same nature as a wall what then could you reply that there are two kinds of wall well then in this case also one might reply that there are two kinds of tree there are others who say that he inquired concerning a hedge of reeds what he asked is the ruling in respect of a hedge of reeds the other replied you have learned this if there was present a tree or a wall or a fence of growing reeds it may be treated as a corner piece does not this refer to a hedge of reeds no it may refer to a fence in which the distance between any two reeds was less than three hand breadths if so is it not exactly of the same nature as a wall what then would you suggest that it refers to a Hedge of reeds is not this exactly of the same nature as a tree what then could you say in reply Talmud, Mas Arabinda that there are two kinds of trees well then in this case also one might submit that there are two kinds of wall Abbe inquired of Rabbi if a courtyard opened out on one side into an area between the strips of wood around a well is it permitted to move objects from its interior into that between the strips and from between the strips to its interior the other replied this is permitted what if two courtyards opened out in a similar manner it is forbidden the other replied said are who not in the case of two courtyards the movement of objects is forbidden even where the tenants have prepared an Arab this being a preventive measure against the possible assumption that an Arab is effective in the case of a space enclosed by strips of wood Rabbi said if the tenants prepared an Arab the movement of objects is permitted said Abbe to Rabbi ruling was taught which provides support to your view if a courtyard opens out on one side into an area between the strips of wood around a well it is permitted to move objects from its interior into that between the strips and from between the strips to the interior but if two courtyards opened out in this manner the movement of objects is forbidden this however applies only where the tenants prepared no Arab but where they did prepare an Arab they are allowed to move their objects must it be said that this presents an objection against Arhunat Arhunat can answer you there it is a case where a breach also combined them have inquired of Rabba what is the ruling where the water dried up on the Sabbath the other replied the enclosure was recognized as a valid partition only on account of the water and since no water is here available there is here no validity in
Although many people cross the enclosure it is regarded as a private domain what principle however does he thereby teach us that even the passage of many people does not destroy the validity of a partition but this it may be contended was already once said by our Eliezer for have we not learned our Judah rule if a public road cuts through then it should be diverted to one of the sides and the sages ruled this was not necessary and both our Yohanan and our Eliezer remarked here they informed you of the unassailable validity of partitions if the principle had to be derived from there it might have been presumed that only here etc but that he himself is not of the same opinion hence we were told that not only here etc but he himself also is of the same opinion then why did he not state this ruling and there would have been no need for the other the one was derived from the other it is permitted to bring the strips close to the well etc elsewhere we learned a man must not stand in a public domain and drink in a private domain or in a private one and drink in a public one unless he puts his head and the greater part of his body into the domain in which he drinks Talmud, Mas Arabin B and the same ruling applies to one drinking from or in a wine press now in the case of a human being it has been laid down that it is necessary for his head and the greater part of his body to be in the domain from which he drinks is it necessary in the case of a cow. Also that its lead and the greater part of its body shall be in the domain from which it drinks or not wherever the keeper holds a vessel and does not hold the animal there can be no question that it is necessary for its head and the greater part of its body to be within the private domain the question only arises where he holds a vessel and also the animal now what is the ruling the other replied you have learned it provided a cow can be within the enclosure with its head and it greater part of its body when drinking this refers does it not to a case where the keeper holds both the cow and the vessel no it may refer to one who holds a vessel but not the cow but is it at all permitted to give drink to a cow on the sabbath where one holds a vessel and not the animal was it not in fact taught a man must not fill a vessel with water and hold it before his beast on the sabbath but he fills his bucket and pours it out into a trough and the cow drinks of its own accord surely in connection with this ruling it was stated i explained here we are dealing with a manger that stands in a public domain that is ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide and one of whose sides projects into the area between the strips of wood a preventive measure having been enacted against the possibility that the man might observe that the manger was damaged and proceeding to repair it would carry the bucket with him and thus carry an object from a Private into a public domain, but does one incur guilt in such circumstances? Has not our Safra in the name of our MI who had it from our Yohanan in fact said if a man was removing his things from one corner into another and then changed his mind and carried them out into a public domain, he is exempt since the lifting up of the objects was not originally intended for this purpose. Rather, this is the explanation. Sometimes he might, after he repaired the manger, carry the bucket back again and thus he would carry from the public into a private domain. Some there are who say in the case of a human being it had definitely been laid down that it was enough if his head and the greater part of his body were in the domain from which he drinks. Is it enough, however, in the case of a cow that its head and the greater part of its body should be in the domain from which it drinks or not wherever the keeper holds a vessel and also the cow? There can be no question that it is enough for its head and the greater part of its body to be within the private domain the question only arises where he holds a vessel but not the cow now what is the ruling the other replied you have learned it provided a cow can be within the enclosure with its head and the greater part of its body when drinking this refers does it not to a case where the keeper holds a vessel but not the cow no it may refer to one who holds both the vessel and the cow and this may also be justified logically for if he held the vessel only and not the cow would the supply of the water have been permitted seeing that it was in fact taught a man must not fill a vessel with water to hold it before his beast on the sabbath but he fills his bucket and pours it out into a trough and the cow drinks of its own accord surely in connection with this ruling it was stated i explained here we are dealing with a manger that stands in a public domain that is ten handbreadths high and four and breadths wide and one of whose sides projects into an area between the strips of wood where it is possible that the man might sometimes observe that the manger was damaged and proceeding to repair it would carry the bucket with him and thus carry an object from a private into a public domain does one however incur guilt in such circumstances has not our Safra in the name of our MI who had it from our Yohanan in fact said if a man was removing his things from one corner into another and then changed his mind and carried them out into a public domain he is exempt since the lifting up of the objects was not originally intended for this purpose rather this is the explanation sometimes he might after he had repaired the manger carry the bucket back again and would thus carry from the public into a private domain come and hear a camel whose head and the greater part of its body is within a private domain may be crammed within that domain now is not the act of cramming it. Same as holding the bucket and the animal and yet it is required that its head and the greater part of its body shall be within the private domain or a Hassan of Aruna replied in the name of our she's hate a camel is different since its neck is long come and here a beast whose head and the greater part of its body is within a private domain may be crammed within that domain is not cramming the same as holding the bucket and the animal and yet it was required that its head and the greater part of its body shall be within the private domain it may be objected that by the expression of beast also a camel was meant were not however both camel and beast separately mentioned were they mentioned in juxtaposition so it was also taught our Eliezer forbids this in the case of a camel because its neck is long or Isaac B. Adda stated strips of wood around wells were permitted to festival pilgrims only but was it not taught strips of wood around wells were permitted for cattle only by Cattle was meant the cattle of the festival pilgrims, but a human being Talmud, Mas Arabin, must climb up or climb down. But this is not so. Did not our Isaac in the name of Rab Judah, who had it from Samuel, actually state strips of wood around wells were permitted only where a well is one of spring water? Now, if strips of wood were permitted for cattle, only what difference is there whether the water was springing or collected? It is required that the water should be fit for human consumption. To turn to the main text, strips of wood around wells were permitted for cattle only, but a human being must climb up or climb down. If, however, they the wells were wide, they are permitted for a human being. Also, no man may fill a bucket with water to hold it before his cattle, but one may fill a bucket with water and pour it into a trough before cattle which drink of their own accord are in and If so, what was the use of strips of wood around wells? What was the use? You ask surely to enable people to draw water from the wells this rather is the question of what use is it that the head and the greater part of the body of the cow is within the enclosure of a replied here we are dealing with a manger that stood in a public domain that was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide and one of whose sides projected into an area between strips of wood etc. Our Jeremiah B. Abel laid down in the name of Rab the law of isolated huts is not applicable to Babylon nor that of strips of wood around wells to any country outside the land of Israel the law of isolated huts is not applicable to Babylon because there the bursting of dams is common nor that of strips of wood around wells to any country outside the land of Israel because their colleges are rare the reverse however is applicable others say that our Jeremiah B. Abel laid this down in the name of Rab the laws of isolated huts and strips of wood around wells are not applicable either to Babylon or to other countries outside the land of Israel. The law of isolated huts is inapplicable to Babylon because the bursting of dams is a frequent occurrence in other countries outside the land of Israel. Also, it is not applicable because their thieves are common. The law of strips of wood around wells is not applicable to Babylon because it has water in abundance in other countries outside the land of Israel. Also, it is not applicable because their colleges are rare. Said Arhis Tajamari, son of Arhuna, the son of our Jeremiah B. Abba, people say that you walk on the Sabbath from Barnish to Daniel Synagogue, which is a distance of three parsangs. What do you rely upon on the isolated huts? But did not the father of your father lay down in the name of Rab that the law of isolated huts is not applicable to Babylon? The other thereupon went out with him and showed him certain ruined settlements that were contained within the radius of. Seventy cubits and a fraction from the town Arhista stated Mari Bimar made the following exposition it is written I have seen an end to every purpose but thy commandment is exceeding broad this statement was made by David but he did not explain it Job made a similar statement and did not explain it Ezekiel also made a similar statement and did not explain it and the exact magnitude remained unknown until Zechariah the son of it came and explained it it was made by David but he did not explain it for it is written in scripture I have seen an end to every purpose but thy commandment is exceeding broad Job
Hundreds part of the Torah are Hisdah further stated Mari Bimar made this exposition what is the significance of the scriptural text and behold two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord one basket had very good figs like the figs Talmud, Mas Iravan B that are first ripe and the other basket had very bad figs which could not be eaten they were so bad good figs are an allusion to those who are righteous in every respect bad figs are an allusion to those who are wicked in every respect but in case you should imagine that their hope is lost and their prospect is frustrated it was explicitly stated the baskets give forth fragrance both will in time to come give forth fragrance Rabba made the following exposition the scriptural text the mandrakes give forth fragrance is an allusion to the young men of Israel who never felt the taste of sin and at our doors are all manner of precious fruits is an allusion to the daughters of Israel who tell their husbands about their doors. Another reading who closed their doors for their husbands new and old which I have laid up for thee O my beloved the congregation of Israel said to the Holy One blessed be he Lord of the universe I have imposed upon myself more restrictions than thou hast imposed upon me and I have observed them are his asked one of the young rabbis who was reciting a good in his presence in a certain order did you hear what was the purport of the expression new and old the former the other replied are the minor and the latter are the major commandments was then the Torah the former asked given on two different occasions but the latter are those derived from the words of the Torah while the former are those derived from the words of the scribes Rabba made the following exposition what is the purport of the scriptural text and furthermore my son be admonished of making many books etc my son be more careful in the observance of the words of the scribes than in the words of the Torah for in the Laws of the Torah there are positive and negative precepts but as to the laws of the scribes whoever transgresses any of the enactments of the scribes incurs the penalty of death in case you should object if they are of real value why were they not recorded in the Torah scripture stated of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of flesh our Papa son of Arahabi Adda stated in the name of Arahabi Ola this teaches that he who scoffs at the words of the sages will be condemned to boiling excrements Rabba Demur is it written scoffing the expression is study rather this is the exposition he who studies them feels the taste of meat our rabbis taught our Akiba was once confined in a prison house and our Joshua the grits maker was attending on him every day a certain quantity of water was brought into him on one occasion he was met by the prison keeper who said to him your water today is rather much do you perhaps require it for undermining the prison he poured out a half of it and handed to him the other half when he came to our Akiva the latter said to him Joshua do you not know that I am an old man and my life depends on yours when the latter told him all that had happened our Akiva said to him give me some water to wash my hands it will not suffice for drinking the other complained will it suffice for washing your hands what can I do the former replied when for neglecting the words of the rabbis one deserves death it is better that I myself should die than that I should transgress against the opinion of my colleagues it was related that he tasted nothing until the other had brought him water wherewith to wash his hands when the sages heard of this incident they remarked if he was so scrupulous in his old age how much more must he have been so in his youth and if he so behaved in a prison house how much more must he have behaved in such a manner when not in a prison house Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel when Solomon ordained the laws of Arab and the washing of the hands of bath coal issued and proclaimed my son if thy heart be wise my heart will be glad even mine and furthermore it is said in scripture my son be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that taunteth me Rabba made the following exposition what are the illusions in the scriptural text come my beloved let us go forth into the field let us lodge in the villages let us get up early to the vineyards let us see whether the vine hath budded whether the vine blossom be opened and the pomegranates be in flower there will I give thee my love come my beloved let us go forth into the field the congregation of Israel spoke before the holy one blessed be he lord of the universe do not judge me as thou wouldst those who reside in large towns who indulge in robbery and adultery and in vain and falsehoods let us go forth into the field come and I will show thee scholars who study the Torah in poverty let us lodge in the villages read not in the villages but among the disbelievers come and I will show thee those upon whom thou hast bestowed much bounty and they disbelieve in thee let us get up early in the vineyards is an allusion to the synagogues and schoolhouses let us see whether the vine hath budded is an allusion to the students of scripture whether the vine blossom be opened alludes to the students of the mission and the pomegranates be in flower alludes to the students of the Gemara there will I give thee my love I will show thee my glory and my greatness the praise of my sons and my daughters are Hamnon said what are the allusions in what was written in scripture and he spoke three thousand proverbs and his songs were a thousand and five this teaches that Solomon uttered three thousand proverbs for every single word of the Torah and one thousand and five reasons for every single word of the scribes Rabba made this exposition what are the implications of what was written in scripture and besides that Kahilath was wise he also taught the people knowledge he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs he also taught the people knowledge implies that he taught it with notes of accentuation and illustrated it by simile he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs alludes to the fact said Ula in the name of our Eliezer that the Torah was at first like a basket which had no handles and when Solomon came he affixed handles to it his locks are curled this said R. His dog in the name of Marat but teaches that it is possible to pile up mounds of expositions on every single stroke of the letters of the Torah and black as a raven with whom do you find these with him Talmud, Mas Arabin who for their sake rises early to go to and remains late in the evening before returning home from the schoolhouse Rabbi explained you find these only with him who for their sake blackens his face like a raven Rabbi explained with him who can bring himself to be cruel. To his children and household like a raven as was the case with our Adabi Mahana he was about to go away to a schoolhouse when his wife said to him what shall I do with your children are there he retorted no more herbs in the marsh and repayeth them that hate him to his face to destroy him or Joshua be Levi remarked were it not for the written text one could not possibly have said it like a man as it were who carries a burden on his face and wants to throw it off he will not be slack to him. That hate him or Ila explained he will not be slack to those that hate him but he will be slack to those who are just in all respects and this is in line with that which our Joshua be Levi stated what is the implication of what was written which I command thee this day to do them this day you are to do them but you cannot postpone doing them for tomorrow this day you are in a position to do them and tomorrow is reserved for receiving reward for doing them or Hagi or as some say are. Samuel B. Namani stated what was the purpose when scripture wrote long-suffering in the dual form where the singular might well have been used but this is the purport long-suffering towards the righteous and long-suffering also towards the wicked our Judah said the enclosure may be only as large as two Beth Sei etc. The question was raised does he mean the area of the cistern together with that between the strips of wood or does he mean the cistern alone exclusive of the area? Between the strips does a man regard his cistern as the permitted area and consequently it is not necessary to restrict the permitted area as a preventive measure against the possibility of one's moving of objects in a car path that is larger than two both Sei or does a man rather regard his partition and consequently it was necessary to restrict the permitted area as a preventive measure against the possibility of assuming that an area of more than two Beth Sei is permitted in the Case of a carpath also come and hear how near may the strips of wood be as near as to admit the head and the greater part of the body of a cow and how far may they be even so far as to enclose a Bethkor or even two Bethkor our Judah ruled an area of two Beth Sei is permitted but one larger than two Beth Sei is forbidden do you not admit they said to our Judah that in the case of a cattle pen or cattle fold or rear court or a courtyard even an area as large as five or ten Bethkor is permitted he replied this is a proper partition but those are mere strips of wood our Simeon B. Eliezer said a cistern the area of which is two Beth Sei by two Beth Sei is permitted and the rabbis permitted to remove the strips of wood from it only so far as to admit the head and the greater part of the body of a cow now since our Simeon B. Eliezer spoke of the cistern exclusive of the strips of wood it follows does it not that our Judah spoke of the cistern together with the strips in fact, however, this is not correct. Our Judah spoke of the cistern exclusive of the area between it and the strips. If so, is not his ruling exactly the same as that of our Simeon B. Eliezer? The practical difference between them is an enclosure that is long and narrow. Our Simeon B. Eliezer laid down a general rule: any enclosed
Construct one side post on one side of any of the houses and another on the other side or one cross beam on the one side and another on its other side and then he may move things about in the space between them but they said to him a public domain cannot be provided with an Arab in such a manner now does not this present a contradiction between one ruling of Arjuna and another ruling of his and between one ruling of the rabbis and another ruling of theirs there is really no contradiction. Between the two rulings of Arjuna there it is a case where two proper walls are available but here two proper walls are not available there is no contradiction between the two rulings of the rabbis either since here the name of four partitions at least is available but there even the name of four partitions does not exist our Isaac B. Joseph stated in the name of our Yohanan in the land of Israel no guilt is incurred on account of moving objects in a public domain Ardimi sitting at his studies. Recited this traditional ruling set of A to Ardimi what is the reason Talmud, Mas Arab and B if it be suggested because the ladder of Tyre surrounds it on one side and the declivity of Gedder on the other side Babylon too it could be retorted is surrounded by the Euphrates on one side and the Tigris on the other side the whole world in fact is surrounded by the ocean perhaps you mean the ascents and descents of Palestine genius the other replied I saw your chief between the pillars what are. Yohanan discoursed on this traditional ruling so it was also stated when Rabin came he stated in the name of our Yohanan others say our Abbas stated in the name of our Yohanan no guilt is incurred for the carrying of objects in the public domain in the case of the ascents and descents of the land of Israel because they are not as accessible as the domain on which the standards in the wilderness marched Rehoboam inquired of Rabbah in the case of a mound that rises to a height of ten handbreadths. On a base of four cubits across which many people make their way does one incur the guilt of carrying in a public domain or is no guilt incurred this question does not arise according to the view of the rabbis for if there were the use of the road is quite easy the rabbis ruled that the public do not impair the validity of the enclosure how much more is that the case here where the use of the road is not easy the question arises only according to Arjuna does he maintain his view only. There because the use of the road is easy but here where its use is not easy the public he maintains do not impair the validity of the legal partition or is there perhaps no difference the other replied guilt is incurred even the first ask if people ascend by means of a rope yes the other replied is this the ruling the first ask even in respect of the ascent of Beth Marin yes the other replied he raised an objection against him a courtyard into which many people enter from one. Side and go out from the other is regarded as a public domain in respect of Levitical defilement and as a private domain in respect of the Sabbath. Now, whose view is here expressed? If it be suggested that of the rabbis, it might be objected. If there were the use of the road is easy, the rabbis ruled that the public cannot come and impair the validity of the partition. How much more is that the case here where its use is not easy? Consequently, it must be must it not the view of Arjuna? No. It may in fact represent the view of the rabbis, but the statement was required on account of the ruling and the public domain in respect of Levitical defilement. Come and hear alleys that open out in cisterns, ditches, or caves have the status of a private domain in respect of Sabbath and that of a public one in respect of Levitical defilement. Now, can you imagine a reading in cisterns? The reading must consequently be towards cisterns and about such alleys. It was ruled that they have it. Status of a private domain in respect of Sabbath and that of a public one in respect of Levitical defilement. Now, whose view is here expressed? If it be suggested that of the rabbis, it could be objected. If there were the use of the road is easy, they ruled that the public cannot come and annul its validity. How much more should this be the case here, where its use is not easy? Consequently, it must be must it not the view of Arjuna? No, it may in fact be the view of the rabbis, but the statement was required on account of the ruling and the public domain in respect of Levitical defilement. Come and hear the paths of Beth Gilgal and such as are similar to them have the status of a private domain in respect of the Sabbath and that of a public domain in respect of Levitical defilement. And what paths may be described as the paths of Beth Gilgal at the school of Arjuna? It was laid down any path along which a slave carrying a of wheat is unable to run before an officer. Now whose view is this if it be suggested that it is that of the rabbis it might be objected if there were the use of the road is easy the rabbis ruled that the public cannot come and impair the validity of the partition how much more would that be the case here where the use of the paths is not easy consequently it must be must it not the view of Arjuna the other replied you speak of the paths of Beth Gilgal which have a status of their own for Joshua being a friend of Israel undertook the task of providing for them roads and highways and those that were easy of access he assigned for public use and those that were not easily accessible he assigned for private use mission strips of wood may be provided for a public cistern a public well as well as a private well but for a private cistern a partition ten handbreadth high must be provided so our Akiva Arjuna be Baba ruled strips of wood may be set up around the public well only while for the others a rope bell ten. And breadths in height must be provided Talmud, Mas Arab and Gemara Arjosef stated in the name of Rab Judah who had it from Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna B. Baba Arjosef further stated in the name of Arjuna who had it from Samuel strips of wood around wells were permitted only in the case of a well of living water and both these statements were required for if we had only been told the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna B. Baba it might have been assumed that in the case of public water he allows strips of wood even where the water is collected and that the reason why he mentioned the public well was to express disagreement with the view of our Akiva hence we were told that strips of wood around wells were permitted only in the case of a well of living water and if only a well of living water had been mentioned it might have been assumed that there is no difference between a public and a private one hence we were told the Halachah is in agreement. With Arjuna B. Baba mission, Arjuna B. Baba further ruled it is permitted to move objects in a garden or a car path whose area does not exceed 70 cubits and a fraction by 70 cubits and a fraction and which are surrounded by a wall 10 handbreadths high provided there is in it a watchman's hut or a dwelling place or it is near to a town. Arjuna ruled even if it contained only a cistern, a ditch or a cave it is permitted to move objects within it or Akiva ruled even if it contained none of these it is permitted to move objects within it provided its area does not exceed 70 cubits and a fraction by 70 cubits and a fraction. Our Eliza ruled if its length exceeded its breadth even by a single cubit it is not permitted to move any objects within it. Our Jose ruled even if its length is twice its breadth it is permitted to move effects within it. Our Eli stated I heard from our Eliza even if it is as large as a Beth Core I likewise heard from him that if one of the tenants of a Courtyard forgot to join in the Arab's house is forbidden to him for the taking in or the taking out of any object but is permitted to them. I have likewise heard from him that people may fulfill their duty at Passover by eating hearts tongue. When however I went round among all his disciples seeking a fellow student I found none tomorrow. What did he already teach that in consequence he used the expression of further if it be suggested because he taught one restrictive ruling and then he taught the other he therefore used the expression of further surely it could be retorted did not argue to teach one restrictive ruling and then he taught another one and yet he did not use the expression further there the rabbis interrupted him but here the rabbis did not interrupt him is it then suggested that wherever the rabbis interrupted one statement the expression of further not used surely it may be objected was not our Eliza in the case of a law about Sukkah interrupted by the rabbis. And the expression further was nevertheless used there. They interrupted him with a ruling on his own subject, but here they made the interruption with another subject. Our Akiva ruled even if it contained none of these, it is permitted to move objects within a Talmud. Mas Arab and B is not our Akiva laying down the same ruling as the first ten. Of the difference between them is a small area, for it was taught Arjuna stated to Beth Seah exceed seventy cubits and a fraction square by a very small margin. But the sages did not indicate its exact dimensions. And what is the area of the size of two Beth Seah one like that of the courtyard of the tabernacle? Whence is this deduced? Rab Judah replied from Scripture, which said the length of the court shall be a hundred cubits and the breadth fifty. Everywhere the Torah having thus ordained take away fifty and surround with them the other fifty. What, however, is the ordinary meaning of the text? Abay replied, put up the tabernacle at the edge of 50 cubits so that there might be a space of 50 cubits in front of it and one of 20 cubits on every side our Eliza ruled if its length exceeded etc was it not taught however that our Eliza ruled if its length was more than
Dwelling purposes and if the greater part of it is sown with seed it is regarded as a garden and it is forbidden to carry any objects within it but if the greater part of it is planted with trees it is regarded as a courtyard and the movement of objects within it is permitted if the greater part of it is sown etc. Set Arhuna son of Arjashua this applies only where the area sown was bigger than two Beth Sia but one of two Beth Sia is permitted in agreement with whose view is it. In agreement with that of Arsimian for we learned Arsimian rule roofs courtyards and car paths are equally regarded as one domain in respect of carrying from one into another objects that were kept within them when Sabbath began but not in respect of objects that were in the house when the Sabbath began but it may be objected even according to Arsimian since the major part of it was sown with seed would not the minor part Talmud, Mas Irvin lose its own status to the major part and the entire area would thus become a car path that is bigger than two Beth Sia. The movement of objects in which is forbidden the fact however is that if the statement has at all been made it must have been in the following terms but it follows that if its lesser part only was sown the movement of objects within it is permitted said Arhuna son of Arjashua this applies only where the sown area was less than two Beth Sia but if it was two Beth Sia the movement of objects within it. Entire area is forbidden in agreement with whose view in agreement with that of the rabbis are Jeremiah of Divti however taught it on the side of leniency but it follows that if its lesser part only was sown the movement of objects within it is permitted said Arhuna son of Arjashua this applies only where the sown area was no more than two Beth Sia but if it was more than two Beth Sia the movement of objects within it is forbidden in agreement with whose view in agreement with that. Of Arsimian, but if the greater part of it was planted with trees, it is regarded as a courtyard, and the movement of objects within it is permitted. Said Rab Judah in the name of Abami, this is the case only where they are arranged in colonnade formation. But Arnaman said, even if they were not arranged as a colonnade, Marjuda once happened to visit Arhuna Judah when he observed certain trees that were not arranged as a colonnade, and people removing objects between them does not the master. He asked uphold the view of Abami. The other replied, hold the same view as Arnaman. Arnaman laid down in the name of Samuel if a car path that was bigger than two Beth Sia was not originally enclosed for dwelling purposes. How is one to proceed? A breach wider than ten cubits is made in the surrounding fence, and this is fenced up so as to reduce it to ten cubits, and then the movement of objects is permitted. The question was raised, what is the ruling where one cubit with the fence? Was broken down and the same cubit of breach was fenced up and then the next cubit with the fence was broken down and was equally fenced up and so on until the breaking down and the refencing of more than ten cubits with of the fence was completed. This case came the reply is exactly the same in principle as the one about which we learned all levitically defiled wooden utensils of householders become clean if they contain holes of the size of pomegranates and when Hezekiah asked what is the ruling where one made a hole of the size of an olive and stopped it up and then made another hole of the size of an olive and stopped it up and so on until one completed a hole of the size of a pomegranate are Yohanan replied Master you have taught us the case of a sandal for we learned a sandal one of the straps of which was torn off and repaired retains its madras defilement if the second strap was torn off and repaired the sandal becomes free from the madras. Defilement but is unclean on account of its contact with Madras and you ask in connection with this why is it that the absence of the first strap does not affect the status of the sandal obviously because the second strap was then available but then the absence of the second strap also should not affect the status of the sandal since the first was then available and then you explain this to us that in the latter case the object had assumed a new appearance well in this case also. It may be explained that the object had assumed a new appearance and Hezekiah made concerning him the following remark the scholar is no ordinary man or as some say such a scholar is the true type of man are Kahana ruled in an open area that is situated at the back of houses objects may be moved within a distance of four cubits only in connection with this are ruled if a house door was opened out into it the movement of objects is permitted throughout the entire area. Since the door causes it to be a permitted domain this however applies only where the door was made first and the area was enclosed subsequently but not where it was first enclosed and the door was made afterwards where the door was made first and the area was enclosed subsequently is it not obvious that the movement of objects in the area is permitted this ruling was required only in the case where it contained the threshing floor as it might have been assumed that the door was made in order to give access to the threshing floor we were therefore informed that no such assumption is made where a car path whose area exceeded two Beth Sia was originally enclosed for dwelling purposes but was subsequently filled with water the rabbis intended to rule that water is subject to the same law as seed and that movement of objects in the enclosure is therefore forbidden but our Abba the brother of Rab son of our Meshashia said thus we rule in the name of Rabba water is Subject to the same law as plants and the movement of objects within the enclosure is consequently permitted Talmud, Mas Ayurvan Biamimar ruled this applies only to such water as is fit for use but not to such as are unfit for use Arashi ruled even where it is fit for use the ruling applies only where the layer of water does not extend over more than two Beth Sia but if it does extend to more than two Beth Sia the movement of objects within it is forbidden but this is not correct. Since water is in the same category as a heap of fruit there was at Pumnahara a certain open area whose one side opened into an alley in the town and the other side opened into a path between vineyards that terminated at the riverbank house said Abay are we to proceed should we put up for it a reef fence on the riverbank one partition upon another partition surely cannot in such a case usefully be put up and should the shape of a doorway be constructed for it at the entrance to it. Path between the vineyards, the camels coming that way would throw it down. The only procedure, therefore, said Abbe, is this let a side post be put up at the entrance to the path of the vineyards, so that this construction, since it is effective in respect of the path of the vineyards, is also effective in respect of the open area. Said Rabbi to him, would not people infer that a side post is effective in the case of any path among vineyards? Rather, said Rabbi, a side post should be put up at the entrance to the alley, and since the side post is effective in respect of the alley, it is also effective in respect of the open area. Hence, it is permitted to move objects within the alley itself. It is also permitted to move objects within the open area itself. But as regards the moving of objects from the alley into the open space or from the open space into the alley, Araha and Rabbi are at variance. One permits this, and the other permits it. Talmud, Mas Ayurveda, one permits it because in the Open area there are no tenants and the other forbids this because sometimes it may happen that there would be tenants in it and they would still be moving objects from the one into the other if the car path was larger than two Beth Sia and was not enclosed for dwelling purposes and it is desired to reduce the size thereof and if it was affected by means of trees the reduction is invalid if a column ten handbreadths in height and four handbreadths in width was built up it is a valid reduction if the column was less than three handbreadths wide it constitutes no valid reduction if it is between three and four handbreadths wide it is said Rabba valid reduction but Rabba maintained it is no valid reduction Rabba said that it was a valid reduction since such a size is excluded from the law of but Rabba maintained that it was not a valid reduction because so long as it does not cover a space of four handbreadths in width it is of no importance if at a distance. A four handbreadths from the wall of partition was put up the act is legally effective but if the distance was less than three handbreadths the partition is ineffective if the distance was between three and four handbreadths the partition is said rabba effective but rabba maintained it is ineffective rabba said that it was effective since such a distance is excluded from the law but rabba maintained that it was ineffective because so long as it does not extend over four handbreadths it is of no importance Arshim I taught that the discussion related to the more lenient procedure if the fence was smeared with plaster and the layer is so thick that it can stand by itself it constitutes a reduction where it cannot stand by itself it nevertheless said rabba constitutes a reduction but rabba maintained it does not constitute a reduction rabba said that it constituted a reduction because now at any rate it stands rabba maintained that it constituted no Reduction because in view of the fact that it cannot stand by itself it possesses no validity whatsoever if at a distance of four handbreadths from a mound the partition was put up it is effective if however it was put up at a distance of less than three handbreadths from it or was actually put up on the edge of the mound there is a difference of opinion between Arhista and Arham none one holds that this is effective and the other maintains
proselytes land and then another Israelite came and hoed a little the latter does and the former does not acquire possession because at the time the former threw the vegetable seed he did not improve the ground and any eventual improvement came automatically if on the other hand it be suggested that the question arises in respect of the laws of the Sabbath such a partition surely it could be retorted is one that was put up on the Sabbath concerning which it was taught any partition. That is put up on the Sabbath whether unwittingly or presumptuously is regarded as a valid partition has it not however been stated in connection with this ruling that Arnaman ruled this was taught only in respect of throwing but the moving of objects within it is forbidden when Arnaman's statement was made it was in respect of one who acted presumptuously a certain woman once put up a fence on the top of another fence in the estate of a proselyte when a man came and hoed the ground a little the latter then appeared before Arnaman who confirmed it in his possession the woman thereupon came to him and cried what can I do for you he said to her seeing that you did not take possession in the proper way if a carpath was of the size of three beth and one beth was provided with a roof its covered space ruled rabba causes it still to be deemed bigger than two beth but our ruled its covered space does not cause it to be deemed bigger must it be assumed that Rabbah and Arzera differ on the same principle as that on which Rab and Samuel differed for was it not stated if an Exeter was situated in a valley it is Rab ruled permitted to move objects within all its interior but Samuel ruled objects may be moved within four cubits only Rab ruled that it was permitted to move objects in all its interior because we apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up but Samuel ruled that objects may be moved within four cubits only. Because we do not apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up Talmud, Mos Arab and B if the roof over the Beth Sel were made like an Exeter the ruling would indeed have been the same but here we are dealing with one that was made in the shape of a hammock Arzera stated I admit however that where a car path has a gap across its entire width towards a courtyard the movement of objects within it is forbidden what is the reason because the space of the courtyard Increases its extent. Our Joseph demurred does a space from which it is permitted to move objects into it. Cause its prohibition said obey to him in accordance with whose view do you demur? Apparently in accordance with that of our Simeon. But according to our Simeon also there is in fact the space of the position of the walls for our historical. If a gap across the full width of a car path was open towards a courtyard, movement of objects is permitted in the latter and forbidden in the former. Now, why is this permitted in the courtyard? Is it on account of the fact that it has ridges? Does it not, however, sometimes happen that the reverse is the case? Consequently, it must be admitted that the reason is that as regards the car path, the space of the walls increases its extent, while in that of the courtyard, the space of the walls does not increase. In a certain orchard to join the wall of a mansion, when the outer wall of the mansion collapsed, it was our BB's intention to rule that one might. Rely upon the inner walls, but our poppy said to him, Because you are yourselves frail beings, you speak frail words. Those walls were made for the interior of the mansion, they were not made for the orchard outside. The eggs large had a kind of banqueting hall in his orchard. Will the master, he said to our who not behind, and make some provision whereby we might be enabled to dine there tomorrow. The latter accordingly proceeded to construct a passage by putting up a reed fence, fixing each reed within a distance of less than three handbreadths from the other. Rabba, however, went there Talmud, Mos Arab, and pulled them out. And our papa and our who son of our Joshua followed him and picked them up on the following day. However, Rabba raised an objection against Rabba. The Sabbath limits of a new town are measured from its inhabited quarter and of all old one from its town wall. What is meant by a new town and what by an old one? A new town is one that was first surrounded by a wall and Subsequently settled and an old town is one that was first settled and subsequently surrounded by a wall now is not this orchard also like a town that was first surrounded by a wall and subsequently settled our papa also said to Rabba did not RC rule that the screens used by master builders are not valid ones from which it is obvious that as it is put up for the sake of privacy only it is no valid partition now in this case also since the hall was put up for the sake of privacy only its walls cannot be regarded as valid partitions Arhuna son of our Joshua also said to Rabba did not Arhuna rule that a partition that was intended to protect objects put beside it is no valid one for as a matter of fact Rabba Biaboa provided a separate Arab for each row of alleys throughout all Mahuza on account of the cattle ditches that separated one row from another now have not the screens protecting the cattle ditches the same status as a partition intended to protect Objects put beside it, the eggs large thereupon apply to them the scriptural text they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge. Our I stated I heard from our Eliezer even if it is as large as a Bethkor our mission cannot be in agreement with the view of Hanani for it was taught Hanani ruled even if it was as large as 40 Beth Sea as big as a royal rear court and both said our Yohanan based their expositions on the same scriptural text for it is said and it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out of the inner court since it was written the city and we read court it may be inferred that royal rear courts were as big as moderately sized cities on what principle do they differ one master is of the opinion that the extent of moderately sized cities is one Bethkor while the other master holds that their size is that of 40 Sea what however did Isaiah want their Rabbi Barhana replied in the name of our Yohanan this teaches that Hezekiah was Stricken with illness and Isaiah proceeded to hold the college at his door from this it may be inferred that when a scholar falls ill a college is to be held at his door this however is not always the proper course since Satan might thereby be provoked I likewise heard from him that if one of the tenants of a courtyard forgot to join in the air of his house is forbidden did we not however learn his house is forbidden both to him and to them for the taking in or for the taking out of any object. Arhuna son of our Joshua replied in the name of Arshis hate this is no difficulty Talmud, Mas Arabin b one is the ruling of our Eliezer and the other is that of the rabbis and on careful consideration of their statements you will find that according to the view of our Eliezer he who renounces his rights to his courtyard renounces ipso facto his rights to his house also and that according to the rabbis he who renounces his rights to his courtyards does not ipso facto renounce them in respect of his House is not this obvious Reuba replied I and Arhuna behind and explained that it was necessary only in respect of five persons who lived in one courtyard and one of them forgot to join in the Arab according to the ruling of our Eliezer this man when he renounces his right need not renounce it specifically in favor of every one of the tenants but according to the rabbis the man who renounces his rights must do so specifically in favor of every one of the tenants in accordance with whose view is that which was taught if five persons live in one courtyard and one of them forgot to join in the Arab with the others he when renouncing his right need not do it specifically in favor of every one of the tenants individually in accordance with whose view you ask in accordance of course with that of our Eliezer our Kahana taught in the matter just stated our Tabiomi taught as follows in accordance with whose view is that which was taught if five persons live in one courtyard and one of then forgot to join in the Arab with the others he when renouncing his rights need not do it specifically in favor of everyone individually in accordance with whose view I ask is this ruling said Arhuna be Judah in the name of Arshis hate in accordance with whose view you ask in accordance with that of our Eliezer said our Papa Juhabe what is the ruling according to our Eliezer if a tenant explicitly stated I do not renounce my right in my house and according to the rabbis if he explicitly stated I renounce my right in my house is our Eliezer's reason based on the view that any tenant who renounces his right in his courtyard renounces ipso facto his right to his house and the ruling consequently would not apply here since that man explicitly stated I do not renounce my right or is it possible that our Eliezer's reason is that people do not live in a house without a courtyard and consequently even where a man states I do not renounce my right in my house is Declaration may be disregarded so that though he said I would live in the house alone his statement is null and void and what is the ruling according to the rabbis if he explicitly stated I renounce my right is the rabbis reason the view that a man who renounces his right in his courtyard does not ipso facto renounce his right to his house and their ruling consequently would not apply here since this man specifically declared I renounce my right or is it possible that the rabbis reason is that it is not usual for a man to give up completely his house and his courtyard and thus become a mere stranger as far as these are concerned and their ruling would therefore apply here also because though this man stated I renounce my right his declaration is to be disregarded the other replied both according to the rabbis and according
To the following all positive precepts the observance of which is dependent on the time of the day or the year are incumbent upon men only and women are free but those which are not dependent on the time of the day or of the year are incumbent upon both men and women now is it a general rule that all precepts the observance of which depends on a certain time are not incumbent upon women behold the precepts of unleavened bread rejoicing on the festival and assembly each of which is a Positive precept the observance of which is dependent on a certain specified time and are nevertheless incumbent upon women furthermore are women liable to perform every positive precept the performance of which is not dependent on a specified time are there not in fact the precepts of the study of the Torah propagation of the race and redemption of the sun each of which is a positive precept the observance of which is not dependent on any specified time and women are nevertheless exempt. From their observance the fact however is explained at Yohanan that no inference may be drawn from general rulings even where an exception was actually specified Abbe or as some say our Jeremiah remarked we also learned the mission to the same effect they furthermore land down another general rule is all that is born above is Ab is levitically unclean but all on which is Ab is born is clean except that which is suitable for lying or sitting upon and a human being now is there no other. Exception is there not in fact that which is suitable for writing upon what is one to understand by that which is suitable for writing upon if it is that on which the Zab sat then it may be retorted is it not exactly in the same category as a seat it is this that we mean is there not the upper part of a saddle concerning which it was taught a saddle is levitically unclean as a seat and its handle is unclean as a writing means consequently it may be deduced that no inference may be drawn. From general rulings even where an exception has been actually specified Rubin or as some say our nomin remarked we also learn to the same effect with all kinds of food may herb or should not be affected except water and salt now is there no other exception is there not in fact that of morels and truffles consequently it may be deduced that no inference may be drawn from general rulings even where an exception was actually specified so also may all kinds of foodstuffs be purchased with. Money of the second tithe, etc. Our Eliezer and our Jose B. had in a different one applied the following limitation to Arab and the other applied it to the second tithe. One applied the following limitation to Arab, thus the ruling that no Arab may be prepared from water and salt was taught only in respect of water by itself or salt by itself, but from water and salt that were mingled together an Arab may well be prepared, and the other applied it to the second tithe, thus the ruling that no water or salt may be purchased with money of the second tithe was taught only in respect of water by itself or salt by itself, but water and salt that were mingled together may well be purchased with money of the second tithe. He who applied the limitation to tithe applies it with more reason to Arab. He, however, who applied it to Arab does not apply it to tithe. What is the reason? Because a kind of produce is required when our Isaac came, he applied the limitation to tithe and objection. Was raised at Judah Begadish testified before our Eliezer my father's household used to buy brine with money of the second tithe when the other asked him is it not possible that you heard this in that case only where it was mixed up with entrails of fish and furthermore did not even our Judah Begadish himself maintain his view in the case of brine only since it contains some fat of produce but not in that of pure water and salt it Joseph replied Talmud, Mas Irvin B Talmud, Mas Irvin B. That refers only to a case where oil was mixed with them said Abbe to him in that case might not the ruling be obvious on account of the oil the ruling was necessary in that case only where one covered the cost of the water and the salt by paying an inclusive price for the oil but is this permissible by paying an inclusive price yes and so it was in fact top and bag bag rule for oxen teaches that an ox may be purchased together with its skin or for sheep teaches that a sheep may be. Bought together with its wool or for wine teaches that wine may be bought together with its jar or for strong drink teaches that tomat may be purchased after its fermentation said Aryohan and should any person explain to me the necessity for the expression of four oxen in accordance with the view of Ben Bagbag would carry his clothes after him into the bathhouse what is the reason because all the other expressions were required with the exception of four oxen which is quite unnecessary what is the purpose for which the others were required if the all-merciful had written only for oxen it might have been assumed that only an ox may be purchased together with its skin because it is a part of its body but not a sheep together with its wool which is not a part of its body and if the all-merciful had only written for sheep to teach us that a sheep may be bought together with its wool it might have been assumed that this only is permitted because the wool clings to its body. But not the purchase of wine together with its cask and had the all merciful written for wine it might have been assumed that the purchase of its jar only is permitted because it is in this way only that it can be preserved but not to met after its fermentation which is a mere liquid acid and if the all merciful had written for strong drinks it might have been assumed that by strong drink was meant the purchase of the pressed fig cakes of kilo which are a fruit but not wine with its jar and if the all merciful had written wine to indicate that it may be purchased together with its jar it might have been assumed that the purchase of its jar only is permitted since in this way only it can be preserved but not a sheep together with its wool hence did the all merciful write sheep to indicate that it may be bought even together with its wool what however was the need for the expression of oxen and should you reply that if the all merciful had not written for oxen it might have been assumed that a sheep may be bought together with its skin but not together with its wool and that the all merciful has therefore written for oxen to include its skin so that sheep remains superfluous in order to include its wool it could be retorted that even if the all merciful had not written oxen no one would have suggested that a sheep may be bought only together with its skin but not together with its wool for if that were so the all merciful should have written oxen so that sheep would for this reason have remained superfluous now since the all merciful did write sheep to indicate obviously that it may be purchased even together with its wool the question arises again what need was there for the expression of for oxen if it may be argued a sheep may be bought together with its wool was there any need to state that an ox may be bought together with its skin it is this line of reasoning that was followed when Aryohan and San should any person Explain to me the necessity for the expression of four oxen in accordance with the view of Ben Bagbag. I would carry his clothes after him into the bathhouse. On what principle do Arjuna Begadish and Arlizer and the following tannas differ? Arjuna Begadish and Arlizer base their expositions on the hermeneutic rules of amplification and limitation, while those tannas base their expositions on the hermeneutic rules of general statements and specific details. Arjuna Begadish and Arlizer base their expositions on the hermeneutic rules of amplification and limitation. Thus, and thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul desireth is an amplification for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink is a limitation or for whatsoever thy soul asketh of thee is again an amplification. Now, since scripture has amplified, limited, and amplified again, it has thereby included all what has it included, it included all things, and what has it excluded according to our. Eliza it excluded brine according to our Judah Begadish it excluded water and salt while those tannas base their expositions on the hermeneutic rules of general statements and specific details for it was taught and thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul desireth is a general statement for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink is a specification or for whatsoever thy soul asketh of thee is again a general statement now where a general statement a specification and a general statement follow each other in succession you may include only such things as are similar to those in the specification as the specification explicitly mentions things that are the produce of produce that derive their nourishment from the earth so you may include all other things that are the produce of produce that derive their nourishment from the earth another berry however taught as the specification mentions explicitly things that are produce of the products of it. Earth so you may include all produce that was of the products of the earth what is the practical difference between these Abbe replied the practical difference between them is the question of including fish according to him who holds that the things included must be the produce of produce that derive their nourishment from the earth fish also may be included since they derive their nourishment from the earth according to him however who maintains that the things included must be produce of the produce of the earth fish are excluded since they were created from the water but could Abbe maintain that fish derive their nourishment from the earth seeing that he ruled Talmud, Mas Arab and Ava man ate an eel he technically incurs flogging on four counts if an ant on five counts if a hornet on six counts now if that statement is authentic should not one eating an eel also be flogged on account of the prohibition against the creeping thing that creepeth upon it. Earth rather replied Robin of the practical difference between them is the question of including birds according to him who holds that the things included must be the produce
Respects he, however, who excludes birds is of the opinion that a first generalization is for principal consideration, hence the proposition is in the form of a generalization and a specification in which case the generalization does not cover more than what was enumerated in the specification, consequently it is only these that are included but no other things, while the second generalization has the effect of including all things that are similar to it in three respects, Rab Judah ruled in. The name of our Samuel B. Shalath who had it from Rab and Arab may be prepared with Cress Perslin and Melilot but not with Lycan or Unruck dates is it however permitted to prepare an Arab with Melilot seeing that it was taught those who have many children may eat Melilot but those who have no children must not eat it and if it was hardened into seed even those who have many children should not eat it explain it to refer to Melilot that was not hardened into seed and that is used for people who have many children and if you prefer I might say it may in fact refer to people who have no children the use of the plant nevertheless being permitted because it is fit for consumption by those who have many children for have we not learned an Arab may be prepared for a Nazirite with one and for an Israelite with Terima from which it is evident that certain foodstuffs may be used for an Arab because through they are unsuitable for one person they are suitable for another so also here. It may be held that though the melilot is not suitable for one, it is suitable for another, and if you prefer, I might reply when Rab made his statement, he referred to the median melilot, but is it not permitted to prepare an Arab from lichen? Has not Rab Judah in fact stated in the name of Rab an Arab may be prepared from cuscuta or lichen, and the benediction of blessed art thou who create the fruit of the ground is to be pronounced over them. Underscore this is no difficulty, the one ruling was made before Rab came to Babylon, while the other was made after he came to Babylon is Babylon. However, the greater part of the world was it not in fact taught if a man sowed beans, barley, or fenugreek to use as a herb, his wishes disregarded in view of the general practice, hence it is a seed that is subject to tithe, but its herb is exempt. Pepperwood or garden rocket that was sown with the intention of using it as a herb must be tithe as herb and as seed if it was sown to be used as seed. It must be tithed as seed and as herb. Rab spoke only Talmud, Moss, Arab, and B of those that grow in house gardens. What is garden rocket suitable for our Yohan? And replied the ancients who had no pepper crushed it and dipped in it their roasted meat. Our zero when he felt fatigued from study used to go and sit down at the door of the school of our Judah. B. Am I saying as the rabbis go in and out? I shall rise up before them and so receive reward for honoring them. On one occasion, a young school child came out. What he asked him, Did your master teach you that the benediction for Cuscuta? The other replied, Is blessed who creates the fruit of the ground and that for lichen is blessed by whose word all things were made. On the contrary, he said to him, Logically, the benediction should be reversed since the latter derives its nourishment from the earth while the former derives it from the air. The law, however, is in agreement with the school child. What is the reason the former? Is the ripened fruit while the latter is not the ripened fruit, and as to your objection that the latter derives its nourishment from the earth while the former derives it from the air, the fact is that in reality this is not the case. Cuscuta also derives its nourishment from the earth, for we may observe that when the shrub is cut off, the cuscuta dies. But is it not permissible to prepare an Arab from unruck dates? Was it not in fact taught the white heart of the palm may be purchased with second tithe money, but is not susceptible to food defilement? Unruck dates, however, may be purchased with second tithe money, and they are also susceptible to food defilement. Our Judah ruled the white heart of the palm is treated as wood in all respects, except that it may be purchased with second tithe money, while unruck dates are treated as fruit in all respects, except that they are exempt from the second tithe. There, the reference is to stunted dates. If so, would our Judah in this case rule? They are exempt from second tithe. Was it not in fact taught our Judah and the stunted figs of Bethania were mentioned only in connection with second tithe alone? The stunted figs of Bethania and the unruck dates of Tobinah are subject to the obligation of the second tithe. The fact, however, is that the very decided does not refer to stunted dates, but the law in respect of food defilement is different from other laws, as it Yohanan explained elsewhere, because one can make them sweet by keeping them near the fire. So here also it may be explained, because one can make them sweet by keeping them near the fire. And where was the statement of our Yohanan made in connection with the following? For it was taught bitter almonds when small are subject to the second tithe, and when big are exempt, but sweet almonds are subject to the second tithe. When big and exempt, when small are Simeon, son of our Jose, ruled in the name of his father, both are exempt, or as others read, both are. Subject to the second tithe said our ILA our gave a decision at Sephori's in agreement with him who ruled both are exempt according to him however who ruled both are subject to the second tithe what it may be asked are they suitable for to this at Yohanan replied they may be regarded as proper food because they can be rendered sweet by keeping them near the fire the master said our Judah ruled the white heart of the palm is treated as wood in all respects except that it may be purchased with second tithe money is not this ruling exactly the same as that of the first ten Abbe replied the practical difference between them is the case where one boiled or fried in Robert Demert is there at all any authority who maintains that such a commodity even when boiled or fried does not assume the character of food was it not in fact taught a skin and a placenta are not susceptible to the defilement of food but a skin that was boiled and a placenta that one intended to boil are susceptible to food defilement rather said Robert the practical difference between them is the form of the benediction for it was stated the benediction for the white heart of the palm is our Judah ruled who creates the fruit of the ground and Samuel ruled by whose word all things were made our Judah ruled who creates the fruit of the ground because it is a food stuff and Samuel ruled by whose word all things were made because in consideration of the fact that it would eventually be hardened the benediction of who creates the fruit of the ground cannot be pronounced over it said Samuel to our Judah shine and logical reasoning is on your side for there is a case of radish which is eventually hardened and yet the benediction of who creates the fruit of the ground is pronounced over it this argument however is not conclusive since people plant radish with the intention of eating it while soft but no palm tree is planted with the intention of eating its white. Heart and consequently, although Samuel complimented our Judah, the law is in agreement with Samuel to turn to the main text. Our Judah stated in the name of Rabban Arab may be prepared from Cuscuta or Lycan, and the benediction of blessed art thou who creates the fruit of the ground is to be pronounced over them with what quantity of Cuscuta as our Yediel said in for a handful, so is it here also a handful with what quantity of Lycan Rabbi B. Tobi replied in the name of our Isaac who had it. From Rab as much as the contents of farmers' bundles are Hilkiah B. Tobi ruled in Arab may be prepared from Kalia from Kalia could such a notion be entertained say rather with the herb from which Kalia is obtained and what must be the quantity our Yediel replied a handful our Jeremiah once went on a tour to the country towns when he was asked whether it was permissible to prepare an Arab with green beans but he did not know what the answer was when he later came to the schoolhouse he was. Told thus ruled our Jenna it is permitted to prepare an Arab from green beans and what must be its quantity our Yediel replied a handful our Hamna ruled an Arab may be prepared from raw beet but this is not so seeing that our Histad in fact stated raw beet kills a healthy man Talmud, Moss Arabina that refers to beet that was only partially cooked there are others who read our Hamna ruled no Arab may be prepared from raw beet for our Histad stated raw beet kills a healthy man do we not see. However that people do eat such beet and yet do not die there it is case of beet that was only partly cooked our Histad stated a dish of beet is beneficial for the heart and good for the eyes and even more so for the bowels Abbe added this applies only to such beet that remained on the stove until it was thoroughly cooked Rabba once said I am today in the condition of Benaze in the markets of Tiberias and one of the younger rabbis to him with what quantity of apples may an Arab be. Prepared is it permissible the other replied to prepare an Arab from apples is it not permitted have we not in fact learned all kinds of food may be combined to make up the prescribed quantity of half of a half loaf in respect of rendering the body unfit or to make up the quantity of food for two meals required for an Arab or the size of an egg in respect of imparting food defilement run what objection is this if it be contended because it was stated all kinds of food and these also are eatable surely it could be retorted did not our Yohan lay down that no inference may be drawn from general rulings even where an exception was been specified the objection rather is because it was stated or to make up the qu
ruled the quantities given must consist of so much food as would enable the recipient to sell them and buy with their proceeds food for two meals and it was in connection with this mission that Rav stated that the same quantities were also applicable in the case of an Arab on what ground however is preference given to the one rather than to the other if it be suggested because in the very the spices were mentioned and spices are not eatables it might be retorted are not wheat and barley mentioned in the mission though they also are not eatables the ground rather is this because in the mission half a log of wine was mentioned and Rav has landed down that an Arab may be prepared with two quarters of a log of wine it may be concluded that when Rav said and the same quantities were also applicable to an Arab he must have been referring to this mission this is conclusive the master said or to make up the quantity of food for two meals required for an Arab or Joseph Intended to lay down that no Arab may be prepared unless there is sufficient food of each kind to provide for a complete meal. But Rabbi said to him, even if each kind of food consisted only of a half a third or a quarter of a meal, to revert to the main text, Rabbi has landed down that an Arab may be prepared with two quarters of a log of wine. But do we require so much? Was it not in fact taught our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled wine for an Arab must suffice for soaking in it the bread, vinegar must suffice to dip in it the meat, and olives and onions must suffice to provide a relish for the bread for two meals. There the reference is to boiled wine. The master said vinegar must suffice to dip in it the meat, sand argital in the name of Rabbi must suffice to dip in it the food of two meals of vegetables. Others read argital said in the name of Rabbi must suffice to dip in it a quantity of vegetables consumed in the course of two meals. The master said olives and onions must suffice. To provide a relish for bread for two meals is it however permitted to prepare all Arab from onions was it not in fact taught our Simeon B. Eliezer stated our mayor once spent the Sabbath Ardeska when a certain man appeared before him and said to him Master I have prepared an Arab from onions to enable me to walk to Tiffin and our mayor ordered him to remain within his four cubits this is no difficulty since one ruling deals with the leaves while the other refers to the bulbs for it was taught if a man ate an onion and was found dead early on the following morning there is no need to ask what was the cause of his death and in connection with the Samuel stated this was taught in respect of the leaves only but against the eating of the bulbs there called be no objection and even regarding the leaves this has been said only Talmud, Mas Arab and B where the onion has not grown to the length of a span but where it has grown to that length there can be no objection our Papa said this has been said only where one drank no beer with them but where one did drink some beer there can be no danger our rabbis taught no one should eat onion on account of the poisonous fluid it contains and it once happened that our Hannah ate half an onion and half of its poisonous fluid and became so ill that he was on the point of dying his colleagues however begged for heavenly mercy and he recovered because his contemporaries needed him our zero laid down in the name of Samuel from beer in Arab may be prepared and if it consists of a quantity of three log it renders a ritual bath ineffectual our Kahana demur is not this obvious for what difference is there in this respect between it and dye water concerning which we learned our Jose ruled dye water of a quantity of three log renders a ritual bath ineffectual it may be replied there the liquid is called dye water but here it is called beer and with what quantity of beer may an Arab be prepared our Ahasan of our Joseph proposed to say before our Joseph with two quarters of beer as we learned if a man carries out wine he incurs guilt if its quantity was sufficient for mixing the cup and in connection with this it was taught it must be sufficient for mixing a handsome cup what is meant by a handsome cup the cup of benediction and our nomin stated in the name of Rabbi Abba the cup of benediction must contain a quarter of a quarter so that when one dilutes it it consists of a quarter this being in agreement with Rabbi who land down that any wine which cannot stand an admixture of three parts of water to one of wine is no proper wine and in the final clause it was stated and in the case of any other liquids the prescribed quantity is a quarter and in that of any liquid refuse it is also a quarter now since there the quantities prescribed are four to one so here also the quantity prescribed should be four to one the ruling however is not so there the reason is that less than that quantity is of no importance but here this does not apply for it is usual for people to drink one cup in the morning and another in the evening and to rely upon these as their meals with how much dates may an Arab be prepared our Joseph replied with one cap sand our Joseph wants to derive this from what was taught if a man consumed unwittingly dry figs and paid for them with dates may a blessing come upon him how is this repayment to be understood if it be suggested to be one corresponding to the value of the figs is that he ate of the priest's figs the value of one zoos and repays him for a dates for a zoos why it may be asked should a blessing come upon him seeing that he consumed the value of a zoos and repays only the value of a zoos must it not then be concluded that this repayment corresponded in quantity is that he ate a gripe of the priest's dry figs that was worth one zoos and repaid him a gripe of dates that was worth four zoos and because of this it was Stated may a blessing come upon him thus it clearly follows that dates are more valuable said Abay to him as a matter of fact the man may have consumed the priest's fix for Azus and repaid him dates for it and in reply to your objection why should a blessing come upon him because he consumed from the priest something which is not much in demand and repaid him with something for which there is a big demand what quantity is required in the case of Shadi Tharaha B. Finay has replied. Two ladles full of roasted ears Abay replied two pomodai and handfuls Abay stated nurse told me that roasted ears are beneficial to the heart and they banish morbid thought Abay further stated nurse told me if a man suffers from weakness of the heart let him fetch the flesh of the right flank of a male beast and excrements of cattle cast in the month of Nisan and if excrements of cattle are not available let him fetch some willow twigs and let him roast it eat it and after that drink some. Diluted wine Rav Judah stated in the name of Samuel any relish must consist of a quantity that is sufficient to eat with it a quantity of bread for two meals but any food stuff that is no relish must consist of a quantity sufficient in itself for two meals raw meat also must consist of a quantity sufficient for two meals as to roasted meat Rav ruled that it must be sufficient to eat with it a quantity of bread required for two meals and our Joseph ruled it must be sufficient in itself for two meals when said our Joseph do I derive this from the practice of the Persians who eat chunks of roasted meat without bread said Abay to him are the Persians a majority of the world was it not in fact taught the webs of the poor are susceptible to uncleanness in the case of the poor and the webs of the rich are susceptible to uncleanness even in the case of the rich Talmud Mas Arabin, but it is not necessary is it in the case of the poor that the webs shall be of it Size of those of the rich and should you reply that in both cases the more restrictive rulings were adopted was it not in fact taught it could be retorted our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled an Arab may be prepared for a sick or an old man with a quantity of food that is sufficient for him for two meals and for a glutton with food for two meals each being a moderate meal for the average man this is a difficulty but could our Simeon B. Eliezer have given such rulings was it not in fact taught our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled the door for our king of Bashan must be as big as his full size and have a what could one do there should it be cut to pieces and carried out that way the question was raised do the rabbis differ from our Simeon B. Eliezer or not come and hear what Rabbi B. has stated in the name of our Yohan and the door of our king of Bashan is to be forehand breads why this however is no conclusive proof since there it may be a case where there were many small doors and only one of them was forehand bread wide so that it is certain that when widening would take place it would be in that door our high b r ashi ruled in the name of rabbin arab may be prepared from raw meat our shai my b high ruled in arab may be prepared from raw eggs with how many are nam and b isaac replied the well read scholar ruled the number to be two if a man vowed to abstain from food he is allowed to consume both water etc apparently it is only salt and water that are not described as proper food but all other things consumed are described as proper food must it then be assumed that this presents an objection against rab and samuel both of whom had ruled that the benediction of who created various kinds of food is to be pronounced over the five kinds of grain alone but were not their rulings already once refuted the question is must it be said that they stand refuted from this mission also our who replied our mission may deal with the case of a man who settled that nourishes shall be forbidden by a vow upon me but is it only water and salt that do not nourish and all other foodstuffs do nourish did not rabbi be barhan early when we followed our yohan and to partake of the fruit of genesis we used each to take ten
For him because no Arab may be prepared from consecrated food let a distinction be pointed out in this very case thus this applies only where he said I swear that I will not eat this loaf but if he said this loaf shall be forbidden to me no Arab from it may be prepared for him or who not can answer you what then would you suggest that whenever a man said this loaf shall be forbidden to me an Arab from it may be prepared for him would not then a difficulty arise from the first. Clause a clause is missing and this is a correct reading if a man vowed to have no benefit from a loaf and Arab from it may be prepared for him and even if he said this loaf shall be forbidden to me it is the same as if he had said I take an oath that I shall not taste it at all events does not the contradiction against Arhuna remain he upholds the same view as our Eliza for it was taught our Eliza ruled if a man said I take all oath that I would not eat this loaf and Arab from it may be prepared for him but if he said this loaf shall be forbidden to me no Arab from it may be prepared for him but could our Eliza have given such a ruling was it not in fact taught this is the general rule if a man imposed upon himself the prohibition of a certain food an Arab from it may be prepared for him but if a certain food was forbidden to a man no Arab from it may be prepared for him our Eliza ruled if the man said this loaf shall be forbidden to me an Arab from it may be Prepared for him, but if he said this loaf shall be consecrated, no Arab from it may be prepared for him, because no Arab may be prepared from consecrated food. The two rulings represent the views of two tannis who differ as to what was the view of our Eliza. An Arab may be prepared for a Nazirite with wine, etc. Our mission does not represent the view of Beth Shammai, for it was taught Beth Shammai ruled no Arab may be prepared for a Nazirite with wine or for an Israelite with Teramah and Beth. Hillel ruled an Arab may be prepared for a Nazirite with wine or for an Israelite with Teramah and Beth. Hillel to Beth Shammai, do you not admit Talmud, Mas Arab, and be that an Arab may be prepared for an adult in connection with the Day of Atonement. Indeed, we do the others replied as the former said to them, an Arab may be prepared for an adult in connection with the Day of Atonement. So may an Arab be prepared for a Nazirite with wine or for an Israelite with Teramah and Beth Shammai. There. Meal is available that is fit for consumption while it is yet day, but here no meal is available that is fit for consumption while it is yet day in agreement with whom not in agreement with Hanani, for it was taught Hanani stated Beth Shammai did not admit the very principle of Arab unless the man takes out thither his bed and all the objects he uses whose view is followed by the very in which it was taught if a man prepared an Arab while he was dressed in black he must not go out. In white if he was then dressed in white he must not go out in black whose view it is asked is this Arnam and B. Isaac replied it is that of Hanani in accordance with the view of Beth Shammai according to Hanani however is it only in black that he must not go out but may go out in white did he not in fact rule that an Arab is invalid unless the man takes out thither his bed and all the objects he uses it is this that was meant if he prepared an Arab while he was dressed in white. And then required black he must not go out even in white in agreement with whom is this ruling Arnam and B. Isaac replied it is in agreement with that of Hanani in accordance with the view of Beth Shammai Simicus ruled with unconsecrated produce but against the ruling that an Arab may be prepared for a Nazi right with wine he does not contend what is the reason is it because it is possible that he might ask to be released from his Nazi rightship but if so is it not equally possible for him to ask for the release of the Teramah were he to ask for its release it would return to its state of people but he could still set aside the priestly dues for it from some other produce fellows are not suspected of setting aside Teramah from produce that is not in close proximity to the produce for which it is set aside but he can still set aside the Teramah for it from the very Arab itself this is a case where it would not contain the prescribed quantity but why the certainty this rather is the reply Simicus holds the same opinion as the rabbis who had land down that every kind of occupation that may be classed as Shabbat has as a preventive measure been forbidden on the Sabbath eve at twilight whose view is followed in what we learn there are some measures which the rabbis have prescribed in accordance with each individual e.g. his handful of the meal offering his handful of incense the drinking of a mouthful on the day of atonement and the requirement of food sufficient for two meals in the case of an Arab in agreement with whose view it is asked is this mission error replied it is in agreement with that of Simicus who had land down that the food for an Arab must be such as is fit for the person for whom it is prepared must it be assumed that this mission differs from the view of Arsimian B. Eliezer it having been taught Arsimian B. Eliezer ruled an Arab for a sick or for an old man is to consist of food sufficient for him for Two meals and for a glutton each of the two meals is to consist of a moderate meal for an average man. The explanation is that the mission refers to a sick and an old man but not to a glutton whose habit is disregarded in the view of the average man. An Arab may be prepared for a priest in the Beth Paris for Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel. A man may blow away the earth of Beth Paris and continue on his way. Our Judah B. M. I ruled in the name of Rab Judah. Trotten Beth Paris is. Levitically clean. Our Judah ruled even in a graveyard a tanned top because a man can put up a screen and pass through it in a chest box or portable turret. He is of the opinion that a movable tent has the status of a fixed tent and they differ on a principle which is the subject of dispute among the following tennis for it was taught if a man enters a heathen country riding in a chest box or portable turret. He is Rabbi ruled Levitically unclean but our Jose son of our Judah declares him to. Be clean on what principle do they differ? One master is of the opinion that a movable tent has not the status of a valid tent, and the other master maintains that even a movable tent has the status of a valid tent. It was taught our Judah rule Talmud, Mas Arab and an Arab for a Levitically clean priest may be prepared from Levitically clean terima and deposited on a grave. How does he get there in a chest box or portable turret? But since the Arab was put down on the grave, it became Levitically unclean. This is a case where the Arab was not rendered susceptible to Levitical uncleanness or one needed in fruit juice, but how does he get it by means of flat wooden pieces which are unsusceptible to Levitical uncleanness? But does not a wooden piece constitute a tent? One might carry it edgeways. If so, what could be the reason of the rabbis? They are of the opinion that a home must not be acquired with things the benefit of which is forbidden. Thus it follows that our Judah is of the opinion that this is permitted for he upholds the view that the commandments were not given to men to derive personal benefit from them with reference however to what Rabbah stated commandments were not given to men to derive benefit from them must it be said that he made his traditional statement in agreement with one of the ten is only Rabbah can answer you had they been of the opinion that an Arab may be provided in connection with a religious duty only all would have been unanimous since commandments were not given to men to derive benefit from them here however they differ on the following principle the master is of the opinion that an Arab may be prepared in connection with a religious duty only and the masters are of the opinion that an Arab may be prepared even in connection with a secular matter in respect however of what our Joseph ruled an Arab may be prepared only in connection with a religious duty must it be said that he land down his traditional Ruling in accordance with the view of one of the tenets are Joseph call answer you all agree that an Arab may be prepared in connection with a religious duty only and all may also agree that the commandments were not given to men to derive benefit from them but it is this principle on which they differ the master is of the opinion that once a man has acquired the Arab it is no satisfaction to him that it is preserved and the masters are of the opinion that a man does derive satisfaction. If his Arab is preserved for in that case he can eat it whenever he needs admission an Arab may be prepared with dime with first tithe from which its terima had been taken and with second tithe and consecrated food that have been redeemed and priests may prepare their Arab with hell it may not be prepared however with tibal nor with first tithe the terima from which has not been taken nor with second tithe or consecrated food that have not been redeemed tomorrow dime surely is. Not fit for him since he could if he wished declare his estate to be Hefker and thereby become a poor man when it would be fit for him it is now also deemed to be fit for him for we learned it is permitted to feed poor men Talmud, Mas Arab and B and billeted troops with Dimei Arhuna stated one top Beth Shammai ruled poor men may not be fed with Dimei and Beth Hillel ruled poor men may be fed with Dimei and with first tithe from which its terima had been taken etc. is not this obvious. The ruling was required in the case only where the Levi forestalled the priest whilst the grain was still in the ears and from his first tithe was taken terima of the tithe but no terima G
Unperforated pot nor with first tie the terima from which has not been taken is not this obvious this was necessary in such a case only where the Levi forced all the priest in taking his due when the grain was already in the pile and terima of the tithe was taken from it while terima idola was not taken from it it might consequently have been assumed that the ruling is as our papa submitted to have a hence we were informed that the ruling is in agreement with the latter's reply. Nor with second tithe and consecrated food that have not been redeemed is not this obvious the ruling was required in that case only where they were redeemed but their redemption was not performed in the prescribed manner where the tithe for instance was redeemed with a piece of unco and metal whereas the all merciful ordained and thou shalt bind up the money implying that the metal must be coined and where the consecrated food was exchanged for a plot of land whereas the all Merciful ordained and he shall give the money and it should be assured for him mission if a man sends his Arab by the hand of a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor or by the hand of one who does not admit the principle of Arab the Arab is not valid if however he instructed another person to receive it from him the Arab is valid Gemara is not a minor qualified to prepare an Arab did not are who not in fact rule a minor may collect the footstuffs for the Arab this is no difficulty since the former refers to an Arab of boundaries while the latter deals with an Arab of courtyards or by the hand of one who does not admit the principle of Arab who are his to reply to Samaritan if however he instructed another person to receive it from him the Arab is valid but is there no need to provide against the possibility that the minor might not carry it to him as are his to explained elsewhere where the sender stands and watches him here also it may be explained where he stands and watches him. But is there no need to provide against the possibility that the agent would not accept it from him as Ariel explained elsewhere it is a legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission so here also it may be explained it is a legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission where were the statements of Arhista and Ariel made in connection with the following for it was taught if he gave it to a trained elephant who carried it or to a trained ape who carried it the Arab is invalid but if he instructed someone to receive it from the animal behold the Arab is valid now is it not possible that it would not carry it Arhista replied this is a case where the sender stands and watches it but is it not possible that the agent would not accept it from the animal Ariel replied it is a legal presumption that all agent carries out his mission Arnaman ruled in respect of the law of the Torah there is no legal presumption that all agent carries out his Mission Talmud, Mas Ayurvan in respect of the law of the scribes there is a legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission Arshis hate however ruled in respect of the one as in that of the other there is a legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission when said Arshis hate do I derive this from what we learned as soon as the Omer had been offered the new produce is forthwith permitted and those who live at a distance bear permitted its use from midday onwards now the prohibition against the consumption of new produce is pentacle and yet it was stated that those who live at a distance are permitted its use from midday onwards is not this due to the legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission and Arnaman there the presumption is justified for the reason stated because it is known that Bethin would not shirk their duty others there are who read Arnaman said once do I derive this since the reason stated was because it is known. That Bethdin would not shirk their duty, it follows that it is only Bethdin who do not shirk their duty, but that an ordinary agent might and Arshis hate he can answer you Bethdin are presumed to have carried out their duty by midday while an ordinary agent is presumed to have done his before all the day has passed said Arshis hate once do I derive this from what was taught a woman who is under the obligation of bringing an offering in connection with the birth or Ganaroya brings. The required sum of money which she puts into the collecting box performs ritual immersion and is permitted to eat consecrated food in the evening. Now what is the reason is it not because we hold that it is a legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission and Arnaman there the presumption may be justified in agreement with the view of Arshimeh for Arshimeh laid down there is a legal presumption that no Bethdin a priest who would rise from their session before all the money. In the collecting box had been spent Arshis hate again said once do I derive this from what was taught if a man said to another go out and gather for yourself some figs from my fig tree the latter may make of them an irregular meal or he must tie them as produce that is known to be untithed if however the owner said to him fill yourself this basket with figs from my tree the latter may eat them as an irregular meal or must tie them as dimay this applies only to an owner who was an amhyaras but if he was a fellow the latter may eat the fruit and need not tie them so Rabbi Arsimi and Begamaliel however ruled this applies only to an owner and amhyaras but if he was a fellow the latter must not eat the figs before he has tied them because fellows are not suspected of giving terima from produce that is not in close proximity to the produce for which it is given my view remark Rabbi seems to be more acceptable than that of my father since it is Preferable that fellows should be suspected of giving terima from produce that is not in close proximity with that for which it is given than that they should give amhyaras to eat all sorts of people now their dispute extends only so far that while one master maintains that they are not suspected but both agree that there is legal presumption that an agent carries out his mission and are nominated the presumption is justified in agreement with the principle of our Hannah Hosea. For our Hannah Hosea laid down it is a legal presumption that a fellow would not allow any unprepared thing to pass out of his hand the master said this applies only to an owner who was an amhyaras but if he was a fellow the latter may eat the fruit and need not tie them so rabbi to whom could this amhyaras have been speaking if it be suggested that he was speaking to an amhyaras like himself what sense is there in the ruling must tie them as dime would he obey it? Consequently, it must be a case where an Amhyaras was speaking to a fellow now. Then read the final clause. My view seems to be more acceptable than that of my father, since it is preferable that fellows should be suspected of giving terima from produce that is not in close proximity with that for which it is given than that they should give Amhyaras to eat all sorts of people. How does the question of Amhyaras at all arise? Rubin replied, The first clause deals with an Amhyaras who was speaking to a fellow, and the final clause deals with a fellow who was speaking to all Amhyaras while another fellow was listening to the conversation. Rabbi Talmud, Mas Arab and B is of the opinion that that fellow may eat the fruit and need not tithe it because it is certain that the first fellow had duly given the tithe for it, while Arsimian B. Gamaliel ruled that he must not eat the fruit before he tithe it because fellows are not suspected of giving terima from produce that. Is not in close proximity to that for which it is given. Thereupon, Rabbi said to him, It is preferable that fellows should be suspected of giving terima from produce that is not in close proximity with that for which it is given than that they should give amhyaras to eat all sorts of people. On what principle do they differ? Rabbi holds that a fellow is satisfied to commit a minor ritual offense in order that an amhyaras should not commit a major one, while our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that a fellow prefers the amhyaras to commit a major ritual offense rather than that he should commit even a minor one. Mishnah, if he deposited it on a tree above a height of ten handbreadths, his Arab is ineffective. If he deposited it at an altitude below ten handbreadths, his Arab is effective. If he deposited it in a cistern, even if it is a hundred cubits deep, his Arab is effective. Gemara, Arhai, Biaba, and RC and Rabbi B. Nathan sat at their studies while Arnaman was sitting beside. The men in the course of their session they discussed the following where could that tree have been standing if it be suggested that it stood in a private domain what matters it it may be objected whether it was above a height of ten handbreadths or below it seeing that a private domain rises up to the sky if however it be suggested that it stood in a public domain the question arises where did the man intend to make his sabbath abode if it be suggested that he intended to make it on the tree above or not then he and his Arab in the same domain the fact however is that he intended to make his sabbath abode below but is he not making use of the tree it may still be maintained that the tree stood in a public domain and that the man's intention was to acquire his sabbath abode below but this mission represents the view of rabbi who land down any act that is forbidden by rabbinical measure is not subject to that prohibition during twilight well spoken said R. Naman to them and so also did Samuel say do you explain with it they said to him so much but did not they themselves explain their difficulty thereby in fact it was this that they said to him did you embody it in the Gemara yes he answered them so it was also stated Arnaman reporting Samuel said here we are dealing with a tree that stood in a public domain that was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide and the man had the intention to acquire his Sabbath abode
deposited it on a tree above a height of 10 handbreadths his Arab is ineffective if he deposited it at an altitude below 10 handbreadths his Arab is effective but he must not move it if the Arab was deposited within 3 handbreadths from the ground it is permitted to move it if he put it in a basket and hung it upon the tree his Arab is effective even if it was above a height of 10 handbreadths rabbi but the sages ruled wherever it is forbidden to move it the Arab is ineffective. Now to what does the statement but the cages ruled refer if it be suggested to the final clause the difficulty would arise does this imply that the rabbis hold the opinion that the use of the sides is also forbidden consequently it must refer to the first clause but then what size of tree is done to imagine if it is one which is less than four handbreadths in width then surely it is a spot of exemption and if it was four handbreadths wide what is the use it may be asked that. The Arab was put in a basket Rubin replied the first clause is a case where the tree had a width of four handbreadths while the final clause deals with one whose width was less than four handbreadths but the basket supplemented it to four Talmud. Mas Arabin B and Rabbi adopts the same view as that of Armeir and also the same as that of Arjuda he adopts the same view as that of Armeir who ruled excavation may be imagined so that the prescribed measurements may be obtained and he also adopts the same view as that of Arjuda who ruled it is necessary that the Arab shall rest on a spot that is four handbreadths wide, which is not the case here. What is the source of the ruling of Arjuda? It was taught Arjuda ruled if a man inserted a pole in the ground of a public domain and deposited his Arab on it, his Arab is effective if the pole was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide, otherwise his Arab is ineffective on the contrary or not he and his Arab in the latter case in the same domain it is this rather that he meant if the pole was ten handbreadths high it is necessary that at its top it shall be four handbreadths wide, but if it was not tell handbreadths high it is not necessary for its top to be four handbreadths wide in agreement with whose view it is apparently not in agreement with that of Arjuda son of Arjuda seeing that it was taught Arjuda son of Arjuda ruled if a man inserted a reed in the ground of a Public domain and on the top of it he fixed a basket anyone who threw something which came to a rest on the top of it incurs guilt it may be said to be in agreement even with that of our Jose son of Arjuda for there the sides surround the reed but here the sides do not surround the tree our Jeremiah replied a basket is different since one might incline it and so lower it within ten handbreadths from the ground our papa sitting at his studies was discoursing on this traditional teaching. When Rabbi Shabba pointed out to him the following objection we learned he said how is one to proceed he arranges for the Arab to be carried by a deputy to the required spot on the first day and having remained there with it until dusk he takes it with him and goes away on the second day he again comes with it and keeps it there until dusk when he may consume it and go away Talmud, Mas Arabin and now why should this at all be necessary let it rather be land down since one could. Carry it if one wished the Arab though one had not actually carried it is deemed to have been carried. Arzera replied this is a preventive measure against the possibility of not carrying it even when a festival occurred on a Sunday. He pointed out to him another objection if a man intending to acquire his Sabbath abode in a public domain deposited his Arab in a wall lower than ten handbreadths from the ground his Arab is effective but if he deposited it above a height of ten handbreadths from the ground his Arab is ineffective if he intended to make his abode on the top of a dovecote or on the top of a turret his Arab is valid if it lay at a height above ten handbreadths from the ground but if it lay at a level below ten handbreadths from the ground his Arab is ineffective but why could it not be said here also that the Arab is effective since one could incline the dovecote or the turret and so lower it to a level of less than ten handbreadths from the ground our Jeremiah replied here we are dealing with a turret that was nailed to the wall Robert replied it may be said to refer even to a turret that was not nailed to a wall for we might be dealing with a high turret which were one to incline it a little it would project beyond the original area of four cubits but how is one to imagine the circumstance if the turret had a window and a cord also was available why should not the Arab be taken up through the window by means of it? Cord this is a case where there was neither window nor cord if he deposited it in a cistern even if it is a hundred cubits deep etc where was the cistern situated if it be suggested that it was situated in a private domain Talmud, Mas Arabin B is not this ruling it may be objected obvious seeing that a private domain rises up to the sky and as it rises upwards so it descends downwards if on the other hand it be suggested that it was situated in a public domain where it may again be. Objected did the man intend to have his Sabbath abode if above he would be in one domain and his Arab in another and if below is not the ruling again obvious seeing that he and his Arab are in the same place, this ruling was required only in a case where the cistern was situated in a Carmelite and the man intended to make his abode above and this ruling represents the view of Rabbi who laid down any act that is forbidden by rabbinical measure is not subject to that prohibition. During twilight on the Sabbath mission if it was put on the top of a reed or on the top of a pole provided it had been uprooted and then inserted in the ground even though it was a hundred cubits high the Arab is effective Gemara Arabi Matina pointed out to Rabbi the following incongruity from our mission it appears that only if it had been uprooted and then inserted in the ground is the Arab effective but if it was not first uprooted and then inserted in the ground the Arab would not have been effective now whose view is this obviously that of the rabbis who rule any act that is forbidden by rabbinical measure is also forbidden at twilight on the Sabbath but you also said that the first clause represents the view of rabbi would then the first clause represent the view of rabbi and the final clause that of the rabbis the other replied Rami Bihama has already pointed out this incongruity to Arista who answered him that the first clause was indeed the view of rabbi while the final one was that of the rabbis Rabbin has said both clauses represent the view of rabbi but the restriction in the final clause is a preventive measure against the possibility of nipping the frail reed and army once came to Nihartia and Arnaman told his disciples go out into the marsh and prepare an embankment from the growing reed so that tomorrow we might go there and sit on the Rami Bihama raised the following objection against Arnaman or as others. Say our Akbabi Abba raised the objection against Arnav and have we not learned that only if it had been uprooted and then inserted in the ground is the Arab effective from which it follows if it was not first uprooted and then inserted in the ground the Arab is not effective the other replied there it is a case of hardened reeds and whence is it derived that we draw a distinction between hardened and unhardened reeds from what was taught reeds thorns and thistles belong to the species of trees and are not subject to the prohibition of Kilim in the vineyard and another berry the taught reeds kasha and bulrushes are a species of herb and subject to the prohibition of Kilim in the vineyard now are not the two berries contradictory to each other it must consequently be inferred that the former deals with hardened reeds while the latter deals with such as are not hardened this is conclusive but is kasha a species of herb have we not in fact learned must not be Grafted on white kasha because this act would constitute the mingling of herb with a tree. Our papa replied, Kasha and white kasha are two different species. Mishnah, if it was put in a cupboard and the key was lost, the Arab is nevertheless effective. Our Eliza ruled, if it is not known that the key is in its proper place, the Arab is ineffective. Imara, but why is not this a case where he is in one place and his Arab is in another? Both Rab and Samuel explained, We are dealing here with a cupboard of bricks, and this ruling represents the view of our mayor who maintains that it is permitted at the outset to make a breach in a structure in order to take something out of it. For we learned if a house that was filled with fruit was closed up, but a breach accidentally appeared, it is permitted to take the fruit out through the breach, and our mayor ruled, it is permitted at the outset to make a breach in order to take the fruit out, but did not our nom be at a state in the name of. Samuel that the reference there is to a pile of bricks here also the reference is to a pile of bricks but did not Arzara maintain that the rabbi spoke only of a festival but not of a Sabbath here also the Arab is one that was prepared for a festival if that were so would it have been justified to state in reference to this mission that our Eliza ruled if the key was lost in town the Arab is effective but if it was lost in a field it is not effective now if it was on a festival. There is no difference in this respect between a town and a field Talmud, Mas Arab and A some words indeed are missing from the Beritha and this is the proper reading if it was put in a cupboard and locked up and the key was lost the Arab is effective this ruling however applies only to a festival but on a Sabbath the Arab is ineffective even if the key was found whether in town or in a
Have they all agree that an object that moved from its place as a direct result of the Zab's strength is unclean but if it moved as a result of the shaking of another object on which it rested it is clean but here we are dealing with an object the vibration of which was a direct result of the Zab's strength and it is this principle on which they differ the master is of the opinion that such vibration is regarded as a shifting of the object from its place and the masters are of the opinion that it is not so regarded how then is our mission to be explained both Abbe and Rob replied we are dealing with a lock that was tied with a cord for the cutting of which a knife is required the first tanda holds the same view as our Jose who laid down all instruments may be moved on the Sabbath except the large saw and the pin of the plow while our Eliezer holds the same view as our Nehemiah who laid down even a cloak and even a spoon may not be moved except for the purpose for which they were made mission if the Arab rolled away beyond the Sabbath limit or if he fell on it or if it was burnt or if it consisted of terabah that became unclean if any of these accidents occurred while it was yet day it is ineffective but if it occurred after dusk the Arab is effective if this is doubtful the man said our Medir and our Judah is in the position of both an ass driver and a camel driver our Jose and our Simeon rule an Arab whose validity is in doubt is effective our Jose stated Abtalamos testified on the authority of five elders that an Arab whose validity is in doubt is effective Gemara if an Arab rolled away beyond the Sabbath limit Rabbah stated this was taught only where it rolled away beyond a distance of four cubits but if it rested within the four cubits it is effective since a person who deposits his Arab in any spot acquires an area of four cubits or if a heap fell on it etc having been presumed that if desired the Arab could be taken out must it be assumed that our mission is not in agreement with Rabbi for if it were suggested to be in agreement with Rabbi the difficulty would arise did he not lay down that any work that was only rabbinically prohibited was not forbidden as a preventive measure on the Sabbath eve at twilight it may be said to be in agreement even with Rabbi since it may apply to a case where a hoe or a pickaxe is required and both rulings were required for if only the one relating to an Arab that rolled a way had been taught it might have been presumed that the Arab was ineffective because it was not near the man for whom it had been provided but that where he fell on it since it is near that man the Arab is effective and if only the ruling if he fell on it had been taught it might have been presumed that the Arab was ineffective because it was covered but that where it rolled away since a wind might sometimes rise and carry it back to its place the Arab might be said to be effective hence both rulings were required or if it was burnt or if it consisted of terimah that became unclean what need was there for both these rulings it was burnt was taught Talmud, Mas Arab and B to inform you of the power of our Jose and terimah that became unclean was taught to inform you of the power of our Meir but is our Meir of the opinion that in a doubtful case the more restrictive course is to be followed have we not in fact learned if an unclean person went down to perform Ritual immersion and it is doubtful whether he performed the immersion or not or even if he did perform the immersion but it is doubtful whether it was done in 40 SEI of water or in less and similarly if he performed his immersion in one of two ritual baths one of which contained 40 SEI of water and the other contained less and he does not know in which one he performed his immersion he being in a state of doubt is unclean this applies only to a major uncleanness but in the case of a minor uncleanness as for instance where one ate unclean foods or drank unclean liquids or where a man immersed his head and the greater part of his body in drawn water or three log of drawn water were poured upon his head and the greater part of his body and he then went down to perform immersion and it is doubtful whether he did or did not perform it and even if he did perform it there is doubt whether the immersion was performed in 40 SEI of water or less and similarly if he Performed the immersion in one of two ritual baths, one of which contained 40 SEI of water and the other contained less, and he does not know in which of the two he performed his immersion. He being in a state of doubt is clean, so Armadir and Rajos declared him to be unclean. Armadir is of the opinion that the laws of the Sabbath limits are pentacle, but does Armadir uphold the view that the laws of Sabbath limits are pentacle? Have we not in fact learned if he is unable to span it? In connection with this, our dust IBJ stated in the name of Armadir, I have heard that hills are treated as though they were pierced. Now, if the idea could be entertained that the laws of the Sabbath limits are pentacle, the difficulty would arise is the method of piercing allowed in such a case, seeing that Arnaman has in fact stated in the name of Rabbi Biaboa that the method of piercing must not be adopted in the case of the measurements around the cities of refuge. Nor in that of the broken necked heifer because they are ordinances of the Torah. This is no difficulty. One ruling was his own while the other was his master's. A careful examination of the wording also leads to this conclusion, for it was taught in connection with this Ardust IBJ stated in the name of Armeir. I have heard that hills are treated as though they were pierced. This proves that a contradiction, however, was pointed out between two rulings of Armeir in respect of Pentacle. Laws for have we not learned if a man who touched the body at night was unaware whether it was alive or dead, but when rising on the following morning he found it to be dead. Armeir regards him as clean and the sages regard him as unclean because questions in respect of all unclean objects are determined in accordance with their condition at the time they were discovered. Our Jeremiah replied, Our mission refers to Terima on which a dead creeping thing lay throughout the twilight, but if so. Would our Jose have ruled an Arab whose validity is in doubt is affected both Rabbi and our Joseph replied we are here dealing with two groups of witnesses one of which testifies that the uncleanness occurred while it was yet day while the other testifies that it occurred after dust Talmud, Mas Arab and Arab replied in that case there are two presumptive grounds for a relaxation of the law while here there is only one does not then a contradiction arise between two rulings of our Jose R. Who not behind and replied the laws of uncleanness are different since their origin is pentacle but are not the laws of Sabbath limits also pentacle our Jose is of the opinion that the laws of the Sabbath limits are rabbinical and if you prefer I might reply one ruling was his own while the other was his master's a careful examination of his statement also leads to this conclusion for it reads our Jose stated Abtalamos testified on the authority of five elders that an Arab whose Validity is in doubt is effective. This proves it. Robert replied. The reason there is that our Jose maintains take the unclean to be in his presumptive condition of uncleanness and suggests therefore that he may not have performed the ritual immersion. On the contrary, take the ritual bath to be in its presumptive condition of ritual fitness and suggests therefore that it was not short of the required volume. This is a case of a ritual bath. The water in which had not been measured it was taught. In what circumstances did our Jose rule that an Arab whose validity is in doubt is effective? If a man made an Arab with turma and it is doubtful whether it contracted uncleanness when it was yet day or after dusk, and so also in the case of fruits concerning which there arose a doubt whether they were prepared for use while it was yet day or after dusk. In any such case, the Arab is deemed to be one whose validity is in doubt and is consequently effective. But if a man prepared an Arab of Terimah about which there is doubt whether it was clean or unclean and so also in the case of fruit concerning which there arose a doubt whether they were prepared for use or not in any such case the Arab is not deemed to be one whose validity is in doubt and which is consequently effective wherein however does Terimah differ in that it may be said regard the Terimah as being in its presumptive condition of cleanness and suggest that it is still clean but as regards the fruit. Also why should it not be said regard the Tebal as being in its presumptive condition of unfitness for use and suggest that it was not yet prepared do not read there arose a doubt whether they were prepared for use while it was yet day but read there arose a doubt whether they were mixed up with Tebal while it was yet day or after dusk our Samuel son of our Isaac inquired of Arhuna what is the legal position where a man had before him two loaves one of which was clean and the other unclean. And he gave instructions prepare for me an Arab with the clean loaf wherever it may happen to be this question may be asked in connection with the view of Armadir and it may also be asked in connection with that of our Jose it may be asked in connection with the view of Armadir since it may be argued that it is only there that Armadir gave his restrictive ruling because there was no definite clean terima but here surely there was at least one loaf that was clean or is it possible that even our Jose laid down his ruling there only because if it is assumed that the terima was clean the man knows where to look for it but here surely he does not know even where to look for it the other replied both according to our Jose as well as according to Armadir it is essential to have a meal that is suitable for the person for whom the Arab is prepared
Prepare with this an Arab for me. His statement is null and void. Rubber remark. This proves that the validity of an Arab takes effect at the end of the day. Talmud. Mas Arab and before if you should entertain the view that the validity takes effect at the beginning of the Sabbath day, the difficulty would arise. Why, if he said, prepare with this an Arab for me, is his statement null and void? Our papa retorted, it may still be maintained that the validity of an Arab takes effect at the beginning of the Sabbath day. Yet the contents of the legend are unfit as an Arab, since it is essential to have a meal that is suitable for consumption while it is yet day, which is not the case. Your mission, a man may attach a condition to his Arab and say, if foreigners came from the east, my Arab shall be that of the west. If they came from the west, my Arab shall be that of the east. If they came from both directions, I will go in whatever direction I desire, and if they came from neither direction, I will be like the people of my town. He may likewise say, if the sage came from the east, let my Arab be the one of the east. If from the west, let my Arab be the one of the west. If a sage came from either direction, I will go in whatever direction I desire. And if no one came from either direction, I will be like the people of my town. Our Judah ruled. If one of them was his teacher, he may go only to his teacher. But if both were his teachers, he may go in whatever direction he prefers. Gemara when our Isaac came, he learned all our mission in the reverse order. Does not then a contradiction arise between the two statements on the foreigners and between the two concerning the sage? There is really no contradiction between the two statements on foreigners, since one refers to tax collectors while the other refers to the landlords of the town. There is also no contradiction between the two statements concerning the sage, since one refers to a scholar who delivers public discourses while the other. Refers to a teacher of young children, our Judah ruled if one of them was etc. And the rabbi sometimes it may happen that a man is more pleased to meet his colleague than his teacher. Rab stated the ruling of our mission is not to be upheld by reason of what Ao learned for Ao learned our Judah ruled a man cannot make simultaneous conditions in connection with two possible events. He can only make this condition if the sage came from the direction of the east, my Arab shall be that of the east, and if the sage came from the direction of the west, my Arab shall be that of the west, but not if one came from each direction. Why is it that the Arab is ineffective where the condition was if one came from each direction? Obviously, because the rule of Bararah is not upheld, but then where the condition was if the sage came from the direction of the east or from that of the west, it should also be said that the rule of Bararah cannot be upheld. Are you and replied are. Mission refers to a case where the sage already arrived. On the contrary, let it be said that Ao's version cannot be upheld by reason of what was taught in our mission. This cannot be entertained at all since we heard of our Judah that he does not adopt the rule of Barah, for it was taught if a man buys wine from among the Kutians Talmud, Mas Arab, and he may say two log which I am about to set aside our Teramah and our first tithe and nine our second tithe, and this he redeems and may drink. The wine forthwith so our Mayor, but our Judah, our Jose, and our Simeon forbid this procedure. Allah said Ao's version is not to be upheld by reason of what was stated in our mission. What, however, about the statement our Judah, our Jose, and our Simeon forbid this procedure. Allah read the names of the authors in peers, thus so our Mayor and our Judah, but our Jose, and our Simeon forbid this procedure. But is our Jose of the opinion that the rule of Barah is not to be upheld? Have we not in fact learned our Jose ruled? If two women bought their bird sacrifices jointly or gave the price of their bird sacrifices to the priest, the latter may offer whichever he wishes as a burnt offering and whichever he wishes as a sin offering. Rabbi replied, There it is a case where the women originally made this condition, but if that is the case, what need was there to state such an obvious ruling? We were thereby informed that the law is in agreement with our histah for our histah rule. Bird sacrifices cannot be designated Talmud, Mas Arab, and be except at the time they are purchased by their owner or when the priest prepares them for the altar. Is it then still maintained that our Jose is of the opinion that the rule of Barah is not to be upheld? Was it not in fact taught if an Amhara said to a Haber, buy for me a bundle of vegetables or a loaf? The latter need not tithe it, so our Jose, but the sages ruled he must tithe it. Reverse the rulings come and here if a man said, Let the second tithe. Which I have in my house be redeemed with the seller that would happen to come from my purse into my hand. It is said, Our Jose redeemed, reverse the rulings, and read, Our Jose said, It is not redeemed. What reason, however, do you see for reversing two statements for the sake of one? Why not reverse the one for the sake of the two? The last sided barrier was at all events taught in a reverse form, since in its final clause it was stated, Our Jose, however, admits that where a man said the second tithe, which I have in my house, shall be redeemed with the new seller that would happen to come from my purse into my hand, the tithe is redeemed. Now, since he ruled here that it is redeemed, it follows that in the previous case his ruling was that it is not redeemed. Whatever is to be understood by the case of the new seller, if there are two or three other new sellers in his purse, so that selection is possible, then this case is exactly identical with the first one. If, however, there was only one, what? Since is there in the expression that would happen to come as in the first clause it was taught that would happen to come it was taught in the final clause also that would happen to come Rabbi asked Arnaman who is the Tana who does not uphold the rule of Barah even in the case of a rabbinical enactment for it was taught if a man said to five persons behold I am preparing an Arab for one of you whom I may choose in due course so that if I wish it he would be allowed to go and if I would not wish it he would not go the Arab is effective if he made up his mind while it was yet day but if he did it after dusk the Arab is not effective the other remained silent and gave him no answer whatever but why could he not tell him that the Tana was one of the school of Ao he did not hear of Ao's ruling our Joseph said do you wish to remove Tanis from the world the fact is that the question is one on which Tanis differ for it was taught if a man said behold I am preparing an Arab for all the Sabbaths of the year so that whenever I should wish it I would go and whenever I should not wish it I would not go his Arab is effective if he made up his mind while it was yet day but if he decided after dusk our Simeon ruled his Arab is effective while the sages ruled his Arab is not effective but surely we heard of our Simeon that he does not uphold Barah so that a contradiction arise between two rulings of our Simeon the fact is that the views are to be reversed but what difficulty is this is it not possible that our Simeon does not uphold Barah only in a Pentateuchal law but in respect of a rabbinical law he may well uphold it he is of the opinion that he who upholds Barah does so in all cases making no distinction between a Pentateuchal and a rabbinical law while he who does not uphold Barah does not do it in any case irrespective of whether a law is Pentateuchal or rabbinical rabbi replied there the case is altogether different the reason being that it is essential for the priestly and Levitical dues to be first fruits, so that whatever remains shall be distinguishable from it said Abbe to him now then if a man who had before him two pomegranates of Tebal said if rain will fall today the one shall be terimah for the other and if no rain will fall today the other shall be terimah for the first with his assertion here also whether there was rain that day or not be will and void and should you reply that the law is so. Indeed it can be retorted have we not in fact learned if a man said the terimah of this heap and its tithe shall be in the middle thereof or the terimah of this first tithe shall be in the middle thereof our Simeon ruled he has thereby given it a valid name there the law is different because the remainder of the produce is round about the dues and if you prefer I might reply in accordance with the reason elsewhere indicated they said to our mayor do you not agree that the skin might First, and the man with us have been drinking liquids of Tebal, and he replied, When it will have burst, there would be time for the question to be considered on the previous assumption, however, that it is essential for the priestly and Levitical dues to be first fruits, so that whatever remains shall be distinguishable from it. What could they have meant? It is this that they meant according to our view. The reason for the prohibition is that it is essential for the priestly and Levitical dues to be first fruits, so that whatever remains shall be distinguishable from it. But even according to your view, Talmud, Mas Arabin, do you not agree that the skin might burst? And the man with us have been drinking liquids of Tebal, and he replied, When it will have burst, there would be time for the question to be considered. Mission our Eliza ruled if a festival day immediately precedes or follows the Sabbath, a man may prepare two Arabs and make the following declaration, My Arab, for the First day shall be that of the east, and the one for the second day that of the west. The one for the first day shall be that of the west, and the one for the second day that of the east. My Arab shall be effective for the first day, and for the second day I shall retain
Holiness said, Our Elizer to them, do you not agree that if a man prepared an Arab with his feet for the first day, he must also prepare an Arab with his feet for the second day, or that if his Arab was eaten up on the first day, he may not go out in reliance on it on the second day? Indeed, they replied, Surely then he retorted, The two days must be two entities of holiness, and the rabbis they were rather uncertain and have therefore adopted the more restrictive course in both cases, do you not? Agree they again said to our Elizer that it is forbidden to prepare an Arab for the Sabbath on a festival day for the first time. Indeed, I do, he replied, Surely then they retorted, The two days must be one entity of holiness, and really is there a restriction there is due to the prohibition of preparing for the Sabbath on a festival day. Our rabbis taught if a man prepared an Arab with his feet on the first day, he must also prepare an Arab with his feet on the second day if his Arab was eaten. Upon the first day he may not go out in reliance on it on the second day so Rabbi Arjuna said Talmud, Mas Arab and be behold this man represents a combination of an ass driver and a camel driver our Simeon be Gamaliel and our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Baraka said if he prepared an Arab with his feet on the first day he need not prepare one with his feet for the second day and if his Arab was eaten on the first day he may go out in reliance on it on the second day Rab stated the Halachias. In agreement with the four elders who follow the view of our Elizer who maintain that the two days are regarded as two entities of holiness and these are the four elders are Simeon be Gamaliel our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Baraka our Eliezer son of our Simeon and our Jose be Judah reported anonymously or as others say one of these is our Eliezer while our Jose be Judah reported anonymously is to be excluded but were not our Simeon be Gamaliel and our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Baraka heard to express it. Contrary be reverse it but if so is not their view identical with that of Rabbi Riyad and so also ruled Arsimian be Gamaliel etc. But why was not Rabbi also enumerated Rabbi only learned the ruling but he himself did not adopt it is it not possible that the Rabbis also only learned it but did not adopt it Rab received the statement as a definite tradition when Arhuna's soul departed to its eternal rest Arhus died entering the academy pointed out a contradiction between two statements of Rab. Could Rab have said the Halajah is in agreement with the four elders who follow the view of our Elizer who maintain that the two days are regarded as two entities of holiness seeing that it was actually stated if the Sabbath and a festival day follow one another in close succession Rab ruled that an egg that was laid on the first of these days is forbidden on the other Rab replied the restriction there is due to the prohibition against preparing from one day for the other four. It was taught and it shall come to pass on the sixth day that they shall prepare implies that one may prepare on a weekday for the Sabbath or for a festival but that no preparations may be made on a festival or the Sabbath nor nay preparations be made on the Sabbath for a festival said Abbe to him what however could be your explanation of what we learned how is one to act he arranges for the Arab to be carried to the required spot on the first day by a deputy who having remained there with it until dusk takes it up and goes away on the second day the Arab is again carried there and kept until dusk when the deputy eats it and goes away is he not there by preparing on a festival day for the Sabbath Rabbi replied do you imagine that it is at the conclusion of the day that an Arab acquires its validity it is at the beginning of the day that its validity is acquired and on the Sabbath one may well make preparations for the Sabbath itself now then why should not people be allowed to prepare an Arab with a legend because it is necessary that an Arab should consist of a meal that is suitable for consumption while it is yet day which is not the case there what however is your explanation of what we learned our Eliza ruled if a festival day immediately precedes or follows the Sabbath a man may prepare two Arabs is it not necessary that the Arab should consist of a meal suitable for consumption while it is yet day which is not the case here do you think that one Arab was late at the termination of 2,000 cubits in one direction and the other was late at the termination of 2,000 cubits in the opposite direction? No one Arab was late at the termination of 1,000 cubits in one direction and the other also was similarly late at the termination of 1,000 cubits in the opposite direction? What however could be said in explanation of that which Rab Judah ruled if a man prepared an Arab for the first day? With his feet he must also prepare it for the second day with his feet and if he prepared the Arab for the first day with bread he must also prepare it for the second day with bread is he not preparing on a festival day for the Sabbath? The other replied do you think that he must go to the required spot and pronounce some formula? In fact he only goes there and sits down in silence in agreement with whose view is it in agreement only with that of our Yohanan Binuri who holds that objects of have to require the spot on which they rested it may be said to be in agreement even with the view of the rabbis for they differ from our Yohan and Binuri only in respect of a person asleep who cannot possibly pronounce the formula but where a person is awake and could if he wished pronounce it he is deemed to have pronounced it even though he has not actually done so said Rabbi Arhanin to Abay if the master had heard that it was taught a man shall not walk on the Sabbath to the end of his field to ascertain what it required similarly Talmud, Mas Arab and no man shall walk about the gate of a province in order that he might enter a bathhouse as soon as the holy day terminates he would have changed his view this however is not correct he did in fact hear of this ruling but did not change his view since there the motive is obvious while here it is not at all obvious for if the person is a scholar people would assume that he might have been absorbed in his studies and if he is and am higher as it would be said that he might have lost his ass to turn to the main text Rab Judah ruled if a man prepared an Arab for the first day with his feet he must also prepare it for the second day with his feet and if he prepared the Arab for the first day with bread he must also prepare it for the second day with bread if he prepared his Arab for the first day with bread and it was lost he may prepare it for the second day with his feet but if he prepared it for the first day with his feet he may not prepare it for the second day with bread because it is not allowed on a festival day to prepare for the first time an Arab for the Sabbath with bread if he prepared the Arab for the first day with bread he must also prepare it for the second day with bread Samuel explained but only with the same bread our Ashi remarked logical deduction from our mission also leads to the same conclusion for it was stated how does he act he arranges for the Arab to be carried to the Required spot on the first day by a deputy who having remained there with it until dusk takes it up and goes away on the second day the Arab is again carried there and kept until dusk when the deputy eats it and goes away and the rabbis there we might merely have been given a piece of good advice mission Arjuna ruled if on the eve of the new year a man fears that the preceding month of Elul might be intercalated he may prepare two Arabs and make this declaration my Arab for the first day shall be to the east and the one for the second day to the west the one for the first day to the west and the one for the second day to the east my Arab shall be effective for the first day and for the second I shall retain the same rights as the people of my town or my Arab shall be effective for the second day and for the first I shall retain the same rights as the people of my town the sages however did not agree with him Arjuna further ruled a man may conditionally set Aside tear him off for a basket of produce on the first festival day of New Year and may then eat it on the second day and so also if an egg was laid on the first festival day it may be eaten on the second but the sages did not agree with him Ardosa Biharkinus ruled the person who acts as congregational reader on the first day of the festival of the New Year says fortify us O Lord our God on this first day of the month whether it be today or tomorrow and on the following day he says fortify us etc whether it be today or yesterday the sages however did not agree with him Gamar who is it that did not agree with him Rab replied it is our Jose for it was taught the sages agree with our Eliza that if on the eve of the New Year a man fears that the preceding month of Elul might be intercalated he may prepare two Arabs and make this declaration my Arab for the first day shall be to the east and the one on the second day to the west the one for the first day to the west and the one for the second day to the east my Arab shall be effective for the first day and for the second I shall retain the same rights as the people of my town or my Arab shall be effective for the second day and for the first I shall retain the same rights as the people of my town but our Jose forbids this said our Jose to them do you not agree that if witnesses came after the offering of the minha both that day and the day following are observed as holy days Talmud, Mas Arab and B. And the rabbis there the reason for the observance is that people shall not treat it with disrespect our Judah further ruled etc and the mention of the three cases was necessary for if we had been informed of the new year only it might have been presumed that our Judah maintained his view only in
A week they let this basket of produce be terrible for the other end of today is a holy day let my declaration be void and he thus names it and made and eat the other our Jose forbids this and so also did our Jose forbid such a procedure on the two festival days of the diaspora a stag that was caught on the first day of the diaspora festival and slain on the second day of the festival was presented at the exilarchist table our and our hate it but our she's hate did not eat it what said our nomin. Can I do with our she's hate who does not eat the meat of a stag how could I eat it retorted our she's hate in view of what is he learned or as others say is he learned and so also did our Jose forbid such a procedure on the two festival days of the diaspora what however objected Rabba is the difficulty is it not possible that he meant this and so also did our Jose forbid such a procedure on the two festival days of the new year in the diaspora if so instead of the expression of the diaspora it should. Have read in the diaspora what difficulty however objected R.C. is this is it not possible that he meant this and so also did our Jose treat the prohibition of such a procedure on any of the two festival days of the diaspora as did the rabbis on the two festival days of the new year on which they permit a similar procedure R.C.'s hate subsequently met Rabbi B. Samuel and asked him has the master learned anything on the question of festival sanctities I have learned the other replied that R. Jose agreed in the case of the two festival days of the diaspora if you happen to meet them R.C.'s hate requested mention to them nothing whatever about the matter R. Ashi stated Amimar told me personally that the stag was not at all caught Talmud, Mas Aravind, but it arrived from without the permitted festival limit he who ate it was of the opinion that if anything arrived for one Israelite it is permitted to another Israelite and he who did not eat it held that all foodstuffs that arrived. At the Exilarch's house were intended for all the rabbis but did not Arshis hate me Rabbi B. Samuel and ask him a question on sanctities that in fact never happened a load of turnips once arrived at Mahuza on a festival day Rabbi went out and observed that they were withered he therefore permitted the people to buy them saying these turnips were undoubtedly pulled out from the ground yesterday what other objection could be raised that they arrived from without the permitted festival limit. But anything that arrives for one Israelite is permitted to another Israelite to eat and much more so are these turnips permitted since they were intended for Gentiles when however he observed that the Gentile vendors were bringing in additional supplies of these turnips he forbade all further buying certain gardeners once cut myrtles on the second day of the festival and Rabbi permitted people to smell their odor in the evening immediately after the termination of the festival said. Rabbi B. Talafat Rabbi the master should really forbid this to them since they are not learned men to this Arshi may demur is the reason and that they are not learned men but if they had been learned men this would have been permitted but surely is it not necessary to allow time enough for their preparation they therefore proceeded to ask this question of Rabbi and he told them that it was necessary to allow time enough for their preparation Ardosa ruled the person who acts as congregational reader etc Rabbi stated when we were at our Hunas we raised the following question is it necessary to mention the new moon in the prayers of the new year is it necessary to mention it because different additional offerings were ordained for the two celebrations or is rather one mention of memorial sufficient for both and he told us you have learned it Ardosa ruled the person who acts as congregational reader etc does not this disagreement apply to the mention of the new Moon, no, it may refer to the conditional form of the prayer. Logical reasoning also supports this. For in the very day it was taught, and so did Ardosa proceed on the new moons throughout the year. But they did not agree with him. Now, if you admit that their objection was to his conditional form of prayer, one can well understand why they did not agree with him. But if you maintain that their objection was to the mention of the new moon, why it may be asked, did they not agree with him? What then? Would you suggest that their objection was to his conditional form of prayer? But what purpose it could be retorted was served by expressing disagreement in the two cases. Both were necessary. For if we had been informed of their disagreement in the case of the new year, only it might have been presumed that only in this case did the rabbis maintain that no conditional form of prayer should be introduced because people might come to regard the day with disrespect. But that in the case of the new moons throughout the year they it might have been presumed to agree with Ardosa and if their disagreement with Ardosa had been expressed in the latter case only it might have been presumed that Ardosa maintained his view only in that case but that in the other case he agrees with the rabbis hence it is that both cases were necessary and objection was raised if the new year festival fell on a Sabbath Beth Shammai ruled one shall recite ten benedictions and Beth Hillel ruled one only. Recites nine now if that were so should it not have been necessary according to Beth Shammai to order eleven benedictions Talmud. Mas Arab and BR Zero replied the new moon is different from a festival since its mention is included in the benediction on the sanctity of the day in the morning and evening prayers it is also included in that of the additional prayer but do Beth Shammai uphold the view that the mention of the new moon is to be included was it not in fact taught if new? Moon falls on a Sabbath. Beth Shammai ruled one recites in his additional prayer eight benedictions and Beth Hillel ruled seven. This is indeed a difficulty on the very question of inclusion. Ten is different for it was taught if the Sabbath falls on a new moon or on one of the intermediate days of a festival. One reads the seven benedictions in the evening, morning, and afternoon prayers in the usual way, inserting the formula appropriate for the occasion in the benediction on the temple service. R. Eliza ruled the insertion is made in the benediction of Thanksgiving, and if it was not inserted, one is made to repeat all the benedictions in the additional prayers. One must begin and conclude with the mention of the Sabbath, inserting the mention of the sanctity of the day in the middle of the benediction. Only our Simeon, Begamaliel, and our Ishmael, son of our Yohanan, Bibaraka ruled wherever one is under an obligation to recite seven benedictions, it is necessary to begin and conclude with it. Mention of the Sabbath and to insert the reference to the sanctity of the day in the middle of the benediction. Now, what is the result of the discussion? Our Hista replied, The mention of one memorial suffices for both, so also ruled Rabbi. The mention of one memorial is sufficient for both. Rabbi further stated, When we were at Arhunaz, we raised the question whether the benediction on the season is to be recited on the New Year festival and on the Day of Atonement must it be recited? We argued, Since these solemn days occur only periodically, or is it possible that it is not to be said since they are not described in Scripture as festivals? He was unable to give an answer when I later arrived at Rab Judas. He stated, I recite the benediction on the season even over a new pumpkin. I do not ask, I told him whether it is permitted to recite this benediction. What I ask is whether its recital is obligatory. Both Rab and Samuel, he replied, Rule the benediction on the season is. Recited only on the occasion of the three major festivals, an objection was raised. Give a portion unto seven, yea, even unto eight. Our Eliza explained seven alludes to the seven days of the creation, and eight alludes to the eight days of circumcision. Our Joshua explained seven alludes to the seven days of the Passover, and eight alludes to the eight days of the festival of tabernacles. And since scripture says, yea, even Pentecost, New Year's Day, and the Day of Atonement are also included, now does not this inclusion refer to the benediction on the season? No, the reference is to the benediction on the sanctity of the day. This may also be logically supported, for if it were to be assumed that the reference is to the benediction on the season, the objection could be advanced is the benediction on the season recited all the seven days of the festival. This is really no objection since a person who did not recite the benediction on the proper day must do so on the following or any. Subsequent day of the festival at all events, however, it may be objected is not a cup of wine required. May it thus be suggested that this provides support for our nomin who laid down one may recite the benediction on the season even in the marketplace. This is no difficulty at all since the benediction on the season could be said when one happens to have a cup of wine. This explanation is quite satisfactory as regards Pentecost and the New Year festival, but how could one proceed on the day of atonement if it be suggested that one is to recite the benediction over the wine and drink it? The objection might be advanced since the man recited the benediction on the season. He has thereby accepted the obligation of the day and caused the wine to be forbidden to him. For did not our Jeremiah B. Abba once say to Rab, Have you ceased from work? And the latter replied, Yes, I have ceased. And if it be suggested that one might recite the benediction over the wine and put it aside, it might. The objected he who recites the benediction over any food or drink must taste it should it be suggested that one might give it to a child it could be retorted the law is not in agreement with our Ahabi Jacob since the child possibly might get used to it now what is the decision on this question the rabbi sent Aryamar the elder to
size of an egg must be brought and eaten before the conclusion of the day so that one does not approach the Sabbath in a state of affliction. It was taught Arjuna stated we were once sitting in the presence of our Akiba and the day was a ninth of a bed occurred on a Sabbath eve when a lightly roasted egg was brought to him and he sipped it without any salt and this he did not because he had any appetite for it but in order to show the students what the Halacha was our Jose however ruled it. Fast must be fully concluded. Do you not agree with the said Arjuna to them that when the ninth of it falls on a Sunday one must break off while it is yet day indeed it is so they replied what he said to them is the difference between beginning the Sabbath when one is in a state of affliction and between letting it out when one is in such a state if you allow a person they replied to let it out when in such a state because he has eaten and drunk throughout the day would you also allow it? Person to begin it when in a state of affliction though he has not eaten or drunk all day and in connection with this ruled the Halacha agrees with our Jose but do we act in agreement with the view of our Jose seeing that such action would be contradictory to the following rulings no fast day may be imposed upon the public on new moons Hanukkah or Purim but if they began the period of fasting prior to these days there is no need to interrupt it so our Gamaliel said Armaiyir although our Gamaliel laid down that there is no need to interrupt it he agrees nevertheless that the fast on these days must not be concluded and the same ruling applies to the ninth of the bed falls on a Sabbath eve and it was further taught after the death of our Gamaliel our Joshua entered the academy to abrogate his ruling when our Yohanan Binari stood up and exclaimed I submit that the body must follow the head throughout the lifetime of our Gamaliel we laid down the Halacha in agreement with his view and now. You wish to abrogate it, Joshua. We shall not listen to you since the Halacha has once been fixed in agreement with Argamaliel, and there was not a single person who raised any objection whatever to the statement in the time of Argamaliel. The people acted in agreement with the views of Argamaliel, but in the time of our Jose, they acted in agreement with the views of our Jose. But could it be maintained that in the time of Argamaliel, the people acted in agreement with the view of Argamaliel? Was it not in fact taught our Eliezer, son of Arzadok, stated, I am one of the descendants of Sen of the tribe of Benjamin. Once it happened that the ninth of it fell on a Sabbath, and we postponed it to the following Sunday when we fasted, but did not complete the fast because that day was our festival. The reason then was that the day had been their festival, but on the eve of their festival, they did complete the fast. Did they not rub and reply to festival of rabbinic origin is different from a Sabbath since it is permitted to fast for a number of hours on the former it is also permitted to complete a fast on its eves but as regards the Sabbath since it is forbidden to fast on it even for a few hours it is also forbidden to complete a fast on its eves I have never heard said our Joseph that tradition said Abbe to him you yourself have told it to us and you said it in connection with the following no fast may be imposed upon the public on new moons etc and it was in connection with this that you told us Rab Judah said in the name of Rab this is the view of our mayor who laid it down in the name of our Gamaliel but the sages ruled one must complete the fast now does not this refer to all the days mentioned no only to Hanukkah and Purim this may also be supported by a process of reasoning Talmud Mas Arabin before if it could have been presumed that the reference is to all the days mentioned the objection would arise did not Rab ask a question on the subject from Rab. Judah and the latter did not answer him but according to your view would not the following objection arise in view of Marzitra's exposition in the name of Arhuna that the Halachah is that one fasting on a Sabbath eve must complete the fast why when Rabbah asked a question on the subject from Arhuna did not the latter answer him but you would no doubt reply that question was asked before Arhuna heard the ruling while his statement was made after he had heard it so also here one might explain that the question was asked before Rab Judah heard it while his statement was made after he heard it Marzitra made the following exposition in the name of Arhuna the Halachah is that those fasting on a Sabbath eve must complete the fast C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-B Mishnahi whom Gentiles or an evil spirit have taken out beyond the permitted Sabbath limit has no more than four cubits in which to move if he was brought back he is regarded as if he had never gone out if he was Taken to another town, or if he was put in a cattle pen or in a cattle fold, he may rule our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B. As Rai moved through the whole of its area, but our Joshua and our Akiba ruled he has only four cubits in which to move. It once happened that they were coming from Brindisi, and while their ship was sailing on the sea, our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B. As Rai walked about throughout its area, but our Joshua and our Akiba did not move beyond four cubits because they desired to impose a restriction upon themselves. Once on a Sabbath eve, they did not enter the harbor until dusk. May we disembark? They asked our Gamaliel, You may, he told them, for I have carefully observed the distance from the shore and have ascertained that before dusk we were already within the Sabbath limit. Tomorrow our rabbis learned three things to deprive a man of his senses and of a knowledge of his creator, his idolaters, and evil spirit, and oppressive poverty. In what respect could this matter in respect of invoking? Heavenly mercy to be delivered from them. Three kinds of person do not see the face of Gehenna is one who suffers from oppressive poverty, one who is afflicted with bowel diseases, and one who is in the hands of the Roman government. And some say also he who has a bad wife and the other it is a duty to divorce a bad wife and the other it may sometimes happen that her ketub amounts to a large somewhere else that he has children from her and is therefore unable to divorce her in what? Practical respect does this matter in respect of receiving these afflictions lovingly three classes of person die even while they are conversing is one who suffers from bowel diseases a woman in confinement and one afflicted with dropsy in what respect can this information matter in that of making arrangements for their shrouds to be ready are nominated stated in the name of Samuel if a man went out deliberately beyond his Sabbath limit he has only four cubits in which to move is not this. Obvious if one whom Gentiles have taken out has only four cubits in which to move is there any necessity to mention that one who went out deliberately is subject to the same restriction rather read if he returned deliberately he has only four cubits in which to move have we not however learned this also if he was brought back by Gentiles he is regarded as if he had never gone out from which it follows that only if he was brought back he is regarded as if he had never gone out but that if Gentiles took him out and he returned of his own accord he has only four cubits rather read if he went out of his own free will and was brought back by Gentiles he has only four cubits in which to move but have we not learned this also whom have taken out and he was brought back he is regarded as if he had never gone out from which it is evident that only he whom Gentiles have taken out and also brought back is regarded as if he had never gone out but that a man who went out of his own free will is not so regarded it might have been assumed that our mission deals with two disconnected instances i.e. whom the Gentiles have taken out and he has returned on his own has no more than four cubits but two if he went out on his own and was brought back by Gentiles he is regarded as if he had never gone out hence we were informed that the second clause is the conclusion of the first and inquiry was addressed to Rabbi what is the ruling where a man had to attend. To his needs human dignity he replied is so important that it supersedes a negative precept of the Torah the Nehardians remarked if he is intelligent he enters into his original Sabbath limit and once he has entered it he may remain there are Papa said fruits that were carried beyond the Sabbath limit and were returned on the same day even if this was done intentionally do not lose their original place what is the reason they were carried under compulsion our Joseph B. Shimei raised them. Objection against our Papa, our Nehemiah, and our Eliza B. Jacob rule the fruits are always forbidden unless they are unintentionally returned to their original place from which it follows does it not that only if they are returned unintentionally is this law applicable but not if they are returned deliberately on this question ten is different for it was taught fruits that were carried beyond the Sabbath limit unwittingly may be eaten if they were carried wittingly they may not be eaten Talmud. Mas Arab and while our Nehemiah ruled if they are in their original place they may be eaten but if they are not in their original place they may not be eaten now what are the circumstances under which they came to be in their original place if it be suggested that they were in their original place through some intentional act surely it could be retorted was it not specifically taught our Nehemiah and our Eliza B. Jacob rule the fruits are always forbidden unless they are unintentionally Return to their original place from which it follows does it not that only if they are returned unintentionally is this law applicable but not if they are returned intentionally must we not then admit that they came to be in their original place through some unintentional act and that some words are missing the corre
distance of 2,000 moderate paces and this constitutes for him the Sabbath limit are nomen further stated in the name of Samuel if a man took up his Sabbath abode in a valley around which Gentiles put up a fence on the Sabbath he may only walk a 2,000 cubits distance in all directions but may move objects throughout all the valley by throwing them but are who are ruled he may walk the 2,000 cubits but may move objects within 4 cubits only but why should he not be allowed to move objects throughout all its area by throwing them he might be drawn after his object then why should he not be allowed to move objects in the usual way within the 2,000 cubits because the area in which he is permitted to walk is like a partition along the full width of which a breach was made towards a place into which it is forbidden to carry anything from it I be rab ruled he may walk the 2,000 cubits and may also move objects within these 2,000 cubits in Agreement with whose view is it neither in agreement with that of Rab nor with that of Arhunarit he may move objects within four cubits if so is not his ruling identical with that of Arhunarit and so ruled Hibi Rab said Arnaman to Arhuna do not dispute the view of Samuel since in a very that it was taught in agreement with his view for it was taught Talmud, Mos Arab and B if a man was measuring the distance from his Arab and advancing towards another town and his measuring of it. Permitted two thousand cubits terminated in the middle of the town he is allowed to move objects throughout the town provided only that he does not pass his Sabbath limit now in what manner could he move the objects obviously by throwing and Arhuna he can answer you know by pulling Arhuna ruled if a man was measuring the distance from his Arab and his measuring of the permitted two thousand cubits terminated in the middle of a courtyard he has only a half of the courtyard in which to move. Is not this obvious read he has a half of the courtyard in which to move is not this also obvious it might have been presumed that there was cause to fear that one might carry objects about all the courtyard hence we were informed that no such possibility need be considered our nomin stated who not agrees with me that if a man was measuring the distance from his Arab and was thus advancing towards another town and his measurement of the 2,000 cubits terminated at a line. Corresponding to the edge of a roof he is allowed to move objects in any part of the house what is the reason because the projection of the roof of the house would strike him or who not son of our Nathan said the divergence of opinion here is like that between the following ten is if he was taken to another town or if he was put in a cattle or in a cattle fold he may rule our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B as Rai move through the whole of its area but our Joshua and our Akiba rule he has only four. Cubits now did not our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B as Rai rule that the man may move through the whole of its area because they do not forbid walking in a cattle pen or in a cattle fold as a preventive measure against the possibility of walking in a valley and since evidently they have not forbidden walking in the former as a preventive measure against walking in the latter they likewise did not forbid the moving of objects by throwing them beyond the Sabbath limit as a preventive measure against the possibility of walking beyond that limit while our Joshua and our Akiba rule he has only four cubits because they forbid walking in a cattle pen or in a cattle fold as a preventive measure against walking in a valley and since evidently they have forbidden walking in the former as a preventive measure against walking in the latter they also forbid the moving of objects by throwing them beyond the Sabbath limit as a preventive measure against the possibility of walking beyond. That limit once could this be proved it is in fact possible that our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B. Ezra did not forbid walking in a cattle pen or in a cattle fold as a preventive measure against the possibility of walking in a valley for the sole reason that two different places are there involved but as regards forbidding the movement of objects as a preventive measure against the possibility of walking which involves one and the same place they may well have enacted a prohibition as a preventive measure against the possibility of being drawn after one's object as to our Joshua and our Akiba also once could it be proved that they restricted the walking to four cubits because they have enacted a preventive measure it is in fact possible that the reason for their restriction is that they hold the view that all the house is regarded as four cubits only while a man occupied a place within its walls while it was yet day but not where he did not occupy the place while it was yet they rab laid down the law is in agreement with Argamaliel in respect of a cattle pen a cattle fold and a ship and Samuel laid down the law is in agreement with Argamaliel in respect of a ship but not in respect of a cattle pen or a cattle fold both at any rate agree that the law is in agreement with Argamaliel in respect of a ship what is the reason rab replied because the man has occupied a place within its walls while it was yet day Arzera replied because the ship continually takes him from the beginning of four cubits and puts him down at the end of the four cubits what is the practical difference between them the practical difference between them is the case where the sides of the ship were broken down or where one leaps from one ship into another but why does not Arzera give the same reason as rab he can answer you the sides Talmud Mas Arab and are made only to keep the water out then why does not rab give the same reason as Arzera he can answer you where the Ship moves no one disputes that it is permitted to walk through it they only differ in the case where it stops said Arnam and B. Isaac from our mission also it may be inferred that they do not differ in the case of a ship that was on the move once from the statement it once happened that they were coming from Brindisi and while their ship was sailing in the sea our Gamaliel and our Eliezer B. Ezra walked about throughout its area but our Joshua and our Akiba did not move beyond four cubits. Because they desired to impose a restriction upon themselves now if it be granted that there is no difference of opinion between them in the case where a ship is on the move it was perfectly correct to state they desired since the ship might have stopped but if it be maintained that they differ even in such a case what is the sense in saying they desired to impose a restriction seeing that in their view walking beyond four cubits is a prohibition our Ashi said the inference from our mission. Also proves that the dispute between the ten is mentioned relates to a stationary ship or ship was mentioned in the same way as a cattle pen and a cattle fold as a cattle pen and a cattle fold are stationary so is the ship mentioned one that was stationary Araha the son of Rabba said to Arashi the law is in agreement with Argamaliel in the case of a ship the law you say does this then imply that the others differ from him yes and so it was also taught Hananiah stated all that day they sat and discussed the question of the Halacha and in the evening my father's brother decided that the Halacha was in agreement with Argamaliel in the case of a ship and the Halacha was in agreement with Arakiba in that of a cattle pen and a cattle fold Arhananiah inquired is the law of Sabbath limits applicable at a height above ten handbreadths from the ground or not there can be no question in respect of a column that was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide since it is regarded as solid ground the question however arises in respect of a column that was ten handbreadths high but less than four handbreadths in width or where one moves by means of a miraculous leap another version in a ship now what is the law or hush I reply come and here it once happened that they were coming from Brindisi and while their ship was sailing in the sea etc now if it be granted that the law of Sabbath limits is applicable one can well see the reason why they desired but if it is contended that the law of the Sabbath limits is inapplicable why it may be asked did they desire as Rabba explained below that the reference was to a ship that sailed in shallow water so it may here also be explained that the reference is to a ship that sailed in shallow water come and here once on a Sabbath they did not enter the harbor until dusk etc now if it be granted that the law of Sabbath limits is applicable their action was perfectly correct but if it be contended that the law of Sabbath limits is inapplicable what it may be asked could it have mattered if they had not been assured we were already within the Sabbath limit Rabba replied that was a case where the ship sailed in shallow waters come and here who was it that delivered the seven traditional rulings on a Sabbath morning to our Histiat Surah and on the same Sabbath evening to Rabbi Pamadai was it not Elijah who delivered them which proves does it not that the law of Sabbath limits is inapplicable above ten handbreadths from the ground it is possible that the demon Joseph delivered them come and here if a man said let me be a Nazi right on the day on which the son of David comes he may drink wine on Sabbaths and festival days Talmud Mas Arabin B but is forbidden to drink wine on any of the weekdays now if it is granted that the law of Sabbath limits is applicable it is quite intelligible why the man is permitted to drink wine on Sabbaths and festival days but if it be contended that the law of Sabbath limits is inapplicable why it may be asked is it permitted for the man to drink wine on Sabbaths and festival days there the case is different since scripture said behold I will send you Elijah the prophet etc and Elijah surely did not come on the previous day if so even in the case of weekdays the drinking of wine should be
The difficulty would arise since the Nazi rightship had once taken effect. How could the Sabbath subsequently annul it? The fact is that the man is assumed to have made his vow on a Sabbath or on a festival day, and it is on that day only that he is permitted to drink wine. Subsequently, however, this is forbidden to him once on a Sabbath. They did not enter the harbor, etc. Attended taught Argamaliel had a tube through which he could see at a distance of 2,000 cubits across the land and a corresponding distance across the sea. If a man desires to ascertain the depth of a ravine, let him use a tube and by looking through it be in a position to ascertain the depth of the ravine. And if he wishes to ascertain the height of the palm tree, let him measure his own height and the length of his shadow as well as that of the shadow of the tree, and he will thus ascertain the height of the palm tree. If a man desires to prevent wild beasts from sheltering in the shadow of a great mound, let him. Insert a rod in the ground during the fourth hour of the day and observe in which direction its shadow inclines and then make the mound slope from the ground upwards and from its top downwards. Nehemiah son of Arhanelai was once on a Sabbath day absorbed in an oral study and walked out beyond the Sabbath limit. Your disciple Nehemiah said Arhistah to Arnaman is in distress. Draw for him the other replied a wall of human beings and let him re-enter Arnaman. B. Isaac was sitting behind. Rabba while the latter sat before Arnaman when Arnaman B. Isaac said to Rabba what exactly was the point that Arhistah raised if it be suggested that we are dealing here with a case where the distance could be fully lined with men and that the point he raised was whether the Halachah was in agreement with Argamaliel Talmud, Mas Arabin, or whether the Halachah was not in agreement with Argamaliel or do we deal here with a case where the distance could not be fully lined with men and it point he raised was whether the Halachah is in agreement with Aralizer or not it is obvious that we are dealing with a case where the distance could not be fully lined with men for were it to be imagined that we are dealing with one where it could be fully lined with men what was there for him to ask seeing that Rab has actually laid down the Halachah is in agreement with Argamaliel in respect of a cattle pen a cattle fold and a ship we must consequently be dealing with a case where the distance could not be fully lined with men and the point he raised was in connection with the ruling of Aralizer this is also borne out by an inference for he said to him let him re-enter but what was the need for saying let him re-enter does not this imply re-entry in the absence of a complete wall Arnam and B. Isaac pointed out the following objection to Rabba if its wall collapsed it is not permitted to replace it by a human being a beast or vessels nor may one put up the bed to spread over it is sheet because even a temporary tent may not for the first time be built on a festival day and there is no need to state that this is forbidden on a Sabbath day. You the other reply quote to me from this statement I can quote to you from the following a man may put up his fellow as a wall in order that he may thereby be enabled to eat to drink and to sleep and he may put up the bed and spread over it a sheet to prevent the sun rays from falling upon the corpse or upon footstuffs are then. The two rulings mutually contradictory there is really no contradiction since one represents the view of Aralizer and the other that of the rabbis for we learned in the case of the stopper of a skylight Aralizer says that if it was tied and suspended one may close the skylight with it otherwise it may not be so used but the sages ruled in either case one may close the skylight with it has it not however been stated in connection with this ruling Rabbi Barhan said in the name of R. Yohanan all agree that not even a temporary tent may for the first time be made on a festival day and there is no need to say that this may not be done on a Sabbath day but they differ on the question of adding to a structure since Aralizer holds that no such structural addition may be made on a festival day and there is no need to say that this may not be done on a Sabbath day while the sages maintain that such structural additions may be made on a Sabbath and there is no need to say that this may be done on a festival day the fact is that there is really no contradiction since one very the represents the view of Armeir and the other that of Arjuna for it was taught if a man used a beast as a wall for a sukkah Armeir ruled it to be invalid while Arjuna ruled it to be valid now Armeir who ruled the wall there to be invalid from which it is evident that he does not regard it as a proper wall would here permit the putting up of a similar wall since thereby nothing improper is Done while Arjuta who regards the wall there as valid from which it is evident that he regards it as a proper wall would here forbid a similar wall do you regard this as sound reasoning might it not be suggested that Armeir was heard to rule the wall to be invalid only in the case of a beast was he however heard to give the same ruling in respect of a human being and vessels furthermore in agreement with whose view could that of Armeir be if it be suggested in agreement with that of R. Eliza one could object that the latter forbade even the addition to a structure consequently it must be in agreement with that of the rabbis but could it not be objected the rabbis may only have permitted the addition to a structure did this however make it permissible to put up a full wall at the outset the fact is that both are in agreement with the view of the rabbis yet there is no contradiction between the rulings regarding vessels since the former relates to a third wall and the latter. To a fourth one the inference from the wording leads to the same conclusion for it was stated if its wall collapsed this is conclusive Talmud, Mas Arabin B but does not a contradiction still remain between the two rulings regarding a human being there is really no contradiction between the two rulings regarding a human being since the former refers to a man used as a wall with his knowledge while the latter refers to a man so used without his knowledge was not however the arrangement for. Nehemiah son of Arhanelai made with the men's knowledge no without their knowledge Arhista at any rate must have known Arhista was not one of the number certain gardeners once brought water through human walls and Samuel had them flogged he said if the rabbis permitted human walls where the men composing them were unaware of the purpose they served would they also permit such walls where the men were aware of the purpose a number of skin bottles were once lying in the manner of Mahusa and while Rabba was coming from his discourse his attendant carried them in on a subscient Sabbath he desired to carry them in again but he forbade it to them because in the second case the human walls must be regarded as having been put up with the men's knowledge which is forbidden for Levi straw was brought in for Zeiri cattle fodder and for Arshimai Bihai water mission if a man who was permitted to do so went out beyond the Sabbath limit and was then told that the act had already been performed he is entitled to move within 2,000 cubits in any direction if he was within the Sabbath limit he is regarded as if he had not gone out all who go out to save life may return to their original places tomorrow what need was there for the ruling if he was within the Sabbath limit he is regarded as if he had not gone out Rabba replied it is this that was meant if he was within his Sabbath limit he is regarded as if he had not gone out of his house is not this obvious it might have been presumed that as he tore himself away from his original abode he has thereby detached himself completely from it hence we were informed that if he was within his sabbath limit he is regarded as if he had not gone out of his house our shimai bihai replied it is this that was meant if the sabbath limits which the rabbis have allowed him overlapped with his original sabbath limit he is regarded as if he had not gone out of his original sabbath limit on what principle do they differ the one master is of the opinion that the overlapping of sabbath limits is of significance while the other master maintains that it is of no consequence said of eight rabbi are you not of the opinion that the overlapping of sabbath limits is of significance what if a man spent the sabbath in a cavern the length of the floor of whose interior was four thousand cubits and that of its roof was less than four thousand cubits would he not be able to move all along its roof and two thousand cubits Beyond it the other replied do you make no distinction between a case where the man began to spend the Sabbath within the walls of his abode while it was yet day and one where he did not begin to spend the Sabbath between the walls while it was yet day you say that where a man did not begin to spend the Sabbath within the walls of an abode common to both limits overlapping of the limits is of no consequence Talmud, Mas Arabin but surely we learned Aralizer Eliza ruled if a man walked two cubits beyond his Sabbath limit he may re-enter and if he walked three cubits he may not re-enter from which it is evident is it not that our Eliza follows his principle on the basis of which he ruled the man is deemed to be in their center so that the four cubits which the rabbis have allowed him are regarded as overlapping with that man's former Sabbath limit and it is because of this overlapping that he ruled he may re-enter does not this then clearly prove that the overlapping of Sabbath limits is of significance said Rabbi Barhana to Abbe do you raise an objection against the master from a ruling of Aralizer yes the other replied because I heard from the master himself that the rabbis differed from Aralizer only in respect of a secular errand but that in respect of a religious one they
Larger distance Rav Judah replied in the name of Rav the meaning is that they may return to their original places with their weapons as it was taught at first they used to leave their weapons in a house that was nearest to the town wall once it happened that the enemies recognized them and pursued them and as these entered the house to take out their weapons the enemies followed them there was a stampede and the men who killed one another were more than those whom the enemies killed at that time it was ordained that men in such circumstances shall return to their places with their weapons Arnaman B. Isaac replied there is really no contradiction the latter deals with the case where the Israelites overpowered the heathens while the former deals with one where the heathens overpowered themselves Rav Judah stated in the name of Rav if foreigners beseeched Israelite towns it is not permitted to sally forth against them or to desecrate the Sabbath in any other way on their account so it was also taught if foreigners besieged etc. This however applies only where they came for the sake of money matters but if they came with the intention of taking lips the people are permitted to sally forth against them with their weapons and to desecrate the Sabbath on their account where the attack however was made on a town that was close to a frontier even though they did not come with any intention of taking lives but merely to plunder straw or stubble the people are permitted to sally forth against them with their weapons and to desecrate the Sabbath on their account said our Joseph B. Menumi in the name of Arnaman Babylon is regarded as a frontier town and by this he meant Nehardi our dust of Barry made the following exposition what is the significance of the scriptural text and they told David saying behold the Philistines are fighting against Gila and they robbed the threshing floors attended Takila was a frontier town and they only came for the sake of plundering. Straw or stubble for it is written and they robbed the threshing floors and yet it is written therefore David inquired of the Lord saying shall I go and smite these Philistines and the Lord said unto David go and smite the Philistines and save Kilo what was it that he inquired about if it be suggested whether it was permitted or forbidden to repulse the attack surely it could be retorted the Beth Din of Samuel the Ramadhide was then in existence rather he inquired whether he would be successful or not the inference from the wording of the text also supports this view for it says go and smite the Philistines and save Kilo this is conclusive mission if a man sat down by the way and when he rose up he observed that he was near a town he may not enter it since it had not been his intention to do so so our mayor Arjuda ruled he may enter it said Arjuda it once actually happened that Artarfan entered a town though this was not his intention when the Sabbath had begun tomorrow it was taught Arjuda related it once happened that Artarfan was on a journey when dusk fell and he spent the night on the outskirts of a town in the morning he was discovered by some herdsmen who said to him master behold the town is just in front of you come in he thereupon entered and sat down in the house of study and delivered discourses all that day said Arakiba to him is that incident any proof is it not possible that he had the town in his mind or that the house of study was actually within his Sabbath limit mission if a man slept by the way and was unaware that night had fallen he is entitled to move within 2,000 cubits in any direction so are Yohanan Binuri the sages however ruled he has only 4 cubits within which to move our Eliza ruled and the man is deemed to be in their center Arjuda ruled he may move in any direction he desires Arjuda however agrees that if he has once chosen his direction he may not go back on it if there were two men and a part of the prescribed number of cubits of the one overlap with that of the other they may bring their meals and eat them in the middle Talmud, Mas Iravan be provided the one does not carry out anything from his limit into that of the other if there were three men and the prescribed limit of the middle one overlap with the respective limits of the others he is permitted to eat with either of them and either of them is permitted to eat with him but the two outer persons are forbidden to eat with one another are Simeon remarked to what may this case be compared to three courtyards that open one into the other and also into a public domain where if the two outer ones made an Arab with the middle one it is permitted to have access to them and they are permitted access to it but the two outer ones are forbidden access to one another tomorrow Rav inquired what is our Yohan and Binuri's view does he hold that ownerless objects do acquire their place in respect of the Sabbath and consequently it would have been proper that he should express his disagreement with the sages in respect of inanimate objects and the only reason why he and the sages expressed their dispute in connection with a human being was to inform you how far the view of the rabbis extends is that although it might be argued since a man who is awake acquires his place a man asleep should also acquire his place hence we were informed that no such argument is admissible or is it likely that our Yohan and Binuri holds that elsewhere Ownerless objects do not acquire their place in respect of the Sabbath and the reason for his ruling here is that since a man awake acquires his place so does also a man asleep. Our Joseph replied come and here if rain fell on the eve of a festival the water may be carried within a radius of 2,000 cubits in any direction but if it fell on a festival day the water is on a PAR with the feet of every man now if you grant that our Yohanan Binuri is of the opinion that ownerless objects acquire their place in respect of the Sabbath this ruling you may say represents the view of our Yohanan but if you contend that ownerless objects do not acquire their place in respect of the Sabbath whose view it may be asked is here represented is it neither that of our Yohanan nor that of the rabbis have a sat at his studies and discoursed on this subject when our Safra said to him is it not possible that we are dealing here with a case where the rain fell near a town and the townspeople relied on that Rain this the other reply cannot be entertained at all for we learned a cistern belonging to an individual person is on a PAR with that individual's feet and one belonging to a town is on a PAR with the feet of the people of that town and one used by the Babylonian pilgrims is on a PAR with the feet of any man who draws the water now it was also taught the water of a cistern used by the tribes may be moved within a radius of 2,000 cubits in any direction or not then the two rulings. Mutually contradictory consequently it must be conceded that the latter represents the view of our Yohanan while the former represents that of the rabbis when he came to our Joseph and told him such and such a thing said our Safra and such and such did I reply the other remarked why did you not argue with him from that very statement if it could be entertained that we were dealing with a case where the rain fell near a town then instead of ruling that the water may be moved within a distance of two. Thousand cubits in any direction should it not have been ruled that it was on a PAR with the feet of the people of that town the master said if it fell on a festival day the water is on a PAR with the feet of every man but why should not the rainwater acquire its place for the Sabbath in the ocean must it then be assumed that this ruling is not in agreement with the view of our Eliezer for if it were in agreement with our Eliezer the objection would arise did he not state that all the world drinks from the water of the ocean our Isaac replied here we are dealing with a case where the clouds were formed on the eve of the festival but is it not possible that those moved away and these are others it is a case where one can recognize them by some identification mark and if you prefer I might reply this is a matter of doubt in respect of a rabbinical law and in any such doubt a lenient ruling is adopted but why should not the water acquire its place for the Sabbath in the clouds may it then be derived from this that the law of the Sabbath limits does not apply to the air above a height often handbreadths for if the law of Sabbath limits were at that height applicable the water should have acquired its place for the Sabbath in the clouds I may in fact maintain that the law of Sabbath limits is applicable even at the height mentioned but the water is absorbed in clouds Talmud, Mas Aravind but should it not then be forbidden all the more because it was produced on the festival the fact however is that the water in the clouds is in constant motion now you have arrived at this explanation you can raise no difficulty about the ocean either since the water in the ocean is also in constant motion and it was taught running rivers and gushing springs are on a PAR with the feet of all men our Jacob B.E.D. stated in the name of our Joshua B. Levi the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohan and Binuri said our Zerah to our Jacob B.E.D. did you hear it explicitly or did you Understand it by implication I the other replied have heard it explicitly what was that general statement the one in which our Joshua B. Levi has laid down the Halachah is in agreement with the authority that maintains a less restrictive ruling in respect of the laws of Arab what need then was there for the two statements our Zerah replied both were required for if we had been informed only that the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohan and Binuri it might have been assumed that this applies. In all cases whether the Halachah leads to a relaxation or to a restriction hence we were informed that the Halachah is in agreement with the authority that maintains a less restrictive ruling in respect of the laws of Arab then let him state the Halachah is in agreement with the authority that maintains a less restrictive ruling in respect of Arab for what
Practical decision in agreement with the ruling of Aralizer and after he had recollected he remarked Aralizer deserves to be relied upon in a time of need now what is meant by the expression after he recollected if it be suggested after he recollected that the Halacha was not in agreement with Aralizer but with the rabbis the difficulty would arise how could he act in agreement with his view even in a time of need it must consequently be conceded that the law was laid down neither in agreement with Aralizer nor in agreement with the rabbis and that it was after he had recollected that not one individual but several authorities differed from him that he remarked Aralizer deserves to be relied upon in a time of need said our Meshachia to Rabbah or as others say our Naman B. Isaac said to Rabbah is there no difference in the case of a rabbinical law between a dispute of two individuals and one between an individual authority and several authorities was it not in fact taught on? Receiving an early report of the death of a near relative both the seven and the thirty days of mourning must be observed but on receiving a belated one only one day of mourning is to be observed and what is meant by early and belated a report received within thirty days of the death is said to be early and one received after thirty days from the death is said to be belated so our Akiva the sages however ruled whether a report is early or belated both the seven and the thirty days of mourning must be observed and in connection with this Rabbi Barhan stated in the name of our Yohanan wherever you come across a law which an individual authority relaxes and several authorities restrict the Halachah is in agreement with the majority who restrict it except in this case where the Halachah is in agreement with our Akiva though he relaxes the law and the sages restrict it in this respect he is of the same opinion as Samuel who laid down the Halachah is in agreement with it. Authority that relaxes the law in the case of a mourner, thus it follows that it is only in the case of mourning that the rabbis have relaxed the law, but that elsewhere, even in respect of a rabbinical law, difference is to be made between a dispute of two individuals and a dispute of an individual authority against a number of authorities. Talmud, Mas Arab and B. R. Papa replied, It was required since it might have been presumed that this applied only to Arabs of courtyards, but not to Arabs of Sabbath limits. Hence, it was necessary to make that statement also. Whence, however, is it derived that a distinction is made between Arabs of courtyards and Arabs of Sabbath limits? From what we learned, our Judah ruled this applies only to Arabs of Sabbath limits, but in the case of Arabs of courtyards, an Arab may be prepared for a person whether he is aware of it or not, since a privilege may be conferred upon a man in his absence, but no disadvantage may be imposed upon him except in his presence. Are as she replied it was required since it might have been assumed that this applied only to the remnants of an Arab but not to the beginnings of one whence however is it derived that a distinction is made between the remnants of an Arab and the beginnings of one from what we learned our Jose rule this applies only to the beginnings of the Arab but in the case of the remnants of one even the smallest quantity of food is sufficient the sole reason for the injunction to provide Arabs for courtyards. Being that the law of Arab shall not be forgotten by the children our Jacob and our Zerika said the Halachah is always in agreement with our Akiba when he differs from a colleague of his with our Jose even when he differs from several of his colleagues and with Rabbi when he differs from a colleague of his to what extent were these meant to influence the law in practice our C replied to the extent of adopting them for general practice our Hibi Abba replied to the extent of being inclined in their favor and our Jose son of Arhanan replied to the extent only of viewing them merely as apparently acceptable in the same sense did our Jacob B.E.D. rule in the name of our Yohanan in a dispute between our Meir and our Judah the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah and one between our Judah and our Jose the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose and there is no need to state that in a dispute between our Meir and our Jose the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose for since it has been laid down that the opinion of the former is of no consequence where it is opposed by that of our Judah can there be any question as to its inconsequence where it is opposed by that of our Jose R.C. said I also learned that in a dispute between our Jose and our Simeon the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose for our Abba has laid down on the authority of our Yohanan that in a dispute between our Judah and our Simeon the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah now since the latter's opinion is of no consequence where it is Opposed by our Judah, can there be any question as to its inconsequence where it is opposed by that of our Jose? The question was raised, what is the law where a ruling is a matter of dispute between our Meir and our Simeon? This is undecided. Our Meshachia stated those rules are to be disregarded. Whence does our Meshachia derive this view if it be suggested from the following where we learned our Simeon remarked to what may this case be compared to three courtyards that open one into the other and also into a public domain where if the two outer ones made an Arab with the middle one it is permitted to have access to them and they are permitted access to it but the two outer ones are forbidden access to one another in connection with which our Habibigoria stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon and who is it that differs from him evidently our Judah and since this cannot be reconciled with what has been laid down that in a dispute between our Judah and our Simeon, Halachah is in agreement with our Judah, it must consequently follow that those rules are to be disregarded, but is this really a difficulty? Is it not possible that the rules are disregarded only where a ruling to the contrary had been stated, but that where no such ruling is stated, the rules remain in force? Our Meshachia's view is rather derived from the following where we learned if a town that belonged to an individual was converted into one belonging to many, one Arab may be provided for all. The town, but if a town belonged to many and was converted into one belonging to an individual, no single Arab may he provided for all the town unless a section of it of the size of the town of Hadashah in Judea, which contains fifty residents, is excluded. So our Judah, our Simeon ruled Talmud, Mas Arab, and the three courtyards, each of which contain two houses in connection with which our Habibigoria stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon, for who is it that differed from him? Our Judah, of course, but has it not been laid down that in a dispute between our Judah and our Simeon, the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah? What, however, is really the difficulty? Is it not possible that here also we may reply that these rules are disregarded only where a ruling to the contrary had been stated, but that where no such ruling is stated, the rules remain in force? The view of our Meshachia is rather derived from the following where we learned if a man left his house and went to spend the Sabbath in another town, whether he was a Gentile or an Israelite, his share imposes restrictions on the residents of the courtyard. Our Meir, our Judah, ruled it imposes no restrictions. Our Jose ruled the share of a Gentile imposes restrictions, but that of an Israelite does not impose any restrictions because it is not usual for an Israelite to return on a Sabbath. Our Simeon ruled even if he left his house and went to spend the Sabbath with his daughter in the same town, his share imposes no. Restriction since he had no intention to return in connection with which our Habibigoria stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon for who is it that differed from him our Judah of course but has it not been laid down that in a dispute between our Judah and our Simeon the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah and what difficulty really is this is it not possible that here also the reply is that these rules are disregarded only where a ruling to the contrary had been stated but that where no such ruling is stated the rules remain in force the view of our Meshachia then is derived from the following where we learned and it is this of which the rabbis have said a poor man may make his Arab with his feet our Meir said we can apply this law to a poor man only our Judah said it applies to both rich and poor the rabbis enactment that an Arab is to be prepared with bread having had the only purpose of making it easier for the rich man so that he shall not be Compelled to go out himself to make the Arab with his feet, and when our Hibi Ashi taught Hibi Rab in the presence of Rab that the law applied to both rich and poor Rab said to him, Conclude this also with the statement the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah for what need was there for a second statement, seeing that it had already been laid down that in a dispute between our Meir and our Judah the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah, but what difficulty is this? Is it not possible that Rab does not accept those rules? Our Meshachia's statement then was derived from the following where we learn the deceased brother's wife shall neither perform the Halizan nor contract Levi rate marriage before three months have passed, similarly all other women shall be neither married nor betrothed before three months have passed, whether they were virgins or non virgins, whether widows or divorcees, whether betrothed or married, our Judah ruled those who were married may be betrothed forthwith and those who were betrothed may even be married forthwith with the exception of a betrothed woman in Judea because there
had laid down the Halachah is in agreement with Armeir in his restrictive measures. Armeshashia's statement then is derived from the following where it was taught one may attend a fair of idolaters and buy of them cattle, men, servants, maid servants, houses, fields, and vineyards. One may write the necessary documents and present them even in their courts because thereby one merely rests his property for their hands. If he is a priest, he may incur the risk of defilement by going outside the land to litigate with them and to contest the claims. And just as he may risk defilement without the land, so may he defile himself by entering a graveyard. A graveyard, how could this be imagined? Is not this a defilement? Pentateuch Ali forbidden the grave area, rather, which is only rabbinically forbidden, is to be understood. One may also incur the risk of defilement for the sake of taking a wife or studying the Torah. Our Judah said this applies only where a man cannot find in the home country. Place in which to study, but when he can find there a place for study, he may not risk his defilement. Our Jose said, even when he can find there a place where to study, he may also risk defilement. Since Talmud, Mas Arab, and be no person is so meritorious as to be able to learn from any teacher. And our Jose related it once happened that Joseph the priest went to his master at Zidon to study Torah, and in connection with this, our Yohanan said the Halacha is in agreement with our Jose, but what need was there? For this specific statement, seeing that it has already been laid down that in a dispute between our Judah and our Jose, the Halacha is in agreement with our Jose, Abe replied, this was necessary since it might have been presumed that the general rules applied only to a mission but not to a barrier. Hence, we were informed here of our Yohanan statement. Our Meshashia, however, meant this, those rules were not unanimously approved since Rab, in fact, did not accept them. Rab Judah laid down in it. Name of Samuel objects belonging to a Gentile do not acquire their place for the Sabbath in accordance with whose view has this ruling been laid down if it be suggested according to that of the rabbis the objection would arise is not this obvious since objects of Hefker though they have no owner do not acquire their place for the Sabbath was it necessary to state that the same law applies to a Gentile's objects which have an owner the fact is that the ruling has been laid down in accordance with the view of our Yohanan Binary and it is this that we were informed that our Yohanan Binary's ruling that objects acquire their place for the Sabbath applied only to objects of Hefker since they have no owner but not to a Gentile's objects which have an owner an objection was raised our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled if an Israelite borrowed an object from a Gentile on a festival day and so also if an Israelite lent an object to a Gentile on the eve of a festival and the latter returned it to him on the Festival and so also any utensils and stores that were kept within the Sabbath limit of the town may be carried within a radius of 2,000 cubits in every direction. If a Gentile has brought fruit to an Israelite front a place beyond his Sabbath limit, the latter may not move them from their position. Now, if you grant that our Yohanan Binary holds that a Gentile's objects do acquire their place for the Sabbath, it might well be explained that this ruling is in agreement with the view of our Yohanan Binary. If, however, you contend that our Yohanan Binary holds that a Gentile's objects do not acquire their place for the Sabbath, the objection would arise whose view does it represent, seeing that it is neither that of our Yohanan Binary nor that of the rabbis. Our Yohanan Binary may in fact maintain that a Gentile's objects do acquire their place for the Sabbath, but Samuel laid down his ruling in agreement with the rabbis, and as to your objection according to that of the rabbis is not. This obvious it may be replied since one might have presumed that a restriction was imposed in the case of a Gentile owner as a preventive measure against an infringement of the law in the case of an Israelite owner hence we were informed that no such restriction was deemed necessary our high B. Abin however laid down in the name of our Yohanan the objects of a Gentile acquire their place for the Sabbath a restriction having been imposed upon those of a Gentile owner as a preventive measure against the infringement of the law in the case of those of an Israelite owner some rams once arrived at Mabrakta and Rabba permitted the inhabitants of Mahuza to purchase them said Rabbin to Rabba what authority is it that you have in your mind that of Rab Judah who laid down in the name of Samuel that a Gentile's objects do not acquire their place for the Sabbath surely in a dispute between Samuel and our Yohanan the Halacha is in agreement with our Yohanan and our high B. Abin has laid down in the name of our Yohanan, the objects of a Gentile acquire their place for the Sabbath, a restriction having been imposed upon those of a Gentile owner as a preventive measure against the infringement of the law in the case of those of an Israelite owner, Rabbah thereupon ruled let them be sold to the people of Mabrakta, since in their case all Mabrakta is deemed to be only four cubits in extent. Our high taught a fish on between two Sabbath limits requires Talmud, Mas Arabin, and Iron Wall to divide it into two independent sections. Our Jose son of Arhanan laughed at him. Why did he laugh if it be suggested because the latter taught this in agreement with our Yohanan Binary that the law is to be restricted while he is of the same opinion as the rabbis that the law is to be relaxed? Is it likely it may be asked that because he is of the opinion that the law is to be relaxed, he would laugh at anyone who learned that it was to be restricted, rather say because it was taught running rivers. And gushing springs are on a par with the feet of all men, but is it not possible that he spoke of collected water? Rather, say because he taught requires an iron wall to divide it. For why should not reeds be admissible? Obviously, because the water would pass through them. But then, in the case of an iron wall, too, the water might pass. But is it not possible that he meant requires? Hence, there is no remedy. Rather, say because the sages have in fact relaxed the law in respect of water, as our tabla was informed. For our tabla inquired of Rab, does a suspended partition convert a ruin into a permitted domain? And the other replied, a suspended partition can affect permissibility of use in the case of water only, since it is only in the case of water that the sages have relaxed the law. The sages, however, ruled he has only four, etc. Is not argued. Repeating the very view of the first ten, Rab replied, there is a difference between them. For the first ten allows an area of eight cubits by eight. So it was also taught he has the right to walk within an area of eight cubits by eight. So Armeir Rabba further stated they differ only on the question of walking, but regarding the movement of objects, both agree that it is permitted along a distance of four cubits, but no more. Where in scripture are these four cubits recorded as it was taught about? Yeah, every man in his place, which implies within an area equal to his place, and what is the area of his place? Three cubits for his body and one cubit for stretching out his hands and feet. So Armeir Arjuna said three cubits for his body and one cubit to enable him to take up an object at his feet and put it down at his head. What is the practical difference between them? The practical difference between them is that according to Arjuna, the measurements of the four cubits are to be exact. Armeir she requested his son when you visit our papa, ask him whether the four cubits of which the rabbis have spoken are measured by the arm of each. Individual concerned or by the standard cubit used for sacred objects, if he tells you that the measurement is to be made by the cubit used for sacred objects, ask him what should be done in the case of the king of Bashan, and if he tells you that the measurement is to be made by the arm of each individual concerned, ask him why was not this measurement taught among those which the rabbis have prescribed in accordance with each individual when he came to our papa. The latter told him if we had been so punctilious, we would not have learned anything. The fact is that the measurement is calculated by the arm of each individual concerned, and as to your objection, why was not this measurement taught among those which the rabbis have prescribed in accordance with each individual? It may be explained that the ruling could not be regarded as definite, since even a normal person may have stumped limbs if there were two men and a part of the prescribed number of cubits of the one, etc. What? Need was there for him to make the remark to what may this case be compared it is this that our Simeon meant to say to the rabbis consider to what may this case be compared to three courtyards that are opening one into the other and also into a public domain why then do you differ there and not here and the rabbis there the residents are many but here there are few but the two outer ones etc but why do not the outer ones since they have joined in an Arab with the middle one constitute one permitted domain Rab Judah replied this is a case for instance where the middle one deposited its one Arab in one courtyard and its other Arab in the other courtyard our she's hate however replied it may even be assumed that they deposited their Arabs in the middle one but this is a case for instance where they had deposited a Talmud Mas Arab and B in two houses in agreement with whose view is it in agreement with that of Beth Shammai since it was taught if five residents collected their Arab and deposited it into receptacles their Arab Beth Shammai ruled is invalid and
each of the outer ones while the latter did not join one another in a common Arab they have thereby intimated that they were satisfied with the former association but not with the latter on the view of our Shis hey too there is really no difficulty for with the rabbis who regarded the people of the outer courtyards as residents of the middle one in order to relax the law also treat them as its residents to impose additional restrictions Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab this is the view of our Simeon the sages however ruled the one domain may be used by the residents of the two but the two domains may not be used by the residents of the one when I recited this in the presence of Samuel he said to me Talmud Mas Arabin this also is the view of our Simeon the sages however ruled the three courtyards are forbidden access to one another it was taught in agreement with the view which Rab Judah had from Samuel our Simeon remarked to what may this be compared to three courtyards that open one into the other and also into a public domain where if the two outer ones made an Arab with the middle one the residents of each of the two may bring food from their houses into the middle one and eat it there and then they may carry back any remnants to their houses but the sages rule the three courtyards are forbidden access to one another Samuel in fact follows a view he expressed elsewhere for Samuel laid down in the case of the courtyard between two alleys the residents of the former. Though they made an Arab with the residents of both alleys are nevertheless forbidden access to either if they made no Arab with either they cause the movement of objects to be forbidden in both alleys if they were in the habit of using one of the alleys but were not in the habit of using the other the movement of objects is forbidden in the one which they were in the habit of using but permitted in the one which they were not in the habit of using Rabbis son of Arhum ruled if the middle. Courtyard made an Arab with the alley which it was not in the habit of using the one which it was in the habit of using is permitted to make an Arab on its own. Rabbis son of Arhum not further stated in the name of Samuel if the alley which it was in the habit of using made an Arab on its own while the one which it was not in the habit of using made no Arab on its own and the middle courtyard itself made no Arab with either it is referred to the one which it was not in the habit of using for. In such circumstances one may be compelled not to act after the manner of Sodom Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel if a man is particular about his share in an Arab his Arab is invalid for what is its name amalgamation Arhanan ruled his Arab is valid though he himself might be called one of the men aboard in Rab Judah further ruled in the name of Samuel if one divides his Arab it is invalid in agreement with whose view is it in agreement with that of Beth Shammai since it was taught. If five residents collected their Arab and deposited it in two receptacles their Arab Beth Shammai ruled is invalid and Beth Hillel ruled their Arab is valid it may be said to agree even with the view of Beth Hillel for it is only there that Beth Hillel maintained their view where the receptacle was filled to capacity and something remained without but not here where it was originally divided in two parts but what need was there for the two rulings both were required for if we had been. Informed of the former ruling only it might have been assumed that only there is the Arab invalid since the man is particular but not here and if we had been informed of the latter ruling only it might have been assumed that only here is the Arab invalid since it was intentionally divided but not there hence both were required Arab addressed the following question to Rab Judah at the schoolhouse of Arzakai could Samuel have said if a man divides his Arab it is invalid seeing that he has laid down the house in which an Arab is deposited need not contribute its share to the bread now what is the reason for this ruling is it not because he maintains that since there is bread lying in the basket it is regarded as lying in the place appointed for the Arab then why should it not be said in this case also so long as there is bread lying in the basket it is regarded as lying in the place appointed for the Arab the other replied there the Arab is valid even if there was no other Bread in the house what is the reason because all the residents of the courtyard virtually live there Samuel stated the efficacy of an Arab is due to the principle of Kanyan and should you ask why then should not the Kanyan be affected by means of a ma'ah it could be replied because it is not easily obtainable on Sabbath eves but why should not a ma'ah affect acquisition at least where the residents did use it for an Arab its use is forbidden as a preventive measure against the possibility of assuming that a ma'ah was essential as a result of which when sometimes a ma'ah would be unobtainable no one would prepare an Arab with bread and the institution of Arab would in consequence deteriorate Rabbi stated the efficacy of an Arab is due to the principle of habitation what is the practical difference between them the difference between them is the case of an Arab that was prepared with an object of apparel with food that was worth less than a parita talmud mas Arab and b or by Minor said Abba Rabbi an objection can be raised both against your view and against that of Samuel for was it not taught if five residents who collected their Arab desire to transfer it to another place one may take it there on behalf of all of them from which it follows that it is that man alone that performs the Kanyan and no other and that it is he alone who acquires the habitation and no other the other replied this is no objection either against my view or against that of Samuel. Since the man acts on behalf of all of them Rabbi stated in the name of Arham Abigoria who had it from Rabbi Halashah is in agreement with our Simeon Mishnah if a man who was on a journey homeward was overtaken by dusk and he knew of a tree or a wall and said let my Sabbath base be under it his statement is of no avail if however he said let my Sabbath base be at its root he may walk from the place where he stands to its root a distance of two thousand cubits and from its root to his house. Another two thousand cubits thus he can walk four thousand cubits after dusk if he does not know of any tree or wall or if he is not familiar with the halacha and said let my present position be my sabbath base his position acquires for him the right of movement within a radius of two thousand cubits in any direction so our hand of antagonist the sages however rule the distances are to be squared in the shape of a square tablet so that he may gain the area of the corners this it is of which the rabbis have said a poor man may make his Arab with his feet our mayor said we can apply this law to a poor man only our judah said it applies to both rich and poor the rabbis enactment that an Arab is to be prepared with bread having the only purpose of making it easier for the rich man so that he shall not be compelled to go out himself and make the Arab with his feet tomorrow what exactly is the meaning of his statement is of no avail rabbi explained his statement is of no avail whatsoever so that he may not proceed even to the space under the tree Samuel however explained his statement is of no avail as regards proceeding to his house he may however proceed as far as the space under the tree the space under the tree however is to be measured as if one were acting both as an ass driver and a camel driver if for instance the man desired to measure from the northern side of the tree he is told to begin his measuring from its southern side and if he desired to measure from its southern side he is told to begin his measuring from the northern side Talmud, Mas Arab and Rabbi stated what is Rab's reason because the man did not specify the exact spot others read Rabbi stated what is Rab's reason because he is of the opinion that what cannot be acquired in succession cannot be acquired even simultaneously what is the practical difference between them the practical difference between them is the case where a man said let me acquire an area of four cubits out of it. Eight according to him who read because the man did not specify the exact spot such a statement is invalid for here surely he did not specify the exact spot but according to him who read what cannot be acquired in succession cannot be acquired even simultaneously such a statement is valid as if an area of four cubits had been indicated for here the man spoke of acquiring no more than four cubits turning to the main text Rabbi stated what cannot be acquired in succession cannot be acquired even simultaneously Abbe raised all objection against Rabbi if a man gives excessive tithes his produce is well prepared but his tithes are spoiled but why should it not be said what cannot be acquired in succession cannot be acquired even simultaneously tithe is different since it is applicable to fractions for if a man said let a half of every week grain be consecrated it becomes consecrated but is not the tithe of cattle inapplicable to fractions and ineffective in succession and Yet Rabbi ruled if two abreast came out tenth and they were both designated as tithe the tenth and the eleventh are a mixture of holy and profane the tithing of cattle is different since in the case of error it is applicable in succession for we have learned if the ninth was named tenth and tenth ninth and the eleventh tenth all the three are consecrated but is not a thanksgiving offering invalid in the case of error as well as in one of succession and yet it was stated if the slaying of a sacrifice of thanksgiving was accompanied by all offering of eighty loaves Hezekiah rule forty out of these eighty are consecrated and our Yohanan rule forty out of eighty cannot be consecrated surely in connection with this it was stated our Joshua B. Levi explained all agree that forty of the loaves are consecrated where the donor
cubits, but in the case of a tree, the diameter underneath which was only seven cubits, behold, a part at least of his house is well marked out. It was taught in agreement with Rab, and it was also taught in agreement with Samuel. It was taught in agreement with Rab. If a man who was on a journey homeward was overtaken by dusk, and he knew of a tree or a wall, and said, Let my Sabbath base be under it, his statement is of no avail. But if he said, Let my Sabbath base be in such and such a place, he may continue his journey until he arrives at that place. Having arrived there, he may walk throughout its interior and along a distance of two thousand cubits beyond it. This, however, applies only to a well-defined spot. As for instance, a mound that was ten handbreadths high and from four cubits to two beth sei in area, or a valley that was ten handbreadths deep and from four cubits to two beth sei in area, but where the place is not well defined, he is not allowed to move more than four cubits if two. We're traveling together and one of them knows of a well-defined place and the other does not know of it. The latter transfers his right to choose a place to the former who then declares my Sabbath base shall be in such and such a place. This only applies where the man had indicated the four cubits he selected by a mark. But if he did not indicate the four cubits he had selected by any mark he must not stir from his place. Must it be said that this presence an objection against Samuel Samuel can answer you here. We are dealing with a case where from the place on which the man stood to the root of the tree there were two thousand and four cubits so that if you were to put him on the further side of the tree he would be standing outside his permitted limit. Hence if he indicated four cubits on the near side of the tree he may proceed thither otherwise he may not. It was taught in agreement with Samuel if a man made a mistake and prepared Arabs in two opposite directions believing that. It is permitted to provide Arabs in two opposite directions, or if he said to his servants, Go and prepare an Arab for me, and one prepared for him an Arab in a northerly direction, and the other prepared one for him in a southerly direction, he may proceed northwards as far as the limit of his southern Arab, and southwards as far as the limit of his northern Arab. But if they measured each limit exactly, he may not stir from his place. Must it be said that this presence an objection against Rab? No Rab is a tana and is privileged to differ. If, however, he said, Let my Sabbath base be at its root, he may walk from the place where he stands to its root a distance of two thousand cubits, and from its root to his house another two thousand cubits. Thus he can walk four thousand cubits after dust. Talmud, Mas Arab and Rabbah explained this applies only whereby running towards the root he can reach it before the Sabbath began. Said Abbe to him, Was it not in fact stated was overtaken by dust? Meaning is that he was overtaken by dusk as far as his house was concerned, the root of the tree, however, he could well reach before dusk. Other say Robert replied, The meaning is that he would be overtaken by dusk if he walked slowly, but by running he could well reach the root. Rabbi and our Joseph were once underway when the former said to the latter, Let our Sabbath base be under the palm tree that is supporting another tree, or as others read under the palm tree that releases its owner from it. Burden of taxes, I do not know if the other replied, Rely then on me. The first said, For it was taught our Jose ruled if two were traveling together, one of whom knew of a well defined place, and the other did not know of it. The latter transfers his right to a choice of place to the former who then declares, Let our Sabbath base be in such and such a place. This, however, was not exactly correct. He attributed the teaching to our Jose with the sole object that the latter should accept it from him since. Our Jose was known to have sound reasons for his rulings if he does not know of any tree or wall or if he is not familiar etc. Where in scripture are these two thousand cubits prescribed it was taught about yeah every man in its place refers to the four cubits let no man go out of his place refers to the two thousand cubits whence do we derive this our historical replied we deduce place from place place from fly fly from fly fly from border border from border border from without and without from without since it is written and ye shall measure without the city for the east side two thousand cubits etc. But why should we not deduce it from the verse from the wall of the city and outward a thousand cubits the expression without is deduced from without but not from outward what material difference however is there between the two expressions did not the school of our Ishmael in fact teach with reference to the expressions the priest shall return and the priest shall come returning and Coming mean the same thing such a comparison is made only where no like expression is available but where one exactly like it is available deduction is made only from the one which is exactly like it a radius of 2000 cubits as to our hand of B antigonus what possible justification is there for his view if he upholds the word analogy the objection could be raised does not scripture speak of sides if however he does not uphold the word analogy the difficulty would arise whence does he deduce that a sabbath limit is 2000 cubits he does in fact uphold the word analogy but here the case is different since scripture said this shall be to them the open land about the cities which implies in this case only sides must be allowed but not in that of those who observe the sabbath rest and the rabbis they uphold the interpretation which our hand advanced like this measurement shall be that of all who observe the sabbath rest are ahabi jacob ruled a man who carries an object Along four cubits in a public domain incurs no guilt unless he carries at a distance equal to the diagonal of their square. Our pop related Robert tested us with the following question with regard to a pillar in a public domain ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide. Is it necessary that its width shall be equal to the diagonal of four cubits square or is this unnecessary? And we replied, Is not this case identical with that of our Hannah who learned like this measurement shall be that of all who observe the Sabbath rest? This it is of which the rabbis have said a poor man may make his Arab with his feet. Our Meir said we can apply this law to a poor man only, etc. Our Nabin said they differ only where the expression used was in my place since our Meir holds that the essence of an Arab is bread Talmud, Mas Arab and B, and that therefore it is only for a poor man that the rabbis have relaxed the law but not for a rich man while our Judah holds that the essence of an Arab is a position. Of one's feet irrespective of whether one is poor or rich but where the expression used was in such and such a place all agree that only a poor man is allowed such an Arab but not a rich man and who was it that learned this it is of which the rabbis have said etc. Our Meir and what does he refer to to the case of one who does not know of any tree or wall or one who is not familiar with the halacha and who was it that learned the rabbis enactment that an Arab is to be prepared with bread. Having the only purpose of making it easier our Judah Arhista however said they differ only where the expression used was in such and such a place our Meir being of the opinion that the law was relaxed for the poor only but not for the rich while our Judah holds that it was relaxed for both poor and rich but where the expression used was in my place all agree that the law was relaxed for both poor and rich since the essence of Arab is the position of one's feet at the spot appointed and who was. It that learned this it is of which the rabbis have said our and what does he refer to to the following if a man who was on a journey homeward was overtaken by dusk and who was it that learned the rabbis enactment that an Arab is to be prepared with bread having the only purpose of making it easier both it was taught in agreement with our and both poor and rich must prepare their Arab with bread a rich man furthermore must not proceed beyond the Sabbath limit and make the declaration. Let my Sabbath base be where I stand now because it is only for the benefit of one who was underway when it became dusk that the rabbis have enacted that an Arab may be prepared with one's feet so our Meir Arjuna ruled both poor and rich must prepare their Arab with their feet a rich man should therefore proceed beyond the Sabbath limit and make the declaration let my Sabbath base be where I stand now and this is the essence of an Arab the sages however allowed a householder to send his Arab by. The hand of his servant, or by the hand of his son, or by the hand of any other agent, in order to make it easier for him, our Judah related it once happened that the Memel and Gorian families at Aroma distributed dry figs and dry grapes to the poor in a time of dearth, and the poor men of Farshine and Farhin and I used to come and wait at their Sabbath limit until dusk, and on the following day got up early and proceeded to their destination. Our Ashi said an inference from the wording of a mission also supports this view, for it was stated if a man left his home to proceed to a town with which his hometown desired to be connected by an Arab, but a friend of his induced him to return home, he himself is allowed to proceed to the other town, but all the other townspeople are forbidden. So our Judah, and in discussing the point, in what respect does he differ from them, Aruna replied, We are here dealing with the case of a man who had, for instance, two houses between which two Sabbath. Limits intervened as far as he is concerned since he had set out on his journey he has the status of a poor man they however have the status of rich men thus it is perfectly dear that only a poor
Feet now if you were to contend that he is not entitled to the four cubits how can it state its purpose to be of making it easier surely it results in the imposition of a restriction one is nevertheless pleased with the enactment since thereby one avoids the trouble of going out mission if a man left his home to proceed to a town with which his hometown desired to be connected by an Arab but a friend of his induced him to return home he himself is allowed to proceed to the other town. But all the other townspeople are forbidden so are Jude Armeyer ruled whosoever is able to prepare an Arab and neglected to do it is in the position of an ass driver and a camel driver Gemara in what respect does he differ from the Marhuna replied we are here dealing with the case of a man who had for instance two houses between which two Sabbath limits intervened as far as he is concerned since he had set out on his journey he has the status of a poor man they however have the status of rich. Men so it was also taught if a man had two houses and two Sabbath limits intervened between them he acquires his Arab as soon as he had set out on his journey so Arjuda relaxing the law still more Arjose son of Arjuda ruled even if a friend of his met him and said spend a night here as the weather is rather hot or rather cold he may set out on his journey on the following day as early as he likes Rabbi submitted all agree that it is necessary to make the prescribed declaration the only point at issue between them being whether it is essential for the man to have actually set out on his journey Arjoseph however submitted that it is essential for the man to have set out on his journey is disputed by none the only point at issue between them being whether it is necessary for him to make the prescribed declaration whose view is followed in the ruling of Allah that if a man set out on a journey and a friend of his induced him to return behold he is regarded as having returned and as having set out but if he is regarded as having returned why is he described as having set out and if he is regarded as having set out why is he described as having returned it is this that was meant although he has actually returned he is regarded as one who had set out now in agreement with whose view has the statement been made in agreement with that of Arjoseph according to our Jose son of Arjuna Arjuna B. Ishtatha once brought a basket of fruit to our Nathan B. Ashai when the former was departing the latter allowed him to descend the stairs and then called after him spend the night here on the following day he got up early and departed Talmud Mas Arab and B in agreement with whose view did he act was it in agreement with that of our Joseph according to our Jose son of Arjuna no in agreement with Rabbi according to Rajud Armeir ruled whosoever is able to prepare an Arab etc have we not already learned this once if this is doubtful the man said Armeir and Arjuna isn't it Position of both an ass driver and a camel driver. Arshis hate replied, Do not say that Armeir's view is that only where it is doubtful whether a man had a valid Arab or not is he in the position of an ass driver and a camel driver, and that where it is certain that he prepared no Arab he is not in such a position, but rather even where it is certain that he prepared no Arab he is in the position of an ass driver and camel driver. For here surely it is a case where it is certain that the man had prepared no Arab, and yet he is put in the position of an ass driver and a camel driver. Mishnah he who went out beyond his Sabbath limit, even only a distance of one cubit, must not re-enter. Our Eliza ruled, If a man walked two cubits beyond his Sabbath limit, he may re-enter, and if he walked three cubits, he may not re-enter. Gemara Arhana ruled, If a man had one foot within his Sabbath limit and his other foot without that Sabbath limit, he may not re-enter, for it is written in scripture, if thou Turn away thy foot from the Sabbath the written form being thy foot but was it not taught if a man had one foot within his Sabbath limit and his other foot without he may re-enter this represents the view of others for it was taught others maintain that a man is deemed to be where the greater part of his body is some there are who read our hand and ruled if a man had one foot within his Sabbath limit and his other foot without he may re-enter for it is written in scripture if thou turn away thy foot from Sabbath which is read as thy feet but was it not taught he may not re-enter he maintains the same view as others it having been taught a man is deemed to be where the greater part of his body is our Eliza ruled if a man walked two cubits beyond his Sabbath limit he may re-enter and if he walked three cubits he may not re-enter but was it not taught our Eliza ruled if he walked one cubit beyond his Sabbath limit he may re-enter and if two cubits he may not re-enter this is no Difficulty since the former refers to a person who left the first cubit but was still within the second while the latter refers to one who left the second and was within the third but was it not taught our Eliza ruled even if he was one cubit beyond his Sabbath limit he may not re-enter this was taught concerning a measure for we have in fact learned and to the measure of whom the rabbis have spoken a distance of two thousand cubits only is allowed even if the end of his permitted measure terminated within a cave mission if a man was overtaken by dusk when only one cubit outside the Sabbath limit he may not enter it our Simeon ruled even if he was fifteen cubits away he may enter since the surveyors do not measure exactly on account of those who are Gemara it was taught on account of those who are in their measure C-H-A-P-T-E-R B mission how are the Sabbath boundaries to towns extended if one house recedes and another projects if one turret of the wall recedes and another Projects if there were ruins ten hand breadths, high Talmud, Moss Arabin or bridges or sepulchral monuments that contain dwelling chambers the boundary of the town is extended to include them Sabbath limits furthermore are to be shaped like a square tablet in order that the use of the corners might be gained Gemara Rab and Samuel are at variance one learned Meobrin and the other learned Meobrin he who learned Meobrin explains it as adding a wing and he who learned Meobrin explains it. In the same sense as that of a pregnant woman the cave of Machbala Rab and Samuel differ as to its meaning one holds that the cave consisted of two chambers one within the other and the other holds that it consisted of a lower and upper chamber according to him who holds that the chambers were one above the other the term Machbala is well justified but according to him who holds that it consisted of two chambers one within the other what could be the meaning of Machbala that it had multiples. Of couples Mamre the city of Arbar Isaac explained the city of the four couples Adam and Eve Abraham and Sarah Isaac and Rebecca Jacob and Leah and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel Rab and Samuel are at variance one holds that his name was Nimrod and why was he called Amraphel because he ordered our father Abraham to be cast into a burning furnace but the other holds that his name was Amraphel and why was he called Nimrod because in his reign he led all the world in rebellion against himself now there arose a new king over Egypt Rab and Samuel differ one explains actually a new king and the other explains he issued new decrees he who explained actually a new king did so because it is written new while he who explained he issued new decrees did so because it was not stated and the former king died and a new king reigned but according to him who explained he issued new decrees may it not be objected that it was written who knew not Joseph what is the meaning of who knew not Joseph who appeared as if he never knew Joseph Nimod 18 and 12 we learned in his generation their heart are Yohanan stated I spent 18 days at Arashai Burabi and learned from him only one word in our mission of is that how are the Sabbath boundaries of towns extended is to be read as Meobrin with an Allah but surely this is not correct for did not our Yohanan state Arashai Burabi had 12 disciples and I spent 18 days among them and gained a knowledge of everyone's intellectual powers and of everyone's wisdom now is it likely that he gained a knowledge of everyone's intellectual powers and of everyone's wisdom and yet did not learn any Gemara if you like I may reply he may have learned much from them but from him he did not learn more than the one word and if you prefer I might reply he meant to say that in our mission he learned only one word our Yohanan further stated when we were studying Torah at Arashai eight of us used to sit in the space of one cubit rabbi stated when we were studying Torah at our Eliezer Bishamu as six of us used to sit in one cubit our Yohanan further stated our Ashai Burabi in his generation was like our Meir in his generation as was the case with our Meir in his generation that his colleagues could not fathom the depth of his knowledge so was it with our Ashai that his colleagues could not fathom the depth of his knowledge our Yohanan further stated the hearts of the ancients were like the door of the Ulam but that of the last generations was like the door of the Hikal but ours is like the eye of a fine needle our Akiba is classed among the ancients our Eliezer Bishamu among the last generations others say our Eliezer Bishamu is classed among the ancients and our Ashai Burabi among the last generations but ours is like the eye of a fine needle and we said they are like a pig in a wall in respect of Gemara and we said Rabba are like a finger in wax as regards logical argument we said our Ashi are like a finger in a pit as regards forgetfulness
Is there anyone who would inquire of the Judeans who are exact in their language whether we learned Miabran or Miabran and whether we learned Akuzo or Akuzo for they would know the correct spelling when they were asked they replied some authorities learn Miabran while others learn Miabran some learn Akuzo while others learn Akuzo the Judeans were exact in their language for instance a Judean once announced that he had a cloak to sell what he was asked is the color of your cloak like? That a beat on the ground he replied the Galileans who were not exact in their language for instance a certain Galilean once went about inquiring who has a more foolish Galilean they said to him do you mean an ass for riding wine to drink wool for clothing or a lamb for killing a woman once wished to say to her friend come I would give you some fat to eat but that what she actually said to her was my cast away may a lioness devour you a certain woman once appeared before a judge and addressed him as follows my master slave I had a child and they stole you from me and it is of such a size that if they had hanged you upon it your feet would not have reached to the ground when rabbis made indulged in enigmatic speech she used to say this the little strikes against the jar let the eagles fly to their nest and when she wished them to remain at table she used to tell them the crown of her friend shall be removed and the little will float in the jar like a ship that sails in it. C.R. Jose Biasian when speaking enigmatically used to say prepare for me a bull in judgment on a poor mountain and when he inquired about an innkeeper he spoke thus the man of this raw mouth what comforts does he provide our bad when indulging in enigmatic speech used to say this make the coals ethered like flatten out the golden cobbles and prepare for me two tellers in the dark others read and let them prepare for me on them two tellers in the dark the rabbi said to our show us where our lay is hiding he replied he amused himself with an Aaronite girl his last keen companion and she kept him awake some say that this referred to a woman and others say that it referred to a tractate they said to our lay show us where our is hiding he replied he consulted the crown maker and betook himself to Mephibosheth in the south our Joshua Behan and I remarked no one has ever had the better of me except a woman a little boy and a little girl what was the incident with the woman I was once staying at an inn where the hostess served me with beans on the first day I ate all of them leaving nothing on the second day too I left nothing on the third day she over seasoned them with salt and as soon as I tasted them I withdrew my hand my master she said to me why do you not eat I have already eaten I replied earlier in the day you should then she said to lie have withdrawn your hand from the bread my master she continued is it possible that you left the dish today as compensation for the former meals for have not the sages laid down nothing is to be left in the pot but something must be left in the plate what was the incident with the little girl I was once on a journey and observing a path across a field I made my way through it when a little girl called out to me master is not this part of the field no I replied this is a trodden path robbers like yourself she retorted have trodden it down what was the incident with the little boy I was once on a Journey when I noticed a little boy sitting at a crossroad by what road I asked him do we go to the town this one he replied is short but long and that one is long but short I proceeded along the short but long road when I approached the town I discovered that it was hedged in by gardens and orchards turning back I said to him my son did you not tell me that this road was short and he replied did I not also tell you but long I kissed him upon his head and said to him happy are you O Israel. All of you are wise both young and old are Jose the Galilean was once on a journey when he met Beruria by what road he asked her do we go to Lita foolish Galilean she replied did not the sages say this engage not in much talk with women you should have asked by which to Lita Beruria once discovered a student who was learning in an undertone Talmud. Moss Arabin rebuking him she exclaimed is it not written ordered in all things and sure if it is ordered in your 248. Limbs it will be sure otherwise it will not be sure one taught our Eliezer had a disciple who learned in a low voice after three years he forgot his learning one taught our Eliezer had a student who deserved burning for an offense against the omnipresent leave him alone the rabbis pleaded he attended on a great man Samuel said to Rab Judah Shinah open your mouth and read the scriptures open your mouth and learn the Talmud that your studies may be retained and that you may live long since it is said for their life unto those that find them and a healing to all their flesh read not to those that find them but to him who utters them with his mouth Samuel further said to Rab Judah Shinah hurry on and eat hurry on and drink since the world from which we must depart is like a wedding feast Rab said to our Hamdan my son according to thy ability do good to thyself for there is no enjoyment in Sheol nor will death be long in coming and shoots thou say I would leave a portion for my Children who will tell thee in the grave the children of men are like the grasses of the field some blossom and some fate are Joshua B. Levi stated if a man is on a journey and has no company let him occupy himself with the study of the Torah since it is said in scripture for they shall be a chaplet of grace if he feels pains in his head let him engage in the study of the Torah since it is said for they shall be a chaplet of grace unto thy head if he feels pains in his throat let him engage in the study of the Torah since it is said in chains about thy neck if he feels pains in his bowels let him engage in the study of the Torah since it is said it shall be a healing to thy navel if he feels pain in his bones let him engage in the study of the Torah since it is said and marrow to thy bones if he feels pain in all his body let him engage in the study of the Torah since it is said and healing to all his flesh are Judah son of our high remark come and see how the dispensation of mortals is not like that of the Holy One, blessed be he in the dispensation of mortals when a man administers a drug to a fellow it may be beneficial to one limb but injurious to another but with the Holy One, blessed be he it is not so he gave a Torah to Israel and it is a drug of life for all his body as it is said and healing to all his flesh are am I said what is the exposition of the scriptural text for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee let them be established altogether upon thy lips when are the words of the Torah pleasant when thou keepest them within thee and when wilt thou keep them within thee when they will be established altogether upon thy lips are Zara said this may be derived from the following a man hath joy in the answer of his mouth and a word in due season how good is it when hath a man joy when he has an answer in his mouth another version when hath a man joy in the answer of his mouth when the word is in due season oh how good is this our Isaac said this may be derived from the following but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it when is it very nigh unto thee when it is in thy mouth and in thy heart to do it Rabbah said it may be derived from the following thou hast given him his heart's desire and the utterance of his lips thou hast not withhold in seal when hast thou given him his heart's desire at the time when thou hast not withhold in the utterance of his lips seal Rabbah pointed out in incongruity it is written thou hast given him his heart's desire and it is also written and the utterance of his lips thou hast not withhold in seal if he is worthy thou hast given him his heart's desire but if he is unworthy the utterance of his lips thou hast not withhold in seal it was taught at the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob wherever in scripture the expression of Nezah or W.A. occurs the process to which it refers never ceases Nezah since it is written for I will not contend for Ever neither will I be always wroth, Selah, since it is written as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God establish it forever, Selah, W.A. Since it is written, the Lord shall reign forever, and ever Nemonic chains his cheeks, tables, graven, our Eliezer said, what is the purport of the scriptural text, and chains about thy neck, if a man trains himself to be like a chain that hangs loosely upon the neck, and is sometimes exposed, and sometimes concealed. His learning will be preserved by him, otherwise it will not, our Eliezer further stated, what is the purport of the scriptural text, his cheeks are as a bed of slices, if a man allows himself to be treated as a bed upon which everybody treads, and as spices with which everybody perfumes himself, his learning will be preserved, but otherwise it will not, our Eliezer further stated, what is the purport of the scriptural text, tables of stone, if a man regards his cheeks as stone that is not easily worn away his Learning will be preserved by him but otherwise it will not our Eliezer further stated what is the purport of the scriptural text graven upon the tables if the first tables had not been broken the Torah would never have been forgotten in Israel our Ahabi Jacob said no nation or tongue would have had any power over them for it says graven read not graven but freedom our Matina expounded what is the purport of the scriptural text and from the wilderness to Matan if a man allows himself to be treated as a wilderness on which everybody treads his study will be retained by him otherwise it will not our Joseph had a grievance against Rabbi son of our Joseph Behama when the eve of the day of atonement approached
prepares in thy goodness for the poor O God if a man behaves like an animal that treads upon its prey and eats it or as others say that drags it and eats it his learning will be preserved by him otherwise it will not if however lie does behave in this manner the Holy One blessed be he will himself prepare a banquet for him as it says in scripture thou didst prepare in thy goodness for the poor O Lord our high be Abba in the name of our Yohanan expounded with reference to the scriptural text Husa. Keep it the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. Why were the words of the Torah compared to the fig tree as with the fig tree Talmud? Mas Iravan be the more one searches it, the more fix one finds in it, so it is with the words of the Torah, the more one studies them, the more relish he finds in them. Our Samuel be Namani expounded with reference to the scriptural text, loving hind and a graceful row, etc. Why were the words of the Torah compared to a hind to tell you that as the hind has an arrow? Woman is loved by its mate at all times as at the first hour of their meeting, so it is with the words of the Torah they are loved by those who study them at all times as at the hour when they first made their acquaintance and in graceful row because the Torah bestows grace upon those who study it, her breast will satisfy thee at all times. Why were the words of the Torah compared to a breast as with the breast, however often the child sucks it, so often does he find milk in it, so it is with the Words of the Torah as often a man studies them so often does he find relish in them with her love wilt thou be ravished always as was the case with our Eliezer B. Petat for instance it was said of K. Eliezer that he sat and studied Torah in the lower market of Sephoris while his linen cloak lay in the upper market of the town our Isaac B. Eliezer related a man once came to take it and found a venomous serpent in it it was taught at the school of Arain and what is the exposition of the scriptural text. Yet that ride on white asses yet that sit on rich cloths and yet that walk by the way tell of it yet that ride on asses refers to the learned men who travel from town to town and from province to province to study the Torah white means that they clarify it like noonday that sit on rich cloths means that they give true judgment for the sake of the truth that walk refers to the students of scripture by the way refers to the students of the Mishnah tell of it refers to the students of the Talmud all. Of whose talk consists of the words of the Torah Arshezbi stated in the name of our Eliezer B. Ezrai what is the exposition of the text the slothful man shall not hunt his prey the cunning hunter will not live long Arshez hate expounded the cunning hunter will roast when Ardimi came he said this may be likened to a fowler who hunts birds if he breaks the wings of each bird as he shoots it down his catch is secure otherwise it is not Rabbah expounded in the name of Arsira who had it from Arhuna. What is the purport of the text wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished but he that gathereth little by little shall increase if a man studies much at a time his learning decreases and if I does not do so but gathereth little by little he shall increase Rabbah remarked the rabbis are well aware of this advice and yet disregarded Arnaman B. Isaac said I acted on this advice and my study remained with me our rabbis learned what was the procedure of the instruction in the oral law Moses. Learned from the mouth of the omnipotent, then Aaron entered and Moses taught him his lesson. Aaron then moved aside and sat down on Moses' left. Thereupon Aaron's sons entered and Moses taught them their lesson. His sons then moved aside. Eliezer taking his seat on Moses' right and Ithamar on Aaron's left. Arjuna stated Aaron was always on Moses' right. Thereupon the elders entered and Moses taught them their lesson. And when the elders moved aside, all the people entered and Moses taught them their lesson. It thus followed that Aaron heard the lesson four times. His sons heard it three times. The elders twice and all the people once at the stage. Moses departed and Aaron taught them his lesson. Then Aaron departed and his sons taught them their lesson. His sons then departed and the elders taught them their lesson. It thus followed that everybody heard the lesson four times. From here, our Eliezer inferred it is a man's duty to teach his people his lesson four times. For this is arrived at a menorah. Admages Aaron who learned from Moses who had it from the omnipotent had to learn his lesson four times how much more so an ordinary people who learns from an ordinary teacher are Akiva stated whence is it deduced that a man must go on teaching his people until he has mastered the subject from scripture where it says and teach thou it to the children of Israel and whence is it deduced that it must be taught until the students are well versed in it from scripture where it says put it in their mouths. And whence is it inferred that it is also his duty to explain to him the reasons it has been said now these are the ordinances which thou shalt put before them but why did they not all learn direct from Moses in order to give a share of the honor to Aaron his sons and the elders then why was not this procedure adopted Aaron might enter and learn from Moses his sons might then enter and learn from Aaron then the elders might enter and learn from his sons and these finally might teach all. Israel as Moses learned from the mouth of the omnipotent his own teaching was of greater value the master said Arjuna stated Aaron was always on Moses right whose view is represented in the following where it was taught if three men were going the same way the master is to be in the middle the more important of the other two on his right and the less important on his left must it be held that it represents the view of Arjuna and not that of the rabbis it may be said to agree even with the view of the rabbis since Aaron's trouble had to be taken into consideration Arbarita had a pupil whom he taught his lesson 400 times before the latter could master it on a certain day having been requested to attend to a religious matter he taught him as usual but the people could not master the subject what the master asked is the matter today from the moment the other replied the master was told that there was a religious matter to be attended to I could not concentrate my thoughts for at every moment I imagined now the master will get up or now the master will get up give me your attention the master said and I will teach you again and so he taught him another 400 times a bath call issued forth asking him do you prefer that 400 years shall be added to your life or that you and your generation shall be privileged to have a share in the world to come that he replied I and my generation shall be privileged to have a share in the world to come give him both. Said the holy one blessed be he or his da stated the Torah can only be acquired with the aid of mnemonic signs for it is said put it in their mouths read not put it but it's mnemonic sign Artalaf of the west heard this and proceeding to Arabah told it to him you the other said to him deduce this from that text we deduce it from this one set the up marks make the etc devise mnemonic signs for the Torah what proof however is there that the expression of Zion means a sign since it is. Written and any see the man's bone and shall be set up a sign by it. Our Eliezer said the deduction is made from this text. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding. They can woman devise mnemonic signs for the Torah. Rabbah expounded a point fixed times for the study of the Torah Talmud. Mas Arabin of this is in harmony with the following statement of Arabimi Biham Abidosa. What is the significance of the text? It is not in heaven that thou shouldst say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us. It is not in heaven, for if it were in heaven, you should have gone up after it. And if it were beyond the sea, you should have gone over the sea after it. Rabbah expounded it is not in heaven. It is not to be found with him who because he possesses some knowledge of it towers in his pride as high as the heavens. Neither is it beyond the sea. It is not found with him. Who because of some knowledge of it is as expansive in his self-esteem as the sea are you had expounded it is not in heaven it is not to be found among the arrogant neither is it beyond the sea it is not to be found among merchants or dealers or rabbis taught how are the sabbath boundaries of towns extended if a town is long the sabbath limits are measured from its normal boundaries if it is round corners are added to it if it is square no corners are added to it if it was wide on one side and narrow on the other it is regarded as if both its sides were equal if one house projected like a turret or if two houses projected like two turrets they are to be treated as if a thread had been drawn beside them in a straight line and the two thousand cubits are measured from that line outwards if the town was shaped like a bow or like a gamma it is to be regarded as if it had been full of houses and courtyards and the two thousand cubits are measured from the imaginary boundaries outwards the Master said if a town is long the Sabbath limits are measured from its normal boundaries but is this not obvious the ruling is required in a case where it was long but narrow since it might have been presumed that the width should be regarded as equal to its length we were informed that the law was not so if it is square shaped no corners are added to it is not this obvious this was only required in a case where it is square shaped but the sides of the square are not parallel with it. Four directions of the world as it might have been presumed that it should be deemed to be enclosed in an imaginary square whose sides are parallel with the four directions of
A case where the gap was only on one side while the latter deals with one that had breaches on two sides then what does he inform us that a carpath is allowed for each section but did not Arhuna once lay down such a ruling as we learned Talmud, Mas Arab and B.A. Carpath is allowed for every town so our mayor but the sages ruled a carpath was allowed only between two towns and in connect Ion with this it was stated Arhuna laid down a carpath is allowed for each town while Arhai Birab held only one. Carpath is allowed for both towns both rulings were required for if we had been informed only of the ruling here it might have been presumed to apply to this case only because originally all the town was a permitted domain but not to the case there and if we had been informed of the ruling there only it might have been presumed to apply to that case alone because one carpath is too cramped for the use of two towns but not here where the space of one carpath would not be too cramped hence. Both rulings were required and what perpendicular distance is allowed between the middle of the imaginary bus string and the arch Rabbi son of Arhuna replied one of two thousand cubits Rabbi the son of Rabbi son of Arhuna replied even one greater than two thousand cubits said of a logical reasoning is in agreement with Rabbi the son of Rabbi son of Arhuna since any person can if he wishes go around by way of the houses if there were ruins ten hand breadth high etc what is meant by ruins. Rab Judah replied three walls without a roof on them the question was raised what is the ruling in the case of two walls upon which there was a roof come and here the following are included in the Sabbath boundary of the town a sepulchral monument of the size of four cubits by four a bridge or a cemetery that contains a dwelling chamber a synagogue that has a dwelling house for the haze and a heathen temple that contains a dwelling house for its priests or stalls or storehouses in open fields too. Which dwelling chambers are attached watchmen's huts in a field and a house on a sea island all these are included in the Sabbath boundary of the town the following however are not included in it a sepulchral monument that was broken on two sides a gap extending from one end to the other a bridge or a cemetery that contains no dwelling chamber a synagogue that had no dwelling house for the haze and a heathen temple that contained no dwelling house for its priests or stalls or storehouses in Open fields to which dwelling chambers are not attached to pit a ditch a cave a wall or a dovecote in a field and a house in a ship all these are not included in the Sabbath boundary of the town at all events it was here taught a sepulchral monument that was broken on two sides a gap extending from one end to the other does not this refer to a case where there was a roof on top no it may be a case where there was no roof on top of what uses a house on a sea island our papa replied it. Reference here is to a house into which a ship's tackle is moved but is not a cave included in the Sabbath boundary of the town did not our high in fact teach a cave is included in the Sabbath boundary of the town of a replied he referred to a cave at the entrance of which was a built structure might not then its inclusion be inferred solely on the ground of the structure the ruling was required only in a case where the cave supplemented the prescribed size are who are for those who dwell in. Huts the Sabbath limits are measured from the very doors of their huts are his raised an objection and they pitched by the Jordan from Beth Yashimoth in connection with which Rabbi Barhanna stated I myself saw the place and it measured three parasangs by three now was it not taught when they attended to their needs they turned neither front nor sideways but backwards Rabbi answered him you speak of the divisions in the wilderness since about them it is written at the commandment of the Lord. They encamped and at the commandment of the Lord they journeyed they could well be regarded as constituting a permanent settlement Arhai and Abi Arkahana ruled in the name of Arashi if among the huts there are three courtyards of two houses each all the encampment assumes the characteristics of a permanent settlement Rab Judah citing Rab remarked dwellers in huts and travelers in the desert lead a miserable life and their wives and children are not really their own so it was also taught Eliza of very remark those who dwell in huts are like those who dwell in graves and concerning their daughter scripture says curse be he that lieth with any manner of beast what is the reason will explain because they have no bath houses and are you and explain because they allow each other to perceive the times of their ritual immersion what is the practical difference between them the case where a river is near the house Arhuna said no scholar should dwell in a town where vegetables are unobtainable this then implies that vegetables are wholesome but was it not taught three kinds of food increase one as excrement spend one stature and take away a 500th part of the human eyesight vis talmud moss arab and black bread new beer and vegetables this is no difficulty one statement referring to garlic and leek while the other refers to other vegetables as it was taught garlic is a vegetable leek is a semi-vegetable if radish appears a life-giving drug has appeared was it not however taught if radish appears a drug of death has appeared this is no contradiction the latter might deal with the leaves while the former with the roots or the latter might refer to the summer while the former might refer to the winter rab judah citing rab said in a town which abounds with the sense and descents men and beasts die in the prime of their lives die can one really think so rather say the age in the prime of life are who not son of Arjashu remarked the cracks between bibari and binarish have made me old our rabbis taught if a town is to be squared the sides of the square must be made to correspond to the four directions of the world its northern side for instance must correspond to the north and its southern side to the south and your guiding marks are the great rear in the north and the scorpion in the south our jose said if one does not know how to square a town so as to make it correspond with the directions of the world one may square it in accordance with the circuit of the sun how the direction in which on a long clay the sun rises and sets is the northern direction the direction in which on a short day the sun rises and sets is the southern direction at the vernal and autumnal equinoxes the sun rises in the middle point of the east and sets in the middle point of the west as it is said in scripture it goeth along the south and turneth about the north it goeth along the south during the day and turneth about the north during the night the wind turneth turneth about moveth refers to the eastern horizon and the western horizon along which the sun sometimes moves and sometimes turns about our measure she has stated these rules should be disregarded for it was taught the sun has never exactly risen in the northeast and set in the northwest nor has it ever risen precisely in the southeast and set in the southwest samuel stated the vernal equinox occurs only at the beginning of one of the four quarters of the day is either at the beginning of the day or at the beginning of the night or at midday or at midnight the summer solstice only occurs either at the end of one and a half or at the end of seven and a half hours of the day or the night the autumnal equinox only occurs at the end of three or nine hours of the day or the night and the winter solstice only occurs at the end of four and a half or ten and a half hours of the day or the night the duration of a season of the year is no longer than 91 days and seven and a half hours and the beginning of one season is removed from that of the other by no more than one half of the planetary hour samuel further stated the vernal equinox never begins under jupiter but it breaks the trees nor does the winter solstice begin under jupiter but it dries up the seed this however is the case only when the new moon occurred in the moon hour or in the jupiter hour talmud mas arab and b are rabbis taught if a circular town is to be circumscribed by a square the sides must be drawn in the shape of a square tablet the Sabbath limits also are then drawn in the shape of a square tablet when the measurements are taken one should not measure the 2,000 cubits from the middle point of the town corner because thereby one loses the corners one should rather imagine that a square tablet of the size of 2,000 cubits by 2,000 cubits is applied to each corner diagonally so that the town gains thereby 400 cubits in each corner the Sabbath limits gain 800 cubits in each corner while the town and the Sabbath limits together gain 1,200 cubits in each corner this is possible Abbe explained in a town of the size of 2,000 by 2,000 cubits it was taught our Eliza son of our Jose stated the limit of the allotted land beyond the confines of the Levitical cities was 2,000 cubits deducting from these an open space of 1,000 cubits such open space would represent a quarter of the entire area of it. Remainder of which consisted of fields and vineyards whence is this deduced robber replied from scripture which says and the open land from the wall of the city and outward a thousand cubits round about the Torah has thus enjoined surround the city by an open space of one thousand cubits such an open space it was said would represent a quarter of the entire area a quarter is it not in fact one in the neighborhood of a half robber replied the surveyor Barata explained this to me such a proportion is possible in the case of a town whose area is two thousand by two thousand cubits for what is the area of its limits sixteen million square cubits what is the area of the corners also sixteen million square cubits deducting for the open spaces eight million square cubits front the limits and four million square cubits from
A third of the area do you think that the reference is to a square town? No, a circular town was spoken of for by how much does the area of a square exceed that of a circle by one quarter approximately deduct a quarter from the measurements given and there would remain six million square cubits and six million represent a quarter of twenty-four million Robin explained what is meant by a quarter a quarter of the area of the limits Arashi explained what is meant by a quarter a quarter of the area of the corner said Robin to Arashi is it not written in scripture roundabout by roundabout the corners were meant for if you were not to admit this would you also contend that the expression and dash the blood roundabout against the altar written in connection with the burnt offering also meant roundabout the very altar consequently you must admit that by roundabout was meant roundabout the corners well then here also by roundabout was meant roundabout the corners said R. Habibi of Hosea to Arashi are there not however the projections of the corners the references to a circular city was it not however made square you might contend that it was said that we imagine it to be a square but can you contend that it was actually made square said our of Hosea to Arashi consider by how much does the area of a square exceed that of a circle by a quarter approximately are not then the so-called 800 only 667 minus a third bit. Other replied this applies only to a circle inscribed within a square but in the case of the diagonal of a square more must be added for a master stated every cubit in the side of a square corresponds to one and two fifths of a cubit in its diagonal mission a carpath is allowed for every town so our mayor but the sages ruled the law of carpath was instituted only between two towns so that by adding to each one a stretch of land of 70 and a fraction the carpath combines the two towns into one. So also where three villages are arranged in the shape of a triangle if between the two outer ones there was a distance of 141 and a third cubits the middle one causes all the three of them to be regarded as one Gemara once is this inferred robber replied from scripture which says from the wall of the city and outward the Torah having thereby enjoined allow an outward area and then begin your measuring but the sages ruled was instituted only etc it was stated Arhunalid. Down a car path is allowed for each town high be rabbi down only one car path is allowed for both towns we learned but the sages ruled the law of car path was instituted only between two towns is not this an objection against Arhuna Arhuna can answer you what is meant by car path the law of car path but in fact a car path is allowed for each town this may also be supported by reason since in the final clause it was stated so that by adding to each one a stretch of land of 70 and a fraction. Cubits the car path combines the two towns into one. This is conclusive. Must it be said that this presence an objection against Hayabi Rab Hayabi Rab can answer you Talmud, Mas Iravan B. This is a view of our mayor, but if this is a view of our mayor, the objection arises. Was it not already enunciated in the first clause? A car path is allowed for every town, so our mayor both were required for it. The law were to be derived from the former only. It might have been presumed that one car path is allowed for one town and one is also allowed for two towns. Hence we were informed that for two towns two car paths are allowed. And if we had been informed of the latter only, it might have been assumed that our mayor's view applied to such a case only because one car path is too cramped for the use of two towns, but not in the former case where the space is not too cramped. Hence both were required. We learned so also where three villages are arranged in the shape of a triangle if between the two. Outer ones there was a distance of 141 and a third cubits the middle one causes all the three of them to be regarded as one the reason then is because there was one in the middle but if there had been none in the middle the other two villages would not have been combined is not this an objection against Arhuna Arhuna can answer you surely in connection with this ruling it was stated Rabbah in the name of Aridi who had it from Arhana explained there is no need for the villages to be arranged in the shape of an equilateral triangle but that if on observation it is found that with the middle one placed between the other two they would form a triangle and there would be between the one and the other a distance of no more than 141 and a third cubits the middle one causes all the three of them to be regarded as one said Rabbah to have a what maximum distance is allowed between an outer village and the middle one 2000 cubits the other Replied, but did you not say the former asked that logical reasoning is in agreement with Rabbah the son of Rabbah son of Arhuna who ruled that a perpendicular distance of more than 2,000 cubits was allowed? What a comparison their houses are in existence, but here there are no houses. Rabbah further asked, Abbe, what maximum distance is allowed between the two outer ones? What distance is allowed? What difference does this make in view of the ruling that if with the middle one placed between the other two there remains between them a distance of no more than 141 and a third cubits? They are all regarded as one, even if they are 4,000 cubits distant from one another. Yes, the other replied, but did not Arhuna lay down if a town is shaped like a bow, then if the distance between its two ends is less than 4,000 cubits, the Sabbath limits are measured from the bowstring, otherwise, measuring must begin from the arch there. The other replied, you. Cannot say that the distance is filled up, but here you can well say so said our Safar to Rabba, behold the people of Tizaphone for whom we measure the Sabbath limits from the further side of Ardashir and the people of Ardashir for whom we measure the Sabbath limit from the further side of Tizaphone does not the Tigris in fact cut between them a gap wider than 141 and a third cubits the other thereupon went out and showed him the flanks of a wall that projected 70 and 2. Third cubits across the Tigris mission Sabbath limits may be measured only with a rope of a length of 50 cubits neither less nor more and a man may measure only while holding the end of the rope on a level with his heart if in the course of measuring the surveyor reached a glen or a fallen wall he spans it and resumes his measuring if he reached the hill he spans it and resumes his measuring Talmud, Mas Arabin provided he does not go beyond the Sabbath limit if he is unable to span it. In connection with this, our dust Ibijane stated in the name of our mayor, I have heard that hills are treated as though they were pierced. Tomorrow, once is this deduced, Rab Judah citing Rab replied from scripture, which says the length of the court shall be a hundred cubits and the breadth fifty by fifty. The Torah having thus enjoined measure with a rope of the length of fifty cubits, but is not this text required for the ordinance to take away fifty and to surround with them the other fifty if for that purpose only scripture might have said fifty fifty. Why then did it say fifty by fifty? Hence both may be deduced, neither less nor more. One taught neither less because the measurements are increased nor more because they are reduced. RC ruled one must measure only with a rope of Ape schema. What is the meaning of Ape schema? Our Abba replied Nargula. What is Nargula? Our Jacob replied the palm tree which has only one vast. Others read what is the meaning of Ape schema? Our Abba replied Nargula. Our Jacob. Replied a palm tree which has only one basket was taught our Joshua Behan and I said you have nothing more suitable for measuring than iron chains but what can we do in face of what the Torah said with a measuring line in his hand is it not however written and in the man's hand was a measuring rod that was used for measuring the gates our Joseph learned there are three kinds of rope those made of measure of wicker and of flax the measure rope was used for the heifer for we learned they bound it with a rope of measure and put it on its pile the wicker rope was used in connection with the test of a faithless wife for we learned and after that he brings a wicker rope and binds it above her breasts the flax rope was used for measuring purposes if in the course of measuring the surveyor reached since it was stated resumes his measuring it may be inferred that if he is unable to span it he proceeds to a position from where he is able to do so and after spanning it he makes the necessary observations whereby he is enable to locate the point on the far side that is in a straight line with his original line of measuring and then he resumes his measurements in a straight line thus we have you learned what the rabbis have taught elsewhere if in the course of measuring the measuring rope reached the glen the surveyor may span it if he can do so with a rope of 50 cubits but if not he proceeds to a position from where he is able to span it and having spanned it he makes the necessary observations whereby he is enable to locate the point on the far side that is in a straight line with his original line of measuring and then he resumes his measuring if the glen was a crooked one it is pierced in an upward as well as in a downward direction if it reached the wall we do not say let the wall be bored through its thickness rather is estimated and the measuring continues have we not however learned he spans it and resumes his measuring there it is a case of one that can be Conveniently used, but here it is a case of one that cannot conveniently be used. Rab Judah citing Samuel stated this was learned only in the case where a plumb line does not descend in a straight line. Talmud, Mas Arabin B, but if it does descend in a straight line, the bottom of the glen is measured by the ordinary method. What may be the depth of a glen? Our Joseph replied, 2,000 
Son of Arnathan taught this in the direction of leniency. Rabbah explained this was learned only in respect of a hill that has a rise often handbreadths to a gradient of five cubits, but a hill that has a rise of ten handbreadths to a gradient of four cubits. One need only estimate its base and proceed with his measuring, provided he does not go beyond the Sabbath limit. What is the reason? Our Kahana replied, this was ordained as a preventive measure against the possible assumption that the Sabbath limit reached to that point. If he is unable to span it, our rabbis taught how is the method of piercing carried out? The man on the lower level holds his end of the rope on a level with his heart, while the man on the higher level holds his end on a level with his feet. Abay stated, we have it as a tradition that piercing may be effected only with a rope of the length of four cubits. Arnav and citing Rabbi Abba stated, the method of piercing must not be employed in measurements in connection with it. Broken necked heifer nor in those around the cities of refuge because these are ordinances of the Torah mission. The Sabbath limit of a town is measured only along the beaten track. If one extended the limit at one point more than at another, the extended limit is observed. If there was a greater distance for one and a lesser distance for another, the greater distance is observed. Furthermore, even a bondman and even a bondwoman are believed when they say thus far is the Sabbath limit since the sages did not enact the law in order to add restrictions but in order to relax them. Talmud, Masirah and Gemara is the extended limit only observed but not the reduced limit read even as far as the extended limit. If there was a greater distance for one and a lesser distance for another, etc. What need again was there for this rule? Is it not practically identical with the previous one? It is this that was meant if one surveyor extended the limit and another reduced it, the one whose limit is the Greater is to be obeyed. Abay added, provided the extended limit does not exceed the lesser one by more than the difference between the diagonal and the side of the town, since the sages did not enact the law in order to add restrictions but in order to relax them. But was it not taught the sages did not enact the law in order to relax restrictions but in order to impose them? Rabbin replied, the meaning is not to relax restrictions in connection with Pentateuchal laws but to add restrictions to them. The laws of the Sabbath limits, however, are only rabbinical mission. If a town that belonged to an individual was converted into one belonging to many, one Arab may be provided for all the town. But if a town belonged to many and was converted into one belonging to an individual, no single Arab may be provided for all the town unless a section of it of the size of the town of Hadashah in Judea, which contains 50 residents, is excluded. So our Judah, our Simeon ruled three courtyards, each of which Contained two houses. Gemara, how is one to imagine a town that belonged to an individual and was converted into one belonging to many? Rab Judah replied, The residential district, for instance, of the Exilarch said, Arnaman to him, What is your reason? If it be suggested because many people meet at the seat of authority, they would remind each other, Are not all Israel, it may be objected, assembled together on a Sabbath morning. Also, rather said, Arnaman, the private town, for instance, of Nitzwar. Rabbis taught, If a town belonging to an individual was converted into one belonging to many and the public domain passed through it, how is an Arab to be provided for it? A side post or a cross beam is fixed on either side and thereby one is enabled to move things about in the space between them. No Arab, however, may be provided for a half of it, but either one Arab for all of it or one Arab for each alley separately. If a town did and still does belong to many, Talmud, Mas Arab and B, but had only one. Gate a single Arab suffices for all of it who is it that learned that a public domain may thus be provided with an Arab Arhuna son of Arjashu replied it is Arjuda for it was taught a more lenient rule than this did Arjuda lay down if a man had two houses on the two sides respectively of the public domain he may construct one side post on one side of any of the houses and another on the other side or one cross beam on the one side of any of the houses and another on its other side and then he may move things about in the space between them but they said to him a public domain cannot be provided with an Arab in such a manner the master said no Arab furthermore may be provided for a half of it our papa explained this was said only in the case where the division was longitudinal but if it was crosswise an Arab may be provided for each half separately in agreement with whose view has this been laid down it is contrary to that of our for if it were suggested that it was in agreement with his view the objection would arise did he not rule a man who is permitted freedom of movement in his own place causes the restriction of free movement on others in a place that is not as it may be said to be in agreement even with the view of our archivist since he maintained his view only there where it was a case of two courtyards one of which was behind the other so that the inner one had no other door but not here where the inhabitants in the one half could gain egress through one gate. While those in the other half could gain egress through the other some there are who read our papa explained it must not be assumed that only where the division was longitudinal may no Arab be prepared but that where it was crosswise an Arab may be prepared the fact is that even where the division was crosswise no Arab may be prepared in agreement with whose view is this laid down is it only in agreement with that of our archivist it may be said to be in agreement even with the view of the rabbis. Since they maintain their view there only where it is a case of two courtyards one behind the other so that the inner one can well lock its gate and use its own area only but can the public domain here be shifted from its place the master said either one Arab for all of it or one Arab for each alley separately now why is no separate Arab allowed for either half obviously because they would cause one another to be forbidden but then would not the various alleys also cause one another to be forbidden here we are dealing with a case where a barrier was provided and this ruling is in harmony with the following one that was laid down by R.E.D.B. Abin in the name of Arhista any of the residents of an alley who had made a barrier to his courtyard entrance can no longer impose any restrictions on the freedom of movement of the other residents of the alley but if a town belonged to many and was converted etc. Our Zara provided an Arab for our highest town and left no section out of its Provision said Abbe to him why did the master act in this matter its elders the other reply told me that our high BSE used to provide one Arab for all the town and I have therefore concluded that it must have been a town that once belonged to a single owner and was later converted into one belonging to many the same elders the first retorted told me it formerly had a rubbish heap on one side but now that the rubbish heap has been removed the town must be regarded as possessing two gates in which the preparation of a single Arab only is forbidden I the other admitted was not aware of this RMIB at a harp and I inquired of Rabba what is the ruling where a town had a ladder on one side and a gate on the other thus the other replied said Rabba ladder has the legal status of a door do not pay heed to him exclaimed Arnav and thus ruled our Abbe in the name of Rabba ladder has sometimes the status of a door and sometimes that of a wall it has the status of a wall as has just been laid down and it has the status of a door where a ladder is put up between two courtyards in which case the residents if they wish may provide only one Arab and if they prefer they may provide two separate Arabs could Arnaman however have made such a statement did not Arnaman in fact lay down in the name of Samuel if the residents of a courtyard and those of a balcony above it forgot Talmud, Mas Arab and A to prepare an Arab the ladder does not restrict freedom of movement in the former if a barrier for handbreadths in height intervened between them otherwise it does impose a restriction here we are dealing with a case where the balcony was less than 10 handbreadths high but if the balcony was less than 10 handbreadths high what is the use of making a barrier this is a case where it was enclosed all along its length up to 10 cubits so that if it was provided with a barrier they may be deemed to be entirely removed from their Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled if a wall was lined with ladders even though they extended to a greater length than 10 cubits it nevertheless retains the status of a wall our Barana pointed out to Rab Judah the following incongruity at the schoolhouse of Arhanan could Samuel have ruled that it nevertheless retains the status of a wall seeing that Arnav inciting Samuel ruled if the residents of a balcony and those of a courtyard forgot to prepare a joint Arab they do not impose any restrictions upon one another if there was a barrier of four handbreadths between them otherwise they do impose restrictions upon one another here we are dealing with a case where the balcony was less than 10 handbreadths high but if the balcony is less than 10 handbreadths high what is the use of making a barrier this is a case where it was enclosed all along its length up to 10 cubits so that if a barrier is provided they may be deemed to be completely removed from that place some of the men of Kakuna once came to our Joseph and Said to him, send with us a man who might prepare an Arab for our town. Go, he said to Abay and prepare the Arab for them, but see that there is no outcry against it at the schoolhouse proceeding thither. He observed that certain houses opened
Outcry against it at the schoolhouse unless a section of it of the size of the town of Hadashah is excluded and was taught Arjuna related there was a town in Judea whose name was Hadashah which had 50 inhabitants men women and children by means of which the sages determined the statutory size of the sections to be excluded and this town itself served as the excluded section of a larger town the question was raised what was the procedure in Hadashah itself since Hadashah served as the excluded section of the large town the latter also obviously served as the excluded section of the smaller town the question rather is what is the procedure in a town that is similar in size to Hadashah Arhuna and Rav Judah differ on this point one holds that a section of it must be excluded while the other maintains that none need be excluded our Simeon ruled three courtyards etc our Hamabi Gorya citing Rav stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon our Isaac ruled even one house and one Courtyard are sufficient. One courtyard is this conceivable. Rather say one house in one courtyard. Said Abay to our Joseph is that ruling of our Isaac a tradition or a logical deduction. What the other retorted does this matter to us is then the first reply. The study of Gemara to be a mere sing-song mishnah. If a man who was in the east instructed his son prepare for me an Arab in the west, or if he was in the west and he instructed his son prepare for me an Arab in the east, if the distance between him and his house was no more than two thousand cubits, and that between him and his Arab was more than this, he is permitted to proceed to his house, but forbidden to proceed to his Arab if the distance to his Arab was no more than two thousand cubits, and that to his house more than this, he is forbidden to proceed to his house, but permitted to proceed to his Arab if a man deposits his Arab within the Sabbatic extension of a town. His act is of no consequence if he deposited it even one. Cubit only beyond the limit Talmud, Mas Arab and B he loses what he gains Gemara assuming that east means the east side of his house and that west means the west of his house one can well understand how it is possible that the distance between him and his house was no more than 2,000 cubits and that between him and his Arab was more than this since he would reach his house before he could reach his Arab but how is it possible that the distance between him and his Arab should be no more than 2,000 cubits and that to his house more than this our Isaac replied do you think that east means east of his house and west the west of his house the meaning in fact is not so east denotes the east of the position of his son and west denotes the west position of his son Rabbi son of Arshila replied one may even explain east as the east of his house and west as the west of his house where for instance his house stood in a diagonal direction if a man deposits his Arab within it. Sabbatic extension etc. How can you possibly assume that an Arab would be deposited beyond the limit rather read outside the Sabbatic extension he loses what he gains only what he gains and no more was it not in fact taught if a man deposits his Arab within the Sabbatic extension of a town his act is of no consequence if he deposited it even one cubit only beyond the Sabbatic extension of the town he gains that cubit and loses all the town because the extent of the town is included in the extent of the Sabbath limit this is no difficulty since the latter refers to a case where his measure terminated within the town while the former deals with one where his measure terminated at the far end of the town this being in agreement with the ruling of R.E.D. who laid down in the name of R. Joshua B. Levi if a man was measuring the 2,000 cubits distance from his acquired Sabbath boat and advancing towards the town and his measure terminated in the middle of the town he is allowed to Proceed no further than half the town, but if his measure terminated at the far end of the town, all the town, as far as he is concerned, is regarded as four cubits, and the remainder of the Sabbath limit may be made up for him. These exclaimed R.E.D. are not but prophetic utterances for what is the difference whether the measure terminated in the middle of the town or at the end. Said Rabbi, we have learned both these cases. The people of a large town may walk through the whole of a small town, Talmud. Mas Arabin, but the people of the small town may not walk through the whole of a large town. Now, what is the reason? Obviously, because the measure of the latter terminated in the middle of the former town, while that of the former terminated at the end of the latter town. And R.E.D. read in both cases, the people may and expounded the mission cited as referring to an Arab that one deposited, but of a case of one who was measuring, we have there learned nothing, have we not? Indeed, did we not as a matter of fact learn and to the measure of whom the rabbis have spoken a distance of 2,000 cubits only is allowed even if the end of his permitted measure terminated within a cave his ruling was required in respect of a Sabbath limit that terminated at the far end of a town a case of which we did not learn our novice stated he who learns the people may is not in error and he who learns the people may not not in error he who learns the people may is not in error since he might explain it to refer to an Arab that one had deposited while he who learns the people may not is not in error since he might explain that it refers to a case where the Sabbath limit was being measured and that a clause is missing from the mission which should properly read thus the people of a large town may walk through the whole of a small town but the people of a small town may not walk through the whole of a large town this however applies only to a case where the Sabbath limit was being Measured, but if a man stayed in a larger town and deposited his Arab in a smaller town, or if he stayed in a small town and deposited his Arab in a large town, he may walk through the whole of the town and a distance of two thousand cubits beyond it. Or Joseph citing Rami B. Abba who had it from Arhuna ruled if a town was situated on the edge of a ravine and there was a barrier four cubits in height in front of it, its Sabbath limit is measured from the edge of the ravine, otherwise measuring must begin from the door of every inhabitant's house. Said Abba to him, you told us in connection with this that the barrier must be four cubits in height, but why should this one be different from all other barriers whose prescribed height is only four handbreadths? There, the other replied, the use of the place involves no fear, but the use of the place here does involve fear. Said Ar Joseph, once do I derive this ruling from what was taught, Rabbi permitted the inhabitants of Gator to go down to. Amen, but did not allow the inhabitants of Haman to go up to Gator. Now, what could have been the reason? Obviously, that the former did put up a barrier while the latter did not put up a barrier. When Ardimi came, he explained the people of Gator used to molest the people of Haman and permitted men ordained. And why should Sabbath be different from other days? Because intoxication is not uncommon on such a day. Would they not molest them when they come there? No dog in a strange town does not bark for seven years now. Then might not the people of Haman molest those of Gator? No, they were not so submissive as all that our Safra explained. Gator was a town that was built in the shape of a bow. Ardimi behind and explained the former were the inhabitants of a large town while the latter were inhabitants of a small town. Thus taught Arkahana Artabiomi, however, taught as follows our Safra and Ardimi behind and a different one explaining that Gator was a town built in the shape of a bow. While the other explains that the latter were the inhabitants of a small town while the former were inhabitants of a large town mission the people of a large town may walk through the whole of a small town and the people of a small town may walk through the whole of a large town how is this to be understood if a man stayed in a large town and deposited his Arab in a small town or if he stayed in a small town and deposited his Arab in a large town he may walk through all the town and 2,000 cubits beyond it our Akiba ruled he is allowed to walk no further than 2,000 cubits from the place of his Arab said our Akiba to them do you not agree with me that if a man deposited his Arab in a cave he may walk no further than 2,000 cubits from the place of his Arab they replied when is this the case only where no people dwell therein but where people dwell therein one may walk through the whole of it and 2,000 cubits beyond it thus it follows that where an Arab is Deposited within it, the law is more lenient than where one is deposited on the top of it, and to the measure of whom the rabbis have spoken, a distance of two thousand cubits is allowed, even if the end of his permitted measure terminated within a cave. Talmud, Mas Arab and Bigamar Rav Judah laid down in the name of Samuel. If a man spent the Sabbath in a deserted town, he may, according to the rabbis, walk through the whole of it, and two thousand cubits beyond it. If, however, he deposited his Arab in a deserted town, he is allowed no more than a distance of two thousand cubits from the place of his Arab. Our Eliezer laid down whether a man spent the Sabbath in a town or deposited in it his Arab, he is permitted to walk through the whole of it, and two thousand cubits beyond an objection was raised. Said our Akiba to them, Do you not agree with me that if a man deposited his Arab in a cave, he may walk no further than two thousand cubits from the place of his Arab? They replied, When is this? The Case only when no people dwell therein from which it is obvious is it not that where no people dwell therein they agree with him by the expression no people dwell therein a place was meant that was unsuitable for dwel
Bed of our Akiva who laid down he is allowed to walk no further than 2,000 cubits from the place of his Arab wall in the case of one who had spent the Sabbath within the town he agrees with the rabbis but was it not stated like the cave of Zedekiah like the cave of Zedekiah in one respect but unlike the cave of Zedekiah in another like the cave of Zedekiah in respect of its huge size but unlike the cave of Zedekiah for whereas the latter was deserted the one referred to us. Inhabited Marjuda once came across the people of Magracta who were depositing their Arabs at the Biagabar synagogue penetrate he said to them further into its interior that you may be allowed to walk a greater distance contentious man said Rabbah to him in respect of the laws of Arab no one takes any notice of the ruling of our Akiva C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V I mission if a man lives in a courtyard with a heathen or with one who does not acknowledge the principle of Arab either of them causes him to be restricted in the use of the courtyard our Elizer B. Jacob ruled neither can restrict him unless there are two Israelites who impose restrictions upon each other our Gamaliel related a Sadducee once lived with us in the same alley in Jerusalem and father told us hasten and carry out all necessary articles into the alley before he carries out his and thereby imposes restrictions upon you our Judah related the instruction was given in a different form hasten and attend to your requirements in the Ali before he carries out his articles and thereby imposes restrictions upon you Talmud, Mas Arab and Gemara Abbe B. Abin and Arhina Abbe Abin sat at their studies while Abbe was sitting with them and in the course of their session they dealt with the following argument it is quite possible to understand the view of our mayor since he may hold the opinion that a heathen's dwelling is legally a valid dwelling and that no difference is to be made between one Israelite tenant and two Israelite tenants what however could be the view of our Elizer B. Jacob if he is of the opinion that a heathen's dwelling is legally a valid dwelling restrictions should be imposed even in the case of one Israelite tenant and if he holds that it is legally no valid dwelling no restrictions should be imposed even in the case of two Israelite tenants said Abbe to them but does our mayor hold that a heathen's dwelling is legally a valid dwelling was it not in fact taught a heathen's courtyard has the same Status as a cattle pen rather say all agree that a heathen's dwelling is legally no valid dwelling but the point at issue between them here is the question whether a law had been instituted as a preventive measure against the possibility of an Israelite's learning to imitate his deeds our Elizer B. Jacob holds that since a heathen is suspected of bloodshed a preventive measure has been enacted by the rabbis in the case of two Israelites who quite frequently live together with a heathen but not in bed of one Israelite who as a rule does not live together with a heathen while our mayor holds that since it may sometimes happen that one Israelite also should live with a heathen the rabbis have laid down no error of his effective where a heathen lives in the same courtyard nor is the renunciation of one's right effective where a heathen is concerned unless that right has been let but a heathen would not let his right what is the reason if it be suggested because he considers it possible that the other might take permanent possession of his share the explanation would be satisfactory according to him who holds that the lease must be of a sound character what however could be said in explanation according to him who holds that only an imperfect lease is required for it was stated our historical the lease must be of a sound character and our she's hate ruled it may be of an imperfect character only what is meant by imperfect and what is meant by sound if it be suggested that sound denotes a rental of a parata and imperfect a rental that was less than a parata the objection would arise is there any authority who upholds the view that acquisition from a heathen cannot be affected with less than a parata did not as a matter of fact our Isaac son of our Jacob BG Yuri send the following message in the name of our Yohan and be it known to you that one can lease from a heathen even with less than a parata and our high be ever ruled in the name of our Yohan and no hide would rather be killed then spend so much as a parata which is not returnable the fact is that sound denotes a lease confirmed by legal documents and attested by officers and imperfect denotes one that was neither confirmed by legal documents nor attested by officers now I again submit the explanation would be satisfactory according to him who holds that the lease must be of a sound character what however could be said in explanation according to him who holds that only an imperfect lease is required even in such a case he fears witchcraft and does not let his share in the courtyard to revert to the main text a heathen's courtyard has the same status as a cattle pen and it is therefore permitted to carry things in and out both from the courtyard into the houses and from the houses into the courtyard but if only one Israelite was a tenant there he does impose restrictions so our mayor our Elizer B. Jacob ruled no restrictions are ever imposed unless there are also two Israelite tenants who impose Restrictions upon one another Talmud, Mas Arab and be the master said a heathen's courtyard has the same status as a cattle pen did we not however learn if a man lives in a courtyard with a heathen either of them causes him to be restricted this is no difficulty since the latter deals with the case of a heathen who was at home while the former deals with one who was not at home but what principle does he adopt if he is of the opinion that a dwelling house without an occupier is legally a valid dwelling should not even a heathen impose restrictions and if he is of the opinion that a dwelling house without an occupier is legally no valid dwelling should not an Israelite also impose no restrictions he in fact holds a view that a dwelling house without an occupier is legally no valid dwelling but in the case of an Israelite who imposes restrictions when he is at home the rabbis have enacted a preventive measure where he is away while in the case of a heathen who even went at home imposes restrictions merely as a preventive measure lest the Israelite learn to imitate his deeds it was enacted that he imposes restrictions only when he is at home but not in his absence but does he not impose restrictions when he is absent have we not in fact learned if a man left his house and went to spend the Sabbath in another town whether he was a Gentile or an Israelite his share imposes restrictions so our mayor there it is a case where he returns on the same day Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel the Halashah is in agreement with our Elizer B. Jacob Arhuna stated the custom is in agreement with the ruling of our Elizer B. Jacob while our and stated the public act in agreement with the ruling of our Elizer B. Jacob said Abbe to our Joseph we have a tradition that the teaching of our Elizer B. Jacob is small in quantity but well sifted and Rab Judah also laid down in the name of Samuel the Halashah is in agreement with our Elizer B. Jacob is it then permitted to a disciple to give a Ruling accordingly in a district that is under the jurisdiction of his master event other replied on the question of the permissibility of eating an egg with kutha which I have been asking him throughout the lifetime of our Hunar Hista gave me no decision our Jacob B. Abba asked Abbe is it permitted to a disciple in a district under his master's jurisdiction to give a ruling that was as authoritative as those contained in the scroll of fast days which is written and generally accepted. Document thus the other replied said our Joseph even on the question of the permissibility of eating an egg with kutha which I have been asking him throughout the lifetime of our Hunar Hista gave me no decision our Hista decided legal questions at Kafri in the lifetime of our Hunar Talmud, Mas Arab and A. Arhamna decided legal points at Hartati Argais during the lifetime of our Hista examined the slaughter of knife in Babylon said our Ashi to him why does the master act in this matter did not be. Other replied our Hamdan to decide legal points at Hartati our guys during the lifetime of our Hista it was stated the first retorted that he did not decide legal points the fact is the other replied that one statement was made that he did decide legal points while another was that he did not do so and the explanation is that only during the lifetime of his master Arhuna did he decide no legal points but during the lifetime of our Hista who was both his colleague and disciple he did decide legal points. And I too am the master's colleague as well as disciple Rabbah said a young scholar may examine his own knife Rabbah once visited Mahuza when his host brought to him a slaughtering knife for examination go he said to him take it to Rabbah does not the master the other ask uphold the ruling laid down by Rabbah that a young scholar may examine his own knife I he replied I am only buying the meat Nemonic Zilla of Hania changes IKA and Jacob Arlazer of Patronia and Arabi Talafah once visited Araha. Son of Arika's house in the district that was subject to the jurisdiction of Arahabi Jacob Araha, son of Arika, desiring to prepare for them a third grown calf, presented to them the slaughtering knife for examination. Should no consideration be shown for the old man Arahabi Talafa asked thus, Araliazer of Patronia replied, said Rabba, a young scholar may examine his own knife. Araliazer of Patronia thereupon examined the knife and was providentially punished for his disrespect, but did not
Our Eliza furthermore had a disciple who once gave a legal decision in his presence. I wonder remarked our Eliza to his wife Imishalom whether this man will live through the year and he actually did not live through the year. Are you she asked him a prophet? I he replied, I am neither a prophet for the son of a prophet, but I have this tradition whosoever gives a legal decision in the presence of his master incurs the penalty of death. Now in connection with this incident, Rabbi Bar Hanna related in. The name of our Yohanan that disciple's name was Judah Begoria and he was three parts angst distant from his master, he was in his presence, but was it not stated that he was three parts angst distant and according to your conception what need was there for the mention of his name and the name of his father, but the fact is that all the details were given in order that it be not said that the whole story was a fable or high be Abba stated in the name of our Yohanan whoever gives a legal decision in the presence of his master deserves to be bitten by a snake for it is said and Elihu the son of Barash the Buzid answered and said I am young etc. Wherefore I held back and elsewhere it is written with the venom of crawling things of the dust Zeir I stated in the name of our Hanan he is called a sinner for it is said thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against the Arham unappointed out an incongruity it is written thy word have I laid up in my heart and it is also written I Preach righteousness in a great congregation. This is really no contradiction. The former relating to the time when Iari the Jerite was still alive, while the latter relates to the time when Iari the Jerite was no longer alive. Our Abba Bizab stated, Whoever gives his priestly gifts to one priest only brings famine into the world, for it is said in Scripture, Iari the Jerite was priest to David. Now was he priest to David alone and not to all the world, but the meaning is that David sent to him his priestly gifts, and this is followed by the text, and there was a famine in the days of David. Our Eliezer said, He is deprived of his greatness, for it is said, And Eliezer the priest said unto the men of war, This is the statute of the law which the Lord hath commanded Moses, although he thus said to them, He commanded my father's brother and not me, he was nevertheless punished as it is written, and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, and yet we do not find that Joshua ever needed his guidance. Are Levi stated he who answers a word in the presence of his master goes down to Sheol childless for it says in scripture and Joshua the son of none the minister of Moses from his youth up answered and said my lord Moses shall them in Talmud, Mos Arabin B and elsewhere it is written on his son Joshua his son this exposition however differs from that of our Abba B Papa for our Abba B Papa stated Joshua was punished for no other sin than that of preventing Israel or one night from the duty of propagation for it is said in scripture and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked etc and this is followed by the text and he said nay but I am captain of the host of the Lord I am now come last evening he said to him in effect you omitted to offer up the continual evening sacrifice and now you are neglecting the study of the Torah on account of which offense the other asked did you come now he replied am I come Joshua we read forth with went that Night into the midst of the Baal, a text which our Yohanan explained teaches that he entered into the profundities of the Halachah, and we have a tradition that so long as the Ark and the Sheshanah are not settled in their appointed place, convivial intercourse is forbidden. Our Samuel being stated in the name of Rab, the study of the Torah is more important than the offering of the daily continual sacrifices, since he said to him, Now am I come, our Baron stated in the name of Rab concerning the man who sleeps in a room in which husband and wife rest. Scripture says, The women of my people ye cast out from their pleasant houses. This our Joseph said applies even to the time when one's wife is menstruant. Rabbi said, If one's wife is menstruant, may a blessing come upon him. This, however, is not very logical for who watched him until that time. There was a certain alley in which Laman Beerist lived. Will you let us your domain? Said the other residents to him, but he would not let it to them, so they went to. Abay and reported the matter to him renounced he advised them your respective domains in favor of one resident so that he would be in the position of one individual living in the same place with a heathen and wherever one individual lives in the same place with a heathen the latter imposes no restrictions upon the former is not the only reason he was asked that it is not usual for one Israelite and one heathen to live together and is it not a fact that these did live together the renunciation of private domains in favor of one resident he replied is an unusual occurrence and the rabbis enacted no prohibitory measures against any occurrence that is unusual Arhuna son of our Joshua proceeded to report this ruling to Rabba when the latter remarked Talmud, Mas Arabin if so are you not abolishing the law of Arab in that alley they might prepare an Arab would it not then be said that an Arab is effective even where a heathen is a resident in the place an announcement might be made Announcement for the children rather said Rabba let one of them persuade him and borrow a place from him on which he shall put down something so that he assumes the status of his hired laborer or retainer concerning whom Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel even his hired laborer and even his retainer may contribute his share to the Arab and this alone is sufficient. Abay asked our Joseph what is the ruling and there were five hired laborers or live retainers the other replied if it. Rabbis have laid down that one's hired laborer or retainer is regarded as a householder in order that the law might be relaxed would they also maintain that a hired laborer or retainer has a similar status in order that the law might be restricted reverting to the main text Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel even his hired laborer and even his retainer may contribute his share to the Arab and this alone is sufficient. Arnaman observed how excellent a ruling is this Rab Judah stated. In the name of Samuel, he who has drunk a quarter of a log of wine must not give a legal decision. This ruling observed Arnaman is not a very fine one because in my own case before I drink a quarter of a log of wine, my mind is not clear, said Robert to him. Why did the master speak in such a manner? Did not Arahabi Hannah in fact state what is the exposition of the scriptural text? But he that keepeth company with harlots loses his substance. Whosoever says this ruling is a fine one or that ruling is not a fine one loses the substance of the Torah. I withdraw the other replied Rabbi son of Arhuna ruled one who is under the influence of drink must not pray. But if he did pray, his prayer is regarded as a proper one. An intoxicated man must not pray. And if he did pray, his prayer is an abomination. How are we to understand the expression of one who is under the influence of drink and how that of an intoxicated man as follows when our Abu and our Manish, Jeremiah of Dipti were taking? Leave from each other at the fort of the river Yapati they suggested let each one of us say something that the other has never heard before from Ari son of Arhuna laid down the best form of taking leave of a friend is to tell him a point of the Halajah because he would remember him for in what is to be understood one of them began by one who is under the influence of drink and what by an intoxicated man the former is one who is able to speak in the presence of a king the latter is one who is unable to speak in the presence of a king what the other began should he who took possession of the property of a proselyte do that he shall be worthy of retaining and let him purchase with it a scroll of the law or she's hate said even Talmud, Mas Arab and B.A. husband should act in a similar manner with his wife's estate Rabbah said even a man who engaged in trade and made a large profit should act in a similar manner our Papa said even he who has found something should act in the same manner our Naman B. Isaac said even if he had only arranged for the writing of one pair of tefillin in connection with this Arhanin or as some say Arhanin stated what is the scriptural proof it is written and Israel vowed a vow etc. Rami B. Abba stated a mill's walk or a little sleep removes the effects of wine said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi B. Abba this applies only to one who has drunk one quarter of a log but if one has drunk more than a quarter a walk would only cause him more fatigue and sleep would produce more intoxication but does a mill's walk remove the effects of wine was it not in fact taught it once happened that Archimelial was riding on an ass when traveling from Ako to Shizabal Arila I was following behind him finding a gluskin on the road he said to him I picked up the gluskin from the road later he met a heathen Mabgay he said to him take away that loaf from Ila Arila thereupon approached him and asked where are you from I am the other replied from the station. Keeper settlements and what is your name? My name is Mabgay. Did Argamaliel ever know you know the other replied at that moment? We discovered that Argamaliel divined by the Holy Spirit, and at the same time we learned three things. We learned that eatables may not be passed by, that the majority of travelers must be followed, and that it is permitted to derive benefit from a heathen's leavened bread. After the Passover, when he arrived, Etches of a man approached him and asked for his vow to be absolved. Have we he asked the person who accomp
while the other holds that no opening for regret is required for Rabbi Barhan or related in the name of our Yohanan, what opening did Argamaliel suggest to that man there is that speak like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is healthy, that speak the vow deserves to be pierced by the sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The master said that eatables may not be passed by our Yohanan laid down in the name of our Simeon Biohe, this applies only to the earlier generations. When the daughters of Israel did not freely indulge in witchcraft, but in the later generations, when the daughters of Israel freely indulged in witchcraft, one may pass them by a tanned taught whole loaves may be passed by, but not crumbs said are to our ashi, but do they not practice witchcraft with crumbs? Is it not in fact written in scripture? And yet profane me among my people for handfuls of barley and for crumbs of bread, these they received as a fee are she's hate citing our Eliezer B. Ezra. Observe Talmud, Mas Arab and Ai could justify the exemption from judgment of all the Israelite world since the day of the destruction of the temple until the present time, for it is said in scripture, therefore here now this thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine and objection was raised the sale or purchase of an intoxicated person is valid if he committed a transgression involving the penalty of death, he is to be executed, and if he committed one involving flogging, he is to be flogged. The general rule being that he is regarded as a sober man in all respects except that he is exempt from prayer does not this contradict the view of Arshi's hate by the expression I could justify the exemption that he used he also meant exemption from judgment for the lack of devotion in prayer Arhanada said this applies only to one who did not reach the stage of Lot's drunkenness but one who did reach such a stage is exempt from all responsibilities Arhanada observed against him who passes. By the shield in the time of haughtiness troubles will be closed and sealed about him for it is said in scripture his scales are his pride shut up together as with a close seal what proof is there that effect signifies passing by since it is written in scripture my brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook as the channel of brooks that pass by our Yohanan said the statement was against him who does not utter what is the proof that mapic signifies manifestation since it is written in scripture. And the channels of waters appeared and the foundations of the world were laid bare. Observe the scriptural texts provide equal proof for the one master as well as for the other master wherein then lies the difference between them. The difference between them is the propriety of the practice of Arshi's hate for Arshi's hate entrusted the task of waking him from his sleep to his attendant. One master upholds the view of Arshi's hate while the other master does not. Arhai be Ashi citing Rab rule day. Person whose mind is not at ease must not pray since it is said he who is in distress shall give no decisions. Arhana did not pray on a day when he was agitated. It is written he said he who is in distress shall give no decisions. Marakba did not attend court on a shut the day. Arnaman B. Isaac observed legal study requires as much clearness as a north wind day of a remark. If my foster mother had told me bring me the kata, I would not have been able to study if remark Rabba Allah spit me out. Could not study seven garments for the seven days of the week were prepared from our son of Rabbana by his mother Rabjuda observed night was created for naught but sleep our Simeon Belakish observed the moon was created only to facilitate study when our zero was told you are exceedingly well versed in your studies he replied they are the result of day work a daughter of Arhista once asked Arhista would not the master like to sleep a little there will soon come he replied days that are long and short and we shall have time to sleep long our Naman B. Isaac remarked we are day workers our Ahabi Jacob borrowed and repaid our Eliza ruled a man who returns from a journey must not pray for three days for it is said in scripture and I gathered them together to the river that turneth to Ahab and there we encamped three days and I viewed the people on returning from a journey Samuel's father refrained from prayer for three days Samuel did not pray in a house that contained alcoholic drink our papa. Did not pray in a house that contained fish. Hashar Hanan observed he who allows himself to be pacified when lie is taking wine possesses some of the characteristics of his creator, for it is said in scripture, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor and said, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Our high observed he who retains a clear mind under the influence of wine possesses the characteristics of the seventy elders, for the numerical value of Yen is seventy, and so is also the numerical value of Sod, so that when wine goes in council departs, Arhani observed wine was created for the sole purpose of comforting mourners and rewarding the wicked, for it is said, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto the bitter in soul. Arhani be papa stated a person in whose house wine is not poured like water has not attained the state of blessedness, for it is said, and he will bless thy bread and thy water as the bread spoken of is a food that may be. Bought with the money of the second tithe, so is the water liquid that may be bought with the money of the second tithe. Now such a liquid is of course wine, and yet it is called water Talmud. Mas Arab and B. If therefore it is poured in one's house like water, that house has attained to the state of blessedness. Otherwise it is not our I said by three things may a person's character be determined by his cup, by his purse, and by his anger, and some say by his laughter. Also Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab an Israelite, and a heathen once lived in the inner of two courtyards, and one Israelite lived in the outer one. And when the case came up for discussion before Rabbi, he forbade the use of the letter, and when it was submitted to our high, he also forbade its use. Rabbi and our Joseph were once sitting at the end of a discourse of our Sheshit session when the letter on sitting down suggested that Rab explained his traditional ruling to be in agreement with the view of our Meir and Rabbi. Not it is said that two great men exclaimed our Joseph should make a mistake in such a simple thing if the ruling is in agreement with our Meir why was it required that all Israelites shall live in the outer courtyard and should you reply that the case just happened to be of such a mature was not Rab asked it could be pointed out whether the inner Israelite tenant could use his own place and he replied that he was permitted in agreement with whose view then is it suggested to be in agreement. With that of our Eliezer B. Jacob did he not it may be retorted rule unless there are two Israelites who impose restrictions upon each other is it then in agreement with our Akiva who ruled a man who is permitted freedom of movement in his own place causes the restriction of free movement on others in a place that is not his what need was there it may be asked to have a heathen seeing that even one Israelite alone would have imposed the restrictions are who not son of our Joshua replied the ruling in. Fact is in agreement with our Eliezer B. Jacob and our Akiva, but here we are dealing with a case where the two Israelites joined in an Arab, hence the reason of the prohibition that there was a heathen who imposed the restrictions, but where there was no heathen, there is none to impose restrictions upon them. Our Eliezer inquired of Rab, what is your ruling where all Israelite and a heathen lived in the outer courtyard, and one Israelite lived in the inner one is the enactment applicable only therefore. The reason that it is usual for an Israelite to live with a heathen, since the former knows that the heathen would be afraid to use violence against him as he expects the other Israelite to come and demand where is that Israelite that lived with you, but not here where the heathen could well reply, he went out and disappeared, or is it likely that the enactment extended also to such a case, since here also the heathen would be afraid to use violence against his neighbor as he Imagine is that the Israelite might at any moment pass and detect him in the act. The other replied, Give to a wise man, and he will be a wiser. Rishalakish and the students of Arhanna once happened to be in a certain inn while its tenant was away, but its landlord was present. Is it proper they discuss to rent from him a heathen share in the courtyard wherever the landlord is not entitled to terminate the lease? There could be no question that we must not rent it. The question arises only where he is entitled to terminate it. May we rent it because he has the power to terminate the lease, or is it possible that since at present at any rate he did not yet terminate it, we may not rent it? Rishalakish said to them, Let us rent it, and when we arrive at our masters in the south, we might submit the question to them on submitting the question to our ex. He replied, You have acted well in renting it. Arhanna be Joseph Arhai, Abba, and KSC once happened to come to a certain inn with Ray. Even the owner of the inn had returned on the Sabbath. Is it permissible they discourse to rent from him? His share is the law of renting like that of the preparation of an Arab, so that as an Arab must be prepared while it is yet day, must renting take place while it is yet day, or is the law of renting like that of the renunciation of one's domain, so that as the right to one's domain may be renounced even on the Sabbath, so may renting also take place on the Sabbath. Our Hannah B. Joseph said, Let us rent it while our C said, Let us not rent it, let us set our high B. Abba to them, rely on the words of the old man and
who laid down wherever tenants impose restrictions upon one another but may join together in an Arab they may renounce their rights to their shares in favor of one of them where they may join in an Arab but do not impose restrictions upon one another or when they do impose restrictions upon one another but may not join in an Arab they may not renounce their rights in favor of one of them wherever tenants impose restrictions upon one another but may join together in an Arab they may renounce their rights to their shares in favor of one of them as for instance in the case of two courtyards one within the other where they may join in an Arab but do not impose restrictions upon one another they may not renounce their rights in favor of one of them as for instance in the case of two courtyards that have a common door between them now what case was intended to be included in the statement where they do impose restrictions upon one another but may not join in an Arab they may not Renounce their rights in favor of one of them was not this meant to include the case of the heathen. Now, if the heathen had come home on the Sabbath, he could not his share have been hired prior to the Sabbath Talmud, Mas Arab, and B. Consequently, it must refer to a case where the heathen came home on the Sabbath, and in connection with this, it was stated that where they do impose restrictions upon one another but may not join in an Arab, they may not renounce their rights in favor of one of them. This is conclusive. I observed our Joseph have never before heard this reported ruling said, Abay to him, you yourself have taught it to us, and you said it in connection with the following. For Samuel said that no domain may be renounced where two courtyards are involved, nor may it be renounced in the case of ruin, and you told us in connection with it that when Samuel said that no domain may be renounced where two courtyards are involved, he meant it to apply only to two courtyards that had one. During common, but where one courtyard was within the other, since the tenants impose restrictions upon one another, they may also renounce their rights. Could I, the former question, have reported such a ruling in the name of Samuel? Did not Samuel, in fact, state in the laws of Arab, we can only be guided by the wording of our mission of his tenants of one courtyard, but not those of two courtyards? When you told us the other, explained that in the laws of Arab, we can only be guided by the wording of our mission. You said it in connection with the following: since an alley to its courtyards is as a courtyard to its houses. To turn to the main text, Samuel ruled that no domain may be renounced where two courtyards are involved, nor may it be renounced in the case of ruin. Or Yohanan, however, ruled the domain may be renounced even where two courtyards are involved, and it may also be renounced in the case of ruin. And both had to be mentioned for if the two courtyards only had been mentioned. It might have been assumed that only in this case did Samuel maintain his view since the use of one is quite independent of that of the other but that in the case of ruin the use of which is common to the two tenants he agrees with Aryohanan and if the latter only had been stated it might have been presumed that in this case only did Aryohanan mention his view but that in the former case he agrees with Samuel hence both were required have a stated Samuel's ruling that no domain may be renounced. Where two courtyards are involved applies only to two courtyards that had one door in common but where two courtyards were one within the other since the tenants impose restrictions upon one another they may also renounce their rights Rob stated even in the case of two courtyards one of which was within the other the tenants may sometimes renounce their rights and sometimes they may not renounce them how is this possible if the tenants deposited their Arab in the other courtyard and one. Tenant whether of the inner courtyard or of the outer courtyard forgot to participate in the air of the use of both courtyards is restricted if they deposited their Arab in the inner courtyard and one tenant of the inner courtyard forgot to participate in the air of the use of both courtyards is restricted if however a tenant of the outer courtyard forgot to participate in the air of the use of the inner courtyard is unrestricted while that of the outer one is restricted if the tenants deposited their Arab in the outer courtyard and one tenant whether of the inner courtyard or of the outer courtyard forgot to participate in the air of the use of both courtyards is restricted for in whose favor could this tenant of the inner courtyard renounce his right should he renounce it in favor of the tenants of the inner courtyard but their Arab surely is not with them should he renounce his right in favor of the tenants of the outer courtyard also surely no domain may be renounced where to Courtyards are involved as to the tenant of the outer courtyard too in whose favor could he renounce his right should he renounce it in favor of the tenants of the outer courtyard there would still remain the tenants of the inner courtyard who would impose the restrictions upon them should he renounce it in favor of the tenants of the inner courtyard also surely no domain may be renounced where two courtyards are involved if they deposited their Arab in the inner courtyard and one tenant of the inner courtyard forgot to participate in the Arab the use of both courtyards is restricted for in whose favor could this tenant of the inner courtyard renounce his right should he renounce it in favor of the tenants of the inner courtyard there would still remain the tenants of the outer courtyard who would impose restrictions upon them should he renounce his right in favor of the tenants of the outer courtyard also surely no domain may be renounced where two courtyards are involved. Talmud, Mas Arabin, if however a tenant of the outer courtyard forgot to participate in the air of the use of the inner courtyard is certainly unrestricted since its tenants might close its door and so enjoy its use while that of the outer one is restricted said Arhuna son of our Joshua to Rabba but why should the use of both courtyards be restricted where a tenant of the inner one forgot to join in the air of could not the tenant of the inner courtyard renounce his right in favor of the tenants of the inner courtyard and the tenants of the outer one could then come and enjoy unrestricted use together with them in agreement with whose view retorted Rabba is the subjection raised apparently in agreement with that of our Eliezer who ruled that it is not necessary to renounce one's right in favor of every individual tenant but I spoke in accordance with the view of the rabbis who ruled that it is necessary to renounce one's right in favor of every individual tenant whenever our histi and our She's hate met each other the lips of the former trembled at the latter's extensive knowledge of Mishnahs while the latter trembled all over his body at the former's keen dialectics are his da once asked are she's hate what is your ruling where two houses were situated on the two sides of a public domain and Gentiles came and put up a fence before their doors on the Sabbath according to him who holds that no renunciation of a domain is valid where two courtyards are involved the question does not arise. For if no renunciation is permitted where two courtyards are involved even where an Arab could if desired have been prepared on the previous day how much less could renunciation be permitted here where no Arab could have been prepared on the previous day even if desired the question arises only on the view of him who ruled the domain may be renounced even where two courtyards are involved do we say that only there where they could if desired have prepared an Arab on the previous day is one also. Allowed to renounce one's domain, but here where they could not prepare an Arab on the previous day, one is not allowed to renounce one's domain either, or is it possible that there is no difference between the two cases? No renunciation is permitted. The other replied, What is your ruling? The former again asked where the Gentile died on the Sabbath, according to him who ruled that it was permitted to rent. The question does not arise, for if two acts are permitted, is there any need to question whether one act only is permitted? The question, however, arises according to him who ruled that it was not permitted to rent, are only two acts forbidden, but not one, or is it possible that no difference is to be made between the two cases? I maintain the other replied that renunciation is permitted. Hamna, however, ruled renunciation is not permitted. Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel if a Gentile has a door of the minimum size of four handbreadths by four that opened into a valley, even though he Leads camels and wagons in and out all day through an alley. He does not restrict its use for the residents of that alley. What is the reason that door which he keeps exclusively for himself is the one he prefers? The question was asked. What is the ruling where it opened into a carpath? Arnam and B. Am I citing a tradition? Reply Talmud. Mas Arab and B. Even if it opened to a carpath, both Rabbah and Ar Joseph ruled a Gentile causes restrictions if his carpath was no bigger than two Beth Esia. But if it was bigger, he causes no restrictions. And Israelite, however, causes no restrictions if his carpath was no bigger than two Beth Esia. But if it was bigger, he does cause restrictions. Rabbah B. Haklay asked Arhuna, What is the ruling where the door of a Gentile's courtyard opened into a carpath? The other replied, Behold, it has been said causes restrictions if his carpath was no bigger than two Beth Esia. But if it was bigger, he causes no restrictions. Allah laid down in the name of Ar Yohanan if a man. Threw an object into a carpath that was bigger than two Beth Esia and that was not enclosed for dwelling purposes, he incurs guilt even if it was of the size of a core or even as big as two cores. What is the reason it is a proper enclosure which
To 2 Beth Ser Ashi replied the limitation applies indeed to the first clause for the rabbis have laid down the one ruling and they themselves have also laid down the other ruling they have laid down the ruling that in a car path that was bigger than 2 Beth Ser and that was not enclosed for dwelling purposes the movement of objects is permitted only within 4 cubits and they themselves have also laid down the ruling that no objects may be moved from a private domain into a carmelith. In the case therefore of a rock that was no bigger than 2 Beth Ser throughout the area of which the movement of objects is permitted the rabbis have forbidden the movement of objects from the sea into it as well as from it into the sea what is the reason because it is a private domain in all respects if however it was bigger than 2 Beth Ser throughout the area of which the movement of objects is forbidden the rabbis permitted the movement of objects from it into the sea and from it. See into it what is the reason because otherwise people might assume it to be a private domain in all respects and in consequence would also move objects throughout its area but wherein does the one differ from the other it is usual to move objects within the area of the rock itself but it is unusual to move objects from it into the sea or from the sea into it there was once a child whose warm water was spilled let some warm water said rabble be brought for him from my house but observed Abbe. We have prepared no Arab let us then rely the other replied on the shit up but Abbe told him we had no shit either than the other said let a gentile be instructed to bring it for him Elwish Abbe later remarked to point out an objection against the master but our Joseph prevented me because he told me in the name of Arkahana when we were at Rab Judas he used to tell us that in a pentacle matter any objection must be raised before the master's ruling is acted upon but in a rabbinical. Matter we must first act on the ruling of the master and then point out the objection after that he said to him what objection was it that you wished to raise against the master it was taught the other replied that sprinkling on the sabbath is only rabbinically forbidden now instructing a gentile to do work on the sabbath is also rabbinically forbidden talmud mas irabin why then should it not be said as sprinkling on the sabbath which is a rabbinical prohibition does not supersede it sabbath so should not an instruction to a gentile to do work on the sabbath which is also rabbinically forbidden supersede the sabbath do you the first retorted draw no distinction between a rabbinical prohibition that involves a manual cat and one that involves no such act how is it rabbi son of arhan and ask Abbe that in an alley in which two great men like you reside there should be neither arab nor shidduch what the other replied can we do for the master to collect the tenants Contribution would not be becoming I am busy with my studies and the other tenants do not care and were I to transfer to them the possession of a share of the bread in my basket the shidduff since if they had asked me for the bread I could not give it to them would be invalid for it was taught if one of the residents of an alley asked for some of the wine or the oil and they refused to give it to them the shidduff is thereby rendered null and void why then the first asked should not the master transfer to them the possession of a quarter of a log of vinegar a casket was taught commodities kept in store may not be used for shidduff but was it not taught that they may be used for shidduff this rashi replied is no contradiction since one view is that of beth shammai and the other is that of beth hillel for we learned if a corpse lay in a house that had many doors all the doorways are unclean if one of them was open that doorway is unclean while all the others are clean if it was Intended to take out the corpse through one of them or through a window that measured four handbreadths by four. This protects all the doors. Beth Shammai ruled this applies only where the intention was formed before the person in question was dead. But Beth Hillel ruled even if it was formed after he was dead. There was once a certain child whose warm water was spilled out. Said Rabbah, let us ask his mother, and if she requires any, a Gentile might warm some for him indirectly through his mother. His mother, our measure, she had told Rabbah, is already eating dates. It is quite possible. The other replied that it was merely a stupor that had seized her. There was once a child whose warm water was spilled out. Remove my things, ordered Rabbah from the men's quarters to the women's quarters, and I will go and sit there so that I may renounce in favor of the tenants of the child's courtyard the right I have in this one. But said Rabbah, to Rabbah, did not Samuel lay down no renunciation of one's right in a courtyard? Is permitted where two courtyards are involved. I the other replied, hold the same view as our Yohanan who laid down. It is permitted to renounce one's right in a courtyard even where two courtyards are involved. But the first ask if the master does not hold the same view as Samuel Talmud, Mas Arab and be let him remain in his usual quarters and renounce his right in his courtyard in their favor and then let them renounce their right in the master's favor. For did not Rab rule renunciation may be followed by renunciation on this point. I am of the same opinion as Samuel who ruled renunciation may not be followed by renunciation but are not both rulings based on the same principle. Since why indeed should not renunciation be allowed to follow renunciation? Is it not because a person as soon as he renounces his right completely eliminates himself from that place and assumes the status of a tenant of a different courtyard and no renunciation is valid between two courtyards? How then could it? Master renounces right underscore there the reason is this that a rabbinical enactment shall not assume the character of a mockery and just to turn to the main text rab ruled renunciation may be followed by renunciation and Samuel ruled renunciation may not be followed by renunciation must it be assumed that rab and Samuel differ on the same principle as that on which the rabbis and our Eliza differed rab holding the same opinion as the rabbis while Samuel holds the same opinion as our Eliza rab can answer you I may uphold my ruling even in accordance with the view of our Eliza for it was only there that our Eliza maintained his ruling that the man who renounces his right to his courtyard renounces ipso facto his right to his house also because people do not live in a house that has no courtyard but did he express any opinion as regards complete elimination Samuel also can answer you I may uphold my ruling even according to the view of the rabbis for it was only there that the rabbis Maintain their ruling since only that which a man actually renounced can be deemed to have been renounced while that which he did not actually renounce cannot be so regarded but from that at least which a man does renounce he is eliminated completely our Ahabi Hannah citing Arshis hate stated their views differ on the same principles as those of the following ten as if a tenant presented his shares and then he carried out something whether he acted unwittingly or intentionally he imposes restrictions so our Meir Arjuda ruled if he acted with intention he imposes restrictions but if unwittingly he does not now do they not differ on the following principles one master holding that renunciation may be followed by renunciation while the other master maintains that renunciation may not be followed by renunciation our Ahabi Talifar replied in the name of Rabbanu all hold the view that renunciation may not be followed by renunciation but the point at issue between them is whether a Penalty has been imposed in the case of one who acted unwittingly on account of one who acted intentionally. One master holds a view that in the case of one who acted unwittingly, a penalty has been imposed on account of one who acted with intention, while the other master holds that in the case of one who acted unwittingly, no penalty has been imposed on account of one who may act with intention. Our Ashi said Rab and Samuel differed on the same point of issue as the one between our Eliza and it. Rabbis Argamaliel related a Sadducee once lived with us. Whoever spoke of a Sadducee, a clause is missing, and this is the correct reading. A Sadducee has the same status as a Gentile, but Argamaliel ruled a Sadducee has not the status of a Gentile, and Argamaliel related a Sadducee once lived with us in the same alley in Jerusalem, and father told us hasten and carry out all the necessary articles into the alley before he carries out his and thereby imposes restrictions upon you, and so it was also. Taught if a man lives in the same alley with a Gentile, a Sadducee, or a Boethusian, these impose restrictions upon him, and it once happened that a Sadducee lived with Argamaliel in the same alley in Jerusalem, and Argamaliel said to his sons, Hasten, my sons, and carry out what you desire to carry out, or take in what you desire to take in before this abomination carries out his articles, and thereby imposes restrictions upon you, since at that moment he renounced his share in your favor, so Armadir. Arjuda related the instruction was given in a different form, Hasten, and attend to your requirements in the alley before nightfall, when he would impose restrictions upon you, the master said, Carry out what you desire to carry out, or bring in what you desire to bring in before this abomination imposes restrictions upon you, this then implies that if they carried out their objects first, and then he carried out his, he imposes no restrictions upon them, Talmud, Mas Irabin, but have we not learned? If a tenant presented his share and then he carried out something whether he acted unwittingly or intentionally he imposes restrictions so our mayor our
Have we not learned before he carries out red before the conclusion of the day and if you prefer I might say there is really no contradiction since the former might refer to one who is a mummer in respect of desecrating the Sabbath in privacy only while the latter might deal with one who desecrates the Sabbath in public whose view is followed in what was taught a mummer or a barefaced sinner is not entitled to renounce his share but is a barefaced sinner on a PAR with a mummer rather red A. Barefaced mummer is not entitled to renounce his share now in agreement with whose view has this been laid down in agreement of course with that of Arjuna a certain man once went out with a jewel charm but when he observed Arjuna Nisiya he covered it up a person of this type the master said is in accordance with the view of Arjuna entitled to renounce his share Arjuna stated who is regarded as an Israelite in mummer he who desecrates the Sabbath in public said Arnam to him in. Agreement with whose view if it be suggested that it is in agreement with that of our mayor who holds that a person who is suspected of disregarding one matter of law is held suspect in regard to all the Torah the statement should also apply to any of the other prohibitions of the Torah and if it is suggested that it is in agreement with the view of the rabbis did they not rule it may be objected that one who is suspected of disregarding one law is not held suspected in regard to all the Torah Talmud, Mas Arab and B unless he is a member in respect of idolatry Arnam and B Isaac replied only in respect of presenting or renouncing his right to his share this being in agreement with what was taught an Israelite member who observes the Sabbath in public may renounce his share but one who does not observe the Sabbath in public may not renounce his share because the rabbis have laid down an Israelite may renounce or present his share whereas with a Gentile transfer is possible only. Through the letting of his share how is this done he says to him my share is acquired by you or my share is renounced in your favor and the latter thereby acquires possession and there is no need for him to perform a formal act of acquisition or as you replied to this tan of the desecration of the Sabbath is an offense as grave as idol worship as it was taught of you implies but not all of you thus excluding a member of you only among you did I make distinctions but not among the other nations of the cattle includes men who resemble cattle from here it has been inferred that sacrifices may be accepted from transgressors in Israel in order that they might return in repentance all except from a member from one who offers libations of wine to idols and from one who publicly desecrates the Sabbath now is not this statement self-contradictory first you said of you implies but not all of you thus excluding a member and then you state sacrifices may be accepted from transgressors in Israel this However is no contradiction since the first clause might deal with a person who is a member in respect of all the Torah while the intervening clause might refer to one who is a member in respect of one precept only but then read the final clause except from a member and from one who offers libations of wine to idols what praise one to understand by this type of member if he is a member in respect of all the Torah he is obviously identical with the one in the first clause and if he is a member in respect of one precept only does not a contradiction arise from the middle clause must it not consequently be conceded that it is this that was meant except from one who is a member in respect of offering libations of wine to idols or the desecration of the Sabbath in public it is thus evident that idolatry and the desecration of the Sabbath are offenses of equal gravity this is conclusive mission if one of the tenants of a courtyard forgot to join in the air of his house is forbidden both to him and to them for the taking in or for the taking out of any object but their houses are permitted both to him and to them if they presented their shares to him he is permitted the unrestricted use of the courtyard but they are forbidden if there were two who forgot to join in the Arab they impose restrictions upon one another because one tenant may present his share and also acquire the shares of others while two tenants may present their shares but may not acquire anyone must one share be presented Beth Shammai ruled while it is yet day and Beth Hillel ruled after dusk if a tenant presented his share and then carried out any object whether unwittingly or intentionally lie imposes restrictions so our Mahir Arjuda ruled if he acted with intention he imposes restrictions but if unwittingly he imposes no restrictions Himara apparently it is only his house that is forbidden but his share in the courtyard is permitted but how is one to understand the circumstances if he has renounced his rights why should his house be forbidden and if he has not renounced his rights why should his courtyard be permitted here we are dealing with the case of a tenant who renounced his right to his courtyard but not his right to his house the rabbis being of the opinion that a tenant who renounces his right to his courtyard does not if so facto renounce his right to his house since a person might well live in a house that has no courtyard but their houses are permitted both to him and to them what is the reason because he is regarded as their guest if they presented their shares to him he is permitted the unrestricted use of the courtyard but they are forbidden why should not they be regarded as his guest one man may be regarded as a guest of five men five men cannot be regarded as a guest of one does this then imply that renunciation may be followed by renunciation no it is this that was meant if they originally presented their shares to him he is permitted the Unrestricted use of the courtyard, but they are forbidden if there were two who forgot to join in the air of they impose restrictions upon one another. Is not this obvious? This ruling was necessary only in a case where one of them has subsequently renounced his share in favor of the other, as it might have been assumed that the latter should be permitted the full use of the courtyard. Hence, we were informed that this is not so because the former, at the time he renounced his share, was not himself permitted the unrestricted use of that courtyard because one tenant may present his share. What need again was there for this ruling if that he may present? Did we not learn this before? If that he may acquire? Did we not already learn this? Also, it was necessary on account of the final clause two tenants may present their shares. Is not this also obvious? It might have been presumed Talmud, Mas Arabin, that this should be forbidden as a preventive measure against the possible assumption. That one may also renounce his share in favor of two, hence we were informed that no such possibility need be considered but may not acquire any what need was there for this ruling. It was required only for this case, even where they said to him, Acquire our shares on the condition that you transfer them. Abbe inquired of Rabbi if five tenants live in the same courtyard and one of them forgot to join in the Arab. Is it necessary when he renounces his right to his share to renounce it in favor of every individual tenant or not? He must the other replied, Renounce it in favor of every individual tenant. He pointed out to him the following objection A tenant who did not join in an Arab may present his share to one of those who joined in the Arab. Two tenants who joined in an Arab may present their shares to the one who did not join in their Arab, and two tenants who did not join in an Arab may present their shares to the two of their neighbors who joined in an Arab or to one neighbor who did not prepare an Arab one however who joined in an Arab may not present his share to one who did not join with them nor may two who joined in an Arab present their shares to the two who did not join nor may the two who did not join in an Arab present their shares to the other two who also did not join at all events it was stated in the first clause a tenant who did not join in an Arab may present his share to one of those who joined in an Arab now how is one to understand the circumstances if there was no other tenant with him with whom could he have joined in an Arab it is consequently obvious that there must have been another tenant with him and yet it was stated to one of those who joined in the Arab and Rabbi here we are dealing with a case where there was one who died but if one was there and died how will you explain the final clause one however who joined in an Arab may not present his share to one who did not join with them if one was there only before and is now dead why should not this be permitted it is consequently obvious that he was still there and since the final clause is a case where he was there must not the first clause also deal with one who was still alive what an argument each clause may deal with a different case you may have proof that this is so for in the final section of the first clause it was stated and two tenants who did not join in an Arab may present their shares to the toe of their neighbors who joined in an Arab from which it follows to two only but not merely to one of a however explained what is meant by to two to one of the two if so why was it not stated to one who joined in the Arab or to one who did not this is a difficulty a tenant who did not join in an Arab may present his share to one of those who joined in the Arab refers according to a to a case where the other tenant was also alive and by this we are informed that it is not necessary to renounce one share in favor of each individual tenant according to Rabbi this refers to a case where the other tenant was first alive and then died and the point in the ruling is that no preventive measure had been enacted against the possibility that sometimes the one may happen to be alive and the same procedure might be followed and two tenants who joined in an Arab may present their shares to the one who did not join in their Arab is not this obvious it might have been presumed that the tenant since he did not join in the Arab should be penalized hence. We were informed that no such penalization had been enacted and two tenants
informed that no penalization was imposed. One, however, who joined in an Arab may not present his share to one who did not join with them. According to Abbe, this final clause was taught in order to indicate the meaning of the first clause. According to Rabbi, the final clause was taught on account of the first one, nor may two who joined in an Arab present their shares to the two who did not join. What need again was there for this ruling? It was required in that case only where one of them renounced his share in favor of the other, as it might have been presumed that the latter should be permitted the unrestricted use of this courtyard. Hence, we were informed that the law was not so because the former at the time he made his renunciation was not himself permitted the unrestricted use of that courtyard, nor may the two who did not join in an Arab present their shares to the other two who also did not join. What again was the need for this ruling? He was necessary only for this case. Even where they said to him, acquire our shares on the condition that you transfer them, Rabbah inquired of Arnaman, may all here renounce his share Talmud, Mas Arab and B is it only in the case where a tenant can if he wishes join in the Arab on the previous day that he can also renounce his share, but this heir since he could not join in the Arab on the previous day even if he wished may not renounce his share or is it possible that an heir steps into his father's place I the other reply. Hold that he may renounce his share but those scholars of the school of Samuel learned that he may not do so he thereupon pointed out the following objection against him this is the general rule whatever is permitted during a part of the Sabbath remains permitted throughout the Sabbath and whatever is forbidden during a part of the Sabbath remains forbidden throughout the Sabbath the only exception being the case of the man who renounced his share whatever is permitted during a part of it. Sabbath remains permitted throughout the Sabbath as is for instance the case of an Arab that was prepared for the purpose of carrying objects through a certain door and that door was closed up or one that was prepared for the purpose of carrying objects through a certain window and that window was closed up this is the general rule includes the case of an alley whose crossbeam or side post had been removed whatever is forbidden during a part of the Sabbath remains forbidden throughout the Sabbath as for instance in the case of two houses that were respectively situated on the two sides of a public domain which Gentiles surrounded with a wall during the Sabbath what does the expression this is the general rule include it includes the case of a Gentile who died on the Sabbath now here it was stated the only exception being the case of the man who renounced his share from which it follows does it not that only he may do so but not his heir the only exception being the law of Renunciation he raised another objection against him if one of the tenants of a courtyard died having left his share to a man in the street the latter imposes restrictions if this occurred while it was yet day but if it occurred after dusk he imposes no restrictions if however a man in the street died having left his share to one of the tenants of the courtyard he imposes no restrictions if this occurred while it was yet day but if it occurred after dusk he imposes restrictions now why should he impose restrictions let him renounce his share the ruling that he imposes restrictions applies only so long as he did not renounce his share come in here if an Israelite and a proselyte lived in one dwelling and the proselyte died while it was yet day Talmud Mas Arabin, even though another Israelite had taken possession of his estate the latter imposes restrictions but if he died after dusk no restrictions are imposed even though no other Israelite took possession of his estate now. Is not this statement self-contradictory you first stated while it was yet day even though another Israelite had taken possession the latter imposes restrictions and much more so if one did not take possession of it but is not the law just the reverse is that where no one took possession no restrictions are imposed underscore our proper replied read although he had not taken possession but was it not stated though he had taken possession it is this that was meant though he did not take possession while it was yet day and did so only after dusk he imposes restrictions since he could have taken possession while it was yet day after dusk no restrictions are imposed even though no other Israelite took possession of his estate you say even though no other Israelite took possession of his estate and much less so if one did take possession but is not the law just the reverse is that where one did take possession restrictions are imposed our proper replied read though he did take possession but was it not stated even though he did not take possession it is this that was meant though he took possession after dusk he imposes no restrictions since he could not take possession while it was yet day at all events it was stated in the first clause that restrictions are imposed but why should restrictions be imposed let him renounce his share the ruling that he imposes restrictions applies only so long as he does not make his renunciation are you and reply the very is represent of you of Beth Shammai who ruled that no renunciation is allowed on the Sabbath for we learned when must one share be presented Beth Shammai ruled while it is yet day and Beth Hillel ruled after dusk said Hula what is Beth Hillel's reason the case of renunciation is on a par with that of saying you should have gone to the better kind one objected of a is the comparison with the case of saying you should have gone to the better kind where the Gentile died on the Sabbath rather it is this principle on which they are here at variance Beth Shammai are of the opinion that the renunciation of a domain is like conferring acquisition of a domain to another but conferring acquisition of a domain on the Sabbath is forbidden while Beth Hillel are of the opinion that renunciation is merely the giving up of one's domain and the giving up of a domain on the Sabbath is perfectly permissible Mishnah if a householder was in partnership with his neighbors with the one in one and with the other in one they need not prepare an Arab but if his partnership was with the one in one and with the other in oil it is necessary for them to join in an Arab Arsimian rule neither in the one case nor in the other need they join in an Arab Gemara Rab explained only if the wine was kept in one container said Rabbi deduction also supports this view for it was stated with the one in one and with the other in oil it is necessary for them to join in an Arab now if you grant that the first clause Deals with one container and the final clause with two containers. Both rulings are quite correct, but if you contend that the first clause deals with two containers and the final clause deals with two containers, why it might be objected should a difference be made between wine and wine and between wine and oil, wine and wine of a retorted can properly be mixed, but wine and oil cannot properly be mixed. Our simian rule neither in the one case nor in the other need they join in an Arab even if the partnership was with the one in wine and with the other in oil. Rabbi replied here we are dealing with a courtyard that was situated between two alleys. Our simian following his own view, for we learned our simian remark to what may this case be compared to three courtyards that open one into the other and also into a public domain where if the two other ones made an Arab with the middle one, it is permitted to have access to them and they are permitted access to it, but the two other ones are. Forbidden access to one another said Abbe to him are the two cases at all alike seeing that there it was stated the two outer ones are forbidden while here it was stated that they need not join in an Arab at all the ruling that they need not join in an Arab applies only to one between the neighbors and the householder but the neighbors among themselves must certainly join in an Arab Talmud. Mas Arab and B.R. Joseph however replied our Simeon and the rabbis differ on the same principle as that. On which our Yohanan Binri and the rabbis differ for we learned if some oil floated on wine and a tea bouillon touched the oil he causes the oil only to be unfit but our Yohanan Binri ruled they both form a connection with each other the rabbis may hold the same view as the rabbis while our Simeon may hold the same view as our Yohanan Binri it was taught our Eliezer B. Tadai ruled in either case it is necessary for them to join in an Arab even if the partnership was with the one in wine and with the other also in wine rabbi explained where this householder comes with his legend of wine and pours it into the common cask and the other comes with his legend and pours it in no one disputes the ruling that this alone is a valid Arab they only differ where the householders bought a cask of wine in partnership our Eliezer B. Tadai is of the opinion that there is no such rule as Berah while the rabbis maintain that the rule of Berah holds good our Joseph explained our Eliezer B. Tadai and the rabbis differ on the question whether it is permissible to rely upon shit where an Arab is required the one master holding that it is not permissible to rely on it while the masters maintain that it is permissible to rely on it said our Joseph once do I derive this from the following since Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with our Meir and our Berah stated in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with our Eliezer B. Tadai now what is the reason obviously because both rulings are based on the same principle said Abbe to him if the principle is the same what need was there to lay down the halacha twice it is of this that we are informed that in matters of Arab we sometimes adopt two restrictive rulings what is the ruling of our Meir and what is that of the rabbis those about which it was taught in Arab of courtyards must be prepared with bread but wine even if preferred may not be used for Arab shit of an
an Arab for the courtyards is prepared with bread and unrestricted movement is permitted in both the alley and the courtyards or shidduch for the alley is made with bread and unrestricted movement is again permitted in both Rab Judah citing Rab stated the Halasha is in agreement with Armeir Arhuna however stated the customary practice is in agreement with Armeir Walar Yohan and stated the people are in the habit of acting in agreement with Armeir Mishnah if five companies spent the Sabbath in one hall each company Beth Shammai ruled must contribute separately to the Arab but Beth Hillel ruled all of them contribute to the Arab only one share they agree however that where some of them occupy rooms or upper chambers a separate contribution to the Arab must be made for each company Gamara Arnaman stated the dispute relates only to partitions of stakes but where the partitions were ten hand breadths high all agree that a separate contribution to the Arab must be made for each company. Others read Arnaman stated the dispute relates also to partitions of stakes are high and our Simeon son of Rabbi differ on the interpretation of our Mishnah one holds that the dispute relates only to partitions that reach to the ceiling but where they do not reach it all agree that only one contribution to the Arab need be made for all of them while the other holds that the dispute relates only to partitions that do not reach the ceiling but where they do reach it all agree that a separate Contribution to the Arab is necessary for each company Talmud, Mas Arab and B an objection was raised Arjuda Hasab stated Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel do not dispute the ruling that where partitions reach the ceiling a separate contribution to the Arab is required on the part of each company they only differ where the partitions do not reach the ceiling in which case Beth Shammai maintained that a separate contribution to the Arab must be made for each company while Beth Hillel maintained that one contribution to the Arab suffices for all of them now against him who stated that the dispute related only to partitions that reached the ceiling this presence an objection in favor of him who stated that their dispute related only to partitions that did not reach the ceiling this provides support while against that version according to which our Naman stated the dispute relates only to partitions of stakes this presence an objection does this however present an objection also against that Version according to which our Naman stated the dispute relates also to partitions of stakes. Our Naman can answer you. They differ in the case of partitions, and this applies also to partitions of stakes. And the only reason why their difference of view was expressed in the case of partitions is in order to inform you to what extent Beth Hillel ventured to apply their principle. But why did they not express their difference of view in the case of partitions of stakes in order to inform you of it? Extent to which Beth Shammai ventured to apply their principle information on the extent of a permitted course is preferable. Our Naman citing Rab stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah Hasaver said our Naman B Isaac all inference from the wording of our mission also leads to the same conclusion for it was stated they agree. However, that where some of them occupy rooms or upper chambers, a separate contribution to the fruit must be made for each company. Now, what was meant by rooms and what by upper chambers if it be suggested that by the term rooms proper rooms and by the term upper chambers proper upper chambers were meant is not the ruling obvious the terms must consequently mean compartments like rooms or upper chambers namely compartments the partitions of which reach the ceiling this is conclusive attended top this applies only where their Arab is carried into a place other than the hall but if their Arab is remaining with them all agree that one contribution to the Arab suffices for all of them whose view is followed in what was taught if five residents who collected their Arab desired to transfer it to another place one Arab suffices for all of them whose view that of Bethel others read this applies only where the Arab remained with them but if they carried their Arab to a place other than their hall all agree that a separate contribution to the Arab is required for each company whose view is followed in which was taught if five residents who Collected their contributions to an Arab desire to transfer it to another place. One Arab suffices for all of them whose view no one's Mishnah brothers who were eating at their father's table but slept in their own house must each contribute a share to the Arab. Hence, if any one of them forgot to contribute to the Arab, he must renounce his right to his share in the courtyard. When does this apply when they carry their Arab into some other place? But if their Arab is deposited with them, or if there are no other tenants with them in the courtyard, they need not prepare any Arab Gemara. Does this then imply that the night's lodging place is the cause of the obligation of Arab Rab Judah citing Flab replied this was learned only in respect of such as receive a maintenance allowance or rabbis taught a man who has in his neighbor's courtyard a gatehouse in Exeter or a balcony imposes no restrictions upon him. One, however, who has in it a straw magazine, a cattle pen, a room for wood or a Storehouse does impose restrictions upon him. Our Judah ruled only a dwelling house imposes restrictions. It once happened. Our Judah related that Ben Napaha had five courtyards at Isha, and when the matter was submitted to the sages, they ruled only a dwelling house imposes restrictions. A dwelling house is such a ruling imaginable. Rather say a dwelling place. What is meant by a dwelling place? Rab explained Talmud, Mas Arab in a once dining place, and Samuel explained once night's lodging place. An objection was raised. Shepherd, summer fruit attendants, station house keepers, and fruit watchmen have the same status as the townspeople if they are in the habit of taking their nights rest in the town. But if they are in the habit of spending the night in the fields, they are only entitled to walk a distance of two thousand cubits in all directions. In that case, we are witnesses that they would have been more pleased if bread had been brought to them. There said our Joseph, I have never heard this. Tradition you yourself have a reminded him have told it to us and you said it in connection with the following brothers who were eating at their father's table but slept in their own houses must each contribute a share to the Arab concerning which we ask you does this then imply that the night's lodging place is the cause of the obligation of Arab and you in reply to this question told us Rab Judah citing Rab replied this was learned only in respect of such as receive a maintenance allowance. Our rabbis taught where a man has five wives who are in receipt of a maintenance allowance from their husband or five slaves who are in receipt of a maintenance allowance from their master our Judah be but there are permits unrestricted movement in the case of the wives but forbids it in the case of the slaves while our Judah be Baba permits this in the case of slaves but forbids it in the case of the wives said Rab what is our Judah be Baba's reason the fact that it is written in scripture but Daniel was. In the gate of the king it is obvious that a son in relation to his father is subject to the ruling here enunciated the status of a wife in relation to her husband and a slave in relation to his master is a point at issue between Arjuna Bibathur and Arjuna Bibaba what however is the status of a student in relation to his master come and hear what Rab went at the school of our high stated we need not prepare an Arab since we virtually dine at our highest table and our high when he was at the school of Rabbi stated we need not prepare an Arab since we virtually dine at Rabbi's table Abbe inquired of Rabbi if five residents collected their contributions to their Arab and desired to transfer it to another place does one Arab contribution suffice for all of them or is it necessary for each one to make a separate contribution to the Arab he replied one Arab contribution suffices for all of them but surely brothers are like residents who collected their contributions and yet was it not stated must each contribute a share to the Arab here we are dealing with a case where other tenants for instance lived with them so that it may be said since these impose restrictions those also impose them this may also be supported by a process of reasoning for it was stated when does this apply when they carry their Arab into some other place but if their Arab is deposited with them or if there are no other tenants with them in the courtyard they need not prepare any Arab this is conclusive our high B. Avin inquired of our she's hate in the case of students who have their meals in the country but come to spend their nights at the schoolhouse do we measure their Sabbath limit from the schoolhouse or from their country quarters he replied we measure it from the schoolhouse behold the first objected the case of the man who deposits his Arab within 2000 cubits and comes to take his night's rest at his house whose Sabbath limit is measured from his Arab in that case the other replied we are witnesses and in this case also we are witnesses in that case we are witnesses that if he could live there he would have preferred it and in this case also we are witnesses that if their meals had been brought to them at the schoolhouse they would have much preferred it Rami Biham inquired of our his daughter a father and his son or a master and his disciple regarded as many or as one individual do they require an Arab or not can the use of their alley be permitted by means of a side post or crossbeam or not he replied you have learned it a father and his son or a master and his disciple if no other tenants live with them are regarded as one individual they require no Arab and the use of their alley may be rendered permissible by means of a side post or crossbeam m
also was made but read then the next clause if an Arab was prepared for the courtyards and shithaf was made for the alley though one of the tenants of the courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab they are nevertheless permitted the unrestricted use of both now how is one to understand this ruling if the tenant did not renounce his share why should the others be permitted it is obvious then that he did renounce it now read the final clause if however one of the residents of the alley forgot to contribute to the shithaf they are permitted the unrestricted use of the courtyards but forbidden that of the alley now if this is a case where he renounced his share why are they forbidden the unrestricted use of the alley and should you reply that our mayor is of the opinion that the law of renunciation of one share is not applicable to an alley surely it can be retorted was it not taught since he renounced his share in your favor so our mayor it is consequently obvious that the tenant did not renounce his share and since the final clause deals with one who made no renunciation in the earlier clause also must deal with one who made no renunciation within the first and the last clauses represent the view of our mayor and the middle one that of the rabbis all our mission represents the view of our mayor for the only reason why our mayor ruled that both Arab and Shidduch were required is that the law of Arab should not be forgotten by the children but in this case since most of the tenants did contribute to the Arab it would not be forgotten Rab Judah stated Rab did not learn opened into each other and so stated Arkahana Rab did not learn opened into each other others say Arkahana himself did not learn opened into each other Abbe asked our Joseph what is the reason of him who does not learn opened into each other he is of the opinion that a Shidduch contribution that is not carried in and out through the doors that opened into the alley cannot be regarded as valid Shidduch. He raised an objection against him if a householder was in partnership with his neighbors with the one in one and with the other in one they need not prepare an Arab there it is a case where he carried it in and out he raised another objection how is Shidduf in an alley affected etc there also it is a case where it was carried in and out Rabbi Behan and Demurd now then would Shidduf be equally invalid if one resident transferred to another the possession of some bread in his basket and should you reply that the law is so indeed it could be retorted did not Rab Judah in fact state in the name of Rab if numbers of the party were dining when the sanctity of the Sabbath day overtook them they may rely upon the bread on the table to serve the purpose of Arab or as others say that of Shidduf and in connection with this Rab observed that there is really no difference of opinion between them since the former refers to a party dining in a house and the latter to one dining in a Courtyard the fact is that Rab's reason this he is of the opinion that unrestricted movement in an alley cannot be rendered permissible by means of a side post or crossbeam unless houses and courtyards open into it to turn to the main text Rab laid down unrestricted movement in an alley cannot be rendered permissible by means of a side post or crossbeam Talmud, Mas Arabin Talmud, Mas Arabin unless houses and courtyards open into it but Samuel ruled even one house and one. Courtyard suffices while Aryohan and maintained even a ruin is sufficient said Abbe to our Joseph did Aryohan and maintain his view even in the case of a path between vineyards Aryohan and the other replied only spoke of a ruin since it may be used as a dwelling but not of a path between vineyards which cannot be used as a dwelling said Aryohan behind and Aryohan and here follows a principle of his for we learned our Simeon ruled roofs car paths and courtyards are equally regarded as one domain in respect of carrying from one into the other objects that were kept within them when the Sabbath began but not in respect of objects that were in the house when the Sabbath began and Rab stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon provided no Arab had been prepared but where an Arab had been prepared a preventive measure had been enacted against the possibility of carrying objects from the houses of one courtyard into some other courtyard but Samuel stated whether an Arab had or had not been prepared and so also said Aryohan and the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon irrespective of whether all Arab had or had not been prepared thus it is evident that no preventive measure had been instituted against the possibility of carrying objects from the houses of one courtyard into some other courtyard and so also here no preventive measure had been instituted against the possibility of carrying objects from the courtyard into the ruin our Barano was sitting at his studies and reporting. This ruling when our Eliezer a student of the college asked him did Samuel say this yes the other replied will you the first asked show me his lodgings when the other showed it to him he approached Samuel and asked him did the master say this yes the other replied but he objected did not the master state in the laws of Arab we can only be guided by the wording of our mission is that an alley to its courtyards is as a courtyard to its houses whereupon the other remained silent did he or did he not accept it from him come and hear of the case of a certain alley in which a B I H I lived and when he furnished it with a side post Samuel allowed him its unrestricted use Talmud, Mas Arab and B R A N and subsequently came and threw it down when he exclaimed I have been living undisturbed in this alley on the authority of Samuel why should R A N B Rab now come and throw its side post down may it not then be deduced from this that he did not accept it from him as a matter of fact it may Still be maintained that he did accept it from him but in this case a synagogue superintendent who was having his meals in his own home came to spend his nights at the synagogue but B.I.H.I. however thought that one's dining place is the cause of shit while Samuel in reality was merely acting on his own principle he having laid down that one's night's lodging place is the cause Rab Judah citing Rab rule for an alley whose one side occupied by all idolater and its other side by an Israelite no Arab may be prepared through windows render the movement of objects permissible by way of the door into the alley said Abbe to our Joseph did Rab give the same ruling even in respect of the courtyard yes the other replied for if he had not given it I might have presumed that Rab's reason for his ruling was his opinion that the use of an alley cannot be rendered permissible by means of a side post or crossbeam unless houses and courtyards opened into it and as to the objection what Need was there for two rulings it could be replied that both were necessary for if all our information had to be derived from the former ruling Talmud, Mas Ayrvan I might have presumed that an idolater's dwelling is regarded as a valid dwelling hence we were informed that an idolater's dwelling is no valid dwelling and if all our knowledge had to be derived from the latter ruling one would not have known the number of houses required hence we were informed that there must be no less than two houses now however that Rab also stated that his ruling applied even to a courtyard it follows that Rab's reason is his opinion that one is forbidden to live alone with an idolater if so observed our Joseph I can well understand why I heard our table mentioning idolater twice though at the time I did not understand what he meant Mishnah if two courtyards were one within the other and the tenants of the inner one prepared an Arab while those of the other one did not prepare one did. Unrestricted use of the inner one is permitted but that of the outer one is forbidden if the tenants of the outer one prepared an Arab but not those of the inner one the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden if the tenants of each courtyard prepared an Arab for themselves the unrestricted use of each is permitted to its own tenants are akiba forbids the unrestricted use of the outer one because the right of way imposes restrictions the sages however maintain that the right of way imposes no restrictions upon it if one of the tenants of the outer courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab the unrestricted use of the inner courtyard is permitted but that of the outer one is forbidden if the tenant of the inner courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden if they deposited their Arab in the same place and one tenant whether of the inner courtyard or of the outer courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab the use of both Courtyards is forbidden if the courtyards, however, belong to separate individuals. These need not prepare any Arab tomorrow. When Ardini came, he stated in the name of Arjane, this is the opinion of our Akiba who ruled even a foot that is permitted in its own place imposes restrictions in a place to which it does not belong. But the sages maintain as a permitted foot does not impose restrictions, so does not a forbidden foot either. We learned if the tenants of the outer one prepared an Arab, but not those of the inner one. The unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden. Now, whose ruling is this? If it be suggested that of our Akiba the difficulty would arise, what was the point in speaking of a forbidden foot, seeing that the same restrictions would also apply to a permitted one? Must it not then be a ruling of the rabbis? It may in fact be the ruling of our Akiba, but the arrangement it may be explained is in the form of a climax. We learned if the tenants of each courtyard prepared an Arab for. Themselves the unrestricted use of each is permitted to its own tenants the reason then is because it prepared an Arab but if it had not prepared one the unrestricted use of both cour
permitted in its own place imposes no restrictions and that a foot forbidden imposes restrictions Robin furthermore raised the following objections if one of the tenants of the outer courtyard forgot to contribute to the error of the unrestricted use of the inner courtyard is permitted but that of the outer one is forbidden if a tenant of the inner courtyard forgot to contribute to the error of the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden the reason accordingly is that a tenant forgot but if he had not forgotten the use of both courtyards would have been unrestricted is it not thus obvious that a foot permitted imposes no restrictions and one forbidden does the fact is Robin when he came stated in the name of Arjane that three different views have been expressed on this question the first tana holds that a permitted foot imposes no restrictions and a forbidden one does our Akiva holds that even a permitted foot imposes restrictions while the latter rabbis hold that is a permitted Foot does not impose restrictions, so does not one that is forbidden if they deposited their Arab in the same place and one tenant whether of the inner courtyard forgot, etc. What is meant by the same place? Rab Judah citing Rab explained the other courtyard, but why is it described as the same place? Because it is a place designated for the use of the tenants of both courtyards, Talmud, Mas Arab and B. So it was also taught if they deposited their Arab in the outer courtyard and one tenant whether of the outer or of the inner courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab, the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden if they deposited their Arab in the inner one and a tenant of the inner one forgot to contribute to the Arab, the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden if a tenant of the outer courtyard forgot to contribute to the Arab, the unrestricted use of both courtyards is forbidden. This is the view of our Akiva the sages, however, ruled in this case the unrestricted use of the inner one is permitted through that of the outer one is forbidden said Rabbi and Juabe why did the rabbis make a distinction when they laid down that the unrestricted use of the inner courtyard is permitted obviously because its tenants can shut its door and so use it why then should they not shut its door according to our Akiva also and so use it the other replied the Arab causes them to be associated does not the Arab cause them to be so associated according to the rabbis also the tenants call say we have associated with you in order to improve our position but not to make it worse why could they not according to our Akiva also say we have associated with you in order to improve our position but not to make it worse because the others can reply we will renounce our rights of entry in your favor and the rabbis the tenants of one courtyard cannot renounce their rights in favor of those of another must it be assumed that Samuel and Aryohan and differ on the same principle as that on which the rabbis and our Akiva differ Samuel holding the same view as the rabbis and Aryohan and holding that of our Akiva Samuel can answer you I may maintain my view even according to our Akiva for it is only here where two courtyards one within the other impose restrictions upon each other that our Akiva upheld his view but not there where they do not impose restrictions upon each other Yohan and also can answer you I may maintain my view even according to the rabbis for it is only here that the rabbis maintain their view since the tenants of the inner courtyard can say to those of the outer one until you make renunciation in our favor you are imposing restrictions upon us but not there where one courtyard does not impose restrictions upon the other if the courtyards however belong to separate individuals etc our Joseph stated rabbi learned if they were three there forbidden said our to them do not listen to him it was I who first reported it and I did so in the name of our at the Akiva giving the following as a reason since I might describe them as many residents in the outer courtyard God of Abraham explained our Joseph I must have mistaken Rabin for Rabbi Samuel however ruled the unrestricted use of both courtyards is always permitted except where two persons occupy the inner courtyard and one person the outer one our Eliezer ruled the Gentile is regarded as many Israelites but wherein does an Israelite who imposes no restrictions essentially differ in this respect obviously in this that he who knows is fully aware of the circumstances and he who does not know presumes that an Arab had been duly prepared why then should it not be said in the case of a Gentile also he who knows is fully aware of the circumstances and he who does not know presumes that the Gentile has duly let his right of way the average Gentile if ever he lets his right makes a noise about it Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled if there were ten houses one within the other the innermost one contributes the Arab and this is sufficient are Yohanan however ruled even the outer one must contribute to it the outer one is it not like a gatehouse the outer house of the innermost one was meant on what principle do they differ one master holds a view that the gatehouse of one individual is regarded as a proper gatehouse while the other master holds a view that it is not regarded as a proper gatehouse are not inciting Rabbi Abba who had it front Rab ruled it there were two courtyards between which there were three houses one tenant may come through the one outer house and deposit his Arab in the middle one and another tenant may come through the outer house and deposit his Arab in the middle one Talmud Mas Arab in the one outer house thereby becomes a gatehouse to the one courtyard and the other outer house becomes a gatehouse to the other courtyard while the middle house being the house in which the Arab is deposited need not contribute any bread to the Arab Rehub attested the rabbis if there were two courtyards and between them two houses and a tenant of the one courtyard came through the one house and deposited his Arab in the other while a tenant of the other courtyard came through the latter house and deposited his Arab in the former do they thereby acquire the privileges of Arab or not do we regard each house in relation to the one courtyard as a house and in relation to the other courtyard as a gatehouse. Both they replied do not acquire the privileges of Arab for whatever you assume this must be the result if you regard either house as a gatehouse an Arab deposited in a gatehouse etc or balcony is not a valid Arab and if you regard either as a proper house the tenants would be carrying objects into a house which was not covered by their Arab but why should this ruling be different from that of Rabbah who laid down if two persons said to a third party go and prepare an Arab on our behalf. And after he had prepared an Arab for the one while it was yet day and for the other at twilight the Arab of the man for whom it was prepared while it was yet day was eaten up at twilight while the Arab of the man for whom it was prepared at twilight was eaten up after dusk both acquire the privileges of Arab what a comparison there it is doubtful whether twilight is daytime or nighttime a point that cannot be definitely determined but in this case if a house is to be regarded as a proper house in relation to the former it must be so regarded in relation to the latter also and if it is regarded in relation to the latter as a gatehouse it must also be so regarded in relation to the former chapterbii mission if between two courtyards there was a window of four handbreadths by four within ten handbreadths from the ground the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer they may prepare one if the size of the window was less than four handbreadths by four or higher then ten handbreadths from the ground two Arabs may be prepared but not one tomorrow must it be assumed that we have here learned an anonymous mission in agreement with our Simeon B. Gamaliel who ruled that wherever a gap is less than four handbreadths it is regarded as Labud it may be said to agree even with the rabbis for the rabbis differed from our Simeon B. Gamaliel only in regard to the laws of Labud as regards an opening however even they may agree that only if its size is four handbreadths by four is it regarded as a valid opening but otherwise it cannot be so regarded less than four etc it is not this obvious for since it was said that the window must be four handbreadths by four within ten handbreadths would I not naturally understand that if it was less than four and higher than ten it is not valid opening it is this that we were informed the reason is because all of it was higher than ten handbreadths from the ground but if a part of it was within ten handbreadths from the ground the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer they may prepare one thus we have learned in a mission of what the rabbis taught elsewhere if almost all the window was higher than ten handbreadths from the ground but a part of it was within ten handbreadths from it or if almost all of it was within ten handbreadths and a part of it was higher than ten handbreadths the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer they may prepare one now then where almost all the window was higher than ten handbreadths from the ground but a part of it was within ten handbreadths you ruled that the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer they may prepare one was it also necessary to mention the case where almost all of it was within ten handbreadths and a part of it was higher than ten handbreadths this is a case of anticlimax this and there is no need to say that our Yohan and ruled around window must have a circumference of twenty four handbreadths two and a fraction of which must be within ten handbreadths from the ground so that when it is squared a fraction remains within the ten handbreadths from the ground consider any object that has a circumference of three handbreadths is approximately one handbreadth in diameter should not then
Learn only in respect of a window between two courtyards, but in the case of a window between two houses, even though it was higher than ten handbreadths from the ground, the residents may, if they wish, prepare one error jointly. What is the reason the house is regarded as filled? Robber raised an objection against our nominal window, irrespective of whether it was between two courtyards, between two houses, between two upper rooms, between two roofs, or between two rooms, must be of the size of four handbreadths by four within ten handbreadths from the ground. The interpretation is that the limitation applies to the courtyards, but was it not stated, irrespective of whether the interpretation is that this refers to the prescribed four handbreadths by four? Our inquired of our nominal. If an aperture led from a room to an upper room is a permanent ladder necessary for the purpose of allowing the movement of objects or not, do we apply the principle that a house is regarded as filled only when? The aperture is at the side but not when it is in the middle or is it possible that there is no difference the other replied it is not necessary he understood him to mean that only a permanent ladder is not necessary but that a temporary one is necessary it was however stated our Joseph Pimenya by citing our nominally down neither a permanent nor a temporary ladder is necessary mission of a whale between two courtyards was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths thick two Arabs may be prepared but not one if there was fruit on the top of it the tenants on either side may climb up and eat them provided they do not carry them down if a breach to the extent of ten cubits was made in the wall the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer only one because it is like a doorway if the breach was bigger only one Arab and not two may be prepared tomorrow what is the ruling where it was not four handbreadths wide rab replied the Arab two domains prevails upon it and no object on it may be moved even as far as a hair's breadth Talmud, Mas Arab and Ar Yohanan however ruled the tenants on either side may carry up their food and eat it there we learn the tenants on either side may climb up and eat there does not this imply that they may only climb up but not carry up it is this that was meant if the top consists of an area of four handbreadths by four they may climb up but may not carry up and if it consists of less than four by four they may also carry up Ar Yohanan follows a principle of his for when Ardini came he stated in the name of Ar Yohanan on a place whose area is less than four handbreadths by four it is permissible both for the people of the public domain and for those of the private domain to rearrange their burdens provided they do not exchange them does not rab however uphold the tradition of Ardini if it were a case of pentacle domains the law would have been so indeed but here we are dealing with rabbinical domains and the sages have applied to their enactments higher restrictions than to those of the Torah Rabbi son of Arhuna citing Arnaman ruled the wall between two courtyards one of whose sides was ten handbreadths high and the other one of which was on a level with the ground is assigned to that courtyard with the floor of which it is level because the use of it is convenient to the latter but inconvenient to the former and any place the use of which is convenient to one and inconvenient to another is to be assigned to the one to whom its use is convenient Arshez by laid down in the name of Arnaman a trench between two courtyards whose one side was ten handbreadths deep and whose other side was on a level with the floor is assigned to that courtyard with whose floor it is on a level because its use is convenient to the latter but inconvenient to the former etc and the enunciation of both cases was required for if we had been informed only of the law of the wall it might have been assumed to apply to it alone because People make use of a raised structure but not to a trench since people do not make use of a depression in the ground and if we had been informed of the law of the trench only it might have been assumed to apply to it alone because its use involves no anxiety but not to a wall the use of which involves anxiety hence the enunciation of both was necessary if the height of the wall was reduced it is permitted to use all the wall if the reduction extended to four handbreadths otherwise one may use only that part that was parallel to the reduction what however is your view if it is that the reduction is effective one should be permitted to have the use of all the wall and if it is not effective even the use of the part that was parallel to the reduction should not be permitted Rubin replied this is a case for instance where a section of its top has been pulled down or yeah you rule if a bowl is inverted a valid reduction is thereby effective but why is not the bowl an object that may be Moved away on the Sabbath and that as such causes no reduction this is was required only in a case where the bowl was attached to the ground but what matters it even if it was attached to the ground seeing that it was taught an unripe fruit that had been put into straw or a cake that had been put among coals may be taken out on the Sabbath if a part of it remained uncovered here we are dealing with a case for instance where the bowl had rooms but what matters it even if it had rooms seeing that we learned if a man buried turnips or radishes under a bun leaving Talmud, Moss Arab and be some of the leaves uncovered he need not fear the possible transgression of the laws of Kilim or of tithe or of the sabbatical year and they may be removed on the Sabbath this was required in that case only where a hoe or pickaxe is necessary an Egyptian ladder affects no reduction but a Tyrian ladder does what is to be understood by an Egyptian ladder at the school of Arjana it was explained one that has less than four rungs Araha son of Rabba asked Arashi what is the reason why an Egyptian ladder affects no reduction did you not hear the other replied what Araha Viata stated in the name of Arhamana who had it from Rab because it is an object that may be moved about on the Sabbath and which like all such objects causes no reduction if so should not the same ruling apply to a Tyrian ladder also in the latter case it is its weight that imparts to it a permanency of position of a ruled if a wall between two courtyards was ten handbreadths high and one ladder four handbreadths wide was placed on the one side and another of the same width was placed on the other side and there is less than a distance of three handbreadths between them a valid reduction is effected but if there was a distance of three handbreadths between them no valid reduction is effected this however applies only where the wall was less than four handbreadths thick but if it was four handbreadths thick the reduction is valid even if the ladders were far removed from one another. Arba Babi ruled if one balcony was built above another balcony, a valid reduction is thereby effected if either the lower one had an area of four handbreadths by four handbreadths or where it was smaller if the upper one had an area of four handbreadths and there was no space of three handbreadths between them. Similarly, Arnam and citing Rabbi ruled a step ladder affects a reduction if the length of it. Lower rung was four handbreadths or where it was shorter if the upper one was four handbreadths long and there was no space of three handbreadths between them. Arnam and further stated in the name of Rabbi Abu Talmud, Mas Arab and Avon a molding of an area of four handbreadths by four handbreadths that projected from a wall a ladder of the smallest size was rested. A valid reduction is thereby effected. This, however, applies only where the ladder was resting on it, but if it was placed at the side of its the ladder is thereby merely extended Arnam and further stated in the name of Rabbi Abu a wall that was 19 handbreadths high requires only one projection to enable it to be used as a means of access but a wall 20 handbreadths high requires for the purpose two projections are his to observe this however applies only where they are not situated exactly one above the other Arhun or if in a public domain there was a post 10 handbreadths high and 4 handbreadths wide and a peg of the smallest size had been inserted on it a valid reduction is thereby effected Arhabi Ahab observed provided the peg was 3 handbreadths high both Abay and Rabba however maintain even if it was not 3 handbreadths high what is their reason because it is no longer suitable for use Arashi ruled even if it was 3 handbreadths high what is the reason it is possible to suspend some object from it Arah son of Rabba asked Arashi what is the ruling where it was Completely covered with picks, did you not hear the other reply? The following ruling of Aryohan and a pit and the bank around it combined to constitute a depth of ten handbreadths. Now, seeing that the bank cannot be used, why should it be regarded as a private domain? What then can you say in reply that some object might be placed over it and thereby it is made available for use? Well, then here also some object might be placed over them and thereby it is made available for use. Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled a wall ten handbreadths high requires a ladder of fourteen handbreadths in length to render it permissible for use. Our Joseph ruled even a ladder of thirteen handbreadths and a fraction is sufficient. Abay ruled even one of eleven handbreadths and a fraction suffices. Arhuna son of Arjashu ruled even one of seven handbreadths and a fraction suffices. Rab stated that a ladder in a vertical position affects a reduction is a tradition, but I do not know the reason for it does not have a Samuel said to him, No, the reason for this ruling the case is in fact similar to that of a balcony above a balcony. Rabbi citing Arhai said the palm trees of Babylon need not be fix
Inquired is made with reference to the view of rabbi and it is also made with reference to that of the rabbis. It is made with reference to the view of rabbi since it is possible that rabbi applied the principle that any act that is forbidden as Shabbat is not subject to that prohibition during twilight only there where the crucial moment is at twilight but not where the entire day is involved or is it possible that even according to the rabbis the tree may have the status of a doorway except that it is one at the side of which a lion crouches what again is the ruling where an Asherah was set aside to serve as a ladder the inquiry is made with reference to the view of Arjuna and it is also made with reference to that of the rabbis it is made with reference to the view of Arjuna since it is possible that Arjuna applied the principle that a house may be bought with objects of benefit from which is forbidden only there because after the Arab had enabled him to acquire the place its owner derives no further satisfaction from its preservation or is it possible that even according to the rabbis an Asherah has the status of a doorway except that a lion crouches at its side a tree the other replied is permitted but an Asherah is forbidden are his daughter on the contrary a tree the restriction on the use of which is due to the incidents of the Sabbath should be forbidden while an Asherah the restrictions on which are due to an external cause should not be forbidden so it was also stated when Rabin came he reported in the name of our Eliezer or as others say our Abad reported in the name of our Yohanan any object the restriction of the use of which is clue to the incidents of the Sabbath is forbidden while an object the restriction on which is due to an external cause is permitted our Naman B. Isaac taught us the permissibility of a tree is a question at issue between Rabbi and the Rabbis and that of an Asherah is a question at issue between Arjuna and the Rabbis. Mishnah if a trench between two courtyards was ten handbreadths deep and four handbreadths wide two Arabs may be prepared but not one even if it was full of stubble or straw if however it was full of earth or gravel only one Arab may be prepared but not two if a board four handbreadths wide was placed across it and so also where two balconies were opposite one another the tenants may prepare two Arabs or if they prefer only one if the board was of a lesser with two Arabs may be prepared but not one Gemara but does not straw constitute a proper filling seeing that we have learned if a heap of straw between two courtyards was ten handbreadths high two Arabs may be prepared but not one Abbe replied as regards the formation of a partition no one disputes the ruling that straw is regarded as a valid partition with regard however to its serving as a valid filling it is only in the case where one completely abandoned it that it constitutes a valid filling but not otherwise if however it was full of earth this then applies even where one's intention was not known but have we not learned if a house was filled with straw or gravel and the owner announced his intention to abandon it it is duly abandoned from which it follows does it not that only if the owner expressly abandoned it is it regarded as abandoned Talmud, Mas Arabin, but not if he did not expressly do so our Huna replied who is it that taught Ahilat Arhose but how could it be the view of Arhose seeing that he was heard to give a reverse ruling for it was taught Arhose ruled straw that was not likely to be removed is on a PAR with ordinary earth and is deemed to be abandoned earth that is likely to be removed is on a PAR with ordinary stubble and is not deemed to be abandoned rather said RC who is it that taught Arabin it is Arhose Arhuna son of Arjash who replied you are pointing out an incongruity between the law concerning Levitical uncleanness and one concerning Sabbath leave alone the restrictions of the Sabbath since on it a person abandons even his purse Arashi replied you are pointing out an incongruity between a ruling concerning a house and one concerning a trench a trench might well be expected to be filled up but is a house also expected to be filled up if a board four handbreadths wide was placed across it Rabbi explained this was taught only in the case where it was laid across the width of it but if it was laid lengthwise even a board of the minutest width also suffices since the width of the trench is thereby reduced to less than four handbreadths and so also where two balconies were opposite one another Rabbi explained with reference to what we learned and so also where two balconies etc the ruling applies only to such as are opposite each other but not to such as are not opposite each other or to such as are above each other and even in the case of such as are above each other the ruling applies only where there was a distance of three handbreadths between them but if there was no such distance between them they may both be regarded as one crooked balcony mission if a heap of straw between two courtyards yards was ten handbreadths high two Arabs may be prepared but not one the tenants of the one courtyard may feed their cattle at their side and those of the other courtyard may feed theirs on the other side if the height of the straw heap was reduced to less than ten handbreadths one Arab may be prepared but not two Gemara Arhuna observed provided no tenant puts any straw into his basket and feeds his cattle it is then permitted to put cattle there but did not Arhuna lay down in the name of Arhana a man may put his beast on a stretch of grass on the Sabbath day but not upon Muksa he only stands near the beast which itself goes and eats provided no tenant puts any straw into his basket but was it not taught if a house was between two courtyards and was filled with straw two Arabs may be prepared but not one and each tenant may put some Straw into his basket and feed his cattle there with it. The height of the straw was reduced to less than ten handbreadths. Both are forbidden. How is one to proceed? One of the tenants locks his house and renounces his right to his share, and thereby he remains under restrictions. But his friend is permitted, and the same law applies to a pit of straw between two Sabbath limits. At any rate, was it not here stated each tenant may put some straw into his basket and feed his cattle there with I might? Reply in the case of a house, since it has a ceiling, the reduction in the straw is quite noticeable. But here the diminution is not noticeable. If the height of the straw was reduced to less than ten handbreadths, both are forbidden. But it follows if it was ten handbreadths high, this is permitted, even though the ceiling was much higher. May it not then be inferred that partitions that do not reach the ceiling are regarded as valid ones? Have they replied? We are here dealing with the case of a house that. Was thirteen handbreadths minus a fraction in height, and that of the straw was ten handbreadths in height. Arhuna son of Arjashu, however, replied, it may even refer to a house that was ten handbreadths high. Talmud, Mas Arabin B, but the straw was seven handbreadths and a fraction, since a distance of less than three handbreadths is regarded as low. But according to Abay, one can well understand why the expression and ten was used according to Arhuna son of Arjashu. However, what could be the purport of then ten and the statutory height of ten both are forbidden? Does this then imply that tenants who arrived on a Sabbath impose restrictions? No, since it is possible that the reduction occurred on the previous day. How is one to proceed? One of the tenants locks his house and renounces his right to his share. Both acts. It is this that was meant. He either locks his house or renounces his right to his share. And if you prefer, I might say both acts are in fact necessary for having been in the Habit of using it, he might continue to move objects into it. He remains under restrictions, but his friend is permitted. Is not this obvious? This ruling was required only in the case where the other tenant had subsequently renounced his share to the former. And it is this that we were informed that a renunciation may not follow a previous renunciation. And the same law applies to a pit of straw between two Sabbath limits. Is not this perfectly obvious? The ruling was required only according to the view of our Akiva, who holds that the ordinance of Sabbath limits is pentacle, since it might have been presumed that a preventive measure should be enacted against the possibility of exchange. Hence, we were informed that no such preventive measure was deemed necessary. Mishnah how is Shitaf in an alley affected? One of the residents places their jar and declares this belongs to all the residents of the alley, and he confers possession upon them through his grown-up son or daughter through his. Hebrew man servant or maid servant or through his wife, but he may not confer possession either through his son or daughter if they are minors or through his Canaanite bondman or bondwoman because their hand is as his hand. Gemara Rab Judah ruled the jar for the shidduch of alleys must be raised from the ground to the height of a handbreadth. Rab observed these two rulings were given by the elders of Pumadai. The one is the ruling just cited, the other is the following. He who recites the Kiddush has performed his duty if he tastes a mouthful, otherwise he does not. Our Habib observed the following ruling also was given by the elders of Pumadai. Before Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel, a fire for a woman in childbirth may be made on the Sabbath. From this one might understand that a fire may be made only for a woman in childbirth, but not for any other sick person, only in the rainy season, but not in the summer season. It was, however, stated our high B. inciting Samuel ruled if a person has. Been bled and felt chilly, a fire may be made for him on the Sabbath, even during the hottest period of the year. Amimar
Related in the name of Rabbit daughter-in-law Arashai was once overtaken by dusk when she went to a bathhouse and her mother-in-law prepared for her an Arab Arhai to whom the incident was reported forbade her return Babylonian said Arishmael son of Arhose to him are you so strict about the laws of Arab but said my father wherever you see an opportunity of relaxing the laws of Arab seize it and when the question was raised was the Arab prepared out of her mother-in-law's food and it Reason for the prohibition was that she did not transfer possession to her or was it rather that it was prepared out of her own food and the reason for the prohibition was that it was done without her knowledge one of the rabbis whose name was our Jacob told them it was explained to me by our Yohanan that the Arab was prepared out of her mother-in-law's food and that the reason for the prohibition was that she did not transfer possession to her our Zerah requested our Jacob son of Jacob's daughter. When you arrive in Palestine make a deeper to visit the ladder of Tyre and ask our Jacob B.E.D. his version of the incident was the Arab he asked him in due course prepared out of her mother-in-law's food and the reason for the prohibition was that she did not transfer possession to her or was it rather that it was prepared out of her own food and the reason for the prohibition was that it was done without her knowledge the Arab the other replied was prepared out of her mother-in-law's food. And the reason for the prohibition was that she did not transfer possession to her Arnam and stated we have a tradition that both in the case of Arabs of Sabbath limits and in that of Shitaf of Ali's possession must be transferred Arnam and however inquired is it necessary or not to confer possession in the case of an Arab of dishes why remarked our Joseph did he ask this question did he not hear the ruling laid down by Arnam and BK Atta in the name of Samuel that an Arab of dishes must be conferred upon those who are to benefit from it it is obvious Abbe retorted that he did not hear it for had he heard it what was the point of his asking did not Samuel rule the first replied that in the case of Arabs of Sabbath limits possession need not be conferred and he nevertheless ruled that possession must be conferred what a comparison his ruling may well be justified there since Rab and Samuel are at variance on the point and he desired to inform us that we must adopt it. Restrictions of the one master as well as those of the other master but in this case seeing that no one disputes Samuel's ruling would he if he had heard it have asked his question a certain superintendent of the town armory lived in the neighborhood of Arzara and when the Israelite residents asked him to let his share to them he refused they thereupon came to Arzara and asked him whether it would be permissible to rent it from his wife thus he replied said Reshlakish in the name of a great man and who is it Arhanan a wife may prepare all Arab without her husband's knowledge a certain superintendent of the town armory lived in the neighborhood of Arjuda B. Ashai will you the Israelite residents asked him let your share to us he refused they proceeded to Arjuda B. Ashai and asked him whether it was permissible to rent it from his wife but he was unable to supply the information they then proceeded to Armatina who also was unable to supply it when they finally came to Rab. Judah he told them thus said Samuel a wife may prepare an Arab without her husband's knowledge an objection was raised if women prepared an Arab or arranged shidduch without their husband's knowledge there is no validity either in their Arab or in their shidduch this is no difficulty since one deals with the person who imposes restrictions while the other deals with one who does not impose restrictions this explanation may also be supported by a process of reasoning since a contradiction would otherwise arise between two rulings of Samuel for Samuel ruled if one of the residents of an ali who usually joins the other residents in shidduch refused to join then the residents may enter his house and collect his contribution to the shidduch by force from which it follows that this applies only to one who usually joins his neighbors in the shidduch but not to one who did not this is conclusive may it be suggested that the following provides support to his view resident may be Compelled to provide a side post and a crossbeam for an Ali Talmud, Mas Arab and be the case may be different there where no partitions are in existence another reading from the side is different it was stated our high B Ashi ruled a side post may be made from an Asherah but our Simeon B Lakish ruled a crossbeam may be made from an Asherah he who permitted a crossbeam would with much more reason permit a side post but he who permitted a side post would not permit a crossbeam since it's prescribed size is virtually crushed to dust mission if the food was reduced one of the residents must add to it and again confer possession upon the others but there is no need to inform them if the number of residents has increased he must add food and confer possession upon them and they must be informed of the facts what is the quantity required when the residents are many there should be food sufficient for two meals for all of them and when they are few there should be food of it. Size of a dry fig for each one are Jose ruled this applies only to the beginnings of the Arab but in the case of the remnants of one even the smallest quantity of food is sufficient the sole reason for the injunction to provide Arabs for courtyards being that the law of Arab shall not be forgotten by the children tomorrow what are we dealing with if it be suggested with the same kind what point was there in speaking of an Arab that was reduced seeing that the same law applies even if nothing of it remained if the reference however is to two kinds the same law should apply should it not even if the food had only been reduced since it was taught if nothing of the food remained there is no need to inform the residents if the new Arab is prepared of the same kind but if it is of a different kind it is necessary to inform them if you prefer I might reply the reference is to an addition of the same kind and if you prefer I might reply of a different kind if you prefer I might reply the Reference is to an addition of the same kind and as to was reduced it means it was reduced to atoms and if you prefer I might reply of a different kind since the case where nothing of the food remained is different from that where the food was only reduced if the number of residents has increased he must add food and confer possession upon them etc. said Arshez by in the name of Arhista this implies that Arjuda's colleagues differ from him for we learned Arjuda rule this applies only to Arabs of Sabbath limits but in the case of Arabs of courtyards one may be prepared for a person whether he is aware of it or not is it not quite obvious that they differ it might have been presumed that our mission refers to the case of a courtyard between two alleys but not to that of a courtyard in one alley hence we were informed that it refers to the latter case also what is the quantity required etc. what number of residents is regarded as many Rab Judah citing Samuel replied 18. Men only eighteen and no more say from eighteen and upwards but why was just the number eighteen selected our Isaac son of Rab Judah replied it was explained to me by my father that wherever the food for two meals if divided between them would not suffice to provide for each as much as the size of a dry fig the residents are regarded as many and a quantity of food for two meals only suffices otherwise they are regarded as few and that we were indirectly informed that food for two meals consists of a quantity that is equal to the size of eighteen dry figs mission with all kinds of food may Arab or should not be affected except with water or salt so our Eliza or Joshua rule the whole loaf of bread is a valid Arab even the baking of one SEI if it is a broken loaf may not be used for Arab while a loaf of the size of an is provided it is whole may be used for Arab Talmud Mas Arab and have we not once learned with all kinds of food may Arab and should not be affected Except water and salt Rabbi replied our mission was intended to exclude the view of our Joshua who ruled that only a loaf of bread is admissible but no other food stuff hence we were informed that Arab and Shidduf may be affected with all kinds of food Abbe raised an objection against him with all kinds of bread may an Arab of courtyards be prepared and with all kinds of food may a Shidduf of Ali's be affected the ruling that an Arab must be prepared with bread being applicable to that of a courtyard alone now who is it that was heard to rule that only bread is admissible but no other food stuff our Joshua of course and yet was it not stated with all rather said Rabbi Barhan the purpose of our mission is to exclude the view of our Joshua who ruled that only a whole loaf is admissible but not a broken piece hence we were informed that an Arab may be prepared with all kinds of food but why should not a slice of a loaf be admissible our Jose B. Saul citing Rabbi replied on account of possible ill feeling said our son of Rabbi to our Ashi what then is the law where all the residents contributed slices of bread to their Arab he replied there may be a recurrence of the trouble our Yohanan B. Saul said if no more than the prescribed quantity of the dough offering or the portion to be removed from a mixture of terima and unconsecrated produce was broken off a loaf an Arab may be prepared with it but was it not taught if no more than the portion to be removed from a mixture of terima and unconsecrated produce was broken off a loaf all Arab may be prepared with it but if the prescribed quantity of dough offering had been removed from it no Arab may be prepared with it this is no contradiction since the former relates to the dough offering of a baker while the latter
Mixture of several kinds for so it is also written take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and spelt etc. Our proper replied that bread was baked with human dung for it is written and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their side what is the significance of barley in the cloth and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes are his dot explained in rations our papa explained its preparation shall be in the manner of barley bread and not in that of wheat. Bread mission a man may give a mile to a shopkeeper or a baker that he might thereby acquire a share in the Arab so our Eliza the sages however ruled his money acquires no share for him Talmud, Mas Arab and B though they agree that in the case of all other men his money may acquire one since an Arab may be prepared only with one's consent our Judah rule this applies only to Arabs of Sabbath limits but in the case of Arabs of courtyards one may be prepared for a person irrespective of whether he is aware of it or not since a benefit may be conferred on a man in his absence but no disability may be imposed on him in his absence tomorrow what is our Eliza's reason seeing that the man performed no meshik arnam inciting Rabbi Abu replied our Eliza treated this case as that of the four seasons of the year for we learned in the following four seasons a butcher is made to slaughter a beast of his own even though his ox was worth a thousand dinars and the buyer had in it a share that was worth only one dinar the butcher may be compelled to slaughter hence if it died the buyer must bear the loss the buyer must bear the loss but why seeing that he performed no meshika arhuna replied this is a case where he did perform meshika if so read the final clause during the other days of the year the law is not so hence if it died the seller must bear the loss but why seeing that the buyer had performed meshika our samuel b isaac replied the fact is that we are here dealing with a case where the buyer performed no meshika but the seller transferred possession to him through a third party hence it is that in these four seasons when it is beneficial to him the acquisition is valid since a benefit may be conferred on a man in his absence but during the other days of the year when it is to his disadvantage the acquisition is ineffective since a disability may be imposed on a man only in his presence and rl citing our Yohanan replied in the case of these four seasons Sages have based their rule on the law of the Torah for Aryohan and said according to the words of the Torah money acquires possession for the buyer and the sages ruled that it is Meshika that gives him possession as a precautionary measure against the possibility that the seller might tell the buyer your wheat was burnt in the loft though they agree that in the case of all other men etc. who is meant by all other rab replied a householder Samuel also replied a householder for Samuel stated this was learned only in respect of a baker but a householder does acquire possession Samuel further stated this was learned only in respect of a mob but all object acquires possession Samuel further stated this was learned only in the case where the resident said to him acquire for me but where he said prepare an Arab for me he has thereby appointed him as his agent and he acquires therefore his share our Judah rule this applies only etc. Rab Judah citing Samuel stated the Halachah is in agreement. With Arjuna and furthermore wherever Arjuna taught a law concerning Arabs the Halachah is in agreement with him said Arhana of Baghdad to Arjuna did Samuel say this even in respect of all Ali whose cross being or side post has been removed concerning Arabs the other replied did I tell you but not concerning partition since said Ara Hassan of Rabba to Arashi it has been said the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna it must be implied that the rabbis are at variance on the point but did not Arjashu be Levi in fact lay down that whenever Arjuna stated in a Mishnah when or this applies his intention was only to introduce an explanation of the words of the sages but do they not differ have we not in fact learned if the number of residents is increased he must add food and confer possession upon them and they must be informed of the fact there it is a case of a courtyard between two alleys but did not Arshes by state in the name of Arhista this implies that Arjuna's Colleagues differ from him. The other replied Talmud, Mas Arabindi, you are pointing out a contradiction between the views of two men. One may hold the opinion that they differ, while the other may maintain that they do not differ. To turn to the main text, our Joshua believe I laid down that wherever our Judah stated in a Mishnah when or this applies, his intention was only to introduce an explanation of the words of the sages or Yohanan, however, held that when introduces an explanation while this applies indicates disagreement, but does when introduce an explanation, seeing that we have learned and these are ineligible to act as witnesses or judges, a gambler, a user, or a pigeon trainer, and traders in produce of the sabbatical year. And our Judah stated when is this so when a person has no occupation other than that, but if he has any other occupation, he is eligible, and in connection with this, it was taught in the very and the sages ruled whether he has no occupation other than that or whether he has another occupation he is ineligible that is a view which Arjuna quoted in the name of Artarfan for it was taught Arjuna quoting Artarfan stated neither of them can possibly be regarded as a Nazi right since Nazi rightship is valid only when it is definite it is thus obvious that when a person is in doubt as to whether he is or is not a Nazi right he does not submit himself to the vow so also here since no one knows beforehand whether one would gain or lose neither fully consents to transfer possession to the other C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I -I Mishnah how is Shitav arranged in connection with Sabbath limits one sets down a jar and says behold this is for all the inhabitants of my town for anyone who may desire to go to a house of mourning or to a house of feasting anyone who accepted to rely on the Arab while it was yet day is permitted to enjoy its benefits but if one did it after dusk this is forbidden since no Arab may be prepared after dusk Gemara Joseph ruled all. Arab may be prepared only for the purpose of enabling one to perform a religious act. What does he teach us? Seeing that we learn for anyone who may desire to go to a house of mourning or to a house of feasting, it might have been assumed that mention was made of that which is usual. Hence, we were informed of our Joseph's ruling. Anyone who accepted to rely on the Arab while it was yet day may it be inferred from this ruling that no retrospective selection is valid for if retrospective selection were valid. Why should it not become known retrospectively that the man was pleased to accept the Arab when it was yet day? Our Ashi replied, The cases taught are those where one was or was not informed. Our said a child of the age of six may go out by the Arab of his mother. An objection was raised. A child who is dependent upon his mother goes out by his mother's Arab, but one who is not dependent upon his mother does not go out by her Arab. And we also learned a similar ruling in respect. Of a Sukkah a child who is not dependent upon his mother is liable to the obligations of Sukkah and when the point was raised as to what child may be regarded as independent of his mother it was explained at the school of Arjana any child who when attending to his needs does not require his mother's assistance Arsimi and Belakish explained any child who when awaking does not cry mother mother is this imaginable do not bigger children also cry mother rather say any child who when he wakes does not persistently cry mother and what is the age of such a child about four or five Talmud Mas Arab and B. R. Joshua son of R. E. D. replied what R. C. spoke of was a case for instance where the child's father prepared an Arab for him in the north and his mother in the south since even a child of the age of six prefers his mother's company an objection was raised a child who is dependent upon his mother may go out by his mother's Arab until he is six years of age is not this an objection against our Joshua son of R.E.D. This is indeed an objection must it be admitted that this also presents all objection against the view of R.C. R.C. can answer you until means that until is included must it be assumed that this presents a contradiction of the views of Arjana and Reshlakish this is really no contradiction since the former refers to a child whose father is in town while the latter refers to one whose father is not in town our rabbis taught a man may prepare all Arab for his son or daughter if they are minors and for his Canaanite bondman or bondwoman either with or without their consent he may not however prepare an Arab for his Hebrew manservant or maidservant nor for his grown-up son or daughter nor for his wife except with their consent elsewhere it was taught a man may not prepare an Arab for his grown-up son or daughter nor for his Hebrew manservant or maidservant nor for his wife except with their consent but he may prepare all Arab for his Canaanite bondman or Bond woman and for his son or daughter if they are minors either with or without their consent because their hand is as his hand if any of these prepared all Arab and the master also prepared one for him the limits of his movements are determined by that of his master a wife however is excluded since she is entitled to object but why should a wife be different rabbi replied the meaning is a wife and all who enjoy a similar status the master said a wife however is excluded since she is entitled to object the reason then is that she
Peasant slopes are at a Bia have replied to Nihar Papalo said our Joseph to our Joseph son of Rabba with whose view does your father's agree his view is in agreement with that of Armeir I am also in agreement with the view of Armeir for if one were to agree with Arjuna there would arise the difficulty of the popular saying there is always room for a spicy dish Our Yohanan B. Baraka ruled one taught their views are almost identical but are they at all alike seeing that the view of Our Yohanan is that a cab provides four meals whereas that of Our Simeon is that a cab provides nine meals Our Histor replied to Dr. for the profit of the shopkeeper but is not the number of meals still nine according to the one master and six according to the other explain rather on the lines of another statement of Our Histor who said to Dr. Half for the profit of the shopkeeper but do not they still amount to nine according to the one master and to eight according to the other this indeed is the reason. Why it was stated their views are almost identical does not a contradiction however arise between the two statements of our hista there is really no contradiction since one statement refers to a place where the buyer supplies the wood while the other refers to one where the buyer does not supply the wood half of this loaf is the size prescribed for a leper's house and a half of its half is the size that renders one's body unfit Talmud, Mas Arabin a one taught and half of the half of its half is the size susceptible to levitical uncleanness of food but why did not our Tana mention the levitical uncleanness of food because their prescribed sizes are not in exact proportions for it was taught how much is half a pair is the size of two eggs minus a fraction so our Judah our Jose ruled two large sized eggs this was calculated by Rabbi to be the size of two eggs and a slight surplus how much was that surplus a twentieth part of an egg in respect of the levitical uncleanness of food however it was taught our Nathan and our Dosa explained that the size of the egg of which the rabbis have spoken includes the egg itself and its shell but the sages explained the egg only exclusive of its shell Raf Rambi Papa citing our Histah stated this is the ruling of our Judah and our Jose but the sages ruled the size is one and a half large sized eggs but who are the sages are Yohanan B. Berica of course is not this then obvious his purpose was to inform us that the eggs must be large sized when our Dini came he related that Bonios once sent to Rabbi Modius of artichokes that came from Naza and Rabbi calculated its capacity to be 217 eggs what kind of SEL however was it if it was a desert SEL it should have contained 144 eggs and if it was a Jerusalem SEL it should have contained 173 eggs and if again it was a one of Sephoris it should have contained 207 eggs it was in fact a Sephoris measure but the Quantity of the dough offering was added to them, but how much is the dough offering? Nine eggs would not then the number still be less. The fact is that the surplus is spoken of by Rabbi were added to them. If so, would not the number be greater as it does not amount to the size of a whole egg? He does not reckon it. Our rabbis taught the Jerusalem SEI exceeds that of the desert one by a sixth, and that of Sephoris exceeds that of Jerusalem by a sixth. Thus it follows that the measure of Sephoris exceeds that of the desert by a third, a third of which would you suggest a third of the desert measure observed, and how much is a third of the desert measure? Forty eight eggs, whereas the surplus amounts to sixty three. If again a third of the Jerusalem measure was meant, how much it could be retorted is a third of it fifty eight minus one third, whereas the surplus is sixty three is then the reference to the measure of Sephoris. How much it may be asked is a third of it seventy minus one. Whereas the surplus is 63 rather explained our Jeremiah it is this that was meant it follows that the SEI of Sephoris exceeds that of the desert by nearly a third of itself and that a third of itself is nearly equal to a half of the desert measure Rubin it was any mention at all made of approximation rather explained Rubin it is this that was meant it follows that a third of the Sephoris measure together with the surplus is spoken of by Rabbi exceeds a half of the desert measure by a third of an egg or Rabbi's taught of the first of your dough Talmud, Mas Arab and B only if it is of the size of your dough and what is the size of your dough that of a dough of the wilderness and what was the size of the dough of the wilderness the one which is described now in Omer is the tenth part of an ephah from which it has been deduced that dough made of a quantity of flour of seven quarters of a cab and a fraction is liable to the dough offering this quantity is equal to six Jerusalem cab or five of the Sephoris cab from this it has been inferred that if a person consumes such a quantity of food he is sound in body and happy in mind he who consumes a greater quantity is a glutton and he who consumes less suffers from bad digestion mission if the tenants of a courtyard and the tenants on its gallery forgot to join together in an air of any level that is higher than ten handbreadths belongs to the gallery and any lower level belongs to the courtyard the bank around a cistern or a rock that is ten handbreadths high belongs to the gallery but if it is lower it belongs to the courtyard this however applies only to one that adjoins the gallery but one that is removed from it even if ten handbreadths high belongs to the courtyard and what object is regarded as adjoining one that is not further than four handbreadths it is quite obvious that if an area is easily accessible to two courtyards the law is exactly the same as in the case of a window between two courtyards that if it is accessible to either courtyard only through thrusting the law is exactly the same as in the case of a wall between two courtyards that if it is accessible to either only by means of lowering their things the law is identical with that of a trench between two courtyards that if to the one it is easily accessible but to the other it is accessible only by means of thrusting the law is identical with that which Rabbi son of Arhuna cited in the name of Ar. Naman that if it was easily accessible to the one while to the other it was accessible only by means of the lowering of objects the law is identical with the one which Arshez by cited in the name of Arnaman whatever is the lower it is accessible to one by means of lowering and to the other by means of thrusting Rab ruled both are forbidden access but Samuel ruled access to it is granted to the tenants that can use it by means of lowering things since to them its use is comparatively Easy while to others its use is comparatively difficult and any area the use of which is convenient to one and difficult to another is to be assigned to the one to whom its use is convenient we learned if the tenants of a courtyard and the tenants on its gallery forgot to join together in an air of any level that is higher than ten handbreadths belongs to the gallery and any lower level belongs to the courtyard assuming that by gallery Talmud, Mas Arabin was meant the tenants of another story and that the reason why they are described as a gallery is because they ascend to their quarters by way of the gallery does it not clearly follow that any area that is accessible to one by means of lowering and to the other by means of throwing up is assigned to the one who uses it by means of lowering as are who not explains below that the reference is to those who dwelt on the gallery so it may also here be explained that the reference is to those who dwelt on the gallery if so Read the final clause and any lower level belongs to the courtyard but why seeing that it is easily accessible to both the meaning of to the courtyard is to the courtyard also and both are forbidden access to it this is also borne out by a process of reasoning since in a subsequent clause it was stated this however applies only to one that adjoins the gallery but one that is removed from it even if ten handbreadths high belongs to the courtyard for what could be the meaning of the phrase to the courtyard if it be suggested that the meaning is to the courtyard and that its use is permitted it could be objected why seeing that it is a domain common to the two of them consequently it must be admitted that to the courtyard means to the courtyard also and that both are forbidden access to it so it should here also be explained that the meaning of the phrase to the courtyard is to the courtyard also and that both are forbidden access to it this is conclusive we have learned the bank Around a cistern or a rock that is ten handbreadths high belongs to the gallery, but if it is lower, it belongs to the courtyard. Arhuna replied, The meaning is to those who dwelt on the gallery. This may be a satisfactory explanation in the case of the rock. What, however, can be said as regards a cistern. Our Isaac, son of Rab Judah, replied, We are here dealing with the case of a cistern that was full of water, but is it not being diminished since the use of a cistern is permitted when full? It is also permitted when some of the water is wanting. On the contrary, since its use would be forbidden when it is not full, should it not also be forbidden when full? Rather, explained, Abbe, we are here dealing with a cistern that was full of fruit. Might not these also be diminished? It is a case where they are tebal. A textual deduction leads to the same conclusion since it has been put on a par with rock. This is conclusive, but why should it be necessary to mention both cistern and rock? Both are. Required for if we had been informed of the law in the case of the rock only the ruling might have been presumed to apply to that alone since no preventive measure in that case could be called for but that in the case of a
Lower one restrictions are imposed on the use of both until all their tenants have joined in one Arab Arabi Ahab replied this is a case where the tenants of the lower balcony come to fill their buckets by way of the upper one Abay replied this is a case where the balconies were situated within ten handbreadths from each other but the ruling is to be understood to be in the form of not only but not only where a partition was made for the lower one and none for the upper one are both forbidden since owing to the fact that they are situated with tell handbreadths from each other their tenants impose restrictions upon each other but even where the partition was made for the upper and none was made for the lower in which case it might have been assumed that owing to the fact that its use is convenient for the former and difficult for the latter it should be assigned to those to whom its use is convenient hence we were informed that since they are situated within ten and breaths from they also impose restrictions upon each other as is the ruling in the case are not incited in the name of Samuel if a roof adjoins a public domain a permanent ladder is required to render it permissible for use thus it is only a permanent ladder that affects permissibility but not an occasional one but why obviously because on account of the fact that they are situated within ten hand breaths from each other the people in them impose restrictions upon each other are Papa demurred. Is it not possible that this applies only to a roof on which many people are in the habit of putting down their skull caps and turbans Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled Talmud, Mas Arab and Ava cistern between two courtyards was removed four hand breaths round the one wall and four hand breaths from the other wall each owner may construct some slight projection from his wall and may then draw the water Rab Judah on his own however rule even a read suffices said to our Joseph this ruling of Rab Judah must be Samuel's for should it be contended that it is Rab's the difficulty would arise did he not rule that no man could impose restrictions upon another through the air from which ruling of Samuel however could this be derived if it be suggested from the following which Arnaman reported in the name of Samuel is if a roof adjoins a public domain a permanent ladder is required to render it permissible for use could it not be retorted that the reason there might be an agreement with the opinion of our Papa it is rather from this ruling each owner constructs some slight projection from his wall and he may then draw the water the reason then is that a projection was made but if no projection had been made it would have been maintained that a man imposes restrictions upon another through the air from which ruling of Rab however was a view here attributed to him derived if it be suggested from this if two balconies were situated in positions one higher than the other end a partition was made for the upper one but not for the lower one restrictions are imposed on the use of both until all their tenants have joined in one Arab in connection with which Arhuna stated in the name of Rav this was learned only in respect of a balcony that is near but where it was four hand breaths away the use of the upper one is permitted and that of the lower one is forbidden could it not be retorted that the case here comes under a different category because owing to the fact that access in the case of the one group is by means of thrusting as well as by means of lowering while in that of the other it is by means of lowering only the case is analogous to that where one gains access by means of thrusting and the other by means of a door it is rather from this ruling which Arnaman cited in the name of Rabbi Abba who had it from Rav if there were three ruins between two houses each occupier may use the ruin nearest to him by means of thrusting Talmud, Mas Arab and B. While the use of the middle ruin is forbidden, our bear on sitting at his studies was enunciating this ruling when our Eliezer, a student at the college, asked him, Did Rab actually say this? Yes, the other replied, Will you the first ask, show me his lodgings? When the other showed them to him, he approached Rab and asked him, Did the master say this? Yes, the other replied, But the first objected, Did not the master state where it is accessible to one by means of lowering things and to the other by means of thrusting both are forbidden access? You imagine the other replied that they stood in a straight line, but no, they stood in a triangle set. Our Papa to Rabba must it be assumed that Samuel does not uphold the view of Ardini, seeing that when Ardini came posed even through the air, how then he wondered could Rab allow each occupier to use the ruin adjacent to his house, seeing that the occupier opposite should impose restrictions on its use through the air since he can use it by throwing his things. Into it he stated in the name of our Yohanan on a place whose area is less than four hand breadths by four it is permissible both for the people of the public domain and for those of the private domain to rearrange their burdens provided they do not exchange them there it is a case of domains access between which is Pentateuch ally forbidden while here it is a case of domains access between which is only rabbinically forbidden and the sages have applied to their enactments heavier restrictions. Then to those of the Torah said Rabbi to Rabbi did Rab say this was it not in fact stated if two houses stood on the two sides respectively of the public domain it is forbidden said Rabbi son of Arhu not in the name of Rab to throw any object from one into the other and Samuel ruled it is permitted to throw from one into the other have we not explained the other replied that one was higher and the other lower so that it may sometimes happen that the object might drop and roll away and one might. In consequence be tempted to carry admission if a man deposited his Arab in a gatehouse in Exeter or a gallery it is not a valid Arab and no one who dwells in it imposes restrictions an Arab deposited in a straw shed a cattle shed a woodshed or storehouse is valid and anyone who dwells in it imposes restrictions Arjuda ruled if the householder has there any holding the tenant imposes no restrictions Kamara Arjuda son of our Samuel Bishalaf stated if concerning any place the sages ruled that no one who dwells in it imposes restrictions the Arab that is deposited in such a place is no valid Arab the only exception being the gatehouse of an individual owner and if concerning any place the sages ruled that no Arab may be deposited in it Shidduch may nevertheless be deposited in it the only exception being the airspace of an alley but what does he teach us seeing that we learned if a man deposited his Arab in a gatehouse in Exeter on a gallery it is not a valid Arab from which it Follows only that it is not a valid error, but that it is nevertheless a valid shit. He found it necessary to make his statement on account of the law relating to the gatehouse of an individual owner and to the airspace of an alley which we have not learned in our mission. So it was also taught if a man deposited his Arab in a gatehouse in Exeter, a gallery, a courtyard, or an alley, his Arab is valid, but have we not learned it is not a valid error, bread, therefore the shit is valid, but can it? Food for shit be safely preserved in an alley, read in a courtyard that is situated in the alley. Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled if members of the party were dining when the sanctity of the Sabbath day overtook them, they may rely upon the bread on the table to serve the purpose of Arab, or as others say, the purpose of shit. Rab observed there is really no divergence of opinion between them since the former refers to a party dining in a house while the latter refer to one dining in a. Courtyard said Abbe to Rabbi it was taught in agreement with your view Arabs of courtyards should be deposited in a courtyard and shit of alleys in an alley and when the objection was raised how could it be said that Arabs of courtyards should be deposited in a courtyard seeing that we learned if a man deposited his Arab in a gatehouse or etc or a gallery it is not a valid Arab it was replied read Arabs of courtyards should be deposited in a house that was situated in the courtyard and food for the shit of an alley should be deposited in a courtyard that was in the alley Arjuda ruled if has there any holding etc what is one to understand by holding one for instance like that in the courtyard of Bonius the son of Bonius once visited Rabbi make room the letter called out for the owner of a hundred main another person entered when he called out Talmud Mas Arab and make room for the owner of two hundred main a master said Arishmael son of Arhose to him the father. Of this man owns a thousand ships on the sea and a corresponding number of towns on land when you meet his father the other replied tell him not to send him to me in such clothes rabbi showed respect to rich men and our Akiba also showed respect to rich men in agreement with an exposition made by rabbi bimari may he be enthroned before god forever appoint mercy and truth that they may preserve him when may he be enthroned before god forever when he appoint mercy and truth that they may preserve him rabbi barhana explained the pill of the plow for instance our nomin stated it was taught at the school of samuel if it is an object that may be handled on the sabbath the tenant imposes restrictions but if it is one that may not be handled on the sabbath the tenant imposes no restrictions so it was also taught if he has table bars of metal or any other object that may not be moved on the sabbath the tenant imposes no restrictions Misha, if a man left his house and went to spend it Sabbath in another town whether he was a Gentile or an Israelite his share imposes restrictions on the residents of the courtyard so our Meir Arjuda ruled it imposes no restrictions our Jose ru
Below means below the water. Why did he not explain actually below? Apparently because the waters would be mixed. But then even if he explains below the water is not the water mixed. The other replied, Have you not heard the statement which Rab Judah made in the name of Rab? Or as others are inclined to assert in the name of Arhai, the tops of the reeds must be seen projecting one hand breadth above the surface of the water. Furthermore, with reference to Rab Judah's submission that above means above. The water, why does he not explain actually above? Apparently because the water would be mixed, but then even if it is explained above the water is not the water mixed, the other replied, Have you not heard what Jacob Akariah has learned? One must insert the ends of the reeds into the water to the depth of a hand breadth with reference, however, to Rab Judah's ruling that a crossbeam of the width of four hand breadths affects permissibility in a ruin and to that of Arnaman who citing Rabbi Abba. Ruled at Talmud, Mas Arab and B.A. crossbeam of the width of four hand breadths affects permissibility in the case of water does not the bucket swing to the other side and thus carry up the water from it. The rabbis have ascertained that a bucket does not swing beyond four hand breadths but are not the waters mixed under the crossbeam. At least the fact is that the sages have relaxed the law in respect of water as our table when he inquired of Rab whether a suspended partition can convert a ruin. Into a permitted domain was told a suspended partition affects permissibility of use in the case of water alone. Since in the case of water did the sages relax the law, Arjuda observed the partition could not be Rabbi Barhan as citing Aryohan and explained Arjuda made his submission on the lines of the view of Arjose who holds a suspended partition affects permissibility even on dry land for we learned if its walls were suspended from above in a downward direction the sukkah is invalid if they were removed three hand breadths from the ground but if they are raised in an upward direction the sukkah is valid if they were ten hand breadths high Arjose ruled as walls of the height of ten hand breadths are valid if they rise from the ground upward so are those that stretch from above downwards valid if their height is ten hand breadths this however is not correct neither does Arjuda hold the view of Arjose nor does Arjose hold that of Arjuda Arjuda does not hold the view of Arjose. Since the former maintained his view only in respect of Arabs of courtyards which are merely a rabbinical institution but not in that of Sukkah which is Pentateuchal nor does our Jose hold the view of Arjuda since the former maintained his view only in respect of Sukkah which is merely a positive commandment but not in that of Sabbath which involves a prohibition punishable by stoning and should you ask in agreement with whose view was that incident at Sephora is decided upon it was not decided. Upon it might be explained in agreement with the view of our Jose but with that of our Ishmael son of our Jose when Ardimi came he related the people once forgot to bring a scroll of the Torah on the Sabbath even on the following day they spread a sheet upon the pillars brought the scroll of the Torah and read from it they spread but is this permitted of initio seeing that all agree that not even a temporary tent may be put tip on the Sabbath the fact is that they found sheets spread upon it. Pillars and so they brought the scroll of the Torah and read from it. Rab observed Arjuda and Arhanan Yabi Akibiyah have said practically the same thing as to Arjuda. There is a ruling just mentioned as to Arhanan Yabi Akibiyah. It was taught Arhanan Yabi Akibiyah ruled in a balcony that has an area of four cubits by four cubits Talmud. Mas Arab in a one cuts a hole of four hand breadths by four and may draw water through it. Said Abay to him, Is it not possible that your observation is incorrect? R. Judah may have maintained his view there only because he holds the principle that a partition is deemed to extend downwards but not here where it must be deemed to be both bent and extended. And Arhanan Yabi Akibiyah may have maintained his view there only in the case of the Sea of Tiberias because it has embankments, towns, and carpaths around it but not in that of other waters. Abay observed according to the view of Arhanan Yabi Akibiyah if the balcony was within three hand breadths from the wall it is. Necessary for its length to be four cubits and for its width to be eleven cubits and a fraction if it was upright it is necessary that its height shall be ten hand breadths and its width six hand breadths and two fractions are who son of our Joshua observed if it was situated in a corner it is necessary for its height to be ten hand breadths and for its width to be two hand breadths and two fractions with reference however to what was taught our hand and the ruled in a balcony that has an area of four cubits by four he cuts a hole of four hand breadths by four and may draw water through it in what circumstances could this be possible where it is constructed in the shape of a mortar mission from a water channel that passes through a courtyard no water may be drawn on the Sabbath unless it was furnished with a partition ten hand breadths high at its entrance and exit Arjuda ruled the wall above it may be regarded as a partition Arjuda observed it actually happened with the water channel. Of Abel that water was drawn from it on the Sabbath on the authority of the elders they replied because it was not of the prescribed size Gemara our rabbis taught if it was furnished with a partition at its entrance but not at its exit or if one was furnished at its exit and not at its entrance no water may be drawn from it on the Sabbath unless it was furnished with a partition ten hand breadths high both at its entrance and at its exit Arjuda ruled the wall above it may be regarded as a partition Arjuda observed it actually happened with the water channel which flowed from Abel to Sephoris that water was drawn from it on the Sabbath on the authority of the elders they replied is this proof the water was used because the channel was either less than tell hand breadths deep or less than four hand breadths wide elsewhere it was taught if a water channel passed between windows it is permissible to lower a bucket to draw water from it if it was less than three hand breadths wide but if it was three hand breadths wide, no bucket may be lowered to draw water from it. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled if it was less than four hand breadths wide, a bucket may be lowered into it and water may be drawn from it. But if it was four hand breadths wide, no bucket may be lowered to draw water from it. Now, what are we dealing with if it be suggested with the water channel itself? Consider the following which Ardimi, when he came, cited in the name of Aryohan, and no domain can be regarded as a Carmelith. If it is less than four hand breadths, did he then make his statement in agreement only with one of the Tanaitic opinions? No, we are rather dealing with its embankments in respect of exchange, but did not Ardimi, when he came, state in the name of Aryohan, and on a place whose area is less than four hand breadths by four, both the people in the public domain and those in the private domain may rearrange their loads provided they do not exchange them. There it is a case of Pentateuchal domains, Talmud. Mas Arab and B. While here we are dealing with rabbinical domains, but did not Aryohan and maintain his view even in the case of rabbinical domains, for we learned if between two courtyards there was a wall ten hand breadths high and four hand breadths thick, two Arabs may be prepared, but not one if there was fruit on the top of it. The tenants on either side may climb up and eat there if a breach to the extent of ten cubits was made in the wall. The tenants may prepare two Arabs, or if they prefer only one, because it is like a doorway. If the breach was bigger, only one Arab and not two may be prepared. And when the question was raised, what is the ruling where it was not four hand breadths wide? Rab replied, the air of two domains prevails upon it, and no object on it may be moved even as far as a hair's breadth. Whereas Aryohan and replied, the tenants on either side may carry up their food and eat it there. Aryohan and thus following his own view, since Ardimi when he came stated in the name of Aryohan. On a place whose area is less than four hand breadths by four, both the people in the public domain and those in the private domain may rearrange their loads provided they do not exchange there. That was reported by Zeiri, but does not this present an objection against Zeiri? Zeiri explains it to refer to the water channel itself. While the ruling of Ardimi is one in dispute between Tanis, but why should it not be regarded as the cavities of the Carmelith? Both Abay Bavin and Arhanan Abay Bavin replied, the law of cavities does not apply to a Carmelith. Arashi replied, it may even be conceded that the law of cavities does apply to a Carmelith, but this is the case only where the cavity is near, whereas here it is far removed. Rubin replied, we are dealing in with a case, for instance, where outlets were made at its ends. The rabbis following their view, while Arsimian B. Gamaliel follows his view, mission from a balcony that was situated above a stretch of water, no water may be drawn on it. Sabbath unless it was furnished with a partition ten hand breadths high either above or below so also where two balconies were situated in positions one higher than the other and a partition was made for the upper one but not for the lower one restrictions are imposed on the use of both until they have prepared a joint Arab Gemara is our mission in disagreement with the view of Hanan Yabi Akibiyah since it was taught H
Pouring it down is forbidden. Arshes by demurred. Wherein does this case essentially differ from that of a trough? In the latter case, the waters are absorbed in the ground, while in the former they are not absorbed. Others say that Rabbi Son of Arhu not explained. Do not say it is only permitted to draw water, but that it is forbidden to pour water down, since in fact it is also permitted to pour it down. Is not this Arshes by asked? Obvious, seeing that it is essentially identical with the case of it. Trophic might have been assumed that they are unlike for whereas in the latter case the waters are absorbed in the ground they are not absorbed in the former case hence we were informed that the same law is applicable to both cases so also when two balconies were situated in positions one higher than etc. Arhu not citing Rab explained this was learned only in the case where the lower balcony was near to the upper one but if it was removed from it the use of the upper one is permitted. Since Rab follows his principle having laid down that no man imposes restrictions upon another through the Arab stated in the name of Arhai and Arjoseph stated in the name of Arashai a robbery is valid in respect of a Sabbath domain and a ruin reverts to its owner but is not the self-contradictory you said a robbery is valid in respect of the Sabbath domain from which it is clear that possession is acquired and then you say and a ruin reverts to its owner from which it is evident. That no possession is acquired, it is this that was meant. The law of the return of a robbery is valid in respect of a Sabbath domain since a ruin reverts to its owner. Said Rabbi, we raised an objection against this ruling of ours. So also, when two balconies were situated in positions one higher than the other, etc. Now, if it is maintained that the law of the return of a robbery is valid in respect of a Sabbath domain, why should restrictions be imposed? Arshis hate replied, We are here dealing with a case, for instance, where they made the partition jointly, but if so, the same law should also apply where a partition was made on the lower balcony since they made a partition for the lower one. They have thereby intimated to the tenants of the upper one that they had no desire to be associated with the mission. If the area of a courtyard was less than four cubits, no water may be poured out into it on the Sabbath unless it was provided with a trough holding two se off from its edge. Downwards, irrespective of whether it was without or within, except that if it was without, it is necessary to cover it, and if it was within, it is not necessary to cover it. Or Eliezer B. Jacob ruled if four cubits of a drain were covered over in the public domain, it is permitted to pour water into it on the Sabbath. But the sages ruled even where a roof or a courtyard was a hundred cubits in area, no water may be poured directly over the mouth of the drain, but it may be poured upon the roof from which the water flows into the drain. The courtyard and the exeter may be combined to make up the prescribed four cubits. So also in the case of two upper stories opposite each other, the tenants of one of which made a trough, and those of the other did not. Those who made the trough are permitted to pour down their water, whereas those who did not make any trough are forbidden. Gamara, what is the reason? Rabbi replied, because a man is in the habit of using up two se of water daily and in an area of. Four cubits he is inclined to spray a Talmud, Mas Arab and B, but in one that is less than four cubits he merely pours it out, hence it is only if he made a trough that he is permitted to pour out the water, but not otherwise. Arzera replied in an area of four cubits the water may be absorbed, but in one that is less than four cubits they cannot be absorbed. What is the practical difference between them? Abbe replied the practical difference between them is a courtyard that was long and narrow. We learned the courtyard and the exeter may be combined to make up the prescribed four cubits according to Arzera. This is quite acceptable, but according to Rabbah does not a difficulty arise. Arzera on the lines of Rabbah's view explained this refers to an exeter that ran along all the courtyard come and here if the area of the courtyard was less than four cubits by four cubits no water may be poured out into it on the Sabbath. Now according to Rabbah this ruling is quite satisfactory, but according to Arzera does not a difficulty arise. Arzera can answer you. This ruling represents the view of the rabbis, whereas our mission is that of our Eliezer Jacob. What, however, was it that urged Arzera to attribute our mission to our Eliezer B. Jacob? Robert Rebold, our mission printed to him a difficulty. What was the object of stating if the area of a courtyard was less than four cubits? Seeing that it could have been stated if the area of a courtyard was less than four cubits by four cubits, consequently he concluded it must represent the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob. This is conclusive, but since a succeeding clause represents the view of our Eliezer Y. Jacob, how could the first cause also represent his view? All the mission represents the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob, but some words are wanting in it. The correct reading being as follows: If the area of a courtyard was less than our cubits, no water may be poured out into it on the Sabbath, but if the area underscore as four cubits, water may be poured into it because our Eliezer B. Jacob ruled if four cubits of a drain were covered over in the public domain, it is permitted to pour water into it on the Sabbath. Our Eliezer B. Jacob ruled if four cubits of a drain were covered over our mission, it cannot represent the opinion of Hananiah, for it was taught Hananiah ruled even if the area of a roof was a hundred cubits, no water may be poured upon it since a roof is not made to absorb water but to cause it to run down. One taught this applies only to the hot season, but during the rainy season, a person may pour his water again and again without any limit. What is the reason? Robert replied, a person is quite satisfied that the water should be absorbed on the spot. Said Abbe to him, is there not the case of waste water with the absorption of which on the spot a person is quite satisfied, and yet it was ruled no water may be poured? What the other replied is it that provision should be made against in that case if it be suggested against the man's objection to the spoiling of. His courtyard surely it may be retorted it is in any case spoiled and if against the possibility of the assumption that so and so's gutter was spouting water all gutters as a rule spout water are nominal ruled in the rainy season if a trough is capable of holding two SEI it is permitted to pour two SEI of water into it and if it call hold one SEI only one SEI of water is permitted in the hot season however if the trough can hold OSQ1 is allowed two SEI but if it can hold one SEI1 is not allowed to pour into it any water at all why should it not be allowed in the hot season also to pour into it SEI if it can hold SEI a preventive measure has been enacted against the possibility of once pouring two SEI into it if so why should not a preventive measure be enacted for the rainy season also what is it that provision should be made against in that case if it be suggested against the man's objection to the spoiling of his courtyard surely it could be Retorted it is in any case spoiled if against the assumption that so and so's gutter spouts water all gutters as a rule spout water hence said Abbe even a core even two core are permitted so also in the case of two upper stories opposite each other rubber rule even though they prepared a joint Arab what ask Abbe is the reason if it be suggested on account of the large quantity of the water was it not taught it may be objected the same law applies to a trough a damaged vessel a pond or a tub. Visit though they were filled with water on the Sabbath eve waste water may be poured into them on the Sabbath rather if the statement was at all made it must have been made in the following terms rubber rule Talmud, Mas Arabin this was learned only in the case where no joint Arab was prepared but if a joint Arab was prepared they are permitted but why are they not permitted where they did not prepare a joint Arab Arashi replied as a preventive measure against the possibility of their Carrying out water and utensils from their houses to the trough C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-X mission all the roofs of the town constitute a single domain provided no roof is ten handbreadths higher or lower than the neighboring roof so are the sages however ruled each one is a separate domain Arsimian ruled roofs courtyards and carpaths are equally regarded as one domain in respect of carrying from one into the other objects that were kept within them when the Sabbath began but not in respect of objects that were in the house when the Sabbath began Gamar Abbe B. Avin and Arhanab B. Avin sat at their studies while Abbe was sitting beside them and in the course of the session they remarked one can well justify the view of the rabbi since they may hold the view that as the tenants are divided below so are they divided above but as to our what could his view be if he holds that the tenants are divided above as they are divided below why should the roofs constitute a single domain and if he Holds that they are not divided above because all places above ten handbreadths are regarded as a single domain. Why should not this also apply to a roof that was ten handbreadths higher or lower? You have not heard Abbe said to them the following statement made by our Isaac B. of Dimi Armeir always maintained that wherever you find two domains of the same character, one within the other, as for instance a column ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths wide in a private domain, it is forbidden to rearrange loads on the former as a
the upward extension of the walls while Samuel ruled it is permitted to move objects throughout its area because even in such circumstances he upholds the principle of the upward extension of the walls we learn the sages however ruled each one Talmud, Mas Arab and B is a separate domain this ruling according to Samuel is quite satisfactory but does it not according to Rab present a difficulty the school of Rab explained in the name of Rab that one must not move an object along two cubits. On one roof and along another two cubits on an adjacent roof, but surely our Eliezer related when we were in Babylon. We used to teach as follows the school of Rab in the name of Rab ruled objects on a roof may be moved only within four cubits, whereas those of the school of Samuel learned householders have only the use of their roofs. Now, what could be the meaning of the expression have only the use of their roofs? Is it not that they are permitted to move objects about throughout its area? Has this been more forced than our mission, as we have explained this to mean that one must not move an object along two cubits on one roof and along another two cubits on an adjacent roof? So we might also explain this two cubits on one roof and two cubits on the other. Our Joseph observed, I have not heard of this ruling said Abbe to him, you yourself told it to us, and it was in connection with the following that you told it to us if a big roof was adjacent to a smaller one, the use of the bigger one is. Permitted and the use of the smaller one is forbidden, and it was in connection with this that you told us Rab Judah in the name of Samuel stated they learned this only in the case where there were dwellers on the one as well as on the other, so that the imaginary partition of the smaller roof is one that is trodden upon. But if there were no dwellers on the one as well as on the other, the use of both roofs is permitted. I the other replied, told you this they learned this only where there was a partition on the one as well as on the other, since the use of the bigger roof is rendered permissible by the railings, while the use of the smaller one is forbidden, since it has a breach extending along its entire length. But if there was no partition either on the one or on the other, the use of both is forbidden. But did you not speak to us of dwellers? If I spoke to you of dwellers, I must have said this they learned this only where there was a partition that was suitable for a dwelling place. Both on the one as well as on the other since the use of the bigger roof is rendered permissible by the railings while the smaller one is forbidden since it has a breach along its full side but if there was a partition suitable for a dwelling place on the bigger roof and none that was fit for a dwelling place on the smaller one even the use of the smaller one is permitted to the people of the bigger one is the reason as they made no partition they have entirely withdrawn themselves from it. The principle here being the same as that enunciated by Arnaman if a person fixed a permanent ladder to his roof he is permitted to use all the roofs have a rule if a man build an upper story on his house and constructed in front of it a small door of four hand breadth, he is thereby permitted to use all the roofs Rob observed the small door is sometimes a cause of restrictions how is this to be imagined when he made it to open towards his house garden since it might well be presumed Talmud. Mas Arab and Talmud, Mas Arab that it was made for the purpose of facilitating the watch over his house garden. Rami Bihama inquired, Is it permitted to move an object two cubits along a roof and two cubits along a column? What an inquiry Rabbi exclaimed, Is this he is asking about a Carmelite and a private domain? And Rami Bihama, in his ingenuity, he was not careful in putting the question. He, however, meant to put the question, Thus, is it permitted to move an object two cubits along a roof and two cubits along an exeter? Do we say, since neither the one nor the other is fit for a dwelling place, both are regarded as a single domain, or is it possible that as he movement of objects from one roof to another is forbidden, so is also that between a roof and an exeter forbidden? Arba Babi Abba inquired, Is it permissible to move an object two cubits on a roof and two cubits in a ruin? Is not this inquiry Arkahana asked identical with that of Rami Bihama? Would I Arba Babi Abba, he retorted. Have come with the inquiry of another man merely to see RETE difficulties in Exeter is unfit as a dwelling whereas a ruin is fit but if it is fit as a dwelling why UID he raised the question his inquiry was in the nature of an alternative question if he said in effect you will find some reason for answering that an Exeter is unfit as a dwelling will you agree that a ruin is fit for a dwelling or is it possible that the latter is subject to THL same law as the former since NW at any rate. It has no tenants this must remain undecided regarding a number of roofs on the same level according to our mayor or a single roof according to the rabbis Rab ruled it is permissible to move objects through there are as and Samuel ruled objects mob be moved only within four cubits as Rab ruled it is permissible to move objects throughout their areas does not a contradiction arise between two rulings of Rab there the walls are undistinguishable but here the walls are distinguishable but since Samuel Ruled objects may be moved only within four cubits does not a contradiction arise between two rulings of Samuel there the area was not bigger than two Beth Sia but here it is bigger than two Beth Sia and since those walls were made for dwelling purposes only below but not on the roof area above the ladder is like a carpath bigger than two Beth Sia that was not surrounded by walls for dwelling purposes and in any carpath bigger than two Beth Sia that was not surrounded by walls for dwelling purposes no objects may be moved within four cubits it was stated as regards a ship Rab ruled it is permissible to move objects about throughout its area and Samuel ruled objects may be moved only within four cubits Rab ruled it is permissible to move objects about throughout its area Talmud, Mas Arab and B because it has walls and Samuel ruled objects may be moved only within four cubits since the walls were put up for the purpose of keeping out the water is the law or high beam. Joseph asked Samuel in agreement with your view or is it in agreement with that of Rab the law the other replied is in agreement with that of Rab Rab explained Argidal in the name of our high B. Joseph agrees nevertheless that if it was turned upside down objects on it may be moved only within four cubits for what purpose however was it inverted if it be suggested for the purpose of dwelling under it why it could be objected should its law be different from that of a single roof it was inverted rather for the purpose of being coated with pitch Arashi reported this with reference to a ship but Araha son of Rab reported it with reference to an exeter for it was stated if an exeter was situated in a valley it is Rab ruled permitted to move objects within all its interior but Samuel ruled objects may be moved within four cubits only Rab ruled that it was permitted to move objects in all its interior because we apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up. But Samuel ruled that objects may be moved within four cubits only because we do not apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up. But according to Rab's interpretation of our Meir's view, should it not be permitted to move objects from a roof into a courtyard? This is forbidden as a measure of which our Isaac B. of Dimi has spoken. And according to Samuel's interpretation of the view of the rabbis, should it not be permissible to move objects from a roof to a carpath? Rabbi Bila replied, the prohibition is due to a preventive measure against the possibility of a reduction in the area of the roof. But if so, it should also be forbidden to move an object from carpath to carpath, since the area of one of them might happen to be reduced, and people would still be moving objects from one to the other. If a reduction were to occur there, it would be noticeable. But if a reduction should take place here, it might not be noticed at all. Rab Judah stated a careful study would show that. According to the view of our many roofs are regarded as a separate domain courtyards as a separate domain Talmud, Mas Arab and A and Karpaths as a separate domain that according to the view of the sages roofs and courtyards form a single domain and Karpath form a domain of their own and that according to the view of our Simeon all these together constitute a single domain it was taught in agreement with Rab and it was also taught in agreement with Rab Judah it was taught in agreement with Rab all the roofs of a town constitute a single domain and it is forbidden to carry objects up or down from the courtyards onto the roofs or from the roofs into the courtyards respectively but objects that were in a courtyard when the Sabbath began may be moved about within the courtyard and if they were at that time on the roofs they may be so moved on the roofs provided no roof was tell hand breadth higher or lower than all adjoining roofs so our Meir, the sages however ruled each one is a separate domain. And no object may be moved in it except within four cubits. It was taught in agreement with Rab Judah Rabbi related when we were studying the Torah at our Simeon's at Tako. We used to carry oil and a towel from roof to roof, from the roof to a courtyard, from the courtyard to another courtyard, from that courtyard to a carpath, and from that carpath into another carpath until we arrived at the well wherein we bathed our Judah related. It once happened that during a time of danger we carried a scroll of it. Law from a courtyard into a roof, from the roof
Preventive measure has been enacted against the possibility of carrying objects from the houses of one courtyard into the next courtyard. Arshis had raised an objection. Our simian ruled roofs, courtyards, and car paths are equally regarded as one domain in respect of carrying from one into the other objects that were kept with them when the Sabbath began, but not in respect of objects that were in the house when the Sabbath began. Now, if you grant that the ruling applies also to cases where an Arab had been prepared, it is quite easy to see how objects from a house called be found in a courtyard. But if you maintain that the ruling applies only to cases where no Arab had been prepared, how is it possible for objects from a house to be found in a courtyard? He raised the objection and he also supplied the solution. The objects referred to might be skull caps or turbans, Talmud, Moss, Arab, and become and here if the tenants of a courtyard and the tenants on its gallery forgot to join together in an Arab any level that is higher than ten handbreadths belongs to the gallery and any lower level belongs also to the courtyard. This applies only where both the former as well as the latter were occupied by many tenants and each group prepared an Arab for itself or where they belong to individuals who need not prepare an Arab but if they were occupied by many tenants who forgot to prepare an Arab roof courtyard etc. and gallery constitute together a single domain the reason then is that no Arab had been prepared but if an Arab had been prepared this would not have been permitted would it this represents the view of the rabbis a deduction from the form of the expression also supports this view since carpath and alley were not mentioned this is conclusive come and here if five courtyards were open one into the other and also into an alley and all their tenants forgot to prepare an Arab it is forbidden to carry in or to carry out from a courtyard into the alley or from the alley. Into a courtyard objects, however, that were in a courtyard when the Sabbath began may be moved about within the courtyard, but in the alley this is forbidden. But our Simeon permits this for he used to say whenever they belong to many people who forgot to prepare an Arab roof a courtyard, all Exeter, a gallery, a car path, and an alley are jointly regarded as a single domain. The reason then is that no Arab had been prepared, but if they had prepared one, this would not have been the case with it. The meaning of no Arab had been prepared is that the tenants of the courtyards did not prepare an Arab jointly, but the courtyard with its houses were joined by an Arab, but was it not stated no Arab had been prepared? The meaning of an Arab had been prepared is that there was no shit off, and if you prefer, I might say our Simeon was speaking to the rabbis in accordance with their view. According to my view, he said, in effect, there is no difference between the case where an Arab had been prepared and one. Where it had not been prepared, but according to your view, would you not agree with me that at least where no Arab had been prepared, all should be regarded as a single domain? And the rabbis replied, No, they must be regarded as two domains. The master said, But in an alley, this is forbidden. May it be suggested that this provides support to a ruling. Our Zara cited in the name of Rab for our Zara citing Rab ruled in an alley where no shit off had been arranged, no objects may be moved about except within four cubits read, but into an alley it is forbidden. But this is identical, is it not? With the first clause, the superfluous mission was required, as it might have been presumed that the rabbis differed from our Simeon only where an Arab had been prepared, but that where no Arab had been prepared, they agreed with him. We were informed that they differ in both cases, said Rabbanit to our Ashi Talmud, Mas Arab and our Yohanan have made such a statement, seeing that our Yohanan laid down that the Halachah is in agreement with an anonymous mission and we learned if a well between two courtyards was ten handbreadths high and four handbreadths thick two errors may be prepared but not one if there was fruit on the top of it the tenants on either side may clip up and eat there provided they do not carry with down the meaning of down is down into the houses but did not our high learn provided neither of the tenants stands in his place and eats the other replied since rabbi has not taught this ruling. Whence could our high know it I was stated if there were two courtyards with a ruin between them and the tenants of the one prepared an Arab and the tenants of the other did not prepare one the ruin said our who not is to be assigned that courtyard for which no Arab had been prepared but not to the one for which an Arab had been prepared since the tenants of the latter might be tempted to carry objects from their houses into the ruin high rab however said it is also assigned to the courtyard for which an Arab had been prepared and both therefore are subject to restrictions for work to suggest that both are exempt from restrictions why I would ask is not a courtyard for which no Arab had been prepared assigned to the courtyard for which one had been prepared no in that case since the objects from the houses are safe and the courtyard one might carry many of them thither but here in the case of a ruin since the objects from the houses are not safe in a ruin no one would carry many of them thither others read high rap said it is also assigned to the courtyard for which an Arab had been prepared and both therefore are free from restrictions for should you insist that both are subject to restrictions since a courtyard for which no Arab had been provided is not assigned to the one for which one had been provided it can be retorted in that case since the objects from the houses are safe in the courtyard the rabbis did not relax the restrictions because otherwise People might carry them out in a ruin, however, they are not safe. Mishnah, if a large roof was close to a smaller roof, the use of a larger one is permitted, but that of a lesser one is forbidden. If the full width of a wall of a small courtyard was broken down so that the yard fully opened into a large courtyard, the use of a larger one is permitted, but that of a smaller one is forbidden because the gap is regarded as a doorway to the former Gemara. What was the point in teaching the same principles twice according to Rab's view? This was intended to teach us that a roof is subject to the same limitations as a courtyard, as in a courtyard the walls are distinguishable, so must the walls be distinguishable in the case of a roof also. And according to Samuel's view, no roof was meant to be compared to a courtyard, as a courtyard is a place upon which many people tread, so must a roof be one on which many people tread. Rabbi and Arzara and Rabbi son of Arhanan were sitting at there. Studies have a sitting beside them and in the course of their session they argued as follows from our mission it may be inferred that the occupiers of the larger one influence the rights of those of the lesser but those of the latter do not influence those of the former if for instance vines were planted in the larger one it is forbidden to sow in the lesser one and if it was sown the seeds are forbidden and Talmud, Mas Arab and be the vines are permitted if vines grew in the lesser one it is permitted to sow in the larger one if a woman was in the larger one and her get was in the lesser one she is divorced thereby but if the woman was in the lesser one and her get in the larger she is not divorced if a congregation was in the larger one and the reader in the lesser one they have duly performed their duty but if the congregation was in the lesser one and the reader in the larger one they have not performed their duty if nine men were in the larger courtyard and one was in the Lesser one they may all be combined, but if nine men were in the lesser one and one man in the larger one they may not be combined. If excrement was in the larger one, it is forbidden to read the portions of the Shema in the lesser one, but if it was in the lesser one, it is permitted to read the Shema in the larger one. Said Abbe to them, if so, do we not find here a case where a partition is a cause of prohibition? For in the absence of a partition, one may sow at a distance of four cubits, whereas now this is forbidden, but retorted Arzara to Abbe, do we not elsewhere also find a case where a partition is a cause of prohibition? Have we not in fact learned if the full width of a wall of a small courtyard was broken down so that the yard fully opened into a large courtyard, the use of the larger one is permitted, but that of the smaller one is forbidden because the gap is regarded as a doorway to the former, but if its projections had been straightened, the use of the large one also would have been. Forbidden there the other replied it is a case of the removal of partitions do we not retorted Rabbi to Abbe find the partition to be the cause of a prohibition has it not in fact been stated Talmud, Mas Arabin if an exeter that had side posts was covered with boughs it is valid as a sukkah but if its side posts had been straightened it would have been invalid would it not according to my view Abbe replied it is still valid while according to your view it is a case of the removal of partition said Rabbi Arhain and to Abbe do we not find elsewhere that a partition may be the cause of a prohibition was it not in fact taught if a house was half covered with a roof while its other half was uncovered it is permissible to sow in the uncovered part the vines grew in the covered part but if all the house had been equally covered with a roof would not this have been forbidden there the other replied it is a case of the removal of partitions Rabbi sent to Abbe by the hand of R. She may be ZEIRA the following message do we not find the partition to be the cause of a prohibition was it not in fact taught partitions in a vineyard may be either the cause of a relaxation of the law or one of a
Sufficient space for the tillage of the vineyard is allowed and the remaining space may be sown what is meant by the uncultivated border of a vineyard the space between the actual vineyard and the surrounding fence if the width is less than 12 cubits no seed may be sown there but if it measures 12 cubits sufficient space for the tillage of the vineyard is allowed and the remaining area may be sown consequently it must be assumed that the reason there is that all the space to the extent of 4 cubits that adjoins the vineyard is allotted for the tillage of the vineyard and a similar space that adjoins the wall since it cannot be sown is renounced so that the area intervening if it measures 4 cubits is deemed to be of sufficient importance but not otherwise Rav Judah said if 3 carpaths adjoined one another and the two outer ones had projections while the middle one had none and one man occupied each the group is treated as a caravan who are allowed as much space as they Require if the middle one had projections while the two outer ones had none and one man occupied each the three men together are allowed no more space than six path sea the question was raised what is the ruling where one person occupied each of the outer car paths and two occupied the middle one is it held that if these were to go to the one car path there would be in it three and if they were to go to the other car path there would be in it three or is it rather held that only one of them is deemed to be going to each car path and were you to find some ground for the assumption that only one of them is deemed to be going to each car path the question arises what is the decision where two persons occupied each of the outer car paths and only one occupied the middle one is it certain that the view is here if he were to go to the one car path there would be in it three and if he were to go to the other car path there would be in it three or is the view rather that it is doubtful in which Direction he would go the law is that in these questions the more lenient rule is adopted are his said Talmud, Mas Arab and B all embankment five handbread tie and the partition on it five handbread tie are not combined since it is necessary that the entire height shall be contained either in the embankment or in the partition B an objection was raised if there were two courtyards one higher than the other and the upper one is ten handbread tie than the lower one or has an embankment FGB handbread tie and the partition five handbread tie two separate Arabs may be prepared but not one if it was lower only a single Arab may be prepared but not two Arabs Robert replied Arhis agrees in the case of the lower courtyard since its tenants can see a frontage of ten handbreads if so should not the tenants of the lower courtyard prepare an Arab as in the case of two separated courtyards but not a single one while those of the upper one should neither. Prepare a single one for the two courtyards nor one for themselves alone. Rabbi Biola replied this deals with a case for instance where the upper courtyard had rooms that left a gap not wider than ten cubits. If so read the final clause if it was lower only a single Arab may be prepared but not two should not the tenants be allowed to prepare one Arab if they wished or if they preferred it to Rabbi son of Rabbi replied this deals with a case for instance where the gap extended along a whole side of the lower courtyard. If so should not the tenants of the lower one be allowed to prepare a single Arab jointly but not one for themselves alone while those of the upper one should be allowed if they wished it to prepare an Arab for themselves alone or if they preferred it a single Arab jointly this is so indeed and the ruling if it was lower only a single Arab may be prepared but not two applies to the tenants of the lower one Amimar made the following exposition and embankment. Five handbread tie and a partition on it. Five handbread tie are combined when Rabbin Amet Araha son of Rabbi he asked him, Did the master learn anything about a partition? The other replied, No, and the law is that an embankment five handbread tie and a partition on it. Five handbread tie are combined. Arhashai inquired, Do tenants who arrive on the Sabbath impose restrictions? Arhista replied, Come and hear it. The full width of a wall of a small courtyard was broken down so that the yard fully opened into a large courtyard. The use of the larger one is permitted, but that of the smaller one is forbidden because the gap is regarded as a doorway to the former. Is it not possible to assume? Rabbi objected that the breach occurred while it was yet day. Said Abbe to him, Do not say, Master, it is possible to assume, but rather it is certain that the breach occurred while it was yet day, for surely it was the master himself who stated, I inquired of Arhuna and also of Rab Judas too. What was the law where an Arab was laid in reliance on a certain door and that door was blocked up or on a certain window and that window was stopped up and each replied since permission for that Sabbath was once granted the permissibility continues until the conclusion of the day it was stated if a wall between two courtyards collapsed Rab ruled it is permitted to move objects within four cubits only but Samuel ruled Talmud, Mas Arab and the tenants on either side may move their objects too. The very foundation of the wall the ruling of Rab however was not explicitly stated but was arrived at by implication for Rab and Samuel were once sitting in a certain courtyard when a parting wall collapsed take a cloak said Samuel to the people and spread it across and Rab turned away his face if Ab objects Samuel told them take his girdle and the with it now according to Samuel's view what need was there for the seeing that he ruled the tenants on either side may move their objects to the very foundation of the wall Samuel did that merely for the sake of privacy if Rab however held that this was forbidden why did he not say so to him the place was under Samuel's jurisdiction if so why did he turn away his face in order that it might not be said that he held the same opinion as Samuel Mishnah if there was a breach in a wall between a courtyard and a public domain any man who brings any object from the latter into a private domain or from a private domain into it is guilty of an offense so our Eliezer the sages however ruled whether a man carried an object from it into the public domain or from the public domain into it he is exempt because it has the same status as a Carmel if the as to our Eliezer does it become a public domain because there was a breach between it and the public domain yes our Eliezer follows his view of having been taught our Judah citing our Eliezer said if the public chose a path for themselves that which they have chosen is theirs but this cannot be Right for did not argue citing Rab explain this applies only to a case where their path had been lost in that field and should you reply that here also it is a case where their path had been lost in that courtyard surely it could be retorted did not our Hanan estate the dispute referred to all the courtyard as far as the position of its walls read the dispute concerned only the position of the wall and if you prefer I might reply their dispute refers to the status of the sides of the public road our Eliezer holding that the sides of the public road are like the public road while the rabbis hold that the sides of the public road are not like the public road why then did they not express their difference of opinion in respect of the sides of public roads generally if they had expressed their difference of view in respect of the sides of public roads generally it might have been assumed that the rabbis differed from our Eliezer only where there were border stones but where there were no Border stones they agree with him hence we were informed that even in the latter case they also differ from him but did he not say from it as the rabbis used the expression from it he also used a similar expression as to the rabbis however how is it that our Eliezer speaks of the size of a public road and they retort to him from it is this that the rabbi said to our Eliezer you agree with us do you not that where a man moved an object from it into a public domain or from a public domain into it he is exempt because it is a carmel if well the same law should apply to the sides also and our Eliezer there are not many people tread on the spot but here they do mission if a breach was made in two sides of a courtyard towards a public domain and so also if a breach was made in two sides of a house or if the crossbeam or side post of an alley was removed the occupiers are permitted their use for that sabbath but forbidden on future sabbaths so our Judah Jose ruled if they are permitted their use on that Sabbath they are also permitted on future Sabbaths and if they are forbidden in future Sabbaths they are also forbidden on that Sabbath tomorrow with what kind of breach do we deal if it be suggested with one that was not wider than 10 cubits wherein then it may be objected does a breach in one side differ in such a case from breaches in two sides is it that it may be regarded as a doorway should not breaches in two sides also be regarded as doorways if however the breach spoken of was wider than 10 cubits should not the same restrictions apply even where it was only in one side Rab replied the fact is that the breach spoken of was not wider than 10 cubits Talmud, Mas Arab and B but it was one for instance that occurred in a corner where people make no doors and so also if a breach was made in two sides of a house wherein does a breach in one side differ from breaches in two sides is it in that it may be assumed that the edge of the ceiling is deemed to Extend downward and to close the gap. Why should it not be assumed in the case of breaches in two sides also that the edge of the beam extends and closes them up at the school of Rabbin was explained on the authority of Rab. This is a case of a house whose breaches, for instance, occurred in a corner and whose ceiling was lying in a slanting
He does does not the first difficulty at any rate remain as at the school of Rabbit was explained in the name of Rab. This is a case of a house whose breaches for instance occurred in a corner and whose ceiling was in a slanting position. So here also it may be explained this is a case of a house whose breaches for instance occurred in a corner and whose ceiling presented a four-sided breach. Samuel does not give the same explanation as Rab since it was not stated that the ceiling was slanting. Rab on the other hand does not give the same explanation as Samuel for in that case the house would in this respect have been in the same legal position as an exeter and Rab follows his view that it is permitted to move objects in all the interior of an exeter for it was stated if an exeter was situated in a valley Rab ruled it is permitted to move objects within all its interior but Samuel ruled objects may be moved within four cubits only Rab ruled that it was permitted to move objects in all its interior because we apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up but Samuel ruled that objects might be moved within four cubits only because we do not apply the principle the edge of the ceiling descends and closes up where a breach was not wider than ten cubits there is no divergence of opinion between them they only differ where the breach was wider than ten cubits others read where it was wider than ten cubits there is no divergence of opinion between them and they only differ where it was not wider than ten cubits with reference however to Rab Judah's ruling Talmud, Mas Aravinda that a crossbeam of the width of four handbreadths affects permissibility in a ruin and that of Arnaman who citing Rabbi Biabor ruled that a crossbeam of the width of four handbreadths affects permissibility in the case of water whose view is represented there according to the version which reads where a breach was not wider than ten cubits there is no divergence. Of opinion these would be a case where the crossbeam was no longer than ten cubits and would represent the unanimous opinion while according to the version which reads they only differ where it was not wider than ten cubits these would represent the view of Rab must it be assumed that Abay and Rabbi differ on the same principles as those on which Rab and Samuel differed for it was stated if an exeter that had side posts was covered with boughs it is valid as a sukkah but if it had no side. Post Abbe ruled it is still valid while Rabba ruled it is invalid Abbe ruled that it was valid because the edge of the ceiling is deemed to descend and to close up while Rabba ruled that it was invalid because he does not uphold the principle that the edge of the ceiling is deemed to descend and to close up now must it be assumed that Abbe is of the same view as Rab while Rabba is off the same view as Samuel according to the view of Samuel there is no divergence of opinion between them they differ only on the view of Rab Abbe of course holds the same view as Rab while Rabba maintains that R A and upheld his view only there because the walls were expressly made for the Exeter but not here where the walls were not expressly made for the Sukkah R Jose ruled if they are permitted the question was raised did R Jose intend to add restrictions or to relax them R Shizhe replied to add restrictions and so too said R Yohanan to add restrictions so it was also taught R Jose ruled as they are. Forbidden on future Sabbath, so are they forbidden on that Sabbath? It was stated our Habib Joseph ruled the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose, but Samuel ruled the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah. But could Samuel have given such a ruling, seeing that we have learned our Judah rule this applies only to Arabs of Sabbath limits? But in the case of Arabs of courtyards, one may be prepared for a person irrespective of whether he is aware of it or not, since a benefit may be conferred on a man in his absence, but no disability may be imposed on him in his absence. And in connection with this, Rab Judah citing Samuel stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah. And furthermore, wherever our Judah taught a law concerning Arab, the Halachah is in agreement with him. And when our Hannah of Baghdad asked Rab Judah, did Samuel say this even in respect of an alley whose crossbeam or side post has been taken away? He replied concerning Arabs, did I tell you, but not concerning partitions? Our Ain replied it. Was explained to me by Samuel that one statement referred to a courtyard in which a breach was made towards a Carmelite, while the other referred to one in which a breach was made towards a public domain mission. If one builds an upper room on the top of two houses, and in the case of viaducts, the movement of objects under these on the Sabbath is permitted. So Arjuna, but the sages forbid this. Arjuna, moreover, ruled an Arab may be prepared for an alley that is a thoroughfare, but the sages forbid. This Gemara Rabbi stated, do not presume that Arjuna's reason is that Pentateuch alai two walls are sufficient, but rather that the edge of ceiling is deemed to descend downwards and to enclose the space below. Abbe raised an objection against him. A more lenient rule than this did Arjuna lay down. If a man had two houses on the two sides respectively of a public domain, he may construct one side post on one side of any of the houses and another on the other side, or one crossbeam on one side of. Any of the houses and another on the other side, and then he may move thingo about in the space between them. But they said to him, a public domain cannot be provided with an Arab in such a manner. The other replied, front that ruling your contention is justified from this one. However, you cannot derive it. Our Ashi observed a deduction from the wording of our mission. Also justified Rabbi's explanation, since it was stated, our Judah moreover ruled an Arab may be prepared for an alley that is a thoroughfare. But the sages forbid this now. If you grant his reason to be that the edge of the ceiling is deemed to descend and to enclose the space below, one can well see why the expression of moreover was used. But if you maintain that his reason is that Pentateuch alai two walls are sufficient, what is the justification for the expression moreover? This is conclusive. C H A P T E R X Mishnah. If a man finds Tefillin, he shall bring them in one pair at a time. Our Gamaliel rule two pairs at a time. This applies to old ones, but in the case of new ones, he is exempt. If he found them arranged in packets or tied up in bundles, he shall wait by them until it is dark and then bring them in Talmud. Mas Aravan be in a time of danger, however, he shall cover them and proceed on his way. Our Simeon ruled, he shall pass them to his fellow, and his fellow shall pass them to his fellow, and so on until the uttermost courtyard is reached. The same procedure is to be followed in the case of a child of his he passes him to his fellow, and his fellow passes him to his fellow, and so on. Even though there are as many as a hundred men, our Judah ruled a man may pass a jar to his fellow, and his fellow may pass it to his fellow, even beyond the Sabbath limit. They, however, said to him, This must not be moved further than the feet of its owner. Gemara only one pair at a time, but not more must it then be assumed that we learned here an anonymous mission that is not in agreement with our for if it were to be. Maintain that it was in agreement with our mayor the objection would arise did he not rule that a man may put on all the clothes that he can put on and he may wrap himself in all things that he can wrap round himself for we learned and thither he may carry out all the utensils he is in the habit of using and he may put on all the clothes that he is able to put on and he may wrap himself in all things that he can wrap round himself but once the proof that that anonymous mission represents it. View of our mayor since in connection there with it was stated he may put on clothes and carry them out and there undress himself and then he may again put on clothes and carry them out and undress himself and so on even all day long so our mayor Robert replied it may be said to be in agreement even with our mayor for there the rabbis have allowed a procedure similar to one's habit of dressing on a weekday and here also they have allowed a procedure similar to one's way of wearing tefillin on a weekday. There where on a weekday a man can wear as many clothes as he desires the rabbis have permitted him to do so also for the purpose of saving but here where even on a weekday a man may wear only one pair but no more he was for the purpose of saving also permitted one pair only but no more Argamaliel ruled two pairs at a time what is the view he upholds if he holds that Sabbath is a time for wearing tefillin a man should be permitted only one pair but no more and if he holds that Sabbath is not a time for tefillin but that for the purpose of saving them the rabbis have permitted him to wear them in the manner of arraignment why should he not be permitted to wear even more than one pair the fact is that he holds that Sabbath is not a time for the wearing of tefillin but when the rabbis have permitted to wear them in the manner of arraignment for the purpose of saving they limited that to the spot prescribed for the position of the tefillin if so should not one pair only be allowed but not more our Samuel son of our Isaac replied there is room enough on the head for laying two tefillin this is a satisfactory explanation as regards those of the head what explanations however can be given in respect of those of the hand the same as that which Arhuna gave for Arhuna explained sometimes a man comes from the field with his bundle on his head when he removes them from his head and binds them on his arm it might still be contended that Arhuna only intended that they should not be treated
The injunction of thou shall not add that is at issue between them the first tanna holding that in order to commit a transgression against the injunction of thou shall not add no intention is necessary while our Gamaliel holds that in order to commit a transgression against the injunction of thou shalt not add intention is necessary and if you prefer I might reply if the view had been adopted that Sabbath is a time for tefillin all would have agreed that intention is unnecessary either in respect of transgression or in respect of discharging the duty but the point at issue between them here is with reference to the transgression when a commandment is performed not at its proper time the first tanna holds that no intention is required while our Gamaliel holds that to commit a transgression when a commandment is performed not at its proper time intention is necessary but if so should not even one peer be forbidden according to our mayor furthermore should not a man who sleeps on the eighth day be flogged it is perfectly clear therefore that the proper explanation is the one originally given who is it that was heard to hold that Sabbath is a time for the wearing of tefillin or before it was taught thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in its season form year to year the term days excludes nights from the days implies but not all days thus excluding Sabbaths and festivals so our Jose the Galilean or Akiba said the expression this ordinance was meant to apply to the Passover. Sacrifice only with reference however to what we have learned the Paschal sacrifice and circumcision are positive commandments must it be assumed that this is not in agreement with the view of our Akiba for it were to be contended that it was in agreement with our Akiba the objection would arise since he applied it to the Passover sacrifice a negative precept also should be involved as our Akiba laid down in the name of our Allah for our inciting our Allah laid down wherever the expressions take. He blessed or do not is used a negative precept is invariably intended it may be said to be in agreement even with the view of our Akiba for the expression take heed has the force of a negative precept only where it introduces a prohibitions but where it introduces a positive commandment it has the force of a positive commandment but how could our Akiba hold that the Sabbath is a time for wearing tefillin seeing that it was taught our Akiba stated as it might have been presented that a man shall wear tefillin on Sabbaths and festivals it was explicitly said in scripture and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand which denotes on those days only that require a sign but these since they themselves are a sign are excluded it represents rather the view of the following tenor for it was taught if a man keeps awake at night he may remove his tefillin if he wishes or if he prefers he may put them on so our Nathan Jonathan the kid night ruled tefillin may not be worn at night now since According to the view of the first tan of the night is a proper time for the wearing of tefillin Sabbath also must be a proper time for the wearing of tefillin but is it not possible that he holds that the night is a proper time for tefillin but that the Sabbath nevertheless is not a time for it since we have in fact heard our Akiva to state that the night is a time for the tefillin and that the Sabbath is not it represents rather the opinion of the following tan for it was taught Michael the daughter of the Kishite wore tefillin and the sages did not attempt to prevent her and the wife of Jonah attended the festival pilgrimage and the sages did not prevent her now since the sages did not prevent her it is clearly evident that they hold the view that it is a positive precept the performance of which is not limited to a particular time but is it not possible that he holds the same view Talmud Mas Irvin B as our Jose who ruled it is optional for women to lay their hands upon him. Offering for were you not to say so how is it that Jonah's wife attended the festival pilgrimage and the sages did not prevent her seeing that there is no one who contends that the observance of a festival is not a positive precept the performance of which is limited to a particular time you must consequently admit that he holds it to be optional could it not then here also be said to be optional it repairs ends rather the view of the following tenor for it was taught if tefillin are found they are to be brought in one pair at a time irrespective of whether the person who brings them in is a man or a woman and irrespective of whether the tefillin were new or old so our mayor Arjuna forbids this in the case of new ones but permits it in that of old ones now since their dispute is confined to the question of new and old while in respect of the woman there is no divergence of opinion it may be concluded that it is a positive precept the performance of which is not restricted to a Particular time women being subject to the obligations of such precepts but is it not possible that he holds the same view as our Jose who stated it is optional for women to lay their hands upon an offering this cannot be entertained at all and neither our mayor holds the same view as our Jose nor does our Judah hold the same view as our Jose neither our mayor holds the same view as our Jose since we learn children are not to be prevented from blowing the shofar from which it follows that women are to be prevented and any anonymous mission represents the view of our mayor nor does our Judah hold the same view as our Jose since it was taught speak unto the children of Israel and he shall lay only the sons of Israel shall lay but not the daughters of Israel our Jose and our Simeon ruled it is optional for women to lay now who is the author of all anonymous statement in the sifra our Judah our Eliezer said if a man found blue wool in the street and it was in the shape of straps it is unfit but if it was in the Shape of threads it is fit wherein however do straps differ in that it may be assumed that they were dyed for the purpose of being used for the manufacture of a cloak but then might it not be assumed in the case of threads also that they were spun for the purpose of weaving a cloak with them this is a case where they were twisted but even where they were twisted might it not be assumed that they were doubled for the purpose of being inserted in the border of a cloak this is a case where they were cut since people would not take so much trouble with them Rob observed does anyone go to the trouble of making all amulet in the shape of tefillin yet we have linked this applies to old ones but in the case of new ones he is exempt our Zara said to his son I have go out and teach them if a man found blue wool in the street it is unfit if it was in the shape of straps but if it was in the shape of cut threads it is fit because no one would take unnecessary trouble and retorted Robin. Because Ahab the son of Arzara taught it as he for hung jewels upon it have we not in fact learned this applies to old ones but in the case of new ones he is exempt the fact however is explained rather that the question whether one does or does not take unnecessary trouble is a point at issue between Tanis for it was taught if tefillin are found they are to be brought in one pair at a time irrespective of whether the person who brings them is a man or a woman Talmud, Mas Arabin or whether the tefillin were new or old so our mayor Arjuna forbids this in the case of new ones but permits it in that of old ones it is quite clear therefore that one master is of the opinion that a man does take unnecessary trouble while the other master holds that he does not mnemonic chizes be now however that the father of Samuel son of our Isaac learned old ones are all those that have straps which are tied into a knot while new ones are such as have straps that are not tied into a knot all might be assumed to agree that no man would take unnecessary trouble but why should not one fasten them with a loop our historical reply this proves that a loop is inadmissible in tefillin abe replied our judah follows his view expressed elsewhere that a loop is like a proper knot the reason then is that a loop is like a proper knot but if that had not been so one would presumably have been allowed to fasten them with a loop but it may be objected did not our judah son of our samuel be shalath rule in the name of rab the shape of the knot of the tefillin is a halajah that was given to moses at sinai and our and explained their ornamentation must be turned outwards one could make the loop similar to the prescribed knot our histah citing rab ruled if a man buys a supply of tefillin from a non-expert he must examine two tefillin of the hand and one of the head or two of the head and one of the hand but whatever your explanation may be a difficulty remains if he bought them from one man why should he not examine either three of the hand or three of the head and if he bought them from two or three persons should not each one require examination the fact is that he bought them from one man but it is necessary that his reputation shall be established in respect of those of the hand as well as those of the head but can this be correct purely rabbi samuel learned in the case of tefillin one examines three of the hand and of the head which means does it not either three of the hand or three of the head no three some of which must be of the hand and some of the head but did not our kahana learn in the case of tefillin one examines two of the hand and of the head this represents the view of rabbi who laid down that if something has happened twice presumption is established but if this represents the view of rabbi read the final clause the same procedure is followed in the case of the second packet and also in that of the third packet but if this represents the view of rabbi would he require the examination of a third packet rabbi agrees in the case of packets since one usually buys them from two or three persons but if so should not even the fourth and even the fifth also require examination the law is so indeed and the reason why the third is mentioned is merely to indicate that no presumption is established in fact however even a fourth or a fifth
From idolaters read them the final clause are Simeon ruled he shall pass them to his fellow and his fellow shall pass them to his fellow would not this cause much greater publicity a clause is wanting in our mission of the proper reading being as follows this applies to danger from idolaters but in the case of danger from highwaymen he carries them in small stages each of less than four cubits are Simeon ruled he shall pass them to his fellow etc on what principle do they differ one master holds that it is preferable to carry them in stages of less than four cubits for if you should say that he should pass them to his fellow and his fellow to his fellow the desecration of the Sabbath would be given unto publicity while the other master holds that it is preferable to pass them to one's fellow for should you say that he shall carry them in stages of less than four cubits it might sometimes happen that he would be absent minded and would in consequence carry them four cubits in the public. Domain the same procedure is to be followed in the case of a son of his how does his child come to be there the school of Manasseh taught this is a case where his mother bore him in the field and what is intended by the expression even though there are as many as a hundred that though the movement from hand to hand is rather a hardship to him this procedure is nevertheless to be preferred Arjuna ruled a man may pass a jar but does not Arjuna agree with what we learn cattle and objects may move only as far as the feet of their owner Rush Lakish citing Levi the elder replied here we are dealing with a case where he emptied the contents from one jar into another Arjuna following his view expressed elsewhere that water is deemed to have no substance for we learned Arjuna exempts water because it has no substance then what could be the meaning of this must not move that which is within this must not be moved further than the feet of its owner might it not be suggested that are Judah was heard to hold his view only where it was absorbed in dough was he however heard to hold the same view where it had an independent existence surely if where water is mixed with the contents of a pot our Judah rules that it does not lose its existence would it lose it where it had an independent existence for was it not taught our Judah ruled water and salt lose their identity in dough but not in a pot on account of its broth rather explained Rabba we are here dealing with the case of a jar that had acquired a place for the Sabbath and that of water that had not acquired a place so that the identity of the jar is lost in the water as we have learned if a man carries out a living person in a bed he is exempt even in respect of the bed since the bed is of secondary importance if a man carries out in a vessel foodstuffs less than the forbidden quantity he is exempt even in respect of the vessel since the vessel is only of secondary importance our Joseph raised an objection our Judah. Ruled when in a caravan a man may pass a jar to his fellow and his fellow to his fellow which implies does it not that only when in a caravan is this permitted but not otherwise the fact rather is explained our Joseph that what we learned in our mission referred also to a caravan Abbe explained when in a caravan the device is permitted even when both the jar and the water had acquired a place for the Sabbath but when one is not in a caravan the device is allowed only where the jar alone had acquired a place for the Sabbath but not the water Arashi explained here we are dealing with the jar and water both of which were ownerless and whose view is expressed in what they said to him at Abar Yohan and Binuri who holds that ownerless objects acquire their place for the Sabbath and what could be the meaning of this must not be moved further than the feet of its owner they must not be moved further than vessels that have an owner mission if a man was reading in a scroll on a threshold and the scroll rolled out of his hand he may roll it back to himself if he was reading it on the top of a roof and the scroll rolled out of his hand he may before it reached ten handbreadths from the ground roll it back to himself but after it had reached the ten handbreadths he must turn it over with its writing downwards Arjuna ruled even if it was removed from the ground by no more than a thread's thickness he may roll it back to himself or Simeon ruled even if it touched the actual ground. He may roll it back to himself since no prohibition that is due to Shabbat retains its force in the presence of the holy writings tomorrow what kind of threshold is one to imagine if it be suggested that the threshold was a private domain and that in front of it was a public domain and that no preventive measure was enacted against the possibility that the entire scroll might fall down and that one might then carry it in Talmud, Mas Arabin, who then it may be asked is the author obviously are. Simeon who ruled no prohibition that is due to Shabbat retains its force in the presence of the holy writings but then read the final clause Arjuna ruler even if it was removed from the ground by no more than a thread's thickness he may roll it right to himself or Simeon ruled even if it touched the actual ground he may roll it back to himself is it likely that the first and final clauses represent the view of Arsimian while the middle one represents that of Arjuna Rabba replied yes the first and final clauses may represent the view of Arsimian while the middle one represents that of Arjuna Rabba replied we deal here with the threshold that was trodden upon by the public and in order to avert disrespect to the holy writings the rabbis have permitted to roll it back Abbe raised an objection against him if it rested within four cubits one may roll it back to oneself but if it rested without the four cubits one must turn it over with its writing downwards now if you Maintain that we are dealing with the threshold that was trodden upon by the public. What matters in whether the end of the roll rested within the four cubits or without the four cubits? Rather explained, Abbe, we are dealing here with the threshold that was a carmelite in front of which passed the public domain. Hence, it is that if the end of the scroll rested within four cubits, where even if all the scroll had fallen down and one would have carried it back, no obligation of a sin offering would be incurred. The rabbis have permitted the man to roll it back, but where it rested without the four cubits, in which case if he had brought it back, he would have incurred the obligation of a sin offering. The rabbis did not permit it to him, but if so, why should not a preventive measure be enacted even where the end of the scroll rested within the four cubits? Lest one night come to carry the scroll from the public into a private domain, and should you reply, since a carmelite intervened, this need. Not be provided against did not rob it may be objected state if a man transferred an object from the beginning of four cubits to the end of the four cubits and the transfer was made above his head he is guilty of an offense here we are dealing with all extensive threshold in crossing which one is sure to recollect to pause if you prefer I might reply the fact is that we are dealing here with a threshold that was not extensive but one usually looks through the holy writings before putting them away but why should not the possibility be taken into consideration that one might look through them while in the public domain and then carry them directly into the private domain the author of this ruling is Benazay who laid down that walking is like standing but is it not possible that he might throw them or Yohan and having stated Benazay agrees in the case of throwing our Ahabi I have replied this proves that holy writings may not be thrown if he was heading it on the top of a roof etc. But is this permitted seeing that it was taught the writers of the scrolls of scripture Tefillin or Mazuzoth were not permitted to turn a skin with the writing downwards but a cloth must be spread over it there this is possible whereas here this is impossible and if one were not to turn it over the holy writings would be exposed to much greater abuse he must turn it over with its writing downwards but surely it has not has it come to arrest Robert replied this is a case where the wall was slanting said Abbe to him you have explained our mission as referring to a slanting wall read them the final clause Arjuna ruled even if it was removed from the ground by no more than a thread's thickness he may roll it back to himself but surely I may ask has it not come to rest some words are wanting the proper reading being as follows this applies only to a slanting wall but in the case Talmud Mas Arab and B of a wall that was not slanting and it came to rest above three handbreadths. From the ground he may roll it back to himself but if below the three handbreadths he must turn it over with its writing downwards Arjuna ruled even if it was removed from the ground by no more than etc because it is essential that the object shall come to rest on something but then what of the statement of Rabbah that even if all object came within three handbreadths from the ground it is necessary according to the rabbis that it shall rest on something must it be assumed that he based his teaching on what is a dispute between ten is the fact is that all this represents the view of Arjuna but some words are missing the correct reading being as follows this applies only to a slanting wall but in the case of a wall that was not slanting even if it was below three handbreadths from the ground he may roll it back because Arjuna ruled even if it was removed from the ground by no more than a thread's thickness he may roll it back to himself what is the reason because it is essential that the object shall come to rest on something mission if there was a ledge in front of a window it is permitted to put objects upon it or to remove objects from it on the sabbath tomorrow whether did the ledge project if it be suggested that it projected onto a public domain why should no provision be made against the possibility that an object might drop and one would be tempted to carry it if on the other hand it be proj
Since it is regarded as an extension of the windowsill but its section on the one side or on the other remains forbidden mission a man may stand in a private domain and move objects in a public domain or he may stand in a public domain and move objects in a private domain provided he does not take them beyond four cubits a man may not stand in a private domain and make water in a public domain or in a public domain and make water in a private domain and the same applies to spitting Arjuna. Rule even where a person's spittle accumulated in his mouth he must not walk four cubits before he spat out Gemara Arhain and Abishalim I taught Hayabi Rab in the presence of Rab a man may not stand in a private domain and move objects in a public domain do you he said to him ignore the rabbis and act according to the view of Armeir Talmud Mas Arabin he thought that since the final clause represented the view of Armeir the first clause also must represent the view of Armeir in fact however this is not so while the final clause represents the view of Armeir the first represents the view of the rabbis provided he does not take them beyond us it follows that if he did take them beyond the four cubits he incurs the obligation of a sin offering may it then be suggested that this provides support for Rabbi who laid down that if a man transferred an object from the beginning of four cubits to the end of the four cubits and the transfer was made above his head he is guilty of an offense. Was it stated if he took them beyond he incurs the obligation of a sin offering it is quite possible that if he took them beyond the four cubits he is exempt but the act is nevertheless forbidden others read thus it follows that if he did take them out he is exempt though this is forbidden must it be conceded that this presents an objection against Rabbi who laid down that if a man transferred an object from the beginning of four cubits to the end of four cubits and the transfer was made. Above his head he is guilty of an offense was it stated if he took them out he is exempt though this is forbidden it is quite possible that if he took them beyond the four cubits he does incur the obligation of a sin offering a man must not stand in a private domain etc. Our Joseph ruled if a man made water or spat he incurs the obligation of a sin offering but is it not necessary that the lifting up and the putting down shall respectively be from and upon a place that was for hand breadths wide. Which is not the case here his intention confers upon him the status of a proper place for should you not concede this principle how would you explain the following ruling of Rabbah if a man threw some object and it dropped into the mouth of a dog or into the mouth of a furnace he incurs the obligation of a sin offering in view of the objection is it not necessary that the putting down should be upon a place that was for hand breadths wide which is not the case here you must consequently admit. That the man's intention confers upon it the status of a proper place so also here it may well be explained it is his intention that confers upon him the status of a valid place Rabba inquired what is the legal position where a man stood in a private domain and the orifice of the organ projected into a public domain are we guided by the source or by the point of exit this remains undecided and the same applies to spitting our Judah rule etc even though he did not turn it over have we not however learned if a man was eating a pressed fig with soiled hands and he put his hand into his mouth to remove a small stone our mayor declares the fig to be unclean while our Jose regards it as clean our Judah ruled if he turned it over the fig is unclean but if he did not turn it over the fig remains clean our Johan and replied reverse the statement Rush Lakish said you have no need to reverse the statement for we are dealing here with phlegm but was it not taught our Judah ruled if his phlegm was detached which implies also does it not if his spittle was detached no only that if his phlegm was detached but was it not taught our Judah ruled whether his phlegm was detached or his spittle was detached he must not walk four cubits before he spat it out clearly the explanation is the one originally given Rush Lakish stated one who coughs up phlegm in the presence of his master deserves an untimely death for it is said in scripture all that hate me love death read not that hate me but those that cause me to be hated but does not one merely act under an impulsion the person meant is one who coughs up the phlegm and ejects admission a man must not stand in a private domain and drink in the public domain or stand in a public domain and drink in a private domain unless he put his head and the greater part of his body into the domain in which he drinks and a similar law applies to a one press gemara does then the first clause represent the view of the rabbis while the final clause represents that of Armeir our Joseph replied the latter clause deals with objects that are among one's necessities and it represents the general opinion the question was raised what is the ruling in respect of the Carmelite Abbe replied the same law applies Robert replied the very law of Carmelite is but a preventive measure shall we then go as far as to enact a preventive measure in addition to another preventive measure once observed Abbe do I derive my view from the statement Talmud Mas Arab and B and a similar law applies to a wine press Rabbah however explained the references to tithe and so explained Arshi's hate and a similar law applies to a wine press refers to tithe for we learned it is permitted to drink wine out of a wine press irrespective of whether it was mixed with hot water or cold water and to be exempt from the tithe so Armeir our Eliezer Bizotic declared it to be liable to tithe while the sages ruled in the case of hot wine one is liable to the tithe but in that of cold wine one is exempt since whatever remains is poured back mission a man may intercept water from a gutter at a level below ten hand breadths from the ground but from a water spout he may drink in any matter tomorrow he may only intercept the water but may not press his lips to the gutter what is the reason our Naman replied we are here dealing with a gutter that was within three hand breadths from the roof since any structure that is within three hand breadths from the roof is regarded as being the same domain as the roof so it was also taught a man standing in a private domain may raise his hand above ten hand breadths towards a gutter that was within less than three hand breadths from a roof and intercept the water provided he does not press his lips to it elsewhere it was taught a man standing in a private domain may not raise his hand above ten hand breadths towards a gutter that was within less than three hand breadths from a roof and press it to it but he may intercept the water and then drink from a water spout he may drink in any manner one taught if the spout had an area of four hand breadths by four this is forbidden because this would be like taking from one domain into another mission if a cistern in a public domain had an embankment ten hand breadths high it is permitted to draw water from it on the sabbath through a window above it if a rubbish heap in a public domain was ten hand breadths high it is permitted to pour water on it on the sabbath from a window above it tomorrow what are we dealing with here if it be suggested with one that was near what need was there it might be objected for an embankment that was ten hand breadths high our replied we are here dealing with a cistern that was removed four hand breadths from the wall hence it is only where there was an embankment ten hand breadths high that the ruling applies but where there was no embankment ten hand breadths high one would be moving an object from one private domain into another by way of a public Domain or Yohanan however replied it may even be assumed to refer to a cistern that was near but it is this that we were informed that the depth of a cistern and the height of its embankment may be combined to the prescribed depth of ten hand breadths if a rubbish heap in a public domain etc. There is no need then to provide against the possibility that the rubbish heap might be removed but did not Rabin son of our Ada state in the name of our Isaac it once occurred that one side of an alley terminated in the sea and the other terminated in a rubbish heap and when the facts were submitted to Rabbi he neither permitted nor forbade the movement of objects in that alley he did not declare it to be permitted since the possibility had to be considered that the rubbish heap might be removed or the sea might throw up oblivion and he did not declare it to be forbidden because partitions in fact existed this is no difficulty since the latter refers to one that belonged to an individual. Whereas the former refers to one that belonged to the public mission where a tree overshadows the ground it is permitted to move objects under it if the tops of its branches are not higher than three hand breadths from the ground if its roots are three hand breadths high above the ground one may not sit on them. Gemara Arhuna the son of Arjashu ruled no objects may be moved under it where the area was greater than two Beth Seo what is the reason Talmud, Mas Arabin because it is a dwelling place that serves only the outside air and no movement of objects is permitted in a dwelling place whose only function is that of serving the outside air if its area was greater than two Beth Seo if its roots are high above the ground etc it was stated if the roots of a tree descended from a level that was above three hand breadths into one that was lower than three hand breadths Rabba ruled it is permitted to use them while Arshis ruled it is forbidden to use them Rabba ruled it is Permitted to use them since all levels lower than three hand breadths from the ground are regarded as the ground itself. Our she's hate ruled it is forbidden to use them because owing to the fact that they derive from a forbidden source they themselves are also forbidden if they are in the shape of a
With the ground our rabbis taught if the roots of a tree were three handbreadths high above the ground or if there was a hollow space of three handbreadths beneath them one must not sit on them even though on one side of the tree they were level with the ground because it is not permissible either to climb upon a tree or to suspend oneself from a tree or to recline on a tree nor may one climb upon a tree while it is yet day to remain there all the Sabbath day the law being the same in the case of a tree and in that of any cattle in the case of a cistern a ditch a cave or a wall one may climb up or climb down even if they were a hundred cubits deep or high one bury the teaches if a man climbed up he may climb down but does not another bury the teach that he is forbidden to climb down this is no difficulty since the former refers to one who climbed up while it was yet day while the latter refers to one who did it after dusk if you prefer I might reply both refer to all ascent after dusk and yet there is no difficulty since the one refers to an unwitting act while the other refers to an intentional one if you prefer I might say both refer to an unwitting act but the principle underlying their divergence of view is the question whether a penalty has been imposed in respect of an unwitting act as a precaution against the performance of an intentional act one master is of the opinion that such a penalty has been imposed while the other master holds that no such penalty has been imposed our son of our Joshua observed this is similar in principle to the dispute between the following ten as if the blood of sacrifices of which one sprinkling only is necessary was confused with the blood of other sacrifices of which one sprinkling is necessary each is to be sprinkled once if blood of which four sprinklings are necessary was confused with other blood of which four sprinklings were necessary each is to be sprinkled four times if that which has to be sprinkled four times was confused with that which has to be sprinkled once our Eliza ruled each must be sprinkled four times and our Joshua ruled each must be sprinkled only once does he not set our Eliza to him thereby transgress the law against diminishing from the precepts does he not thereby reply our Joshua transgress the prohibition against adding to the precepts this our Eliza retorted applies only where it is in all isolated condition is the prohibition against diminishing from the precepts also said our Joshua to him applies only when it is in all isolated condition our Joshua furthermore explained if you sprinkle you transgress the prohibition against adding to the precepts and you also perform the act with your own hand but if you do not sprinkle you transgress indeed the prohibition against diminishing from the precepts but you do not perform any act with your own hand now according to our Eliza who laid down there that the performance of an uncertain precept is preferable the man may hear also climb down while according to our Joshua who held there that the abstention from the performance of an uncertain precept is preferable the man here also may not climb down this argument however might be fallacious since our Eliza may have maintained his view that the performance of an uncertain precept is preferable only there where a positive precept is thereby performed but here where no positive precept is performed he may also agree that the man must not climb down or else our Joshua may have maintained his view that the abstention from the performance of an uncertain precept is preferable only their Talmud, Mas Iravan B where no direct transgression is committed but here where a direct transgression is committed he may also agree that the man may climb down one berry the top the same prohibition applies to a green tree and to a dry tree and another berry the top this prohibition applies only to a green tree whereas in the case of a dry one no prohibition exists Rab. Judah replied this is no difficulty since the former refers to a tree whose stump grows afresh whereas the latter refers to one whose stump does not grow afresh but if its stump grows afresh would you describe it as dry rather say there is no difficulty since the latter refers to the hot season whereas the former refers to the rainy season you say in the not season surely the fruit falls of this is a case where it bore no fruit but do not some chips fall off this is a case where the tree was stripped but surely this cannot be right for did not Rab once visit of Seisha where he forbade the use of a strip tree Rab found an open field and put up a fence around it Rami B. Hamas citing R.C. rule the man is forbidden to walk on grass on the Sabbath because it is said in scripture and he that haste death with his feet sineth one buried the taught it is permitted to walk on grass on the Sabbath and another buried the taught that this was forbidden this is no difficulty since the latter refers to fresh grass whereas the former refers to dry grass and if you prefer I might say both berries refer to fresh grass and yet there is no difficulty since the latter refers to the hot season whereas the former refers to the rainy season and if you prefer I might reply both deal with the hot season and yet there is no difficulty since the former deals with the person who wears his shoes whereas the latter deals with one who is barefooted and if you prefer I might reply both deal with a person who wears his shoes but there is no difficulty since the latter refers to shoes that have nails whereas the former refers to such as have no nails and if you prefer I might reply both deal with shoes that have nails but the latter refers to long and tangled grass whereas the former refers to one that is not tangled nowadays however since we have it as an established rule that the law is in agreement with our simian it is permitted to walk on grass in all the cases mentioned Rami Bihama. Citing R.C. for the rule, the man is forbidden to compel his wife to the marital obligation since it is said in scripture, and he that hastes death with his feet sineth. Our Joshua B. Levi similarly stated, Whosoever compels his wife to the marital obligation will have unworthy children, said R.I.K. Behind him, what is the scriptural proof? Also without consent, the soul is hot good, so it was also taught. Also without consent, the soul is not good, refers to a man who compels his wife to the marital obligation, and he that hastes death with his feet sineth refers to the man who has intercourse twice in succession, but surely this cannot be right, for did not rob a state he who desires all his children to be males should cohabit twice in succession. This is no difficulty since the latter deals with the woman's consent, whereas the former without her consent, our Samuel B. Namani, citing R. Yohanan, stated, A woman who solicits her husband to the marital obligation will have children the like of whom did. Not exist even in the generation of Moses, for of the generation of Moses it is written, Get you from each one of your tribes wise men and understanding and full of knowledge, and then it follows. So I took the heads of your tribes wise men and full of knowledge, while men of understanding he could not find. Whereas in the case of Leah it is written in scripture, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come unto me, for I have surely hired thee, and subsequently it is written, and of it. Children of Issachar men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their commandment. But can that be right, seeing that our Isaac be of Dimi stated he was cursed with ten curses, since it is written unto the woman, he said, And I will greatly multiply, which refers to the two drops of blood, one being that of menstruation, and the other that of virginity, that pain refers to the pain of bringing up children, and thy Travail refers to the pain of conceptions in pain thou shalt bring forth children is to be understood in its literal meaning and thy desire shall be to thy husband teaches that a woman yearns for her husband when he is about to set out on a journey and he shall rule over thee teaches that while the wife solicits with her heart the husband does so with his mouth this being a fine trait of character among women what was meant is that she ingratiates herself with him but are not these only seven. When Ardini came he explained she is wrapped up like a mourner banished from the company of all men and confined within a prison what is meant by banished from the company of all men if it be suggested that she is forbidden to meet a man in privacy is not the man also but could be retorted forbidden to meet a woman in privacy the meaning rather is that she is forbidden to marry two men in the very that it was taught she grows long hair like Lilith sits when making water like a beast and serves. As a bolster for her husband and the other these he holds are rather complimentary to her high having made the following statement what is meant by the scriptural text who tiakate us by the beast of the earth and make us wise by the fowls of the heaven who tiakate us by the beast refers to the mule which kneels when it makes water and make us wise by the fowls of the heaven refers to the cock which first coaxes and then mates our Yohanan observed if the Torah had not been given we could have learned modesty from the cat honesty from the ant chastity from the dove and good manners from the cock who first coaxes and then mates and how does he coax his mate Rab Judah citing Rab replied he tells her this I will buy you a cloak that would reach to your feet after the event he tells her may the cat tear off my crest if I have any money and do not buy you one Talmud Moss Iravan Amisha with the door in the rear court or the stop gaps in a breach or read mats one may not close an opening unless they are raised from the ground Gemara does not the following however present a contradiction with a door reed mat or a kick that drag along the ground it is permitted whenever they are fastened and suspended to close an opening on the
downwards, but it is forbidden to build it up from the bottom upwards, and the same applies to an egg, a pot of bed, and a cask. A certain Sadducee once said to our Joshua, Be had an eye, or a briar, since of you it is written in scripture, the best of them is as a briar, foolish man. The other replied, Look up the conclusion of the text where it is written, The upright man is a better protection than a tabernacle. What then was meant by the best of them is as a briar, as briars protect a gap, so do the best. Men among us protect us. Another interpretation, the best of them is as a deck, because they crush the wicked men in Gehenna, as it is said in Scripture, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many peoples, etc. A mission of man may not stand in a private domain, and open a duan in the public domain, or in the public domain, and open a door in a private domain, unless he has made a partition ten hand breadths, I so end. But here they said to him, It once happened at the butcher's market in Jerusalem that they locked their shops and left the key in a window above a shop door. Our Jose said it was the wool dealer's market. Gamar asked to the rabbis, How is it that when Armadier spoke of a public domain, they retorted by citing a Carmelite, since Rabbi Barhanna stated in the name of our Yohananis for Jerusalem, were it not that its gates were closed at night, one would have incurred the guilt of carrying in it as a public domain. Are. Papa replied the latter statement refers to the time before breaches were made in its wall whereas the former refers to the time after the breaches had been made. Robber replied the final clause deals with the gates of a garden and it is this that was implied as a man may not stand in a private domain and open a door in a carmelite or in a carmelite and open a door in a private domain Talmud, Moss Irvin B unless he has made a partition ten hand breadths I so are here they said to him at once. Happened at the butcher's market in Jerusalem that they used to lock their shops and left the key in a window above a shop door. Our Jose said it was a wool dealer's market. Our rabbis taught the doors of garden gateways whenever they have a gatehouse on their inner side may be opened and closed from within if they have it on their outer side they may be opened and shut from without if they have one on either side they may be opened and shut from either side if they have none on either side they Maybe neither open nor shut from either side. The same law applies also to shops that open into a public domain whenever the lock is below ten hand breadths from the ground. The key may be brought on the Sabbath eve and placed on the threshold, and on the following day the door may be opened and duly closed when the key may again be placed on the threshold. And whenever the lock is above ten hand breadths from the ground, the key must be brought on the Sabbath eve and inserted in the lock and on the following day it may be opened and shut and returned to its place. So our mayor, the sages, however, rule even when the lock is above ten hand breadths from the ground, the key may be brought on the Sabbath eve and placed on the threshold. And on the following day the door may be opened and shut and the key may be returned to its place, or it may be put on a window above the door if the window, however, had an area of four hand breadths by four. This is forbidden since the transfer of the key would. Constitute a transfer from one domain into another since it was stated and the same law applies also to shops it may be concluded that we are dealing with a threshold that had the status of a carmelite but then how are we to imagine the conditions of the lock if it is one that was less than four hand breadths in width it would surely be a free domain and if it was four hand breadths why would the rabbis in such a case have ruled even when the lock is above ten hand breadths from the ground the key may be brought on the sabbath eve and placed on the threshold and on the following day the door may be opened and shut and the key may be returned to its place or it may be put on a window above the door seeing that thereby one is moving an object iron carmelite into a private domain and they reply the fact is that the lock was less than four hand breadths but there was sufficient space in the door in which to cut and make it up to four hand breadths and it is this principle on which they Differ Armadier holds the opinion that the door is regarded as virtually cut for the purpose of completing the prescribed width, while the rabbis maintain that it is not regarded as cut for the purpose of completing the prescribed width. Said RBBB Abbe, from this very thing you may deduce three things. You may deduce that virtual cutting for the purpose of completing a prescribed width may be assumed. You may deduce that Armadier withdrew from his view on the gates of the garden and from the ruling of the rabbis. You may also deduce that Ardimi's view is tenable for when Ardimi came, he reported in the name of Aryohanan in a place whose area is less than four hand breadths by four. It is permissible for both the people of the public domain and those of the private domain to rearrange their burdens, provided only that they do not exchange the mission if a bolt had a knob at one end. Our Eliezer forbids it to be moved, but our Jose permits it. Said our Eliezer in a synagogue at Tiberius the common. Practice in fact was to treat it as permitted until Argamaliel and the elders came and forbade it to them. Our Jose retorted they treated it as forbidden but Argamaliel and the elders came and permitted it to them. Gemara where it can be lifted up by the court to which it was tied no one disputes that it is permissible to move it. They only differ Talmud, Mas Aravind where it cannot be lifted up by the court to which it was tied in which case one master holds that since there was a knob at one. And it has the status of a vessel while the other master holds that since it cannot be lifted up by the court to which it was tied it may not be moved. Mission with a bolt that drags along the ground it is permitted to shut up the door in the temple but not in the country but with one that rests on the ground this is forbidden everywhere. Rajita ruled with one that rests on the ground this is permitted in the temple but with one that drags on the ground this is also permitted in the country. Gemara or rabbis taught what is the definition of a bolt that drags wherewith it is permitted to shut up the door in the temple but not in the country one that is fastened and suspended and whose one end touches the ground our Judah ruled with such a bolt it is permitted to shut up the door even in the country but what kind of bolt is it wherewith it is permitted to shut up in the temple and not in the country one that is neither fastened nor suspended but which is removed and put away in a corner Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled the halachah is in agreement with our Judah in the case of a bolt that drags along the ground Rab observed this applies only where it is fastened to the door but could this be right seeing that our Tavla when he visited Mahusa saw a bolt that was suspended from the side of a doorway and yet made no remark whatsoever on the matter that was one that could be lifted up by the court to which it was tied Arihuda once visited Nihardia and observed that a certain man was fastening a bolt with a piece of reed grass this he remarked must not shut up our Zara inquired what is the ruling where the bolt was pressed into the ground what question is this retorted our Joseph has he not heard what was taught if it was detached it is forbidden but if it was pressed into the ground it is permitted and our Judah ruled if it was pressed into the ground even though it was not detached it is forbidden and in connection with this Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled the Halashah is in agreement with our Judah in the case where it was pressed into the ground but what is the reason Abbe replied because it has the appearance of building our Nehu may be Zechariah inquired of Abbe what is the ruling where a handle was attached to the bolt you the other replied speak now of a club it was stated our Nehu may be at a rule if a handle was attached to it the handling of the bolt is permitted at the house of our Pedat they had a beam which ten men had to lift to fix it in position at the Door, but he told them no word against this. It has he observed the character of a vessel at the house of Mar Samuel. They had a mortar of the capacity of an artaba, and Mar Samuel allowed it to be fixed behind the door. It has he observed the character of a vessel. Rami B. Ezekiel sent to Aram Rome the following message when the master tell us some of those excellent sayings that you once told us in the name of R.C. in respect of the arches of a boat. He sent word in reply, thus said R.C. with reference to the arches of a boat whenever they are a handbreadth wide or even when they are less than a handbreadth in width, provided there was no space of three handbreadths intervening between the one and the other. It is permissible to bring it on the morrow and to spread it over them. What is the reason one is there by merely adding to an occasional tent which is perfectly legitimate? Arhuna possessed some rams that needed the shade in the daytime and the open air at night when he came to. Rab the latter told him go and roll up the reed mat but leave one hand breadth rolled and on the morrow spread it all out and you will be merely adding to all occasional tent and that is perfectly legitimate Rab citing our high rule that is permissible to draw and to withdraw a certain on the Sabbath it is also permissible to take down or to put up a bridal canopy on the Sabbath said Arshis hate the son of R.E.D. this applies only where the top was less than a hand breadth in width but where the top was one hand breadth wide this is forbidden and even when the top was less than one hand breadth wide this is applicable only if it's width
Temple wall in the country it may only be adjusted but the upper one may not be reinserted in either place the former prohibition being a preventive measure against the possibility of one's driving it into its socket by force and should one drive it in the obligation of a sin offering is incurred the pivot of the door of a sister in a cellar or an anixa may not be reinserted in the socket and if one did reinsert it a sin offering is incurred mission it is permissible to replace a plaster on a wound in the temple but not in the country for the first time however this is forbidden everywhere tomorrow our rabbis taught a plaster that was detached from a wound may be replaced on the sabbath our judah ruled only if it slipped downwards may it be pushed back upwards or if it slipped upwards it may be pushed back downwards one may also uncover a part of the plaster and wipe the opening of the wound and then another part of the plaster may be uncovered and the opening of the wound be wiped but the plaster itself may not be wiped off since such wiping is tantamount to spreading the salve and if one did spread the salve the obligation of a sin offering is incurred Rab Judah citing Samuel ruled the halachah is in agreement with our Judah this artist I observed was learned only where it slipped off onto an object but if it slipped off onto the ground all agree that it is forbidden to replace it on the wound Marsan of Arashi stated I was once standing in the presence of my father when his plaster slipped off onto his pillow and he replaced it does not the master accept I asked him the statement of Arhistah that they differed only where it slipped off onto an object but that if it slipped off onto the ground all agree that replacement is forbidden in connection with which Samuel stated the halachah is in agreement with our Judah I he replied did not hear of this by which I mean I do not accept it mission a string may be tied up in the temple but not in the country for the First time however this is forbidden everywhere Gemara is not our mission in disagreement with the following if the string of a harp was broken one would not tie it up but secure it with a loop this is no difficulty since the latter represents the view of the rabbis whereas the former represents that of our Eliezer according to our Eliezer who holds that the preliminary requirements of a precept supersede the Sabbath one may tie the string while according to the rabbis who ruled that they did not supersede it one may only secure it with a loop but if this represents the view of our Eliezer should not tying be permitted also for the first time rather say this is no difficulty since the former is the view of our Judah whereas the latter is that of the rabbis according to whose view however did our Judah give his ruling Talmud Mas Arabin if he made it according to the view of our Eliezer should not this be permitted also for the first time rather say there is no difficulty since the latter Represents the view of Arsimian while the former represents that of the rabbis for it was taught if a Levite had a break in the string of his harp he may tie it up Arsimian ruled he may only make a loop Arsimian B. Eliezer said neither the one nor the other would produce a tone one should rather unwind the string from the lower pin and wind it round the upper one or unwind it from the upper pin and wind it round the lower one and if you prefer I might reply the former as well as the latter. Represents the view of the rabbis and yet there is no difficulty since the former refers to a break in the middle while the latter refers to one at the end and if you prefer I might reply both refer to a break in the middle part but the master holds that a preventive measure is enacted while the masters hold that no preventive measure is to be enacted Mishnah one may be removed in the temple but not in the country if the operation however must be performed with an instrument it is forbidden. Everywhere Gemara is not this inconsistent with the following carrying it bringing it from without the permitted Sabbath limit and removing it when do not supersede the Sabbath and our Eliza ruled they do supersede it our Eliezer and our Jose son of our Hannah gave different explanations one master explains that both rulings refer to a soft one and yet there is no difficulty since the former deals with removal by the hand while the latter deals with removal by means of an instrument and the other. Master explains that both rulings refer to removal with the hand and yet there is no difficulty since the latter refers to a soft one while the former refers to a dry one but according to him who explained that the former dealt with removal by the hand while the latter dealt with removal by means of an instrument what was his reason for not explaining that the latter dealt with a soft one and the former with a dry one he can answer you a dry one may be removed even by means of an instrument. What is the reason because it merely crumbles away and according to him who explained that the latter referred to a soft one while the former referred to a dry one what was his reason for not explaining that the former referred to removal by hand and the latter to an operation by means of an instrument he can answer you concerning an instrument we have explicitly learned if the operation however must be performed with an instrument it is forbidden everywhere and the other the reason why the ruling was taught there is because it was desired to indicate the divergence of opinion between our Eliezer and the rabbis and the other the ruling must be similar to that of carrying it or bringing it from without the permitted sabbath limit which is only a rabbinical restriction and the other as regards carrying it he is not in agreement with our Nathan who holds that a living being carries its own self and as regards bringing it from without the permitted sabbath limit he is in agreement with our Akiba who holds that the laws relating to Sabbath limits are Pentateuch, our Joseph raised an objection, our Eliza argued may not this be inferred of an ad majus if slaughtering which is forbidden under the category of work supersedes the Sabbath, how much more so should these which come only under the category of Shabbat supersede the Sabbath, rather said our Joseph both deal with removal by hand, but a Shabbat relating to the temple within the temple has been permitted, whereas a Shabbat relating to the temple in the country has not been permitted. Abbe once sat at his studies and discoursed on this statement when our Safra pointed out to him the following objection if a man was reading in a scroll on a threshold and the scroll rolled out of his hand, he may roll it back to himself. Now is it not the case here one of a Shabbat relating to the temple in the country and yet no preventive measure has been enacted against the possibility that the scroll might fall down completely and the man might then carry it have we not explained this case as dealing with the threshold that was a carmelite in front of which passed the public domain so that since its rolled up section was still in his hand even the prohibition of Shabbat does not exist he raised a further objection against him the paschal lamb may be lowered into the oven at dusk now is not the case here one of a Shabbat relating to the temple in the country and yet no preventive measure was enacted against the possibility that the man might stir up the coals thereupon he remained silent when he came to our Joseph and told him thus said our Safar to me the latter asked him why did you not answer him the members of a paschal lamb party are careful and Abbe we only presume that priests are careful but we do not presume that the members of a paschal lamb party are also careful Rabbi explained this represents the view of our Eliza who ruled that the preliminary requisites of a precept supersede the Sabbath are Eliezer, however, agreeing that a change should be made as far as this is possible, Talmud, Mas Arabin, be what is the proof since it was taught if F when appeared on the body of a priest, his fellow may bite it off for him with his teeth, thus only with his teeth, but not with an instrument, only his fellow, but not he himself. Now, whose view could this be if it be suggested that of the rabbis and the permissibility is because it is in connection with the temple, the objection would arise since the rabbis have elsewhere forbidden such acts only as a Shabbat. What matters it here whether he or his fellow does abiding consequently, it must represent, must it not the view of our Eliezer who ruled elsewhere that for such acts a sin offering is incurred, but here, though the preliminary requirements of a precept supersede the Sabbath, the change must be made as far as this I hashtag possible. No, it may in fact represent the view of the rabbis, and if the one had grown on his belly, the law would indeed. Have been so, but here we are dealing with one, for instance, that grew on his back or his elbows, where he himself cannot remove it. If this, however, represents the view of the rabbis, why should he not be allowed to remove it with his hand? And this, you might easily derive the statement made by our Eliezer, for our Eliezer stated they only differ in the case of removal with the hand. But if it is done with an instrument, all agree that guilt is incurred. And according to your line of reasoning, why should he not be permitted, even in accordance with the view of our Eliezer, to remove it with his hand? What an argument is this? If you grant that it represents the view of our Eliezer, one can easily see why removal with the hand was forbidden as a preventive measure against the use of an instrument. But if you maintain that it represents the view of the rabbis, why should he not be allowed to remove it with his hand? And nothing more need be said about the matter. Mishnah, a priest who was wounded in his finger. May wrap some regress round it in the temple but not in the country but if it was intended to force out blood it is forbidden in both cases Gamar our Judah son of Arhai explained they learned this only in respect of regress but a bandage is regarded as an addition to the priestly garments are Yohanan however stated they forbade an
however stated they forbade interposition where the material was less than three handbreadths by three only if it rested on a part of the body where clothes are usually worn but on a part where no garments are usually worn Talmud, Mas Aravan only a piece of material that was three handbreadths by three causes an interposition while one that is less than three handbreadths by three causes no interposition this is in fact identical with the ruling which Rabbi cited in the name of Arhis Damas. It be conceded that this differs from the view of our Judah son of our high bandage is different since it is significant but according to our Yohanan instead of being informed about the regress why were we not informed about a bandage we were taught indirectly that regress heals mission assault may be scattered on the altars ascent that the priests shall not slip water also may be drawn on the Sabbath by means of a will from the cistern of the exiles and from the great cistern and on a festival day from the Hagel also Gemara Rika Pashrani pointed out to Rabbi the following inconsistency we learn salt may be scattered on the altars ascent that the priests shall not slip thus only in the temple is this permitted but not in the country but is not this inconsistent with the following if a courtyard floor was damaged by rainwater one may bring straw and level its straw is different since its owner does not renounce it said Araha son of Rabbi to our Ashi how are we to? Understand the case of the salt if its owner has renounced it would not the scattering constitute an addition to the structure and if he did not renounce it would it not constitute an unlawful interposition this is a case where the salt was scattered when the limbs of sacrifices were carried up the ascent an act which is not regarded as part of the temple service but is it not indeed was it not in fact written in scripture and the priest shall offer the whole and make it smoke upon the altar a text which a master explained refers to the carrying of the limbs up the ascent rather say this refers to salt scattered when the wood is carried to the altar pile which is an act that is no part of the temple service Rabbah discoursed if a courtyard floor was damaged by rainwater one may bring straw and level it said our papa to Rabbah was it not taught when he levels the ground he must not scatter the straw either with a small basket or with a large one but only with the bottom broken from a Basket Rabbah thereupon appointed an Amora and delivered the following discourse the statement I made to you was an error on my part but it was this indeed that was reported in the name of our Eliezer and when he levels it he must not scatter the straw either with a small basket or with a large one but with the bottom broken from a basket water also may be drawn from the cistern of the exiles Ola once happened to visit Armanasa when a man came and knocked on the door who he exclaimed is this person may his body be desecrated for he desecrates the Sabbath only a musical sound said Rabbah to him has been forbidden Abbe pointed out an objection against him liquids may be drawn by means of a siphon and water may be allowed to drip from the Iraq for a sick person on the Sabbath thus only for a sick person is this allowed but not for a healthy one now how are we to imagine the circumstances would you not agree that this is a case where the sick man was asleep and it was desired that he should wake up may it not then be inferred that the production of any sound is forbidden no this is a case where he was awake and it is desired that he should fall asleep so that the sound heard is one like a tingling noise he pointed out to him a further objection if a man guards his fruit against the birds or his gourds against wild beasts he may proceed on the sabbath in his usual way provided he does not clap his hand beat his chest or stamp his feet as is usually done on weekdays now what could be the reason is it not that the man produces sound and that the production of any sound is forbidden or ahabi jacob replied this is a preventive measure against the possibility of his picking up a pebble what however is the reason for the statement which rab judah citing rab made that women who play with nuts commit a transgression is it not that this produces sound and that the production of any sound is forbidden no the reason is that they might proceed to level the ground for work you not to concede this how would you explain the ruling of Rab Judah that women who play with apples commit a transgression what sound could be produced there consequently it must be conceded that the reason is that they might proceed to level the ground we learned water may be drawn on the Sabbath by means of a will from the cistern of the exiles and from the great cistern thus only in the temple is this permitted but not in the country but what could be the reason is it not that the revolution of the will produces a sound which is forbidden no this is a preventive measure against the possibility of a man's drawing the water for his garden or his ruin Amimar allowed the drawing of water by means of a will at Mahuza for he said on what ground did the rabbis enact a preventive measure against such drawing only on the ground that a person might also draw water for his garden or his ruin but in this place there is neither garden nor ruin when however he observed that they Began to Talmud, Mas Aravan be so flax in it he forbade it to the men from the Haker well what was the Haker well Samuel replied a cistern concerning which arguments well forth and its use on a festival was declared to be permitted an objection was raised not all the Haker cisterns but only this one did they permit now if you explain it to mean that concerning it arguments well forth what could be the meaning of only this one rather said Arnav and be Isaac a well of living water as it is said in scripture as a cistern welleth with her water etc to turn to the main text not all the Haker cisterns but only this one did they permit and when the exiles returned they encamped by it and the prophets among them permitted them to use it on festivals and not only the prophets among them did this but it was a practice of their forefathers that they upheld Misha if a dead creeping thing was found in the temple a priest should carry it out in his girdle to avoid keeping it. Uncleanness there any longer than is necessary so Yohanan and be Baraka Arjuda ruled it should be removed with wooden tongs in order that the uncleanness shall not increase whence must it be removed from the Hikal from the Ulam and from between the Ulam and the altar so our Simeon be Nanus Arakiba ruled from any place where Karath is incurred for entering presumptuously and a sin offering for entering it in error it must be removed in any other places however a sighter is to be put over it our Simeon said wherever the sages have permitted you anything they have only given you what is really yours since they have only permitted you that which is forbidden as Shabbat Gemara Artobi Bikis citing Samuel ruled one who brings into the temple all object that was defiled by a creeping thing incurs guilt but if one brings in the creeping thing itself one is exempt what is the reason scripture said both male and female shall yet put out from which it is inferred that only that which may attain. Cleanness in a ritual bath is subject to the prohibition a creeping thing however is excluded since it can never attain cleanness may it be suggested that the following provides support for this view both male and female shall yet put out excludes an earthen vessel so are Jose the Galilean now what could be the reason is it not because it cannot attain cleanness through a ritual bath no only that which may become a primary source of uncleanness is subject to the prohibition an earthen vessel however is excluded since it can never become a primary source of uncleanness must it be conceded that on this question there is a divergence of opinion between the following ten as if a creeping thing was found in the temple a priest should carry it out in his girdle to avoid keeping the uncleanness there any longer than is necessary so are Yohanan Biberica Arjuda ruled it should be removed with wooden tongs in order that the uncleanness shall not increase now do they not differ on this point that he who said to avoid keeping holds the opinion that one who takes a creeping thing into the temple incurs guilt while he who said in order that shall not increase holds the opinion that one who takes a creeping thing into the temple is exempt no all may agree that guilt is incurred but the point at issue here is the following one master holds that it is preferable to keep an unclean object a little longer while the other master holds that it is preferable to increase the uncleanness. The point at issue is rather the same as that between the following ten as we learned once must it be removed etc now do they not differ on this point that he who ruled that from the temple court it may not be removed is of the opinion that one who takes a creeping thing into the temple is exempt while he who holds that it must be removed from any part of the court is of the opinion that guilt is incurred Talmud, Mas Aravan Ar Yohanan retorted both expounded the same text and the priests. Went in unto the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took it to carry it out abroad to the brook Kidron. One master holds that since in the court there was a change over to the Levites there can be no prohibition against allowing uncleanness to remain for some time in the court while the other master holds that up to the point where it was impossible. For the Levites to attend the priests had to carry the uncleanness out but where it could be done by the Levites the priests could no longer defile themselves. Our rabbis taught all may enter the Hikal to build to repair or to take out uncleanness it is a religious duty however that the priests should do it if no priests are available Levites may enter if no Levites are available Israelites may enter but in all these cases only Levitically
Service R. Eliezer replied, The man who has the blemish shall enter since he has been declared permitted to eat consecrated food. R. Simeon said, etc. What does R. Simeon refer to? He refers to a previous statement where we learned if a man was overtaken by dusk even when only one cubit outside the Sabbath limit, he may not enter it. R. Simeon ruled, even if he was fifteen cubits away, he may enter since the surveyors do not measure exactly on account of those who might hear the first tana having thus ruled, he may not enter. R. Simeon said to him, He may enter since they have only permitted you that which is forbidden as Shabbat. What does he refer to? He refers to another statement where the first tana ruled that it may be tied up in connection with which R. Simeon said to him, He may only secure it with a loop, only a loop which cannot involve one in the obligation of a sin offering did the rabbis permit, but a not which might involve one in the obligation of a sin offering the rabbis did not permit.